Chapter Ninety Seven. Valmy the Vampire. Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Valmy. Valmy the Vampire. Volume Two by Thomas Prescott Press Chapter 97 The Admiral's Preparation and the Visit to Deerbrook It was quite finally settled between the Admiral and the Bannerworths that he was to have the whole conducting of the marriage business and he even succeeded in getting a concession from Flora Bannerworth that he might invite more than twenty guests as had at first been stipulated indeed she told him that he might ask forty if he pleased the admiral had asked for this enlargement of his of powers because he had received from the lawyer such a satisfactory list of people who were eligible to be invited that he found it extremely difficult to draw any individual's distinction and accordingly he felt fully inclined as far as he was concerned to invite them all which was a piece of liberality he scarcely expected flora would accede to when however he got leave to double the number he considered that he was all right and he said to jack pringle to whom as usual he had got completely reconciled i say jack my boy we'll have the whole ship's crew and no mistake for at a wedding the more the merrier you know ay ay sir said jack that's true i have not been married more than a dozen times myself at the outside and i always took care to have lots of fun a dozen times jack you don't mean that I rather think I does. You know, I was married at different ports of India twice, and then wasn't I married in Jamaki? And then after that, wasn't I married in the South Seas, in one of the friendly islands? A deuce deal too friendly, I should say. Why, confound you, Jack? You must have the impudence of the very devil. Yes, I believe ye I have. I look upon it that it is our impudence has got us on in the world. How dare you say are, you vagabond? But however, I won't quarrel with you now at any rate, for I expect you to dance a hornpipe at the wedding. But mind me now, Jack, I'm serious. I won't have any drunkenness. Well, it's rather a hard thing that a fellow can't get drunk at a wedding but i suppose i must put up with that deadly injury and do the best i can and now admiral as you have looked over that little affair of mine in going to the lawyers when you didn't want me i'll make you a voluntary promise and that is that i'll only take two bottles all the day long two bottles of what Oh, run, of course. Well, that's moderate, for as I have known you, I think take about five, of course. I can't very well say anything to two. So you may take that much, Jack, for I really think you won't be much the worse of it. The worse of it? I should think not, sir it rather strikes me that two bottles of rum wouldn't hurt a newborn baby it's just for all the world like milk you know it has no effect upon me and as far as being fond of drink goes i'd just as soon take pump water if it had a different taste and was a damn deal stronger well well jack that's a bargain you know so we need say nothing more about it 
I suppose there'll be a fiddle and all that sort of thing? Oh, don't doubt that there shall be lots of fun. Then I'm your man. I'll show them a thing or two that will make them open their eyes a bit. And if so be, as they want, anything in the shape of a yarn, I'm the proper sort of individual to give it to them. I rather think and no mistake. I'll tell them how you ran away once with a female savage after you, with a long thing like a squirrel that she called a sphere, and how you called to all the ship's crew to come and help you, as if the very devil was at your heels. Jack very prudently did not wait for an answer to this, for he was rather well aware that it was not the sort of thing that was exactly pleasing to the admiral, who was just upon the point, of course, of getting into one of his rages, which would have produced another quarrel, only as a matter of course, to end in another reconciliation. The old man, however, was too well pleased with the unlimited commission he had to do as he pleased regarding the marriage affair to allow himself to be put much out of the way in the matter, and he bent all his mind and energies towards the completion of that piece of business which he had in hand, and which was certainly the most interesting to him that he had ever been permitted to engage in. Passing as he did almost the whole of his life upon the ocean, he had never married, and his affection for Charles Holland, who was the only relative he had in the world, was of that concentrated nature which is only to be found under such circumstances. Charles' mother had always had a large portion of the admiral's regards, and when upon returning home once from a cruise of three years' duration, he found that she was dead and had left behind her an orphan child. He at once avowed his intention of filling the place of a parent to it, and that he had, both in the spirit and the letter, kept his word. We know that Charles Holland was always most ready to admit. Perhaps the severest shock he ever experienced was when that letter purporting to be from Charles, but which was really the production of Marchdale and Varney, was produced, and which seemed at the first blush to imply a dishonorable breaking of his contract with Flora. And if anything could have increased his admiration of her, it certainly was the generous and noble manner in which she repudiated that attempt to injure Charles in her esteem, and at once declared her belief that the letter was a forged document. We may easily imagine then from these preceding circumstances that the marriage of Charles with one whom he so entirely approved of was one of the most gratifying affairs in the old man's life, and that he viewed it with an extraordinary interest. As we have before stated, he got possession for a month of the house on which he had fixed his fancy, and an extremely handsome and commodious place it was. It was arranged that after they had remained there for some time, they should all move off to Deerbrook together, and as it was only in early infancy that the Bannerworths had seen that estate, they purposed paying it a visit before the marriage ceremony took place. This was an idea of the old admiral's, for he said truly enough, You can't possibly know what state it is in till you go there, and it may be necessary for all we know to do a great deal to it before it is fit for occupation. Apart from this consideration, too, it seemed likely enough that somebody might be in it, for of late it had changed hands, and for all they knew, the Bannerworth family might have to institute a suit at law for its recovery. The distance was sufficient to make it a whole day's journey, but it was a very pleasant one, for they went in a travelling carriage, 
replete with every accommodation, and the road passed through one of the most fertile and picturesque counties of England, being interspersed with hill and dale most charmingly, and reminding the younger branches of the Bannerworths of some of those delightful continental excursions which they once had the means of making, but which for a long time they had not had an opportunity of enjoying. It was towards the close of a day of great beauty for the season that they reached the village of Deerbrook, close to where their state was situated, and put up at the principal inn to which they were directed. The circumstances under which the Deerbrook property had been left for a long time had been such that there was likely to be some difficulty concerning it. In fact, it had been used by Marmaduke Banavard as a kind of security from time to time for his gambling debts, so it was probable that hardly anyone had had it long enough to trouble himself about rentals. If we find anyone, said Henry Banoworth, in possession, I shall not trouble them to pay anything for the use of the house they have had, provided they quietly give up possession and leave the place in a decent state. Oh, that of course they will do, said Charles Holland, and be too glad to escape arrears of rent, but it would be no bad thing to ask the landlord of this house what is the state of the property. No doubt he can not only let us know whether it be tenanted or not, but if so, what sort of people they are who occupy it. This suggestion was agreed to, and when the landlord was summoned and the question put, he said, Oh yes, I know the Deerbrook estate quite well. It is a very handsome little property, and is at present occupied by a Mr. Jeremiah Shepherd, a Quaker, a very worthy gentleman indeed, I believe, but I suppose all Quakers are worthy people, because, you see, sir, they wear broad-brimmed hats and no collars to their coats. An excellent reason, said the Admiral, but I had a friend who did know something about Quakers, and he used to say that they had got such a reputation for honesty that they could afford to be rogues for the rest of their existence. Well, well, said Henry, we can but call upon him. Do you think that this would be a reasonable hour? Oh, yes, sir, said the landlord. He is sure to be home at this hour, if you have any business to transact with Mr. Shepherd. He is a very respectable man, sir, and as it is his own property that he lives upon, he is quite a gentleman, and never wears anything but drab breeches and gaiters. Without waiting to enter into any further conversation with the landlord, who had such extraordinary reasons for his opinions, Henry and Charles and the Admiral, leaving the rest of the party at the inn, proceeded to Deerbrook Lodge, as it was called, and found as they approached it that it exceeded in appearance their warmest anticipations. It was a substantial red brick house of the Tudor style of architecture, and had that air of dignified and quiet repose about it which a magnificent lawn of the greenest possible turf in the front always gives to a country mansion. The grounds, too, seem to be extensive, and to take it, for all in all, the Bannerworth family had every reason to be well pleased with this first view that they got of their acquired property. You will have some trouble, said the Admiral, with the Quaker, you may depend. They are a race that hold fast to anything in the shape of pounds, shillings, and pence, and are not very easy to be dealt with. 
Oh, the man may not be so absurd, I should think, said Charles. It can be proved that the estate was in the Banavort family for many years, and your possession, Henry, of the title deeds will set the question at rest. But see what a stately looking servant is coming in answer to the ring which I have just given to the bell. A footman most certainly having all the appearance of what is so frequently advertised for as a serious manservant advanced to the gate and in answer to the inquiry if Mr. Shepherd was within, he said, Yes, truly is he, but he liketh not to be disturbed, for he is at prayers, that is to say at dinner, and is not accustomed to be disturbed thereat. I regret that we must disturb him, said Henry, for our business happens to be important, and we must positively see him. Upon this remonstrance, the servant unlocked the gate and conducted them up a path by the side of the lawn which led to the house, and the more they saw of it, the more pleased they were with the many natural beauties with which it abounded and henry whispered to charles i am quite sure that flora will be delighted with this place for if i know anything of her taste it will just suit it agreeably and comfortably and i do sincerely hope that we shall be able to get possession without the disagreeable necessity of a lawsuit they were assured into a handsome apartment and then told that Mr. Shepherd would be with them very shortly, and they were not sorry to have a little leisure for studying the place before its reputed owner made his appearance. I suppose, said Henry, the best way will be at once to state that I am the owner of the place, and upon what conditions I am willing to forego any claim that I might otherwise succeed in settling up for arrears of rental during the time that he has been here. Oh, yes, said Charles, you cannot be too explicit. But hush, here he comes, and you will soon know what sort of an individual you have to deal with in this matter. At this moment the door opened, and Mr. Shepherd, the present, ostensible possessor of the Deerbrook estate, and whose appearance spoke to the truth of the landlord's word, made his appearance. But as what he said was sufficiently important to deserve a new chapter, we shall oblige him with one. End of chapter 97《Chapter 98 of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2 》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vali Varney the Vampire, Volume 2 by Thomas Prescott Dressed Chapter 98 The Interview with the Quaker at Deerbrook The Quaker was a man of about middle age, and was duly attired in the garb of the particular sect to which he belonged. There was about his countenance all that affectation of calmness and abandonment of worldly thoughts and desires, which is mistaken by so many people for the reality of self-denial, when really those who know this sect well are perfectly aware that there is not a more money-loving, grasping people on the face of the earth. After gravely motioning his visitors to be seated, 
Mr. Shepherd cast his eyes up to the ceiling, as if he were muttering some prayer, and then he said, Verily, may I ask to whom I am to attribute this visit from individuals who, in this veil of unblessedness, are unknown to me? Certainly, sir, said Henry, you are entitled, of course, at once to such an explanation of us. I have called upon you because I am the proprietor of this estate, to know how it is that you became in possession of it, and under what pretense you hold that possession. Mr. Shepherd slightly changed color and staggered back a pace or two before he said, The property is mine, but I naturally decline to produce my title to anybody who may ask for it. Thou mayest go now. Behind thee is the door. Mr. Shepherd, said Henry, I am fully in a condition as to means and evidence both to prove my title to the estate, and an action of ejectment will soon force you from it. But I am unwilling, under any circumstances, to do what I fully may do, if anything short of that will answer my purpose. I therefore give you fair notice that, if upon my convincing you that I am the owner of the estate, you go out quietly within fourteen days. I will make no inquiry as to how long you have been here, and will say nothing whatever upon the subject of rental owing to me on account of such occupation. I defy thee, friend, said the Quaker, and if thou givest me any trouble, I shall put thee in chancery, from whence thou wilt not get out for the term of thy natural life. So I give thee due notice, and thou mayest please thyself in the transaction, and again I tell thee the door is exactly behind thee, out of which I beg to request thou shouldst at once walk. I tell you what, Mr. Quaker, said the Admiral, who had with difficulty restrained himself thus far. I look upon you as one of the greatest humbugs ever I came across, and that's saying a great deal, for in my life I have come across some thumpers, and if we don't make you smart for this confounded obstinacy, you wolf in sheep's clothing, we will know the reason why. If it costs me a thousand pounds, I'll make you suffer for it. Thou mayest be damned, friend, said the Quaker. Possession is a great number of points of the law, and as I have it, I mean to keep it. I have a friend who is in law, and who will put thee as comfortably in chancery, and with as little expense to me as possible. This is a very charming estate, and I have not the slightest intention of giving it up. But you must, said Charles, give it up to the right owner. How can you be so foolish as to run yourself to legal expenses for nothing? Teach thy grandmother, young man, to suck eggs, said the Quaker. I wish thee all a remarkably good day, and thou mayest all return from whence you came, and hang thyself, if thou pleased, for all I care, and having made up my mind to live and die in this very pleasant property, I shall have to put thee all into chancery. Why, you canting thief, said the admiral. Thou mayest be damned, said the Quaker. In speaking so to thee, I use the language which I am perfectly well aware thou wilt best understand. So I say unto thee again, thou mayest be damned. Obedia, show these sinners of the premises, and should they refuse to go with that quickness that shall seem to be fitting and proper, thou mayest urge them on with diverse kicks on their hinder persons, 
and thou mayest likewise call to thy aid Towser, the large dog, to bite singularly great mouthfuls out of them. The Quaker turned and was walking in a very stately manner out of the room when the admiral stepped forward and exhilarated his movements with such a kick that away he went as if he had been shot out of a gun. There, friend, said the admiral, since you seem fond of kicking, I think this is a very good beginning. It strikes me you didn't know who you had to deal with. And now, Mr. Obedia, it's your turn, and we'll manage Towser when we get outside. I think thee all the same, friend, said Obedia, but would rather be excused. Perhaps you would like your nose pulled instead then? No, friend, it's quite long enough already, and I shall take myself off to the lower regions of these premises forthwith. So saying, Obedia rushed from the room with great precipitancy, leaving most certainly the admiral and his party masters of the field. And although both Henry and Charles both disapproved of the assault which the admiral had committed, they could not interfere for laughing, and as they left the house, which they did now of their own accord, Charles said, Uncle, you may depend you will be pulled up to the quarter session. Damn the quarter session, said the admiral. Do you think I was going to sit still quietly while that vagabond promised to kick me? But as it is, it's all up with coming to Deerbrook to live for one while to come. For if he is really as good as his word and puts the matter into chancery, there's an end of it. I have heard it's like ducking in head foremost into a hollow tree with a wasp's nest at the bottom of it. You may kick, but I'll be damned if you can get out. Well, said Henry, I believe that's rather an apt illustration, but we must do the best we can in such a case, and in the meantime seek out some other place to reside in. Your friend, the little lawyer in the town, shall have the case to conduct for us, and perhaps after all we shall defeat the Quaker sooner than you imagine. I long to see the day come, said the admiral, when that fellow will have to troop out of the place, for in all my life I never did know such confounded impudence as he treated us with. Never mind, never mind, said Charles. The time must come, of course, when this pleasant estate to which we have taken such a fancy will be ours, and until then, we shall have no difficulty whatever in finding some sweet verdant spot full of exquisite and natural beauties, which we can make a home of well and easily, caring nothing for being a short time only kept from possession of that which, of right, shall in a short time belong to us. And there is one thing that I am rejoiced at, which is that Flora has not seen this place so that she can have no regret about it, because she don't know of its existence farther than by name, and it can hold no place in her imagination which could make it a subject matter of regret. When they reached the inn, they informed Mrs. Banneworth and Flora of the ill success of the enterprise, and of the obstinacy of the tenant of the house, and on that evening, they had a good laugh with each other about the little scene that had occurred between the admiral and the Quaker, so that, upon the whole, perhaps they were quite as happy, for people can but laugh and be merry, as if they had at once got possession of the Deerbrook estate without any trouble or difficulty whatever. They determined upon staying there for that night, although they might have got fresh horses and gone back, 
if it had pleased them so to do. But there was much to tempt them in the romantic scenery around which they took a stroll when it was lit up by the sweet moonlight, and everything came out in silvery relief, looking so beautiful and serene, so pensively quiet and so admirable, that it was calculated to draw the mind entirely from all thought of earthly matters, and to completely rid them of even the shadow of an annoyance connected with that Deerbrook property, which was so wrongfully detained from them. It is at such seasons as this, said Flora, that contentment steals into the heart, and we really feel with how little we should be satisfied, provided it be sufficient to ensure those ordinary comforts of existence which we all look for. It is indeed, said Charles, and you and I, Flora, would not repine if our lot had been much more humble than it is, provided heaven had left us youth and love. Those indeed, said Henry, are dear possessions. Well then, remarked the admiral, you have got youth on your side, and I once knew a worse-looking fellow than even you are. So why don't you fall in love with somebody at once? Don't make so sure, uncle, said Flora archly, that he has not. The old admiral laughed, for he liked Flora to call him uncle, and said, You shall tell me all about it, Flora, some day when we are alone, but not now, while these chaps are listening to every word we utter. I will, said Flora. It's a grand secret of Henry's, which I'm determined to tell. That's very unkind of you, said Henry, to say the least of it. Not at all. If you had trusted me, Henry, it would be quite another thing. But as I found it out from my own natural sagacity, I cannot see that I am bound in the slightest to bestow upon you any consolation on account of it, or to shew you any mercy on the subject. And she hopes, said Charles, that that will be a lesson to you to tell her upon another occasion everything whatever, without the slightest stint or hindrance. I stand convicted, said Henry, and my only consolation is that I don't mind a straw the admiral knowing all about it, and I meant to tell him myself as a matter of course. Did you? said the admiral. That's a very good attempt to get out of it, but it won't answer exactly, Henry, with those who know better, so say no more. In such light and pleasant conversation they passed some time, until the chill night air, grateful and pleasant as it was to the senses, made them think it prudent to retire to the inn again. After they had partaken of the evening meal, and Flora and Mrs. Bannerworth had retired to rest, the gentlemen sat up, at the express desire of the admiral, to talk over the affair upon which they were all in common so deeply interested. A general feeling of anxiety evidently pervaded all their minds to ascertain something of the whereabouts or the fate of Varney, who had so very mysteriously taken himself off at a time when they least of all expected he would have executed such a maneuver. You all see, said the admiral, that what is bred in the bone, as I told you, will never be out of the flesh, and this vampire fellow could not possibly be quiet, you see, for long, but he must be at his old tricks. I do not know, said Charles Holland, but I am rather inclined to think that he has somehow become aware 
that he had become rather a trouble to us and so his pride of which i think we have had evidence enough that he has a large share of took the alarm and he went off as quick as he could it may be so said henry and of course in the absence of anything to the contrary i feel inclined to give varney the vampire credit for as much purity of motive as i can that's all very well in its way said that mirror but you must acknowledge that he did not leave in the most polite manner in the world and then i for one cannot exactly approve of his jumping upon dr chillingworth's back from off a garden wall as a cat would upon a mouse be liberal uncle said charles and recollect that we are not quite sure it was varney for the doctor declines to be positive upon the subject and he ought to know stuff said that mirror the doctor knows well enough but he is like the man that has threatened to kick the other for laughing at his wife he said he was sure he had done it but if he had been damn sure he would have kicked him into the middle of next week certainly said charles the doctor seems quite clearly of opinion that whoever committed that assault upon him did so with a full knowledge of the worth of the picture which he believes contained within its extra lining bank notes to a large amount and which said henry after all is but a supposition and varney after such an attempt to possess himself of such a treasure if it was he that made it may be actually now a houseless wanderer but i consider that such has been the notoriety of his proceedings that if he now attempts any vampire tricks he very soon will be discovered and we shall hear of him from his own account said charles holland he has not been the most scrupulous person in the world with regard to the means by which he has from time to time recruited an exhausted exchequer and we can easily imagine that this vampire business of his would so terrify and paralyze people that he would have little difficulty in robbing a house under such circumstances you may depend added charles that he has done one of two things he has either commenced a much more reckless career than ever he has yet attempted or he has gone away completely into obscurity and will never be heard of again i sincerely myself hope that the latter is the case for it will be better for him and better for everybody connected with him hang the fellow said the admiral i should not like him to starve although he has given us so much trouble and i hope that if anything very queer happens to him he will not scruple to let us know and he will not positively want but come is it to be another tumbler of peace or to bed bed was voted for such the new was the admiral's wish or he never would have mentioned the alternative and in the course of another half hour the whole of these persons in whose fate we profess to have so profound an interest were wrapped in repose we will now turn to a consideration of what this singular and mysterious baron stolmoyer of salzburg was about for that he has some ulterior objects in view which by no means at present show themselves we cannot doubt and likewise there can be no question but that very shortly some of his views and projects will develop themselves end of chapter 98
Chapter Ninety Nine. Ronnie the Vampire. Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wally. Ronnie the Vampire. Volume Two. By Thomas Prescott Press. Chapter Ninety Nine. The Baron becomes master of Anderbury on the Mount and begins to congratulate himself. The Dream. It was a wonderful relief to Mister Leake to find that the fact of a dead body having been found in the subterranean passage of Anderbury House was really no bar to the Baron possessing himself of those premises. Mr. Leake could not disguise from himself that to many persons it would have been a serious impediment, and the very mystery in which that affair was still wrapped up would have made the impediment greater, because people don't so much think of a murder which is all found out, and for which the perpetrator suffers. But a murdered body found, and yet no murderer, keeps public curiosity upon the stretch, and is almost certain destruction to house property. But now, whether the Baron bought Anderbury House or rented it, was much the same to Mr. Lee, for in the former case he got his percentage all at once, and in the later, acting as agent, he got more, but he got it by degrees. He waited, therefore, with some degree of feverish impatience to know which way that illustrious individual would make up his mind, and when he said at length, in his strange calm way, that he would give ten thousand pounds for Anderbury on the Mount, Mr. Leake wrote off, in violent haste, to the owner, advising him to accept the same without delay, and as the owner never intended again to set foot in Anderbury House, and moreover wanted money, he wrote back again in as violent haste that he would take ten thousand pounds most certainly, and wished the transaction concluded as quickly as it very well could be, promising Mr. Lee, which was a very gratifying thing to that gentleman, not on account of the money, as he himself said, Oh dear, no, but as a matter of feeling, a handsome bonus, in addition to his percentage, if he quickly got the matter completed. Armed with this authority, the agent showed an amount of generalship which must, if he had been placed in the situation of Field Marshal, the Duke of Wellington, have won for him all the continental battles. He went at once to the Baron and told him that he had received a letter from the owner of Anderbury on the Mount asking ten thousand five hundred pounds for the estate, but leaving it at his, Mr. Leake's option to take ten thousand pounds if he chose. Now, my Lord Baron, said Mr. Leake, business is business and I may as well put two fifty pounds in my pocket, and your lordship put two fifty pounds in yours, as not. That is to say, said the baron, that you are willing to sell your employer's interest to me. Oh, why, it isn't exactly that, you know, my lord, only, you know, in these transactions, everybody does the best he can for himself, and I'm sure I should be very sorry if you thought that, that... Mr. Leake interrupted the Baron. You need have no delicacy with me, whatever. I believe you to be as great a rogue as ever stepped. So you need make no excuses. Only, of course, you cannot expect me to assist you in your villainy. That is quite out of the question. So you will understand that I decline giving more than the ten thousand pounds for Anderbury House. 
and if that is not accepted in one hour from this time, I will not have it at all. It's accepted now at once, groaned Mr. Leake, who found that the baron was too many for him. It's accepted at once, my lord, and I beg that you will bury the past in what do you call it, oblivion. Very good, said the baron. I presume if I give you a check for a thousand pounds as a deposit, I may have possession at once, while the deeds are preparing. Certainly, my lord baron, oh, certainly. The baron then gave Mr. Lee, and took his acknowledgment for the same, a check for a thousand pounds, on one of the most eminent banking houses in London, and in two hours from that time, such was the celerity and precision of his movements he took possession of Anderbury house and engaged the man and woman who had been minding it to be his temporary servants until he could get up an establishment suitable to his rank and the place he inhabited it would have been a strange sight to mr lee and would have made him open his eyes a little with wonder if he could have seen the baron traversing the apartments of Anderbury House alone. And am I at last settled, he said to himself, as he stood in a large saloon. Am I at last settled in a home such as I can really call my own? And shall I not be hunted from it by my enemies? Let me consider. I will be quick in giving such an entertainment here that it shall be talked of for many a day to come. It shall be such an entertainment as shall present to me all of youth, beauty, rank and wealth that can be found in the neighborhood. And out of them I will choose someone who shall be the baroness and for a time pace the stately halls as their mistress. For a time, yes. I have said only for a time. I wonder if there be a family vault to this property, because if there be, I may want to use it. In this purchase of Anderbury on the Mount, the ancient furniture of the place had been all included, so that, in truth, the baron had but to walk in and to find himself if he could make himself so, quite at home. A costly bedchamber was prepared for him, the bed linen and furniture of which was sent by Mr. Leake from his own house, and no doubt he fully intended to be well paid for the same. The baron, after about two hours spent in examination of his house, sat down in one of the principal apartments and partook of a very slight repast and after that folding his arms upon his bosom he seemed to give himself up to thought entirely and from the smile that occasionally showed itself on his remarkable physiognomy it would seem that those thoughts of his were of a pleasant and felicitous character now and then, too, from a few and unsettled words that fell from his lips, it would seem as if he were greatly felicitating himself upon something which he had achieved that was of a character to give him intense satisfaction. Perhaps it was the death of this singular man who called upon him that gave him so much pleasure, and we are inclined to think that was the case, for after the commission of a murder such as that, one of two feelings were pretty sure to possess him. Remorse might take possession of him, and he might suffer much mental anguish in consequence of the deed, or the object which he achieved by that death might be of such a nature as to become quite a subject of congratulation, so as whenever he thought upon it to give him the pleasantest and most delightful feelings it looked very much as if this was the case as regarded the baron 
because it was as clear and evident as the sun at noonday that he had felt no degree of remorse or regret for that deed and that as regards his conscience certainly the murder he had committed sat as easy upon it as anything well could the evening was now drawing on and the large apartments of the ancient house began to be enveloped in gloom but unlike the generality of persons who have committed crimes and whose conscience are charged with injustice the gathering gloom of night seemed to have no terror whatever for the baron stolmuir but at length with something of a sense of weariness he rose and rang for attendance desiring to be shown to the bedchamber which had been prepared for his reception it was a strange thing but it seemed to be customary with him not to undress when he retired to rest but as he had done at the hotel he only took off a portion of his apparel and then cast himself upon the bed and in a few moments it seemed as if a deep repose crept over him we may seem but in reality it was a disturbed and anxious sleep which the baron had and soon he began to toss his arms to and fro restlessly and to utter deep groans indicative of mental anguish occasionally likewise a muttered word or two scarcely articulately pronounced would come from his lips such as save me save me not yet not yet my doom no no the moonlight the moonlight kill him strike him down this state of mind continued for a considerable time until with a shrill cry he sprung to his feet and stood in an attitude of horror trembling in every limb and exhibiting a most horrible and frightful picture of mental distress then there came a loud knocking at his chamber door and the voice of the man davis who had been alarmed at the strange shriek that had come from the baron's lips fell upon his ears the sound of any human voice at such a time was like music to him are you ill sir cried david are you ill no no it was nothing but a dream only a dream and then he added to himself but it was a dream of such absolute horror that i shall dread to close my eyes and rest again lest once more so fearful a vision should greet me it was a dream of frightful significance that it will live in my remembrance like a reality and be dreamed of again as such he sat down and wiped the cold perspiration from his brow then rising he walked with unsteady steps towards the window and throwing aside the mass of curtain which shut out the night without by making a still deeper night within a flood of beautiful and tender moonlight fell into the apartment as the cold rays fell upon his face he breathed more freely and seemed more to revive beneath their influence than as if he had suddenly found the bright sunshine beaming upon him in all the refulgence of its midday glory i'm better now he muttered i'm much better now what a fearful vision that was which came across my heated fancy welcome welcome beautiful moonbeams welcome for deep in my very heart i feel your cheering influence now the violent trembling which had seized him passed away and once more he resumed his wonted composure and calm hideousness of expression if we may be allowed the word now for some time he sat in silence 
and then in a low deep voice he spoke it was a strange dream a dream made up of strange fancies and strange impulses i thought that i stood in a vaulted chamber and that all round me depicted nothing but gloom and desolation but as i there stood the chamber filled with hideous forms coming from where i knew not but still crowding crowding in until the shadow of the merest shade could not have found a place and so they crushed me into the smallest possible space and there i stood with a hundred grinning faces close around me and in such a mad paroxysm of terror that i would have given the world for escape from that dreadful thraldom but they jibed at me filling my ears with shrieking noises and then at once there was a proposition a proposition yelled out with shrieking vehemence by every voice it was to place me in the tombs even as i was a living man heap mountains of earth upon him cried a voice endow him with rare gift of immortality and then let him lie buried for thousands of years yet to come there seized upon me those gaunt and terrific forms and deep into the bowels of the earth i was hurried a depth beyond all calculation and when i thought my fate was sealed a change came over me and i found myself in one of the ice wells of this mansion cold and death-like while a crowd of eager curious faces illumined by the light of torches gazed down upon me but no one spoke and then they began to cast large fragments of the rocky cliff upon me i called for aid and asked for death but still they proceeded to fill up the pit while i lay incapable of anything but agonized thought at the bottom of it then it was i presume that in my despair i shook off that fearful slumber and awakened he was silent and seemed much to rejoice in the moonbeams as they fell upon his face and after a time in order it would appear that he might feel more of their influence he opened the window and stepped out upon a balcony which was immediately in front of it the view that he now had was a beautiful one in the extreme spreading far over in one direction a beautiful tract of highly cultivated country and on the other as far as the eye could reach upon the boundless ocean on which the moonbeams fell with such beauty and power that still and placid as the waters were on that particular night the sea looked like a sheet of radiant silver broken into gentle irregularities it was a scene upon which a poet or a painter but painters should be all poets although poets may not be painters might gaze with rapture and delight not the slightest breath of air stirred the gentlest leaf upon a forest tree but such a calmness and such a serenity reigned over all things that one might imagine oneself looking upon some new and beautiful world the harmony of which had never yet been disturbed by the jarring sounds of elemental strife strange thoughts and feelings seemed to come over the baron as he then looked upon that mild and placid scene without and after a time he spoke saying and what do i struggle for now what is it now but mere existence that is the end and aim of all these anxious thoughts and feelings nothing more nothing more but the mere liberty to breathe and to be anxious the capacity to endure pain that is what i live for nothing else nothing else in the wide world for when and how can i expect 
that calm contentment of the soul which man takes such pains to cast from him but which i know the full value of can ever be mine once more he cast his eyes round him upon the great extent of cultivated country and although he felt he could call the most of it that lay immediately beneath his observation his own it yet gave him but little gratification to do so and probably he looked with about as much indifference upon his own possessions as any one possibly could this is a new career he said and something tells me that it is my last so while it continues i will not shrink from it but on the contrary enjoy it and i will endeavour to lose the recollection of those stormy periods of my existence which have passed away in a complete round and whirl of what the world calls enjoyments and delights i will spend large sums on brilliant entertainments and this house which they tell me has been so long deserted by everything in the shape of festivity and hilarity shall once again ring with joyous laughter and i will make an endeavour to forget what i am he evidently dreaded again to lie down to repose for after some time further spent in thought and in the expression of the feelings that lay uppermost in his mind he put on again that portion of his apparel which he had taken off in this soft and pleasant moonlight he said which is so grateful to my senses i will walk in the gardens of this mansion and should a sense of weariness oppress me i shall be able to find no doubt some pleasant spot where i can lie down to rest and i shall not fear horrifying or anxious dreams when i can repose beneath the beams of the moon which cool my fevered brow with a slow and stately step he moved across the long and beautiful corridor from which his chamber opened and then descending the grand staircase and in that house a grand staircase it really was he made his way across the hall and undoing the fastening of a window which opened into a large and handsome conservatory he passed through that again and soon found himself in the extensive gardens of Anderbury. Certainly, if there be any side more chaste and beautiful than another, it is a highly cultivated and well wooded garden by moonlight. And we cannot but admire the taste of the Baron Stolmier in preferring it even to the stately bedchamber he had so recently left and which notwithstanding all the advantages and beauties that art could bestow upon it could never hope to rival or even to come near the natural beauties of that highly cultivated piece of ground and there are some flowers too that give out their sweetest odours to the night air and some again that unfold their choicest beauties only when the sun has set and the cold moonbeams can but look down upon them when he got fairly into the garden he found that there was a light gentle breeze playing among the shorter shrubs and flowers but that it reached not high enough to stir the leaves of the trees but it is extremely doubtful if completely taken up as this man was no doubt with worldly pursuits he did not after the first few moments completely forget the world of natural beauties by which he was surrounded folding his arms he walked along the stately avenues with a solemn tread and then soon banishing from his mind those feelings of melancholy sadness which had oppressed him he began evidently to indulge in dreams of felicity which by the manner in which he spoke of them were evidently but dreams 
what can i desire or want more than i have he said immense wealth consequently immense power golden opinions may always be purchased with gold and what is there then really to hinder me pursuing to the full the career which i have marked out to myself surely i can surround myself with all that is young and delightful and beautiful can i not make these halls echo with such laughter that surely it must awaken even in my breast joyous emotions then there is the wine cup why should not that flow with rich abundance gladdening the hearts of all and adding even to genius for the time a new fire and a more delightful expression of its thoughts and feelings and music too surely i can have abundance of music to shed the witchery of its charms about me and with these inducements and allurements i must and will succeed in banishing reflection if i achieve no more as he now stood and turned his eyes towards the east he fancied he saw that the morning light was beginning faintly to show itself in the far-off horizon another day is coming he said and how much how very much might be done in a day i will with the assistance of that man leek who i can readily perceive is quite willing to bow down to any idol provided it be of gold to commence the career of festivities that i have set my heart upon and we shall soon see how striking an alteration will take place in the halls of anderbury he entered a small summer house which was built in the garden and through the stained glass of which the moon shone with a variegated light and there he sat down and after a time tasted of that repose which upon the bed of down that he had left and surrounded by all the costly litter of his handsome bedchamber he had courted in vain End of chapter ninety nine hundred of vani the vampire volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot o r g recording by valli vani the vampire volume two by thomas prescott prest Chapter Hundred. Mister Leek speculates upon the Baron's matrimonial intentions. Mister Leek pondered deeply over what the Baron had said to him regarding his intention to take unto himself a wife, and viewed the resolution in all its bearing, with a view of discovering in what way such a thing could be turned to account. And whether that account might not be managed to his own advantage, which was a matter that Mister Leek very often considered of paramount importance to himself, as being the pivot upon which things moved. In Mister Leek was certainly centred all those notions which usually rise from a desire to benefit oneself, and causing, as far as in him lay, all events to circle round him when they least appeared to do so i must make this move of the baron's matrimonial alliance redound to my own advantage in some way or other though i cannot precisely say in what way but if i have any hand in it there must be a way of that there can be no doubt the only thing is to discover the way Mr. Leek set himself steadily to consider the subject in all its various bearings, determined 
he would not give up the chase until he had discovered what was to be done i have it i have it he muttered i have it who can suggest anything better i must have something to do in the suggestive style i will persuade the baron to invite someone with whom i can have a few words in private i will have some few words in the way of a bargain with them. Yes, yes, I will do my best to make somebody else's fortune, but at the same time, they must do something for me in return. I must have a quid for my co, as the parsons say. They cannot preach the gospel without they have a full stomach. For who can be pious and hungry at the same moment? I can't. My thoughts would be diverted. But the case holds good in every relation in life, even though whom I would benefit must benefit me. Else I lose the natural desire I have to benefit them. This reciprocity is the motto I like to apply in cases of this kind, and very proper too. Thus did Mr. Leake argue the matter within his own mind, and then, having thus made a resolution, his next step was to consider how he should put it in practice, how he should be able to realize his hopes and give life and being to the suggestions of his inventive faculties, which were usually of a practical nature. Well, well, he muttered, let me see. It's difficult to say who is who nowadays, but that must not cause me to lose a chance, and I think I can make pretty sure of my bargain. I think if I undertake anything, I can go through it and not fail. I will have so much of security as will prove a bargain, and thus bring shame and disgrace upon them if they refuse to make good the conditions. Thus, Mr. Leake had an eye to the future and the contingencies that might, under different circumstances, arise by any possibility. Men like Mr. Leake do not often fail in their endeavors when they take a comprehensive view of any affair in which they might engage, and thus, by contemplating it in all its various phases, ensure as much as may be success to all their schemes the next consideration that presented itself to mr leake was the party it was all very well to chalk out a plan of action the mode in which a thing should be done but it was another to adapt the tools to the occasion and make them subservient to the purpose he had in view he did not choose his tools first and then adapt his work. No, he saw his object and adapted the means to the end. And in considering this part of the affair, he came to the following resolution. I think I know who to pitch upon, muttered Mr. Leake to himself in a thoughtful tone. Aye, she has several children. And is a widow too. I know she is comparatively poor, and not too much troubled with compunction, or any absurd notions of delicacy upon this matter. I can tell her what I mean better than I could to a good many. Yes, I will go and visit her. I can come to an understanding at once. This was satisfactory, and he arose to quit the house and proceeded to the residence of Mrs. Williams. The lady, whose accommodating disposition and whose desire to see her daughters well provided for would cause her to bargain about matters that many would think too serious and too much a matter of the affections to be permitted to be looked upon in the light of a mere affair of pounds, shillings and pence now mrs williams was a lady who possessed something 
very much like a genteel independence, which is a very mysterious matter, and one which puzzled many people to divine. No one can understand what a genteel independence means. It is one of those things that enables people to flit about, apparently comfortable in circumstances, with genteel clothes and fingers on which nor marks of toil are observable, but which are white and soft, though often lean attenuated, in consequence of privations. However, to return to Mrs. Williams, she was a widow, had several marriageable daughters, and was most anxious that they should be settled out in life, so that she might be sure of their future welfare. She was a sharp-sighted, clever woman in some respects, and in others she was as women usually are, which is not saying much. The house the widow occupied was on a pattern of neatness and gentility, and ornamented with women's work from one end to the other. The ladies were accomplished and well-educated, and possessed of some personal charms, and they were not altogether unacquainted with the fact. Yes, yes, he muttered, I will go to Mrs. Williams, and there we can come to an immediate understanding. Helen Williams will, I think, stand a very good chance indeed. I must go and have some conversation with her, and learn her sentiments before I break ground with him else she may try something without my aid on her own account this was a laudable object and was but as he said merely putting another person in the way of making a fortune and putting something into his own pocket at the same time which was doing two good things at once charitable acts of the first class because charity begins at home and then it gives to one's neighbours when we have a surplus. It did not take Mr. Leake very long to reach the widow's house, and it was not without some degree of confidence that he rang the bell for admission, and when a servant appeared, he said, Is Mrs. Williams at home? Yes, sir, she is, answered the drudge. Do you want her? I wish to see her, else I should not have come here, replied Mr. Leake. Tell her Mr. Leake desires to speak with her. Very well, sir, said the girl, who left the hall and then walked to the parlour in which Mrs. Williams was seated and overheard all that was said in the passage. Mr. Leake, ma'am, said the girl. Tell Mr. Leake to walk in, said the lady, and in due form, Mr. Leake did walk in, introduced by the servant, who soon departed, leaving the two worthies in each other's presence. Good morning, Mrs. Williams. And good morning, Mr. Leake. This visit is unexpected, but valued. I'm happy to see you. Will you be seated? Thank you, said Leake. I will. Unexpected incidents give rise to other unexpected incidents. So you see, one event gives rise to another, and they follow each other in rapid succession. So they do, said Mrs. Williams. Well, said Mr. Leake, as if greatly relieved in mind, giving sound to something very much like a sigh. And how so you find yourselves this variable weather, eh, Mrs. Williams? As well as can be expected, you know, at my time of life. Your time of life? Upon my word, you are a young woman, and if I might hazard an opinion, one with no small share of charms. Indeed, you are decidedly a beautiful woman, Mrs. Williams. Ah, Mr. Leake, 
i though you were too much a man of business to be given to flattery but i am afraid of you there's no need ma'am i assure you but how are your lovely daughters in the enjoyment of good health and spirits yes they are very well i thank you mr leake very well indeed they usually are they are considered to enjoy very good health that is a good thing i'm sure a very good thing upon my word they usually are well yes they have very little that ails them it will be a blessing to you when they are comfortably provisioned of under the protection of some one who will seek their future happiness as he own said mr leake why as to that said mrs williams i am not so anxious as many might be i love to see my children around about me i love to be in their company and to know that no one can elude them that's very true said mr leake and yet i have i must say at times a wish that i might before i die see them comfortably settled in life and their future happiness secured certainly it's quite a mother's wish that it should be so that her children might enter the world and that they might be provided for and subject to none of the disagreeable contingencies of life those are my feelings i thought as much mrs williams have you heard of the kershaws lately inquired mr leake yes i did hear there was a marriage in the family pray is it true it is a good marriage yes i believe a very good marriage one in which a great deal of money is floating about from one to the other indeed i hear the gentleman is very rich how did they become acquainted with such a man i did not think they had any friends who could have brought them into contact with such a person a friend said leake indeed why as i said i did not know they possessed such friends but still i suppose there was some drawback either low-bred contracted friendships or some circumstances or other that caused him to settle there i believe not said lee and what is he then inquired mrs williams why he was a strong guy in those parts but he had an excellent fortune and was according to all accounts a very excellent match how came they to find him out who introduced them to him i should like to know such a person why some friend how very disinterested of that friend said mrs williams not quite it was a mutual understanding i believe how why thus the friend wanted money and the lady wanted a husband for her daughter well i dare say she did and i should have thought she was like to have waited long enough and so she would but an active man of business may have the means of pushing a family's fortune if they will but make it worth his while it was in this manner the kershaws have made their fortune and what did they do why they pushed her daughter into certain company into which she was introduced by the man of business not by himself but he managed it so that she was introduced in a manner that made it appear as if they had no connection and then he could exert himself in another manner and so contrived to serve them by spreading favourable reports and that's how mary kershaw got her husband is it inquired mrs williams with a serious air yes it is indeed how very immoral eh how very immoral of a mother speculating in matrimonial affairs 
for her daughter. How could she expect that she could procure happiness for her when she uses such means? What better could she use? You mistake the motive of the affair altogether, Mrs. Williams. Give me leave to say you do. Indeed. Yes, decidedly. Thus, you don't attempt to buy a daughter's happiness. You only pay an agent, that is all. But it can be no crime that that agent is engaged upon matters connected with the happiness of your daughter which is the great object of a mother's care. Certainly, certainly, how plain all that is, said Mrs. Williams. But I can't think it is exactly what I should do myself. Perhaps not, but I have exactly such a chance at this very moment. You, Mr. Leake? Yes, I have the means, I believe, of obtaining a good fortune for the daughter of a very respectable person, of the first respectability, and with natural advantages in her favour. Such a one, if it were worth my while to lose time in carrying such an affair. Why then? The matter looks a little different to what it did, and certainly, who could object to do what was just and right? Exactly. Now, if you were desirous of seeing your daughter Helen, for instance, comfortably provided for, what would you give? Making it a supposititious case, what would you give to see your daughter happy and comfortable for life, with a good home over her head? A good deal? What? I cannot say, but of course that would depend much upon the value of such a price. But I would not hesitate at a trifle in such a matter as that, come what may. Well, well, this is really the best way to consider the affair in all its various branches. You become more satisfied in the end. Now, do you really think you would be able to tolerate such an attempt to benefit yourself and daughter? I do. Will you enter into particulars? Yes, Mr. Leake, whenever you please. I'm willing to attend to your proposal and will be bound to anything I may say. For in matters of this kind, I must consider anything one may say or undertake as a debt of honor. Exactly. But what we agree to now, we must put in black and white, because, by the by, we may not think of it so well as we should when we see it drawn up before one. Agreed. But what of this person? Why, I think if we were to agree, we would find this gentleman very rich and munificent, and living in a princely style. He is, in fact, a man of rank, of title, in fact. Is that so? Yes, it is, I assure you, because I know him and have had business matters to do with him. And though a correct man, he is not at all nice about matters in which money is the chief ingredient. He pays eight hundred a year for rent, so you may guess he is not at all unlikely to give your daughter a handsome settlement. If he will have her. Exactly, if he have her. There is the contingency, of course, which, however, cannot affect you. Yes, it must, since my daughter does not obtain her husband. And you pay no money. If the benefit is contingent to you, it is to me also. I do not wish to bind you to anything that will cause you to be a loser under any circumstance. Very well, said Mrs. Williams. Say what you please. There is pen, ink, and paper. Make it out, and I will sign any memorandum you may please, provided it be of the complexion you have mentioned. I wish for no other. Mr. Leake accordingly sat down near a table and produced an agreement which was to give him a certain sum of money 
provided Helen Williams was married to the Baron. And who is he, my dear Mr. Leake? said the lady. There, said Leake, read that, and you will see his name. And as he spoke, he pushed the memorandum towards her, and she took it up and read it carefully over, and when she had so done, she signed it and returned it, saying, So he is a baron. Yes, I told you he was a man of rank and title. You did, and where will he live? At Anderbury House. A fine place, I know it. A splendid and princely place it is too. He must have a large fortune there. It will be a splendid match for Helen. I wonder if there be any prospect of success. It appears almost too great a catch. I should say there was every prospect of success. But we must not let Helen know anything of our compact. I know her feelings so well that I am fully persuaded that she would not acquiesce in the arrangement at all. Certainly, it may forever remain our own secret, with which no human being need be acquainted. That is precisely what I wish. But now, how are we to manage the introduction? That will be easy enough. I am glad of it. But how is it to be managed at all? Thus, the Baron will give grand entertainments, and as he knows I am very well acquainted with the generality of the gentry about, he has asked me to point out those whom he might safely invite to his splendid banquets. Then you will have the kindness to invite us, said Mrs. Williams. I see through it now. Aye, a very good plan. Then you can say everything that is necessary. To be sure I can, and will, said Lee. Well, I am glad you have called about this today, for we have had some little scheme in view, but unknown to the principal party concerned. However, as this one is in view, I shall prosecute no other. It would be dangerous to attempt two such speculations at once, else he would be unlikely to fill a promise even after he had gone some way towards doing so. I would run no risk in landing such a prize, said Mrs. Williams, who began to have a keen relish for the chance they had in view, such as they had not yet heard of from any quarter. Then I may fully rely upon your putting Helen forward upon every occasion that may present itself? You may. And in the meantime, keep as much to yourself as you can. You must profess to be unbounded in your admiration for all he says or does, and then you will obtain a preference for companionship, and every little is an aid in such matters. I shall be careful. And in the meantime, I will bid you good day, said Mr. Leake. End of chapter 1001 hundred and one of Varney the Vampire Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Oakley. Varney the Vampire Volume 2 by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 101. The Baron made quick work of it, for in five days after the one in which he took Anderbury House, he gave his first entertainment. Money works wonders, and in the Baron's hands it seemed to have lost none of its magical power, for Anderbury House in that time was furnished like a palace, rich and costly were the decorations, the ornamental parts were bold and florid. The house and grounds were of most magnificent character, though they had been viewed as separate features, but when considered as one, 
as that which was part and parcel of the great whole it was truly princely great care labor and expense had been exerted to make the mansion one befitting the habitation of a prince and the baron himself was looked upon as little less than a prince his disregard of money his liberality all concurred in making him looked upon as one of the most popular men in that neighborhood indeed none such as he had ever been seen or heard of in that quarter he was safe to be considered as one of the grandees of the day and Berry house was now a theme of conversation with every one in the whole town his magnificence liberality and all things connected with him were all well calculated to cause a feeling of prejudice to be made in his favor when people saw the men that were at work the loads of articles that were sent there they were amazed and could hardly credit their senses then they all considered how very rich he must be to be able to spend so much in furniture in hangings in beautifying and in ornamental work which must have been very heavy the baron was fully determined to do all he had intended to do in the way of opening his first grand entertainment with great eclat and in a manner that would take the whole country by surprise the day came the house was finished decorated filled with servants and everything that could make it appear as though it had been for years in that state it is surprising how soon a place can be made to lose all signs of its ever having been uninhabited and the fact of human beings being in a place soon wears away the look of desolation by which it is otherwise enveloped but how much easier it must have been with ample means for a man like the baron to cause such a house as that of enderbury house to become what it was the great wonder being not what was done with ample means but the short time in which it had all been collected together which was done with such celerity and such small signs of bustle and disturbance that it appears as if performed by the wand of a magician so sudden and so quiet it was done comparatively at the end of five days there was a number of invitations fairly written out and directed by order of the baron to the principal inhabitants and gentry of the place to visit anderbury house and partake of a grand banquet given by the baron to them and his friends on that occasion the day was named and the information supplied by mr leake to the baron was of a character that to that individual was extremely valuable and of which he freely availed himself it must not be imagined that the worthy mr leake was in any way oblivious of the promise or obligation into which he had entered with mrs williams whose name he had taken very great care to insert in the list of invitations that the baron had sent out the evening arrived and the carriages drove up to the anderbury house in rapid succession there are few or none of them who knew the baron they were all however anxious most anxious to see who and what the baron was who occupied the estate the title and name sounded well and that was what dwelt upon people's minds and it made an impression upon them and they freely accepted the invitations especially when they inquired among themselves what was the extent of invitation had been issued and they were confined wholly to the elite of the place what was thought or said upon the occasion it would be difficult to say because it was so various and there were none who could in any way form an opinion at all that wore any appearance of probability about it but there was a rumor spread about that he was a foreigner who had immense riches desirous of marrying an english woman and yet unable to obtain introductions in the usual way or else he was merely acting in accordance with the customs and habits of his own country the carriage drive of Anderbury House was completely occupied by the strings of carriages that had taken up and set down for two hours or more as rapidly as they could. The fine apartments that Anderbury House contained that were destined to be used for the occasion were indeed a splendid suite of rooms, but now they were lit up with chandeliers and adorned with glasses and mirrors and pictures as for the ornamental part of the mansion it was superb nothing had been spared in expense and by the way in which it was laid out it was evident the baron was a man of taste and judgment and had converted a nobleman's residence into a palace the gentry came dashing up to the door the place was crowded and many were announced and met and welcomed by the baron who gave them a cordial and distinguished greeting 
there were many persons present. They were astonished at the display of magnificence and wealth of the Baron. They were delighted by his reception of them, his conversation and general manners, and many, too, were much astonished by the splendid entertainment with which he had provided them. All that art or the season could produce was there, superb wines and liqueurs, fruits, to an extent they had never before contemplated or thought of. Anderbury House was without rival. The wines were good, and they warmed the blood, and curtsies and civilities of life were by the aid of alchemy of old port, splendid and sparkling champagne, sherries, burgundies and other wines soon turned into friendships and cordialities. Baron, said one of the guests, you have a superb place, and you certainly are the proper individual to own such a place. And why, my dear sir, inquired the Baron blandly, because you have the taste and heart to decorate and array the place in a manner befitting its extent, and you have the hospitality of one of the ancients to the east. Ha ha! Very good, my dear sir. You are kind, very kind. But I must admit, I do like to see neighbours act honestly and in good faith with each other. Besides, I am of opinion that man is a social animal and one who lives only in society. I cannot be a hermit. Right, if the world were all of your opinion, and I believe they are, practice only is opposed, what a state of kindliness and comfort we should all be in. I am sure of it. Aye, so am I. Do you like music? I do, was the answer. Then you shall hear some. We shall have dance presently, and there will be no heart that will be not beat in unison with a harmonious strain. I think they deserve not to be here in the centre of happiness if they did not. Ho! Oh, music there, said the Baron as he stamped on the floor of the grand saloon in which several hundred guests stood. The call was answered by a loud crash of instrumental music that came suddenly and startlingly upon the ears of the guests, but then it was followed by a lighter strain, with a pretty but marked melody, such a one that it instantly communicated to those present the feeling of being participators and even actors in the scene that was about to be enacted upon the floor. It required but very little exertion to form the dance, where everyone was willing and anxious to take their places. There was a slight degree of excitement in the procuring of partners. Here for a moment the Baron was at fault, but by some means they were not at that moment explained or even thought of. Mrs. Williams led the beautiful Helen past the spot at the moment. He had spoken to her before, and it was well pleased with her. He perceived she was beautiful and amiable. Her mother, too, was with her, and in another moment the Baron stepped forward, saying, Madame, if the hand of your daughter is not already engaged, I beg respectively to claim it for the opening dance. Mrs. William cursed in condention, saying in reply, Yes, my lord, my daughter is disengaged. Miss William, said the Baron with much deference, may I request the honour of your hand? Helen Williams cursed and she was not engaged and accepted his offer with a smile, but with some diffidence. The Baron immediately led her to the top of the room, where, by this time, there was a perfect lane for them to pass through until they reached the top. All had taken their places by an instinctive sort of feeling that was almost universal in the ballroom. The signal was given, and then the Baron led Helen down the first dance amidst the admiration of all and the envy of not a few. The giddy whirl of the dance, the throng of beauty and the sweet but gay notes of the bands added to the coup d'oeil of the scene, a scene of so much happiness and gaiety there were few who called, looked coldly upon it. The Baron himself appeared in the highest spirits, and with the greatest hospitality he sought to administer to the wants of his guests every moment that he could abstract from the present leadership of the dance. He visited one and then the other, until he had made a fair round and then found that the night was very far advanced, and that, in a short time, he was convinced the daylight would come. The guests were well pleased with the splendour of the entertainment and the profusion that was there. Nothing was wanting. All were well pleased with the arrangements. Great care and great expense had gone to gratify and pleasure them, and it had succeeded indeed. If it had not, they would have been captious and ungrateful to an extreme. The guests, however, well pleased with their entertainment, were still unable to bear up against the excitement and fatigue of pleasure for hours, and the animal power fails. Indeed, there is no one sense 
which may not be exhausted by an overindulgence, even hearing will, as soon as any other, become invariably tired by listening too long to music, a, and even become unable to distinguish between the different melodies, and the guests began to flag and to pay more attention to the side tables, and then to look drowsy, and some of the younger spirits appeared to have the dance to themselves. The Baron now saw the proper moment had arrived for dismissing the company, and, causing the music to cease, he advanced in the middle of the room, and waving his hand, said, My honoured guests, the sun begins to peep over the hills, and the bright car of Phoebus rapidly ascends the sky, telling us that another day has begun. The happy mortals must part, and so must we. Let me thank you all for this kindness, for thus honouring my banquet with your presence, and let me hope it may be often thus. Often I say, yes, fair ladies, your presence will always be a distinguished honour. While I am a bachelor, I shall continue these fates once a fortnight regularly until someone takes the arrangement of such matters out of my hands by legally assuming the title of Baroness. There was a long pause after this announcement, and then a sudden buzz of admiration which was heard on all sides, and the ladies looked at each other, the Baron, and the magnificent place they were in. We cannot tell what passed in their minds, but a shrewd guess might readily be formed, and the, to the performance of the task we leave the reader. There were many courtesies before the separation was effected, and an hour had passed before the Baron Stolmeyer of Stolzberg found himself alone. End of chapter 101. Recording by Jason Oakley, Brisbane, Australia. www.bangrocks.com One hundred and two of Varney the Vampire, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barony. Varney the Vampire, Volume Two, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter One Hundred and Two: The Wedding Feast, The Admiral's Disappointment. And now the day arrived at length, when Charles Holland was to call Flora Bannerworth his bride. On this most auspicious event, as may be well imagined, the Admiral was in his glory, and he declared his intention of dancing, if any very handsome young lady should ask him to be her partner at the ball, but not otherwise, for it had been agreed to have a ball in the evening. Jack Pringle, too, was restored completely to favour upon the occasion. Indeed, as far as the Admiral was concerned, he seemed to have granted a general amnesty to all offenders, because he was heard to say, "'Well, I really should not mind if any poor devil of a Frenchman was to come. He should know what good eating and drinking was for once in his life. Or even that old vagabond, old Varney the Vampire. What a fool he was to take himself off before the wedding, to be sure!' Henry Bannerworth had undertaken to take off the old man's hand all the trouble connected with the actual ceremony, that is to say, letting the clergyman know, and so on. Therefore he, the admiral, had nothing at all upon his mind but the festivities that were to be gone into upon the occasion. The numerous guests recommended by the lawyer were invited to a breakfast, which was to be at one o'clock, while a favoured few, which, together with the family party, made up altogether about eighteen persons, were to come to the wedding itself, and to be actually present at the ceremony. The Admiral was rather annoyed at Jack Pringle, about ten o'clock, looking very anxiously at the sky, and shaking his head in a manner which seemed to indicate that he had something of importance on his mind. "'What the deuce is in the wind now?' said the Admiral. "'You are always looking for foul weather you are, and behind you.' Oh, said Jack, I was only a considering what they calls the blessed aspect of the sky, and it seems to me that there is a sort of kind of look about things as says that there won't be no marriage at all today. No marriage? No, not a bit of it. I'm tolerably sure there won't. I was a-going on one of my numerous occasions to be married, and there was just that there kind of look in the sky. And I wasn't. What kind of look, you lubber? I rather think, after living afloat a matter of forty years and more, I ought to know the looks of the sky, rather, and I don't see anything unusual in it. Don't you? Then I does, and there won't be no marriage. 
Why, you infernal croaking swab! You are drunk or out of your senses, one of the two. I would bet my head to a bottle of rum that there will be a marriage. I don't mind, said Jack, betting one bottle to twenty that there won't. Done, then, done. And, Jack, for once in a way you will find yourself regularly done. I can tell you. I know you have got some crotchet or other in your head, by which you think you will get the better of the old man, but it won't do, for I won't stand any quibbling or lawyer-like sneaking out of it. Oh, I won't sneak out of it, you shall see. It shall be all plain sailing and above board, I can tell you, Admiral. The old man rather puzzled himself to think what Jack could mean, but after a time he gave it up and forgot it for his mind began to be too actively engaged upon what was going on to pay much attention to what he considered was some joke of Jack's, which would turn out to be a mere quibble of words after all. The Admiral was right when he said there was no appearance of anything in the weather to indicate that any stop would be put to the festivity on that account, for a more pleasant and a more genial delightful day for the occasion never shone out of the heavens. Indeed. If anything could have been considered as a gratifying omen of the future felicity which Charles Holland was likely to enjoy in the society of Flora Bannerworth, it was the aspect of that day, a day so replete with beauties, that had it been picked out specially for that occasion, it could not have been more gratifying or delightful. The house was a large and handsome one which the Admiral had taken, and since, of course, he considered it to be his own, he was from an early hour in the morning in a perpetual fidget and here and there and everywhere, for the purpose of seeing that all the arrangements were complete for the day's proceedings. As may be well supposed, he was a great hindrance to everybody, and most especially the servants, whom he had temporarily engaged, wished him at the very devil for his interference. But, however, notwithstanding all these drawbacks, by ten o'clock everything was in a tolerable state of readiness, and then the Admiral vociferously congratulated the first of the guests who arrived for that was a great merit in the old man's eyes, and although he did not know the person a bit, he almost terrified him by the cordiality of his greeting. "'That's right,' he said. "'Take old time by the forelock, and always be too soon instead of too late. I'll tell you some capital stories some of these days about the advantage of being a little too soon. But, helloa, here comes somebody else. Egad, we shall have them all here soon. Here, Jack Pringle, where are you?' Here, cried Jack, hard on to your larboard bow. Pipe all hands among the flunkies. Aye, aye, sir, said Jack. Producing then a boatswain's whistle, he blew a shrill call, which pleased the Admiral, for as he said, that was the proper way to begin anything like an entertainment. People know they must be punctual at weddings, and generally are tolerably so with the exception of those persons who are never punctual at anything, so that in a short time nearly the whole of those who had been invited to be present at the ceremony had arrived, and the hour was fast getting on towards that when the marriage was to take place. The Admiral would have been blind indeed if he had not perceived that there was a great deal of whispering going on among the Bannerworth family, and he got rather indignant and a little uneasy to know what it could all be about. But most of all he began to be annoyed at Jack Pringle, for that individual's conduct was certainly of a peculiar and extraordinary character. Every now and then he would burst out into such an amazing roar of laughter, apparently at nothing, that it became seriously annoying to the old man, and finally, taking up a pair of nutcrackers that were upon the table, he gave Jack a hard rap upon the top of the head as he said, "'Are you out of your senses? What are you going on about?' "'Oh, nothing,' said Jack. I was only a thinking. Don't you recollect our wager? Yes, I do. You have laid me one bottle of rum to twenty that Charles and Flora won't be married today. Very good, said Jack. That's quite correct, and mind I owed you to it. Hold me to it. I'll hold you to it. I know well enough it's some stupid joke you have got hold of. Very good, said Jack. We shall see. The time crept on, and half-past eleven o'clock came, and the guests were assembled in the drawing-room, where by a special license the ceremony was to have been performed, and on the mantel-shelf of which there was a timepiece indicating the rapid arrival of the hour named for the ceremony. 
"'You know, Henry,' said the Admiral, "'I left everything to you. I hope it's all correct now, and that you have not made any blunders.' "'None whatever, I assure you, Admiral. I have arranged everything. But Flora has just told me that she wants to speak to you.' "'Speak to me? Then why the deuce doesn't she speak? I suppose she can speak to me without asking your leave.' Admiral, said Flora, I am extremely anxious to ask you if you will forgive me for something which may possibly annoy you a little, and which certainly I feel myself answerable for. What is it? You must promise to forgive me first. Well, well, of course. Of course I do. What is it? Then I must say... I would rather not be married today. What? cried the Admiral. I told you so, shouted Jack. I saw it in the look of the clouds this morning. I never knew anybody get married when there was a light breeze blowing from the nor'east. You be quiet, said the Admiral. I'll be the death of you presently. What is the meaning of this, Flora? Is it not rather a cruel jest to say such a thing to me now? It is no jest, sir, but a fact. I must beg to be excused. And I, uncle, said Charles Holland, advancing, am of the same mind, and I join with Flora in begging that you will look over the little disappointment this may occasion you. Little disappointment, cried the Admiral. Am I awake? Am I out of my senses? Jack, you rascal, where am I? Can't say cried Jack. But I think as how you are about two points to the suffered. Flora, speak again. You do not, cannot mean to tell me that any foolish quarrel has interfered to prevent this union, upon which I have set my heart. If you are not jesting, there must be some very special reason for this alteration of intention. There is, said Flora, as she looked the old man kindly in the face. There is a very special reason, sir, and one which I will mention to you at once, a reason which makes it next to impossible that the ceremony should proceed. The real fact is— Well, go on. Go on! That Charles and I were married a fortnight ago. Damn me! said the Admiral. If ever I was so taken in my life! A fortnight ago, shiver my timbers! Go on, old Peppercaster, said Jack. Only remember you owe me twenty bottles of rum. I won't look over it, said the Admiral. I won't and I can't. It's treating me ill, Flora. I tell you, it's treating me ill. But you know you have looked over it, Admiral, said Flora. And I have your positive promise to forgive me. Besides, said Jack, she won't do so no more. And as far as I sees of these here things... It's a deuced good thing as we ain't bothered with any parson coming here this morning, casting up his eyes like a dying dolphin if you're outs with so much as a natural dam or two. I can't stand such rubbish, not I. And it's my out-and-out -out opinion that we shall be all the merrier. And as for the old man... Jack's oratory was put to a stop by the Admiral seizing a piece of confectionery that was upon the table, and throwing it with such a dab in his face that he was half choked and covered with currant jam, and he made such a spluttering that the guests could not keep their countenances no longer, but burst into a roar of laughter consequent upon that proceeding. "'And you too, Henry,' said the Admiral. "'I suppose you were in the plot.' "'Why, yes,' said Henry. I rather think I was. The fact is that Flora disliked the public marriage, although she looked forward with pleasure to the meeting with this pleasant party on the present occasion, so among us we all cast about for some means for securing the agreeable without the disagreeable, and so a fortnight ago they were married, quietly and privately, and I plead guilty. I thought as much, said the Admiral. I'll be hanged if I didn't. But now just answer me one question, Charles. A hundred, if you please, Uncle. No, one will suffice. I want to know whether you were married in the name of Bell, or in the name of Holland. 
I took legal advice, uncle, as to the validity of my marriage in the name of Bell, and as I found that a man's marriage was quite legal, let him call himself whatever he pleases, and as I knew that it was your wish I should take the name of Bell, I was married in that name, and Flora now calls herself Mrs. Bell. Then I'll say no more about it, said the Admiral, but let it pass so. Let's be as merry as possible. And first of all, we will have a bumper all round to the bride. This affair, upon which Charles really had had some misgivings, being thus agreeably settled, there was certainly nothing to interfere with the hilarity of the meeting, and as there was an abundance of good cheer, and the guests had been selected judiciously, and were persons who could and would enjoy themselves, an extremely pleasant day was passed. For about an hour, perhaps only, the Admiral now and then exhibited some symptoms of indignation, and shook his head occasionally at Flora, but a smile from her soon restored him, and he did actually contrive to get through a quadrille in some extraordinary manner, by almost knocking every lady down, and ending by falling sprawling himself. The only great interruption, and that lasted for nearly half an hour, to the proceedings, arose from that incorrigible Jack Pringle, who, as usual, did not get a glass too much, but a whole bottle too much, and then an obscure idea seized him that it was absolutely impossible for him to avoid kissing all the ladies, as it was a wedding, or ought to have been a wedding. Blaming himself, therefore, very much for not having thought of it before, he made a wild rush into the drawing-room, and commenced operations. A scene of confusion ensued which quite baffles description, and Jack had to be carried out at last by main force, thinking himself a very ill-used person, when he was only doing what was right and proper. The Admiral apologized to the ladies for Jack calling their attention to the fact that he wasn't such a fool as he looked, and that, after all, it wasn't a bad notion of Jack's, only that he had not set about it in the right way. "'Howsomedever,' said the Admiral, "'I don't mind showing you how he ought to have done it.' This, however, was universally declined, and that with so much decision, too, that the Admiral was forced to forego the generous intention. But long before the parties separated for the night, he admitted that it was just as well the marriage business had been all settled before, and it was shrewdly suspected that from the fact of the Admiral singing Rule Britannia after he had gone to bed, he had just slightly exceeded the bounds of that moderation which he was always preaching to Jack. End of chapter 102 Recording by Barony One hundred three of Varney the Vampire, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Varney the Vampire, Volume Two, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter One Hundred Three. Doctor Chillingworth makes urgent inquiries for the vampire, and the lawyer gives some advice concerning the Quaker. If the Bannerworth family and the Admiral were inclined to put up quietly with the loss of the large sum of money which Dr. Chillingworth fully believed that Varney the Vampire had gone off with, he could not fully divest himself of the idea that it was recoverable. When he went home, he succeeded in silencing the clamors of his wife by assuring her that his practice for half a dozen years would not at all be equal to what he should gain if he could successfully carry out what he was aiming at, and as everything— to Mrs. Chillingworth, resolved itself into a question of pounds, shillings, and pence, she was tolerable well satisfied, and consented to remain quiet, more especially as he gave her sufficient to keep the household comfortably for some time while again left home. So thoroughly had he made up his mind not to let the matter rest, that he carefully resolved the best means of setting about, systematically, to inquire for Varney. He thought it impossible that he could have left the cottage home of the Bannerworths with such great secrecy that no one had observed him. He was too remarkable a man, too, in personal appearance, to escape notice, and if any one saw him, with a grain of curiosity in their composition, they would be sure to look after him with speculative eyes as to who and what he was. The cottage had not many dwellings near it, and the doctor thought it highly possible that if he visited them all, and made proper inquiries, 
some one among their inhabitants might be able to tell him that such a man as Varney had been seen. Accordingly he commenced his tour, and, as luck would have it, at the very second cottage he went to, a woman stated that a tall, dark, singular-looking man had asked leave to sit down for a few minutes, and to be accommodated with a glass of water. "'Had he any parcel or bundle with him?' asked Mr. Chillingworth. "'No,' was the reply. "'He certainly had nothing of the kind that I could see, and only seemed very weary and exhausted indeed. "'Do you know which direction he went in?' I watched him from my cottage door, and after looking about him for some few minutes, he walked away slowly in the direction of the London road. This was all the information that Dr. Chillingworth could obtain in that quarter, but it strengthened him in his own opinion that Varney had left that part of the country and proceeded to London, but with what motives or intentions could not be guessed even, although probably it was with an intention of finding a wider sphere of action. If, thought the doctor, he has gone on the London road, and walked, he must have stopped, in the very weak state that he was, within a very few miles for rest and refreshment, in which case I shall hear tidings of him if I take myself the same path. He pursued this plan, and walked on, inquiring at the different inns that he passed, but all in vain, for such a man. No one had seen anybody resembling Varney, and the doctor, with a sense of great disappointment, was compelled himself to stop for rest at a roadside inn, where the mails and stagecoaches stopped to change horses. The landlord of the inn was a good-tempered, conversable man, and was listening, with quiet complacency, to the rather long description of the personal appearance of the individual he sought, that was given by Dr. Chillingworth, when the mail-coach from London, which was proceeding to a very distant part of the country, stopped to change horses, and the coachman came to the bar to take his usual glass of refreshment. While so engaged, he heard something of what Dr. Chillingworth was saying, and remarked to that gentleman, "'Do you mean, sir, a long fellow, that looked as if he had been buried a month and dug up again?' "'Well,' said the doctor, "'he certainly had something of that appearance, but the man I am inquiring about disappeared last Thursday.' "'The very day, sir,' I was going up with the mail when he hailed it, and got up on the outside. He is the very man you may depend. I remember well enough his getting up, but somehow or another when we got to London he wasn't to be found. And so he had his ride as far as it went, and I have not the least idea of how far that was for nothing. I thank you for your information, and I have no doubt that it was the man I seek for. Although he had a large sum of money with him, I think, yet it was not in an available shape to use, and I dare say he would not be very scrupulous about the means he adopted to avoid the inconvenience of any detention. Not he, sir, he wasn't very particular. I dare say he got down somewhere in London, most probably at Piccadilly, where there is always a crowd, and I draw up for about five minutes. I don't look to see who gets down or who stays up, so, as regards that, he might take himself off easily enough if he liked." But you missed him? Yes, I did, when it was too late. Can you tell me who or what he is, sir? Yes, said Dr. Chillingworth. It was Varney the vampire, of whom, no doubt, you have all heard so much, and who has made such a commotion in the countryside. The deuce it was, said the coachman, and I have actually had one of these creatures upon my coach, have I? I only wish I had known it, that's all. I would have pretty soon got rid of such a customer, I can tell him. They don't suit me, those sort of gentry. But I'm off now. Good day, sir. I hope you may catch him. The coachman got upon his box and drove away, and Dr. Chillingworth began to think that unless he took a journey to London, which he was scarcely prepared to do, he must give up for a time the pursuit of Varney. Besides, he thought, and justly enough too, that even if he went to the metropolis in search of him, its extent would baffle all inquiry, and make it almost impossible that it could be set about with any prospect of success. So he resolved, before he went any further in the matter, to urge the admiral and the bannerworths once more upon the subject. He was firmly, himself, of opinion that something more, and that perhaps too of a very uncomfortable character regarding Varney, would soon be heard, unless they could communicate to him in some manner, and persuade him either to retire from England altogether, 
or to lead a quiet life with a portion of the wealth he had acquired. It will be seen with what great pertinacity the doctor clung to that idea which to the Bannerworths appeared such a very doubtful one, namely, that Varney had really got possession of all the money which had been hidden by Marmaduke Bannerworth. But we must leave the doctor for the present inactive, because he felt that, at the period of Flora's marriage, they would be too much occupied to give him the attention he required, and, therefore, he determined to wait until that ceremony, at all events, was completely over. And now we may as well state at this juncture that the admiral was quite as good as his word, as regarded taking the advice of his friend, the lawyer, concerning the Quaker who still held possession of the Deerbrook estate. With all the indignation that he felt upon the matter, he laid it before the man of law, explaining how liberally Henry had dealt with him, and what a very uncourteous reception they had met with. "'I am afraid,' said the lawyer, "'that he may keep you out of it for a year or two, unless you compromise with him.' "'What do you mean by compromise?' "'Just this. He knows very well, of course, that he cannot hold possession, and he wants to be paid out. That's the whole of the affair. He considers that you may take friendly advice, and that then you will be told how much shorter, cheaper, and less vexatious a course it is, to put up with almost any amount of imposition, than to get involved in a lawsuit. "'That's all very fine,' said the admiral. "'But do you think I'd let that rascally Quaker have a farthing of my money? No, indeed, I should think not. If he expects us to compromise, he will be disappointed.' "'Well, then, if your determination is to proceed, I will, if you like, take the necessary steps in the name of Mr. Henry Bannerworth. Do you know if he administered to his father's estate? No, I know very little about it, but you had better see him. Certainly, said the lawyer, that will be the best plan. I had better see him as you say, and I dare say, added the lawyer to himself, I shall find him more reasonable than you are by a great deal. The lawyer did see Henry, for he called upon him and so strongly advised him to compromise the matter with the Quaker, that Henry gave him full instructions to do as he pleased. "'Your title is so clear,' said the lawyer, "'that it cannot prejudice you to make the offer, or rather, to allow me to make it for you. Besides, I will take care that it shall be made without prejudice, and I dare say you will get possession pretty quickly of the Deerbrook estate.' The lawyer wrote to the Quaker, asking for the name of some solicitor who would act in his behalf, and at once received an answer, referring him to a Quaker attorney, who was tolerably notorious for sharp practice, and who was about as great a rogue as could be found in a profession somewhat notorious for such characters. The shortest plan and the best was that which was at once adopted by the Admiral's friend, the attorney, for he went to town and saw the Quaker upon the subject. The result of their conference was that Mr. Shepherd wanted a sum equivalent to two years' rental of the premises he occupied before giving up possession of them, and in reply one year was offered, and there the matter rested for mutual consideration of the principles. Henry did not feel exactly disposed to do anything in the affair in actual defiance of the admiral, so he resolved upon trying, at all events, to persuade him into the compromise if possible and the principal argument he intended using was, that Flora had heard sufficient of the Deerbrook property, and that it would be a thousand pities, consequently, to keep her out of possession of it, since, from what they had all seen of it, they felt that it would be a very desirable residence indeed. The Admiral's anger, however, had been so roused by the insolent conduct of the Quaker, that it required great care and tact to introduce the subject to him in such a shape, and Henry set about it not without some fear of the result. "'I have seen, Admiral,' he said, "'your friend the lawyer about the Deerbrook property, "'and we shall not have possession in our lifetimes.' "'What do you mean by that?' "'Oh, our ghosts may perhaps haunt its verdant shades, "'but we shall all be dead long before the Court of Chancery "'decides in our favour, "'for, owning to the manner of my father's death, "'some difficulties may be thrown in the way to protract time.' What, does he tell you so? Yes, indeed he does, Admiral. And then, you see, heaven knows how many claimants may arise for the estate, if it was known how recently we came by the title deeds. The deuce they would! I can't say but there is some reason in that, after all. 
but what is to be done? You can't say that the Quaker, Shepherd, is to be allowed to retain possession of the Deerbrook estate, just because there are some difficulties in the way of getting it out of his clutches? Certainly not, but the whole question resolves itself into what is the best means of accomplishing that object, and the great difficulty seems to be this, that he actually has possession, which you have heard, of course, is nine points of the law, and puts a man in such a position that he can give a great deal of trouble to any one who is not so fortunately situated. Can he? Then I tell you what I'll do, Henry. I'll pretty soon alter that state of things. But how can you, Admiral? By going and taking possession, to be sure. And if possession be indeed nine points of the law, I don't see why we shouldn't have them. I have taken a ship or two from an enemy when they have been under their own batteries, and it ain't the most likely thing in the world that a Quaker, who in the Navy we call a wooden gun, should stop me taking possession of the house. I am quite sure, said Henry, that if you were to set about it, you would do it. There can be no doubt whatever upon that head. But it's a very difficult thing to treat the law in that sort of way, and you may depend there would be an amazing fuss made about it, so much so indeed, that some serious consequences might ensue, and we should perhaps lose the estate altogether. Hang the estate! It's the Quaker I want to serve out. But you have served him out. Don't you recollect the kick you gave him? Why, yes, I certainly did give him a kick. And a good one, too. You think it was a good one, do you, Henry? Well, I must say I am very glad of that, very glad of it. It's some consolation, that's quite clear. And I think, then, after that, Admiral, after feeling that you have served him out in that kind of manner, and that he has put up with the degradation of having been kicked by you, you might just as well forego a little of your resentment, and allow me to ascertain if I cannot make something like terms with him. Terms with a vagabond like that? Yes. What say you to giving him a trifle, and then let him go, provided he clears out of the estate at once, and gives us no further trouble? I'd ten times rather kick him again. Why, yes, and I must confess he deserves kicking most certainly. I admit all that, that a greater scamp you could not find. But, after all, you see, Admiral, it comes to a question of pounds, shillings, and pence. Nothing in the world makes a man like that suffer but touching his pocket. Very likely, but you propose to put something into his pocket. Yes, at first, but it is to save the more, as would easily be found. And besides, you see how he has been afraid to take any notice of your kicking him. To be sure he has. Such fellows are always afraid. You didn't expect he would take any notice, did you? And if you did, I knew better. Afraid, indeed. Ah, to be sure, that's just what he was likely to be. Afraid, as a matter of course. If you please, sir, said a servant, coming in to the admiral, here is a gentleman wants to speak to you. To me? Who the deuce can it be, I wonder? He says it's on particular business, sir. Well, well, show him in here. A mere youth was shown into the apartment, who, addressing the admiral, said, Pray, sir, is your name Bell? To be sure it is, and what of that? Nothing particular, sir, only I have the honor of serving this upon you. And what the devil is it? Before this question was well out of the admiral's lips, the lad had disappeared, and when the old man unfolded the paper, he found that it was a notice of action from Shepherd, the Quaker, on account of the assault which Admiral Bell had committed upon him. "'And this is the fellow,' cried the Admiral, "'that you want me to compromise with. "'No, Master Henry, that won't do. "'And, since he has had the imprudence now to commence war with me, "'he shall not find that I am backward in taking up the cudgels in my own defense. "'I'll pretty soon let him know that he has got rather an obstinate foe to deal with, "'and we will see how long he will find it worth his while to persevere.' Henry felt at once that this imprudent act of the Quaker, which, no doubt, was intended to hasten and facilitate a compromise, placed it further off than ever, and that, in the Admiral's present state of mind, it was quite absurd to think of talking to him in anything like a peaceable strain, for such could not be done. The utmost that could be hoped was that he would not actually give way to some act of violence, and that he would, at all events, do nothing more than what the law allowed him to do in the matter. 
This was what Henry did not feel quite sure of, and he only hoped it. End of chapter 103《104 of Barney the Vampire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Barney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 104 The Bone House of the Churchyard of Anderbury, The Resuscitation, The Fight and the Escape of the Dead, The Boat and the Vain Pursuit. The coroner, after the inquest was over, issued his precept for the interment of the body of the man who was found in the ice-well of Anderbury House, and whose body was deposited at the bone house in Anderbury Churchyard. There was an end now to these proceedings, though it was much too fresh in people's minds to enable them to forget it. Yet, once the coroner's inquiry over, it usually happens that a feeling of satiety, arising from excitement in the first place, or following that excitement, and induced by the knowledge that all is done that can be towards unraveling the mystery that had caused such a sensation, takes place. The town of Anderbury was first subsiding to its original quietude, and the only indication of any excitement was that among a few old topers, who met in the early part of the evening, to discuss anything that there might be stirring to talk about, and to do that required but little inducement, to talk being their principal, not to say only, amusement. Indeed, to have deprived them of that would have been to have deprived them of nearly their only inducement to work and to live, that they may indulge in their evening conversations at the alehouse. There was a very general belief among such people that, as the whole affair was unexplained, that it was mysterious, and the nods and winks were numerous. Indeed, it was thought that there was more than the usual amount of mystery, However, this has its limit, and when all is said that can be said, there must be an end to the discussion, which is usually dropped for want of fuel to feed it. That night the baron sat alone in his apartment, apparently buried in deep thought, but, now and then, he might have been seen to lift up his eyes toward the east, as if watching for something, and then he would cast them towards a magnificent timepiece on the mantelpiece, and then he would again relapse into thoughtfulness. There were several such fits as these that were broken in the same manner as before, and at length he arose and took a small book off one of the tables, and examined a certain page and a certain column, and then he half muttered to himself, Yes, yes, it is as I thought. The moon will rise in about an hour and a half. That will do. I will now go to the bone house, and there watch the body, and ascertain if my fears are correct. If not, I shall be well repaid for my trouble, and should they be, why, I must endeavor to make the affair take the best turn I can. I must try and prevent the completion of my own deed from being disturbed in its integrity. The dead must remain so, and, if not, to that condition he must return, and lie where no moon's ray will reach him. He arose, and, wrapping his cloak around him, went to the door of his apartment, and paused as if listening. No one is stirring, he muttered, no one is about. He stole softly out of the apartment, and descended the stairs, making his way towards a small private door, which opened into the garden, which he secured behind him. Then he walked rapidly but softly through the garden, which he quitted by another private door, and which he also secured after him and then proceeded quickly and silently towards the churchyard of Vanderbury Church, which was but ill-qualified to keep intruders out of it, seeing that there was but a low wall and a hedge for the purpose of a fence, which could at various places be easily scaled. Indeed, there are few country churchyards that cannot be so entered, and it does not appear usually the practice to endeavor to keep out human beings, but rather to keep the yard clear of all brute intruders, for it was open to all who should choose to come. The scene was not very distinct, the moon was not yet risen, and darkness reigned upon the earth. He could see but a short way, and he cared but little for that. If darkness prevents my seeing, it also prevents others seeing me. Therefore it is welcome. The moon will rise soon enough to aid me in my watch, 
and if it rise not at all, it would be agreeably satisfactory, seeing that there would be no probability of what I suspect happening without her rays. He hurried onwards towards the churchyard. The sea was close by, and the night breeze, as if swept across the face of the ocean, gave an indistinct roar which never ceases, but only increases and abates as a storm or calm prevails at the time, and as the wind increases or diminishes, thus increasing or diminishing the intensity of the roar, but it never entirely ceases at any time. The baron made his way towards the churchyard by an unfrequented path that was well known to him, but as he was about to get over a stile into a field, he thought he heard a voice speaking on the other side of the hedge. He paused a moment and crept along the hedge until he came to the spot where the voice seemed to come from, and then he paused until he heard them speak again. I tell you what it is, Jack, it's a very strange affair, a very strange thing indeed. So it is. And one I can't understand at all, though I have endeavored to do all I can that way. I have thought the matter over very often, but it always comes to this, that it is a very strange affair. What can be the cause of it? I don't know. Have you seen it? I thought I did once, said the second, but it was misty and dark, but I think I couldn't be mistaken. Nor I. You have seen it oftener than I, have you not? Yes, yes, I have, several times. How did you see it? Why, thus, I was looking out for the lugger, and there away in the east I saw something white coming across the sea. It came very steady and slow, and looked small at first. Yes, yes. Well, then, after that it came closer and closer, until I saw it changed its shape to a gigantic woman. A woman? exclaimed the other. Yes, or maybe a man in a winding sheet. That is most likely, though, after all. I think so, too, he replied. As sure as there are dead bodies in Andebury churchyard, it forebodes some great evil. Of that I am very well persuaded. What great evil do you think will happen? How can I tell? I am no prophet. I cannot imagine in what shape it should come. But come it will, depend upon it. If it comes not now, when it does come, remember my words. I will. And you will find them all true some day or other, if it don't come too soon to be pleasant. But I think something may happen to the lugger. She has not been seen these two days, and it is now past the time when she ought to have been in. Thus it was with the other lugger that the revenue cutter took. Did you see the apparition? No, but there was a token, I believe, but I was not in those parts at that time. Well, but how did it happen that they let the lugger be taken by the king's men? Oh, they couldn't well help it, you may depend upon that. She was coming from Cherbourg, laden with brandy and with lace, a good cargo, and worth something, I assure you. She must have been worth something. She was. Well, she had a very good run for a part of the way, when a fog came on. Well, it wasn't well understood what they were to do. Some were for putting back, others for standing where they were, and some few for running in shore. I shall run in shore, said the captain. I know every hole upon the coast, and I know the exact spot where we are and how to steer. I can run the vessel to an inch. And that inch may do the business for us all, said one of the crew, but I'm ready. And I too, said the captain and I will run her where there will be no chance of any meeting with the preventive people. But the fact is, we can neither see nor be seen. We are safe, boys, a good run on shore and a swift voyage home. Huzzah! shouted the men, and the vessel was run towards the shore, and at the same time they were going under an easy sail safe and secure, and had no thought of any evil. There was a lookout, at the same time we could not see two yards beyond the vessel, the watch was alert, but he could see nothing. But suddenly he called out, Ship ahead, port your helm. What ship's that? inquired a voice, and in another moment they found themselves alongside the revenue cutter, from whom they had so long and so often escaped. Board! shouted the officer on board, and then he called upon our people to surrender. But the captain drew his sword and called out to the crew to do as he did and defend the ship 
and as he spoke he cut one man down, but was immediately met by a pistol shot, which laid him dead on the deck. After that there was no resistance. The men didn't want to endanger their lives by resisting men who were doing their duty, and protected by law. They were, moreover, outnumbered by the revenue people, and if they resisted, they would be liable to hanging, whereas they could but imprison them. They were all taken, and they were all imprisoned for different crimes, all, however, getting free after a term. Did that ruin the owners? Oh, no, they calculated upon a loss now and then, and can well afford it, too. Well, what do you think of the baron at Andebury House? Think? Why, think he's a trump. What a glorious hall there would be there if we could get hold of it. How do you mean? Why, the plate and other things that are valuable. Look, you now, if we could load the lugger with the contents of the house, what would they not fetch in Paris? We should not get it if we were to take it there. We should obtain a heavier profit than ever we should under any other circumstances, and I think it will be a very good plan, indeed, to take Anderbury House by storm. There's some thousands of pounds worth of plate and jewelry there. So there is. Well, what do you say to make the attempt? Attempt, I say, but I shall not call it an attempt, for there will be no attempt at resistance. We shall have only to walk in and frighten a few servants. There will be nothing but to carry away what we lay our hands on. That will do anything that will pay. The baron had been an attentive listener. He had, moreover, had some thoughts in his own mind of jumping over the hedge and seizing the two men. But, upon second thoughts, he believed that this was the worst that could be done. I will frighten them, and thus prevent them from putting their designs into practice to my damage. The baron silently collected several large stones and clods of earth into one space, and then he peeped through the hedge. He saw where they lay, and took up two clods, pitched one on each of their heads, and then he said, when they started up, Miserable sinners, the eye of heaven is upon you. Go your ways and repent while there is time. The men were for a moment horrified and stood still, chained to the spot. But suddenly they were released, and in a moment they rushed from the spot with the fleetness of deer. The baron watched them out of sight, and then he muttered to himself, Tis well, they are now out of sight, they are gone, and they will make no attempt upon Andebury House, I'll warrant them they think their design will be penetrated by others, and they will suffer for it should they attempt it. I trust I can make a very good resistance. However, it is worth thinking of. He paused a few moments longer, and then turned towards the churchyard. He pursued his way, however, thoughtfully. Every now and then, however, he looked around to ascertain if any one were present, but he was satisfied there was none, and thus he was quite and entirely alone in his walk. There was now light enough to enable him to distinguish objects at a short distance, and he quickened his pace as he thought of the moon's rising, but a few minutes brought him into view of the church of Anderbury. The old church was seen to advantage at such an hour, for as the sky was cloudless, and the stars were out, the tapering spire looked like some great and gigantic indication raised there for some purpose pointing heavenward. There was a deep gloom surrounding the whole place, for there was not a shadow cast by any one object, neither had the church one side that was lighter than the other. In a very short time the baron reached the charnel house, or the bone house as it was more usually called. It was a small place, attached to the church itself. The wants of the population were not great, and, therefore, all these public places were built with the view only of a limited use. It was large enough for all purposes, and as large as it is usual for them to be in such places, and the baron, before he attempted to enter the place, took a walk all the way round to ascertain if there was any one lurking about, but finding none, he returned to the door of the charnel house with the full intention of going in. However, there was no key, and he could not, therefore, enter it by the usual way, and he must find some other. There is sure to be something or other, he muttered, to cause a temporary stop to one's career in some place or other, but I will not be deterred by such a trifle. 
There is a place in the roof somewhere here, I think, where I can get in with but little trouble. The baron looked about for a place that would enable him to climb up, but he suddenly withdrew his hand, exclaiming, Pilloa, what have we here? It was soon settled, and the baron held up between him and the light the key of the charnel house, which he had found as he put his fingers into a niche to assist him in lifting himself up to the roof. This is lucky, and will save me much trouble, but I have not much time to spare. He put the key into the lock, and found it fitted the lock, and he in another moment opened the door of the charnel house, and entered its unwholesome precincts. There were but few who would have entered that place at that hour, knowing, too, that a man was lying dead that had died a violent death. Few, indeed, would have done so, but the baron was himself above such considerations and besides he had an object in view which was of some importance. He desired to watch the body of the murdered man. He desired to stay there, and watch the effects of the moon's rays upon it. He now smelt where he was, for there was that fetid smell of death, which always hangs about the bone-house, which is a receptacle of all the mortal remains of man, which have been once cast into the grave, for which their friends have paid large fees as well for the ceremony as for the quiet enjoyment of the home of death, but which bargain must be continually violated, and the bones of a man's ancestor, instead of ornamenting some museum, or his carcass doing some good by way of instruction, lie rotting in the graveyard, till the sexton digs up the same ground and takes fresh his fees, but burning the bones of the former. The baron entered the receptacle of the remains of mortality, one after the other have men's bones been thrown in here, or perhaps they have been mixed together, so that it would have puzzled an angel to have separated them from each other. What more could mortals expect? Their bones, at least, will form a fuel to be sure, but very indifferent fuel, too. Here, however, the baron entered, and stepped lightly into the place. It was an uncomfortable place at best, cold, cheerless, very bare, save of such things as would remind one of the sexton's duty, and of the nature of the place in which he was. The first thing the baron did was to look towards the place where the window was placed, but no light came in. He advanced to it and gazed out upon the night. "'Well, well,' he muttered, "'the moon is just rising. There will be time enough, and I can remain in this place as long as any of its rays penetrate the windows.' He paused a few moments, during which he looked out upon the country, but all was wrapped up in gloom and darkness, save where some of the moon's beams fell, and then there could be seen some dark spots more prominent than the rest, and then, after a while, he could distinguish between the different objects, though he could not always tell their different parts. Well, he muttered, I am here now, and am housed. Fa, how the place smells! I shall never be able to remain here, I shall never get the scent from my nostrils. He turned from the window and examined the place. It was a square room with bare walls, a few shelves and some odd lumber thrown into one corner, a ladder, some tools, trestles, and a lot of rubbish in the shape of old pieces of coffins, bones, and other matters that belonged to a churchyard. There was very little in all this to make the place at all likely to become popular with anybody. The shell in which the man had been placed was, from some cause or other, upset from off the trestles, and the body had rolled out. It lay in all its ghastly proportions at full length upon the ground, somewhat on one side, and looking towards the window. The posture showed the body was deprived of life. It was still and motionless. Not a sound or motion escaped the lips of the baron as he gazed upon the victim of the ice well. Well did the baron mark the position of the body, and marvel at the singularity of the accident which had exposed the body in the way in which it laid. I wonder what could have been the cause of such an accident. Who could have thought it would have happened? I am sure I never could have expected it should have happened. He took one of the trestles that lay near the body, and placed it so he could gaze upon the corpse and out the window alternately, without any disturbance to himself. Here I can watch the progress of the moon, he thought, and the body too, and if I find my conjectures are right, I will soon prevent his quitting this place, 
and put him in such a position as shall preclude the possibility of the revivifying powers of the moon ever reaching him again. He shall lie till corruption visits his body, and then a return to life be impossible. Thus muttered the baron, as he gazed fixedly at the body of the man, who had met his death in the manner related, and of whom the baron entertained some singular suspicions. The moon was rising above the horizon, and shed a soft light over the fields and woods. It was strange and silent, save when the church clock struck out the hours as they fled. It was a strange sound, and almost startled the baron to hear the hour come booming through the building, and gave such a sound that it broke the awful stillness of the night which reigned. The moon all the while rising higher and higher in the heavens, until its beams came very near the window. The baron's patience became somewhat impaired. He saw that the time would soon arrive when his curiosity must be satisfied, and when the truth would at once break in upon him. Can it be, he muttered, that the dead should ever again rise to communicate with the world, and live to lead a loathsome life? Impossible. And yet it is said so by many, who assert they speak but the evidence of their own senses. If it is to be depended upon at all, it will be as well for me as they. Why should I not be satisfied as well as they are? I have, moreover, more than ordinary motives for satisfaction. The human bloodsucker shall not live. I am resolved upon that. The moonbeams now entered the window of the charnel house. At first it was but a pencil ray, so small and minute, that the baron himself could scarce perceive it. But he did see it, and kept his eye intently fixed upon it, watching its increase in size and change of position with intense excitement. There was the moon rising high in the heaven, with all its myriads of stars and black canopy, studding the vault with innumerable gems, and as it rose, so it gave a far greater change to the aspect of the landscape than would have been expected. The whole side of the charnel house was illuminated by the moon's rays, but they fell aslant and only entered the window in one direction, which cast them on one side, near where the baron sat. He could now see how the place was furnished. The significant appurtenances of the charnel house were easily discernible, and would have given a melancholy turn to the thoughts of anybody who might have examined them. But not so the baron. He was by far too excited to heed them, though he honored them with a passing glance. They were used by the sexton in the prosecution of his business, in the performance of his duties. Therefore there need be but little attention paid to them. They cannot harm any one, but are the means of frightening fools. To frighten the baron was, however, something more than a mere matter of course. His nerves were strung to the purpose with which he visited the place, and they were not to be disturbed by any insignia whatever. There were plenty of ghastly objects about, bones, legs, hands, arms, and even skulls, were lying about in profusion, or rather they were heaped up in one corner of the place, and there was an attempt to hide them by heaping up old boards in front of them, as if it were done on purpose to prevent the prying eye of man from peeping and seeing the secrets of the charnel house. It is strange but true, being accustomed to such scenes as these causes a diminution of the awe and fear in which such things are usually held. Soldiers and sailors care not much for death, they are used to exposure, and the loss of life does not seem to them so terrible as to those who have never faced danger. So with the sexton. He turns up the remains of mortality, as if they were so much rubbish and never had been endowed with life. Indeed, it was only necessary to become familiar with the remains of man, and then much of the awe and mystery attending them dies away. What cares the grave-digger whether the burial service has been read over the remains or not? What cares he if the ground in which they have been placed is consecrated ground? He can't tell the difference, and it matters not to him. He is above such consideration, and so is he and his patrons, as to whether the spot in which the remains lie has been bought and paid for long ago. He has no objection to sell again that which has been sold, and that which has been used as the resting place of some one or other. No matter, they say, the mystery, the Freemasonry, and all, have been instituted for the multitude, and not for those who are behind the curtain, and pocket the fees. 
That is the great object of the conspirators. However, here they were, all lumped up together on one side, or rather in one corner, with a few boards thrown over them, as if to prevent their being seen by any incidental intruder. Here the baron sat, watching the moonlight in its slow progress towards the dead body, and, as it crept towards the object, he felt more and more excited, but yet remained perfectly immovable. He turned his eyes sometimes from the body to the streak of moonlight that passed through the small window, and then to the small window itself, from which he could see the moon himself, but that was fast rising too high, and was becoming invisible by changing its position, so that the baron could not see it. The moon travels fast, he muttered, and a few more minutes will tell me what I am to expect. As he spoke these words, he felt in his pocket, and appeared satisfied with what he found there, possibly some weapon. The moon's rays were now within an inch or so of the body, and all was still and silent as the grave. No sound, no motion, not even a breath of air stirred, to interrupt the silence and stillness of the scene. Even the breathing of the baron himself was suppressed, and he strove to watch without motion. The moonlight appeared to grow more brilliant, more beautifully white, and cast, as he thought, a stronger and more sickly light than usual into the charnel house. There was nothing that he had ever before seen like it, and he looked around him more than once to assure himself that he was where he was, and that he was alone with the body in the bone house. At such moments the fancy is apt to play us strange freaks, and, if not a strong and nervous man, capable of throwing off any extraneous influence, why he would soon be bowed down by the weight of mental terror and agony, that is, nothing short of temporary madness, and which probably would make a permanent impression, and leave the seeds of mental disease for ever. But the baron was not easily moved. He had not been brought up in schools where the mind is bound, enchained from infancy by artificial means, which seem to bind the powers of the mind in after years, and, in moments of doubt and difficulty, to render it dependent upon any extraneous circumstance rather than itself. However, there were few things thought of then by the baron, who sat intently watching the progress of the moon's beams towards the body, which was now touched by them. The light fell strong. It edged the white garments that were thrown around the body. The baron watched more and more intently, and each moment lessened the space of time when the truth would come out, when he would be assured of the truth of his conjectures. There was no ray on the body yet, but it slowly and slowly let the light approach the body. The edge was illumined, and then the moonbeams fell more and more upon it. Gradually did they enlarge its surface, till the whole body was in the light of the moon. The baron's excitement and expectation were now at the highest, for the whole body was illuminated. Now, he exclaimed in a muted whisper, now is the moment. No sooner was the whole of the body, the breast, and the face illumined, than there was a perceptible quiver through that form. Ha! exclaimed the baron with a start. The features presented a ghastly spectacle. There was a peculiar sickly and horrible expression in the countenance, much of which was caused by the peculiar position in which it was placed. The peculiar color of the moon's rays, and the additional horrors of the place, all seemed to give an effect to an object peculiarly ghastly and horrible. The body, after a few moments, as if awakening to life and recollection, lifted up its head, and turned over upon one side towards the moonlight, and then, after a moment, it looked up in the moon's rays, which seemed to pour down upon the countenance that lifted up towards it. The baron rose softly and stealthily. You shall feel that this is your last hour. The newly awakened life which feeds upon the blood of others shall never exist to carry on its disgusting career. As he muttered these thoughts to himself, he drew a short dagger from his pocket. At the same moment the figure turned its face towards him. It gave a half unearthly scream, as its eyes met those of the barons, who exclaimed, Now, now's the time, death to the monster! As he spoke, he threw himself headlong on the prostrate form of the vampire, for such it was, which, as he did so, endeavored to rise up and escape. 
the baron, who had aimed a deadly blow at him, as he threw himself upon him, caused him to fall back again. But the fearful being had contrived to ward off the blow, either with its arms, or by means of shifting its position, or something of the sort. The baron missed the blow, and was now in a deadly struggle with the vampire. The struggle was fierce. No signs of shrinking on the part of the baron, who carried it on with the full intention of its ending fatally to his opponent, while he was exerting himself to escape the muscular grasp of the baron. The baron, however, was not a match for the more than superhuman strength of the vampire, who, endued with all the energy of love of a newly acquired life, struggled with a desperation scarcely to be conceived. Had any one looked in, from without, upon the struggle that was going on within, they would have believed that some demons of the dead had suddenly become endued with the power of appearing upon earth, and had chosen that spot upon which they could exercise their malignity in combat with each other. Suddenly, however, the baron was thrown with great force upon the ground, and he lay for a moment half stunned. Then the vampire, disengaged as he was, stopped to cast a magnificent look of triumph upon his fallen foe, and dashed out of the bone-house by the same entrance as that which afforded ingress to the place to the baron. In another moment the baron rose up and rushed after the flying vampire, his defeat by no means extinguishing his courage or ardor. He soon caught sight of the vampire as he was flying from the bone-house. Indeed, the moonlight was now so strong that it seemed almost day. Every object, far or near, appeared distinct and observable, while the waves of the ocean appeared every now and then to throw off the silvery light like a thousand moving mirrors. Beautiful as the scene was, there was none there who stood to look upon it. The only living and breathing persons present were those who were engaged in the chase. Not a soul, save these two, were about. None saw them. None witnessed the fearful efforts of the two. The place looked like some spot of earth spoken of by the enchanters. All was motionless and still, save these two, and the ceaseless motion of the ocean waves. The vampire made for the shore, with the baron a short distance behind him. They strained every nerve, and the baron thought he should succeed in securing him on the beach. There were some boats that were secured on the beach, and towards these the vampire sped with the fleetness of the wind, and no sooner did he reach one than seizing its head, he caused it to run through the sand by the impetus he had acquired in running, and it was afloat in a moment. There was no time to lose, for just as he had pushed into deep water, the baron had rushed down almost in time to seize the boat, but missed it. He then made for the boats, and succeeded in reaching one that was afloat, secured only by a rope. In this he pushed out in the waves in pursuit of the object of his search. Away they both went. The sea was comparatively smooth. They both rowed with velocity, that promised much as regarded their capability as rowers. The spray of the water was thrown up by their oars and by the boat's heads. The baron, however, had the worst of it. He rode to disadvantage, because every now and then he had to turn his head to see which way the object of his pursuit was rowing, and, therefore, a loss of speed occurred, but yet he kept up well in the wake of the vampire. There was, however, no attention paid as to where he was going. As long as it was straight in the wake of the flying, he was satisfied. But he saw nothing else, nor looked at aught else, Indeed, the world might have been there, and he would not have been aware of the fact. His whole faculties were bound up in the object before him, to reach which he exerted his whole strength. However, upon looking up again, he could nowhere see the vampire. He looked long and steadily in all quarters, but saw him not. He had eluded him. End of chapter 104《5 of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barony. Varney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 105. The Baron proposes for Helen Williams, and is duly accepted, 
with a compliment on his beauty. The Baron had put out to sea in chase of the vampire, without considering that there was really great danger in so doing, inasmuch as that the elements were not quite in a kindly disposed condition, and there was a heavy sea. Where he had obtained his skill as a seaman, heaven only knows, but certain it is he had obtained such knowledge somewhere, for he commenced navigating the boat with the greatest skill, and soon succeeded in getting close in shore. The moment the keel grated upon the beach, a man rushed into the water, and laid hold of the boat with one hand, and the baron with the other, exclaiming, "'You are my prisoner. You took my boat, and I don't care who or what you are. I will have justice. How much money do you require? More than you would like to pay. I shan't let you off under a pound. Here are five pounds. Law, excuse me, Your Honour. I didn't mean what I said. If so be as Your Honour is such a gentleman as I now sees as Your Honour is, it don't make any matter in the world. I hopes as how Your Honour will always take my boat when you wants one, and no mistake. The Baron made no reply to all these compliments, but walked away at once towards his own house on the cliffs. "'I have missed him,' he muttered, "'and all my labour has been in vain. I thought that at least I had got rid of that affliction. I thought that he at least would have rotted in the tomb. Curse on the tardiness that left him unburied until the moonbeams had rested upon him. After that all was in vain.' unless some new death had come over him. There was a flush of anger upon the Baron's face as he reached his own house, and let himself into it by a garden gate that he always kept the key of, which would have effectually prevented any of his servants from taking any notice of him, had they met him. But at such an hour it was not likely he should meet any one, nor did he do so. He at once sought his own chamber, where he remained for some time immersed in deep thought, this thought was not wholly devoted to a consideration of his annoyance at the escape of the vampire, but he took into his most serious thoughts the circumstances attending upon his entertainment. The question of to marry or not to marry was not one that had to be settled by the Baron. No, that he had done already, and he had not made the announcement he had to Mr. Leake of his matrimonial intention unadvisedly. What the Baron now considered was— whether he should propose to Miss Helen Williams or not. He certainly had been somewhat struck by the quiet beauty of the young girl, and probably he was aware that he was not just the sort of person to win a young maiden's heart, and that if he achieved such an honour at all, it would most probably be in consequence of acting upon the cupidity of her relations. As he was determined, therefore, to marry, it became necessary that he should select some one for his victim who, in addition to the personal charms which appeared to him to be a desideratum, should be of so pliant and amiable a disposition as to give way to those solicitations and incessant remonstrances which she was likely to be assailed with if she resisted. It was fortunate for Mr. Leake that the Baron did fix his regards upon Helen Williams, because from what we know of Mrs. Williams, we can well perceive that it is quite evident she will not let any considerations of her daughter's happiness stand in the way of an equitable arrangement with that gentleman. And although there might have been, and indeed were, persons at the Baron's entertainment whom he would more gladly have called by the name of Bride than Helen Williams, Yet he was not slow to perceive that those parties had wills of their own, and if their relatives had pleased to do so, they would not themselves had admitted that they were up for sale to the highest bidder. The result of the Baron's considerations, therefore, was that Helen Williams would suit him very well, and that the poverty of her family was just the circumstance of all others which ensured his success. "'I will wed her,' he said although I cannot win her. She will be mine, because I shall purchase her, which, to my mind, is a much more admirable mode of embarking in a matrimonial career than the trouble of a tedious courtship, with all its frivolities and follies. Whether or not the Baron was used to matrimonial affairs, we cannot say, but certain it is he did not seem to consider that the proposing for a young lady and marrying her was a matter of very grave or serious moment, but really, by the style in which he considered it, 
anybody would have thought it one of the most ordinary concerns of life. During his short stay at Anderbury, he had managed, by the magic power of wealth, to procure everything he required in the shape of servants, carriages, and horses, and now, on the morning after his most strange and mysterious adventure with the corpse of the murdered man, he ordered his carriage, and went out to pay a number of visits to the parties who had been present at his entertainment. Among those visits he included one to the Williamses' family, and by about twelve o'clock in the day reached their residence, and was received with such an extraordinary amount of bustle that it was quite ludicrous to see it, but still it suited him, because it showed how they worshipped wealth, with the exception of Helen, and she did not make her appearance at all. Mrs. Williams was all smiles and sweetness, paying so many compliments to the Baron, that, although he knew nothing of the diplomatic arrangement of Mr. Leake, he yet felt quite certain that he had her with him most completely, and that none of her exertions would be wanting for the purpose of securing his victim. After these compliments had somewhat subsided, the Baron said, "'Madam, I hope I shall have the pleasure of seeing your daughter Helen.' who did me the honour of being at my poor entertainment the other evening, and attracted while there the eyes of all beholders. Oh, certainly, my Lord Baron, I have not the slightest doubt in my own mind, but that Helen is quite, quite panting, in a matter of speaking, for the honour of seeing you again. You are very obliging, madam and I can assure you that one of the most gratifying circumstances that have occurred to me during my short residence in this neighbourhood had consisted in the fact of my making the acquaintance of you and your amiable family. "'Will you excuse me for one moment?' said Mrs. Williams, and after a courteous bow from the Baron, she left the apartment, and proceeded to the room of her daughter Helen, whom she addressed, saying, "'Helen, are you aware that the Baron is here, the great Baron, the Baron Stolmuir of Salzburg? Good God, how can you be so foolish? He has actually asked for you, and you are not there. When you know as well as I do, Helen, that such a man as that, to whom the expense is no object, might pop in a moment?' "'He might what, mother?' Pop the question! Propose, of course! Don't tell me that you don't know what I mean. I have no patience with such nonsense. Only think how rich he is. You know as well as I that it would be the making of you and the whole family. And I can tell you, Helen, that if you are not a positive fool, in my opinion, he will pop. For there was quite a particular expression upon his face when he asked for you. But I fancy, mother, there is always a particular expression upon his face. A particularly ugly one, I mean. For beyond all question he is the most ordinary man I ever saw in my life. Now really, Helen, you are enough to vex a saint. What can a man's looks have to do with his property? But what's his property to me, mother? Oh, good gracious! Have I lived to hear a child of mine ask what a man's property is to her when he begins to be attentive? I did not expect it. I will confess I did not expect it. I did think there would be a little consideration on the part of a child of my own, when she knows I have to strive and strive and stretch our means like a thin piece of Indian rubber to make both ends meet. But, mother, if I cannot love this man, wherefore should I for one moment entertain the thought of making him my husband? Self! Self! exclaimed Mrs. Williams, lifting up her hands. Nothing but self! I cannot suppose, mother, that it is an extraordinary act to decline sacrificing one's whole existence for the sake of marrying a man with money, who cannot only not love, but who is an object of positive aversion as this man is to me. Yes, exclaimed Mrs. Williams, that's right. See me dragged to prison, and see us all without shoes to our feet. That's what you would do, rather than give up your nonsensical notion about people's looks. But why, said Helen, should these calamities, which have never yet appeared, all suddenly come over us, because I do not feel inclined to marry the Baron Stolmuir of Salzburg? And as for the man's looks? 
added Mrs. Williams, rather adroitly shifting the argument, and declining to answer the rather home question put by Helen. "'As for the man's looks, I am quite ashamed of any daughter of mine talking about men's looks. It's indelicate, positively indelicate.' "'I cannot see your argument, mother, and I implore you not to persecute me about this man, whom I really cannot love.' "'Persecute, indeed! But I tell you what it is, Helen, you don't seem to be at all aware, first of all, that I am drowned in debt, secondly, that I shall have to bring your brother Charles home from college to make him a tailor or a shoemaker or something of that sort, and you will have to go out as a daily governess while I rot away by slow degrees in a prison. But, mother, if these evils are all about to fall upon us, cannot some fair means be adopted of extrication from them? Your income, I always understood, was a certain one, and surely it almost amounts to criminality to live far beyond it. Not at all. When you expect your daughter to be a reasonable Christian, and to marry decently and respectably. Really, my dear, I must say that I little expected such remarks as you make from a child of mine, I can tell you. Mrs. Williams was right enough there, for it was a wonder that such remarks should come from a child of hers, who could not be supposed to have heard any such sentiments, but who must have, from the mere force of a just and admirable disposition, given utterance to them. Mother, she said after a pause, do not fancy that I would not do much to relieve you from any burthens you may have, and if difficulties have arisen, they are to be remedied in the best way we can, as well as regretted. But I pray you not to ask me to wed this man whom I cannot love. Well, well, I am sure you make a terrible fuss, and I don't know what about, for my part. It's nothing, I rather suppose, and after all, the Baron may not be going to propose at all for you, and I may be wrong. As Mrs. Williams thus admitted the possibility that she might be wrong, she looked with an expression of countenance, as much to say, Did you ever in all your life hear of such virtue as that, or such self-denial? Then what do you wish for me to do, mother? To see him! You cannot put such a slight! Indeed, I might almost say an insult upon him, as not to see him when he actually calls and asks for you. He is, you know, after all, a gentleman." Helen found it difficult to say that she would not see the Baron, so although it was done with great reluctance, she followed her mother to the room in which that lady had left him, and where he did most anxiously expect her. He felt that his cause was not quite so good as it had been, and that the non-appearance of Helen got up some serious doubts as to the complying disposition he thought she had. When, however, he at length saw her, some of those fears were dispelled, and he began to imagine that his suit did not look quite so desperate. There was certainly about the Baron a rather courtly air and manner, which, as Mrs. Williams said, showed that he lived in the best society, and Helen would not allow her aversion to the man to carry her so far as not to behave to him with politeness, so that for some moments that the conversation proceeded, any one would have thought that those three persons were upon the most amicable of terms with each other. But Mrs. Williams, like some skilful old general, was well versed in matrimonial tactics, and after making a few remarks, she deliberately left the room, to poor Helen's great chagrin. For although she had consented out of ordinary civility to see the Baron, she had by no means intended to have a tete-a-tete -tete with him. That was quite another affair, and one may well suppose what a degree of indignation she felt at being forced into such circumstances, and by her mother, too, who of all persons in the world ought to have protected her, and to whom she ought to have looked certainly for very different things indeed. It was a very awkward situation to be placed in for poor Helen, inasmuch as she now really could not leave the Baron completely alone without great rudeness, and yet she much dreaded, in consequence of the hints that her mother had thrown out, what the interview would be that was about to ensue. How devoutly and particularly she hoped that, after all, the supposition of her mother that the Baron had any matrimonial intentions toward her was a mistake and she felt that the first words he might utter would be the means of chance letting her know if such really was the case, or if she was to be what she could not help styling the victim of his addresses. 
Of course, the Baron knew perfectly well that Mrs. Williams had taken her departure for the express purpose of giving him an opportunity of pressing his suit to her daughter, if he felt so disposed. And as he did feel so disposed, he was not at all likely to neglect the opportunity. None but a man of great tact and discretion, however, could have made so good use of such an opportunity as the Baron. For although he certainly did not succeed in removing from the mind of Helen Williams a strong feeling that he was an uncommonly disagreeable man, he did not add to that impression. "'Miss Williams,' he said, "'I have not until now had an opportunity of thanking you for the very great favour you did me by making one at the party at Anderbury House.' "'The obligation,' said Helen, "'was on my side, sir and I beg that you will not pay me so empty a compliment as to endeavour to make it otherwise. You do yourself a great injustice. The grace which you lent to my entertainment was to my mind its greatest charm. I feel, I assure you, compelled to say so much, because it is the genuine truth, and not for the purpose of paying to you an empty compliment, which I have too much respect for you to do." Helen was silent for she knew not very well what to reply to the speech, inasmuch as it was one of those general ones that require no reply, unless the persons to whom they are uttered choose to enter at length into a civil, complimentary kind of warfare, for the express purpose of so doing. The Baron waited for some reply to be made, and then as none came, he spoke himself, saying after at least two minutes' pause, "'Miss Williams, you may or you may not have heard that my principal intention of settling in this neighbourhood which I was informed, and I find correctly so, is celebrated for the respectability of its inhabitants, was to marry. Sir, said Helen, I know nothing of that matter, nor do I think it is one with which I ought to be in any way troubled. Without explanation, certainly not, Miss Williams. But will you allow me to add that unless my speech had contained certainly something more than a mere compliment, or a mere desire to give you a piece of gossiping information, I should not have uttered it on any account. But I have something to add to it, which does concern your private ear most particularly, and which I do hope will meet with your favourable consideration." He paused again and as Helen returned no answer, he after a time continued, saying in a still lower tone, "'May I venture to hope that no preconceived prejudice will have the effect of diminishing any expectations and hopes with which I have pleased myself?' It is said, and said most truly, too, that there are none so blind as those who won't see, and the same rule may be most unquestionably applied to those who won't hear or understand. And although it was, of course, impossible that Helen Williams could have any doubt as to what the Baron meant, she was resolved that he should speak out plainly, in order that she might, without giving room for any ambiguity, likewise speak as plainly to him, in answer to the proposition that was upon his lips. Perhaps the Baron was wise enough to see that much, for he proceeded now with much more clearness to declare what he meant, when he said, I told you, Miss Williams, that my object in coming here was to contract a matrimonial alliance, being tired of the solitary life I had been leading for some years. I should not have troubled you with such a communication, had it not been in my power to add to it another that will explain why I did so." Helen merely inclined her head to signify that she heard him. "'That other communication,' he continued is to the effect that I have found the person on whom I feel convinced that I can fix my affections, without the possibility of their ever wandering again from the dear object. Amid all the rank, beauty, and intelligence that graced my halls upon that occasion, which will ever be hallowed in my imagination, I had eyes but for one form, and ears but for one voice. Still Helen was silent. There may be many who, in the possession of much attraction and much virtue, may make many happy homes, but the heart calls its own flower, and will think that it presents the most delicate and most beautiful tints to the eye. That flower, from amidst all the galaxy of beauty, I think, nay, I know, that I have selected. 
Can you not now guess the purport of my simple words, Helen? It was tolerably familiar to call her Helen upon so short an acquaintance, and she drew back, looking some astonishment, which he perceiving and divining the cause, for no one could accuse the baron of want of tact, replied to. Forgive me, if in conversing with you my heart seems to forget the distance that is between us, and I think of you by that name which certainly is presumptuous on my part to call you by. But there are persons in whose thoughts and feelings we so deeply sympathize, and who, from the first moment that we see them, become bound to us by so many mysterious links of feeling, that we seem as if we had known them for ages, and as if, from that moment, we could be as familiar, I much more so, than with many whom we may have met often in the great world. This was true, and what is more, it happened to be a truth that touched a right chord in the breast of Helen Williams, for she felt what he said recall recollections of the past, when there was one whom she had seen, and from the first moment that she had seen him, had felt that time and circumstances could effect no change in those first dear and delightful impressions which had swept across her heart. The Baron saw the contemplative aspect of her face, and he added, you feel the truth of what I utter." She started, for she had indeed felt the truth of the sentiment, although her heart was far away, and for a moment she had completely forgotten the existence of the Baron, or that it was from his lips she had heard the sentiment expressed. It was a mortification to him to see this, for he did see it, and he said, "'Miss Williams, I hope I have said enough, at all events, to convince you that I am not one of those cold, worldly-minded spirits, who have none of what may be truly called the higher and the nobler feelings of humanity, but who can, and who do feel and think, that there is much of beauty and much of innocence in life, and that both are the dearest and best gifts of heaven." "'I have nothing to say in contradiction to what you have uttered,' said Helen. But you will, I trust, now excuse me, sir, from continuing a conversation which can have no good result, and which between persons who are nearly perfect strangers is scarcely desirable." This was a speech, which, if anything would, was calculated to bring the Baron to the point at once, and as she rose while she uttered it, as with an intention of leaving the room, he at once said, Nay, as I am here, allow me to utter that which I came to speak, and do not, I pray you, hastily decide upon a question of more importance to yourself and to me than any which can be ordinarily asked. Let me beg of you, Miss Williams, to be seated, and to believe that, in my manner of putting this question to you, there shall be nothing which can, in the slightest degree, prove offensive to you. Thus urged, it would have been something savouring of ill manners if Helen Williams had refused to accede to his request, and although there was nothing she so devoutly wished as that that interview should be over, and over quickly, she felt that perhaps the surest way of accomplishing that object was to listen quietly to what he had to say, and accordingly she did so, reseating herself again on the chair she had so recently occupied, and determined in her own mind to give him a decisive answer. He then seemed rather in doubt as to how he should commence, and as he spoke, there was an air of hesitation and doubt about him, such as he, indeed, very seldom wore. Probably he felt it was rather a climax that he had arrived at, and that if he was to accomplish anything in the matrimonial way, it was a very doubtful case as regarded his present application. "'I cannot but feel,' he said, "'that what I am about to say sounds hasty and premature considering that we have known each other for so short a space of time. It is not for me to enlarge upon circumstances which I fear will have but little weight with you, but still it is my duty to mention that I have a large fortune, and consequently can afford to place the object of my affections in such a position in life as that she shall feel surrounded with everything that can make her existence pleasant and desirable." "'Go on, sir,' said Helen. I am staying to hear you, in order that I might clearly and distinctly answer you." This was by no means encouraging, but still the Baron proceeded. "'I wish to make you an offer of my hand and heart.' 
and as the Baroness Stolmure of Salzburg, I am quite certain that you will add a dignity to that title, instead of receiving one from it. Sir, said Helen, an offer of this kind from any gentleman is a compliment which ought always to be appreciated, and I assure you it is one which I feel highly, but as one's future happiness in a marriage is by far too important an affair to be trifled with, I must beg to decline the honour you intend me. Decline? said the Baron. Yes, sir, I said decline, and I trust that the justice of the Baron Stolmuir will effectually preserve me from anything in the shape of a persecution for so declining. At this moment, and before the Baron could make any answer to what was said to him by Helen in this firm and determined manner, the door was flung open, and Mrs. Williams rushed into the room. "'My dear sir,' she cried to the Baron, "'of course you understand these matters perfectly well. Girls, you know, are always so very unreasonable that you can't expect anything from them but a refusal at first, although they may really mean quite the reverse. "'Mother, is this just or fair?' said Helen reproachfully. "'Oh, stuff! Stuff! Don't speak to me about justice and fairness, indeed, when you are so absurd as to behave in this dreadful manner towards the Baron. But, madam, said the Baron, I fear, fear nothing, my lord, but if you will have the kindness to step into the next apartment for a few minutes, I will join you, and we can talk this matter over. Mrs. Williams did not think it at all necessary to make any excuse for having listened to the Baron's overtures, and perhaps indeed she thought that it was not necessary to do so, and that her interest in the affair was a sufficient extenuation of what certainly was a most abominable proceeding. Shame and disgust at her mother's conduct now kept Helen silent, and as the Baron was perfectly willing to give himself all the chances he could, he made a low bow and left the apartment, in conformity with the desires of Mrs. Williams, wondering much in his own mind by what miracle she proposed influencing her daughter's decision after the extremely positive negative she had given to his proposal. He waited with much impatience, as well as curiosity, and as our readers may, as well as the Baron, be a little curious to know what arguments Mrs. Williams used, we shall proceed to give them a brief outline of what she said. "'Are you mad?' was the first ejaculation. "'Are you thoroughly and entirely out of your senses, that you behave yourself in this extraordinary manner?' "'In what extraordinary manner? A man asks me if I can wed him and love him and as he asks me politely, I tell him as politely that I cannot, which is the whole of the affair. Is there anything so very extraordinary in such behaviour as that? Indeed, I think there is something very extraordinary in it. I tell you what it is, Helen. Mr. Leake is firmly of the opinion that the Baron's income must be at least ten thousand pounds a year. I do not think I shall marry a man for his income if it were ten times that amount. This is insanity, positive insanity. Have you really the least idea of what you are talking about? But I know what it is well enough. I know very well what it is. Of course, it's that fellow James Anderson that comes between you and your wits. That's the scamp that prevents you from exercising a proper control over yourself. And you know it is. But he is gone to sea, and it is to be hoped we shall never look upon him again. I don't wish to see him, and I am quite sure you need not, so you had better make up your mind to marry the Baron at once. This is too cruel, much too cruel, and but that I see it with my own eyes I would not have believed it possible." She burst into tears as she spoke, and then for a brief moment, but it was only for a moment, the heart of the mother was a little touched. The love of money again assumed its sway, and the happiness of her child sunk into insignificance compared with that worst of passions. "'Listen to me, Helen,' she said. "'It's all very well to make choice of who you like and refuse who you like, when it can be done. But I tell you that in this case it cannot be done, for we are all of us on the brink of ruin. And if you will not by this marriage rescue us from that state, destruction must come upon us all.' You can save me, you can save your sisters, and you can save your brother, if you will. 
Of course, if you will not, I cannot make you, and you will have the consolation of knowing that although you had it in your power to save us all from destruction, you did not do it. But why should I be placed in so cruel a situation as to be called upon to sacrifice myself completely for my family? Would it not be nobler to meet difficulties, if they have arisen, with a good spirit? As you please, as you please, I can say no more. Mrs. Williams moved towards the door, but Helen called to her, saying, "'Give me time to think. I only ask you to give me time to think.' This was a grand concession, and Mrs. Williams at once acceded to the proposition that it was prudent to leave well enough alone in such a case, and that having once seen that persecution would do something, it was highly desirable to leave it to work its way. She accordingly at once left the room and proceeded into the adjoining apartment to which the baron had retired, and where from his attitude it seemed highly probable that he had taken example by Mrs. Williams, and as she had listened to his conversation with her daughter, he had, in like manner, listened to her. "'I have the pleasure to inform you, baron,' she said, "'that my daughter, although at first taken a little by surprise as regards your offer, now accepts it, and I can only add for my own part that it is with great pleasure I contemplate having so handsome and distinguished a son-in-law. Madam, I highly esteem your compliment, and I must beg of you as a favour that you will fix the wedding day as quickly as you please or can, and that, as it must put you to some expense as well as your other daughters, and as it would be very unjust that on my account you should expend one penny-piece, you will do me the favour of accepting from me a five hundred pound note to cover those expenses." Mrs. Williams quite instinctively held out her hand, but the Baron added with a bow that dampened her expectations a little, "'A sum which I shall have the pleasure of handing to you as soon as the wedding day is fixed.' It would be doing great injustice to the acuteness of Mrs. Williams if we did not say she quite understood this to be a bribe for expediting proceedings, and if anything was likely to clench the matter and to place the marriage of the Baron with Helen beyond the shadow of a doubt, it certainly was this fact, that five hundred pounds was offered to the mother for what we cannot help calling the sale of her child. But these kind of things are much more common in society than people are at all aware and one half the marriages that take place at all are most unquestionably matters of barter. When the highest bidder obtains the prize, if prize that can be called, which generally consists of a shallow conceited heart, nurtured in all kinds of selfishness, and full of feelings, not one of which can be considered great or estimable. It is sad, indeed, when, as in the case of Helen Williams, the victim is made a victim on account of her better and nobler feelings, and where it is not her own selfishness, but the selfishness of others, which she is condemned to be victimized to. Whether she will or will not consent, under the circumstances we have narrated, to become the bride of the Baron Stolmuir of Salzburg, we shall shortly discover. But certain it is that he entertained a strong notion she would, and that Mrs. Williams thoroughly made up her mind that she should. Nothing can save Helen but a determination of character which we fear we cannot say she possesses. Her correct reason makes her say things which, if she could carry them out, would be as proper and as decisive as possible. But the great fault of her character consists in a weakness of purpose, which effectually prevents her from carrying out the suggestion presented to her by her own superior intellect. End of chapter 105 Recording by Barony Chapter 106 of Vani the Vampire, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avali Vani the Vampire, Volume 2 by Thomas Prescott Prest 
Chapter 106 The Preparations for the Baron's Marriage The Young Lover and the Remonstrance So it appeared that the Baron was right, and that, with all his disqualifications, he had succeeded in obtaining the promise of her wife, because he had the one great qualification which outshone everything to his disadvantage, namely wealth. And he was not so blind or so foolish as not fully to understand and to know that it was to the relatives of the bride and not to the bride herself that he was indebted for an answer in the affirmative to his proposition. He well knew that although he had dazzled their eyes and awakened their cupidity, he had produced no such an effect upon the young and beautiful being who was about thus to be sacrificed upon the altar of mammon and probably if anything could have added to his earnest desire to make her his it was that he saw she was untouched by the power of his gold and therefore he could not but respect as well as admire her and he much preferred taking to his arms one for whom he entertained a supreme and sovereign contempt. She felt that she was a victim, and that if she consented to become his, she must look upon herself as blighted and sacrificed forever. But he was too selfish to hesitate on such a ground as that. His feelings were far from being so human as to stop short, because he knew the alliance was viewed by her with hatred and horror. And that she did view it with those feelings spared him at all events, as he told himself some trouble, for it took away from the necessity of keeping up the constant shoe and glitter of wealth, for that shoe and glitter affected her not, and therefore would have been presented to her imagination in vain. But far different was it regarded her friends and connections, who had arrogated to themselves the power of deciding upon this matter of life and death to her. To them he felt that he must shew all the glitter of display that belonged to his extensive means, or they would be disappointed. For they not only wanted riches themselves, but they wanted the worldly reputation contingent upon having so rich a relative. Therefore was it that he determined that nothing should be wanting at his approaching nuptials to make them most magnificent, and he raked his imagination to discover a mode by which he could spend a large sum of money, so as to get for it the greatest amount of display. This was a matter which a man such as he was eminently calculated to achieve, and as he succeeded in fixing his nuptials to take place in a fortnight from that time, he had ample time to make all such preparations as he might consider requisite. It so happened that on the following evening on that on which he had obtained so strange a consent through another party, to his matrimonial speculation that the sun sunk upon the coast with every appearance of approaching stormy weather scarcely had its disk sunk below the western horizon when a furious gale arose and for the first time since his residence at anderbury hall he felt what it was to hold an estate so near to the sea coast The sea rose tempestuously, appearing to shake the mansion to its very foundation, and more than one half of the excavation leading from the grounds to the sea coast was filled with water. The gale blew off the sea, and one or two trees upon the Anderbury estate were torn up by their roots, spreading destruction round them among the numerous shrubs and flowers. Some of the windows of the mansion were dashed in, and the wind came roaring into the house, whistling up the staircases, opening and shutting doors, 
and altogether procuring a scene of devastation and uproar which would have terrified most persons. The baron, however, on the contrary, notwithstanding whatever damage was done, was of course done to his property, took the matter with the greatest ease and composure in the world, and in fact rather seemed to enjoy the fury of the elements than to be awed by them. He remained out of doors the whole time, and although the rain now and then fell in torrents and drenched him to the skin, he seemed scarcely conscious of that circumstance, or, if he were, he evidently thought it too trivial to take any notice of. The servants looked at him in amazement, scarcely believing it possible that any one in his senses could be so indifferent to the rage of the elements that was proceeding. But they little knew the real character of the man whom they had for a master, or they would have wondered at nothing and been surprised at nothing that they saw of him or heard of him. The storm continued until the night completely set in, and still it showed no signs whatever of anything in the shape of an end, and it seemed but too evident that it was likely to continue in all its wild and ungovernable fury for many an hour to come. He got as close as he could to the beach, so as not to leave his own estate, and from there he listened attentively to the howling of the blast, seeming rather pleased with the idea than otherwise that much mischief was being done by that most terrific storm. A servant brought him a telescope, so that he could look out upon the waste of waters and see some of the struggling vessels that, with might and main, were endeavouring to keep off the shore, but which, despite all their efforts, were being hurried to destruction, a destruction which they could not avoid, and which must present itself in the most serious aspect, because it appears inevitable and is invested with all the misery of a protracted execution. and in particular he remarked one vessel which was drifting onward to certain and inevitable destruction. He could see the rockets and the blue lights that they burned now and then through the storm, while ever and anon, with a booming strange sound over the waste of waters, there would come the signal gun of distress, with its awful reverberations, awakening feelings of sympathy in the breast of every one but the baron and he seemed impenetrable to all human feeling, for he looked on with a strange calmness, a calmness that one might suppose would set upon some man who had nothing to do with human hopes, human thoughts, or human feelings, but not by any means that calmness of a pure spirit looking upon things which it would aid, if it could, but which are beyond its power of action. He saw the anxious throng of persons on the beach precisely below his own estate. He saw them launch a boat, and with a grim smile he saw it swamped in the surge, and the brave, bold men who had made the gallant endeavour to save their fellows met themselves, with but one exception, a watery grave. And then even the baron smiled and muttered to himself, what is all this to me? What have I to do with human hopes and feelings? What is it to me whether they live or die? Or whether yon ship that I now see struggling through the waste of waters reaches its destination, or is engulfed forever in the foaming surge? What is it to me, I repeat, whether these bold, brave men live or die? Will they not be the very persons to hunt me from the face of society? Will they not be the very persons who would declare that I was unfit to live? And shall I trouble myself with one thought as to whether they live or die? Ah, they come nearer, nearer, nearer still. 
and I shall see such a sight as may not often be observed by one such as I am, and on such a coast as this. There was a strange wild wailing cry, and the ship, which was a large one, struck heavily upon a rock about a mile distant from the shore, and very close indeed to where the Anderbury estates commenced. Now, as if seized with a sudden impulse, although we cannot and do not think it was one of humanity, the baron descended by a large fissure in the rock to the beach. This took him some time to accomplish, for he had to walk completely through the grounds of the Anderbury Hall, half a mile beyond, before he reached it, and then it took him some time to walk down, because he had to do so with extreme caution, inasmuch as the heavy rain that had fallen had made the ground so slippery that it was with great difficulty he could at all keep his feet. When he arrived in the sight of the beach, the ship was gone, but a lifeboat was being launched amid the hurrahs of the multitude for the purpose of picking up some of the survivors of the wreck who were noticed drifting upon portions of its hulk. The baron had brought his telescope with him, and he placed it to his eye and took a long and steady look at the boat. A muttered malediction came from his lips, and having shut the telescope, he turned and hastily pursued his path again to Anderbury House. After the wedding, Jack Pringle really felt himself so upset by the quantity of health he had drunk, and the general manner in which he had disposed of a quantity of rum, that he told the admiral he found himself not quite so well as he ought to be, and that he thought it was all owing to having been out of sight of water for so many months. This was a plea which sounded very reasonable to the admiral, and when Jack said, You know it ain't possible to live very long without a glimpse, at least, of an arm of the sea, or something of that sort. The old man assented to the proposition at once and replied, Why, that's true enough, Jack, and I shall have to go somewhere myself soon, or else get musty, for you may depend it never was intended that human beings should live all their lives on land. I should think not, said Jack, and I, what I was going to say was, that you must try and take care of yourself, you old baby, for a day or two, while I take a run to the coast. It ain't above twenty-five miles, and mind you don't get into any mischief till I come back. Confound your impudence! It's a very odd thing that you can't come into my presence without a lie in your mouth. You know you have been as much trouble to me as a cargo of monkeys in a storm. Be off with ye, and if I never see your face again, it will be a good job. Jack considered that he had quite sufficiently announced his departure, so he set off at once, and made his way towards the coast, not a little pleased, as he neared it, to fancy that every now and then he kept snuffing the sea air, and when the coach in which he went, put him down within about four miles of a little village inhabited by fishermen, he walked that distance. Although, sailor-like, it was an exercise he was by no means fond of, and to his great joy once more stood upon a sandy beach, and heard the murmur of the ocean, and saw the waves curling at his feet. He was quite delighted and really felt, or fancied he felt, which was the same thing, wonderfully invigorated by the change, and quite another thing to what he had been. Under such circumstances, Jack was sure not to be long in picking up a companion, so in one of the cottages into which, with all the free and easy manner of a sailor, he strolled, he found an old man of war's man, 
retired there to spend the remainder of his days along with his son and daughter. We feel that it would be quite impossible for us to do justice to the meeting between those two worthies, for they soon found out the capabilities of each. Some grog, which Jack thought the sweetest he had tasted for a long time, because it was drunk within the sight of the ocean, was produced. And then the tales they set to telling each other of their adventures afloat would have been enough to stun anyone. We have rather a fear, likewise, that in some cases they were not so strictly particular as they might have been had they been upon their oaths as regards truth, but they seemed to be upon the principle of mutual forbearance and the implied understanding of you believe me and I'll believe you. Whenever this kind of rivalry, however, commences between inveterate storytellers, there is no saying to what length they will go, and Jack certainly related some extraordinary things. They happened both to have been to the same latitude, but of course they had not both seen the same sights exactly, or enjoyed the same adventures. So what one did not know or could not invent, the other pretty soon did, so that between them they made up a most entertaining conversation, and one which really would, to anyone who was willing to be amused, and not very particular about veracity, have had great charms. Ah, said the old sailor, when I was on the coast of Engi, the hair melted off my head. Did it? said Jack. Oh, that's nothing at all. We had a couple of men roasted at the wheel with the heat, and they didn't know it till they were both done brown. You don't say so? Yes, I does, and what's more, we always had our meat cooked over again upon one of the gun slides, and after that, when we were a long way southward, it was so cold not one of the crew shut his eyes for a week. Indeed, but you spoke of a man as you called Safety Jack. Who was he? I should like all for to know. When I was on board the fame, our captain was a know-nothing sort of sure-going lubber, who had been gaffed a pair of swabs over better men's heads, and uncommon afeard he was of getting into any danger. He was always coming on deck on a morning, and gaffing a kind of a hurry-scurry scared look all round him. He'd say, if so be as he seed no land. Where are we? Is there any danger? Then a first laugh he'd say, no danger, sir, only a little fear. Then the captain he'd say, all the while looking as scared as a marine in a squall, let us be safe, let us be safe, that's all. So we called him Safety Jack in consequence of that peculiarity. Well, you must know, as we were running for the Cape and Safety Jack, he wouldn't be persuaded, but insisted upon hugging the coast of Africa all the way, cause, as he said, it looked safer to see the land. So as it happened, when we neared the Cape, we got into a regular northwesterly current that set clear away southeast so it might be a few points more southerly. The wind, too, blew in the same direction, and it seemed a bad job altogether. I laughed then, says, says he to the captain. That's safety, Jack, you must understand. It will take us some time to work into the bay with this wind and current, but we can do it. Is it safe? said safety, Jack. Oh, yes, said the other though I have known a vessel of small draught to be capsized hereway. Safety Jack at this turns very pale, and he says, Well, run before the wind a few leagues to the south. It's safer, and, and the gale may go down, and we may get out of the current, 
and and besides it's safer well everybody grumbled but safety jack would have his own way and we went spanking along with the wind and current nearly due south but instead of getting out of the current we got further into it and the gale increased to a hurricane we went through the water at such a rate that the men who stood facing the wind could not button their jackets or shut their eyes and there was the mate and five able-bodied men holding the captain's hair on his head the men's teeth too were all blown out of their mouths and kept rattling among the rigging like a half dozen old shot in a locker on we went faster and faster till all of a sudden we saw the rails flapping against the masts and the ship was evidently turning around in spite of the helm you're out of it mumbled safety jack i think we are in for it cried the mate this is the whirlpool and so it was round and round we flew like lightning coming nearer to one point at each turn the men all fell down on the deck as giddy as geese and safety jack he began screaming just to give you an idea of how we went around there was two of the crew as had a squabble about a bottle of rum and one of them says if i can't have it you shan't and there it goes shaking it behind him well you'll hardly believe it but the ship was going round so fast in a circle of about a mile that afore the bottle could drop the man as through it was brought round to it again and it knocked his eye out well presently the ship gives a kind of shivering and stops for half a moment and safety jack he screams again then the water opened like a well hole and just for a moment we could see it bubbling and lashing like a boiling cauldron then down we went into the foaming surge like a lump of lead you don't mean to swear to that yes i do at any time and any day i should think so and rather think i ought to know as i was there and how did you get saved that's the question my boy you ought to be satisfied about that i should think said jack by seeing me here if i had not escaped i rather suppose i shouldn't have been here to have told you about it that's all very well but i ask you how you escaped oh that's quite another thing i floated about for eight weeks upon an empty tar barrel eight weeks did you say yes eight weeks two days four hours and three quarters the deuce you did how came you to be so mightily particular as to the three quarters because i thought some fool would be sure to ask me oh that indeed but the most odd thing that happened to me i will say was when i was once wrecked on an island that we called a flea island flea island what a rum name what made you call it that i should like to know oh a trifling circumstance there was nothing in it but fleas and they were as big as elephants very good said jack i can believe that because there is nothing outrageous about it i don't consider myself at all difficult to please and so long as you stick to such things as that nobody can doubt you will find it all right with me i'm very much obliged but should you happen ever to come across that captain of yours again yes but it were a good while afterwards i was on board a whaler that i saw something floating that looked like a great hump of chalk and when we picked it up who should it turn out to be but safety jack and what they called putrefied and turned to something like white coral you don't mean that yes i do 
we keep him out of curiosity for about a week lashed up to the mainmast but the men of the night watch were scared at him and threw him overboard because they said when the moonlight fell upon him he for all the world looked like a ghost and they couldn't keep their eyes off him which i dare say was somewhere about the truth you certainly have seen a little service but mix yourself another glass of grog and i shall do the same for i don't mean to turn into hammock to-night what for because there is going to be a storm i have not been looking at the weather for so many years without being able to tell that before it comes there will be a storm before twenty-four hours are over and i think it will blow off the sea so that there will be no end of mischief jack pringle went to the door of the fisherman's hut and although the evening had set in he cast a scrutinizing glance at the heavens looked earnestly in the direction from whence the wind proceeded and when he came back again and sat down by the side of the old sailor he said you are right there will not only be a storm but such a one too as they haven't seen for some time so i shall no more think of turning in than you do who knows but what vessel may be drifted in shore and then we who are seamen will be able to do more good than a score of your shore-going fellows who are afraid if the salt water gets above their ankles that's true enough when the wind does rise in this way and blows a strong gale it's pretty clear that there will be something in the shape of wreck to look at the prognostications of jack and the old sailor turned out as we know to be tolerably correct for the storm which they had anticipated was precisely that severe one which roused the baron stolmoyer of salzburg from his lethargy and induced him to go down to the beach to see what was likely to be the fate of the vessel from which the signals of distress had proceeded as soon as the wind began to howl and the waves to dash upon the shore jack pringle and the old sailor left the cottage and stood with great anxiety upon the beach anxious to render what assistance they could to those who were suffering from the fury of the storm we have before mentioned that a boat that the baron stolmoyer saw swamped had ventured out to the assistance of the crew in that boat had been jack pringle and he had refused to allow the old sailor to accompany him on account of his age no no said jack this is a work for youngsters and they and they only ought to set about it you remain where you are we know well enough that your will is good and let that be sufficient and now my lads who will go with me jack soon got a few good volunteers and started out on his chivalrous expedition to see what could be done towards rescuing some of the crew of the distressed ship but alas what the baron had said about the fate of that boat was true although he was incorrect as regarded the consequences of its swamping to all on board for jack pringle in consequence of being a first-rate swimmer and possessed likewise as he was of great coolness and presence of mind contrived to reach shore again although he was the only one of the ill-fated crew who really did so but as jack himself said they died in a noble cause and as everybody must die some time in some sort of way he didn't see that they had anything very particular to complain of in that respect it was on a second occasion however that jack was going out with a lifeboat that the baron reached the beach and then as if indignant that such daring attempts should be made to save what he evidently thought so little of namely human life he retired in indignation again to his home but not all the barons in the world would have stopped jack 
in his chivalrous enterprise and so he proceeded at once to carry it out to the best of his ability and he did pick up a man who was nearly exhausted and clinging with but a faint hope of deliverance to a portion of wreck End of chapter 106chapter 107 of vani the vampire volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by valli vani the vampire volume 2 by thomas prescott press Chapter 107 The young sailor saved by Jack Pringle turns out to be an important personage. It was not the least gratifying part by any means of Jack Pringle's going to the seaside that in consequence of that occurrence he had been instrumental in saving the life of a fellow creature and when he returned to the cottage of the fisherman bearing in his arms the apparently lifeless remains of a young man who had been clinging to a portion of the wreck the cheer that greeted him from the bystanders was certainly the most grateful music that had ever greeted his ears he had a strong impression on his own mind that the young man whom he had removed from the wreck would recover and that impression he was wonderfully well pleased to find verified by the fact the care and acidity of the family upon whose hospitality the young stranger was thus by the fury of the elements thrown succeeded shortly in restoring him to perfect consciousness he showed a disposition then to arise but this jack pringle and the old fisherman would not permit for they both knew from experience in such cases how essential rest was so they darkened the room in which he lay and left him to himself well said jack as they sat together what do you think of that young fellow i cannot for my part make out very well what he is although i can say what he is not and that's a seaman no he is no sailor certainly and he is more likely to have been a passenger on board the merchantman than anything else and if so it is an odd thing that he should have been the only one saved out of the ship's crew when there much have been men used to such disasters and one would think capable of taking care of themselves it is an odd thing but there is no accounting for it we shall hear all about it though when he recovers sufficiently to speak to us without doing himself any mischief certainly and that will be after he has had a sleep for then he will be all right for mind you i don't think he was insensible on account of having been in the water so much as because he was so thoroughly tired out that he didn't know what he was about the stranger slept for about four hours and then he awakened greatly refreshed by the slumber and quite able to give some account of himself without fatigue after expressing his most grateful thanks for the service that had been rendered to him to which jack listened with great impatience because he really did not consider it a service at all but one of the most natural things in the world for a man to do who saw another in distress he said i was captain's clerk on board a king's ship called undyne and we had a smart affair with a nest of pirates on the african coast we were absolutely attacked by four or five of their vessels at once 
and having sunk three and captured the remainder during which however we lost some officers and a number of men our captain determined upon sending home a dispatch of the transaction which he entrusted to my care hang pirates said jack they ought all to be hung up at the yard arm without judge or jury but i suppose they are by this time pretty well settled i have no doubt of it for it was the captain's intention to steer to the nearest port and there be evidence against them and get them in due course executed he put me on board a merchant vessel with my dispatches and a more prosperous and pleasant voyage we could not have until the storm which arose off the coast here and proved the destruction of our vessel ah said jack it's always the case if anything happens it's within sight almost of the port you are bound to so it is said the old fisherman all is safe out in the blue waters but when you least expect it and things are looking quite pleasant and people are brushing themselves up to go on shore then all of a sudden something will occur and you'll find yourselves a wreck it would seem so said the young stranger and at all events that was our evil fortune whatever it may be any one else's for we were indeed just congratulating ourselves upon being at home or nearly so when this terrific storm arose and i suppose i am the only survivor out a crew of twenty-eight men the only one said jack i'm sorry to say all had sunk before the lifeboat had reached you and what's more several brave fellows lost their lives in the first attempt to pick up some of the crew so it has been a most disastrous matter altogether but cheer up said the fisherman it might have been worse for i have known cases when a ship has gone down and not left one survivor to say who or what she was or tell the tale of her destruction and i too said jack on what part of the coast said the stranger am i for during the night we have drifted so far and been so beaten about by the gale that whether we came twenty miles or a hundred i cannot tell why the town at close here is called anderbury anderbury exclaimed the young man is it possible that my faculties have been so confused by the danger i have been in as not to know this coast this is the very place to which i should have proceeded post haste directly i concluded my business in london at the admiralty indeed then you had better stay here at once and go to the admiralty afterwards for i dare say that will answer the purpose just as well at all events and i suppose you have lost your dispatches i have indeed but yet it is my duty to report myself as soon as possible but now that i am in anderbury i cannot resist the opportunity of calling upon a dear friend who resides in this town do you happen to know a family of the name of williams no said jack i never heard of them except you mean a bill williams that was once on board the ocean frigate as a cook no no i mean a family residing here one of the members of which is dearer to me than life itself well said jack it is good fortune that has cast you here since that is the case it is not likely that i should know anything of the people you speak of because i am a stranger in the place myself and have come a distance of twenty-five miles just to have a look at the sea and nothing else and good fortune brought me here in time it appears to save your life and i only hope you will find your sweetheart true to you i can have no doubt of that well it's a good thing to be confident but for my part i always had very serious doubts and when i came off a voyage i frequently found that my sweetheart had picked up with somebody else in the course of about a week after i was gone 
but in this case said the young stranger i would stake my life upon the fidelity of her whom i wish so much now to see well said jack of course you please yourself but before you make a fool of yourself by calling upon her just satisfy yourself upon the subject that's all and get some friend to make an inquiry for you or else perhaps you will be served as i was once how was that why the fact is when i was younger than i am now i took a fancy to a nice little creature of the name of jemima west whom i fully intended to marry and so i told her before i started upon one voyage that i meant to be my last for you see i had a pretty good stock of prize money and i meant to set up a public school at liverpool and did she prove false to you a little when i came home of course i walked off straight to where she lived her father and mother were very respectable people and amused themselves with selling coals and potatoes so in i walked as i used to do into the shop and so on bang into the parlour and there sat jemima much as usual neither very clean and neither very dirty well on the other side of the fireplace was a fellow smoking a pipe and when i caught hold of her and gave her half a dozen regular kisses he takes his pipe out of his mouth and opens his eyes like an old crocodile why my girl i said how are you oh i don't know she said i didn't expect to see you any more no said the fellow with the pipe and i'm damned if ever i expected to see you at all who the devil are you who the devil are you says i but however that don't much matter for be you whom you may if you don't pretty quick take yourself off i'll kick you out that's a good joke says he to talk of kicking a man out of his own house after coming in and kissing his wife like a steam engine a very good joke wife says i do you say you are this fellow's wife yes says she and she pretended to wipe something out of the corner of her eye with her apron yes says she i thought you were drowned long ago and so i thought i might as well be mrs joggles now you may guess messmate what a damned fool i looked after that and how glad i was to back out so you see i advise you to make some inquiries just before you take upon yourself to be so positive about your sweetheart the young man laughed as he said i think i'll chance it and notwithstanding your misadventure i have some reason to believe that i shall not be so unfortunate but at all events i will take your advice and make some previous inquiries it shall not be said that i fell into any misadventure of that nature for want of ordinary caution that's right don't be above taking advice and do you know i shan't be at all surprised that you will find your sweetheart going to be mrs somebody else but come here's dinner will be ready directly yes said the old man it will as soon as my son returns from anderbury where he has gone to buy a bit of fresh meat for you for i thought you would be tired of fish and we had nothing else in the house i regret much giving you so much trouble but i shall have my pay to receive when i reach london and will take care that you are amply recompensed oh don't mention that and by the by here he comes well tom what have you brought a leg of mutton said tom i ain't a judge of nothing else but i thought i might venture upon that at all events i think somebody told me it was very good with shrimp sauce 
rather an odd mixture that term and not quite usual i should say well the old fellow was on the grin that told me on account of an old woman that had been to them to ask for some credit for a month or two because her daughter was going to be married to a baron somebody who they say has taken Anderbury on the mount and is immensely rich did you hear her name tom oh yes i have seen her before in the town it's old mother williams and it's her daughter helen as is going to be married well i never cried jack i say miss may didn't i tell you the murder is out now that's your sweetheart ain't it the young man turned very pale and for a few moments he did not speak but when he did so he said there must be some mistake i could stake my life upon her constancy then a precious goose you would be said jack to do any such thing for i wouldn't stake my little finger upon any woman why man it's just what you ought to have expected it's the way with them all out of sight out of mind and i'm only surprised at a fellow of your sense not knowing that for you seem to be up to a thing or two it cannot be it cannot be i must go myself to seek helen and at once put a stop to these rumours which i am convinced arise from some misconstruction and probably a confusion of names i know that mrs williams is a selfish woman and it is possible that she might not hesitate in sacrificing one of her daughters to gold but that one cannot be helen who has pledged her faith to me well said jack take advantage of any doubt you can but it would be very absurd for you to go interfering in the matter yourself you leave it to me to make the necessary inquiries whilst you remain here snug and unknown and i promise you on the word of a british seaman that i'll bring you exact news all about it i accept your offer gratefully for if she be faithless to me i wish never to encounter her again but to leave her to enjoy what happiness she can with that other for whom she has broken her faith with me good said jack that's the wisest plan for after all you see in these matters who's to blame but the girl herself and you can't very well give her a thrashing you know for as regards the fellow of course she don't say anything to him about you and he can't tell but what she is a regular free trader true true and the best thing therefore i can do to make certain of controlling my temper in the transaction is not to see her unless i can make certain that she is faithful to the vows she has plighted to me but let me beg of you as quickly as possible to end my state of suspense and doubt i believe you said jack i'll go at once to find it all out you shan't be in doubt much longer and of course i hope that things will turn out to your satisfaction although i can't say i expect they will the hope that they will is life itself to me and i shall wait here with an impatience bordering upon positive agony for your report End of chapter 107Chapter 108 of Vani the Vampire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vali. Vani the Vampire, Volume 2 by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 108 The Decision Against the Doctor and More News of Vani the Vampire
it will be remembered that dr chillingworth although he had without doubt ascertained that varney had proceeded to london hesitated about following him there without the full conveyance and consent of the bannerwards and now at the very first opportunity he had when he found the admiral and henry together he introduced the subject he detailed what he had already done in the way of tracing varney from place to place and ended by declaring his conviction that he was to be found in london it is not only of importance he said to discover varney on account of the property which i think he has taken with him but it really amounts almost to a public duty to do so when we consider the evil he has succeeded in bringing upon us and that some other family may be soon suffering from similar machinations but doctor said henry i presume you have no disinclination to admit that the principal view you take of the subject is as regards its connection with the supposed sum of money which varney has taken with him i freely own said the doctor that i should like to place that money in your hands because i think you are entitled to it and perhaps that is my principal motive but it certainly is not my only one for as i consider varney quite a curiosity in a medical point of view i certainly wish to follow him up and should be extremely sorry to lose sight of him altogether but you must be aware doctor said henry that there really is something like positive danger in following such a man up and although he feels himself under such great obligations to you that i do not think he would willingly do you an injury yet there is no knowing what so strange and irascible a temper might not be goaded to i have no dread of danger i dare say you have not said the admiral but i give you my vote against having anything further to do with varney and said henry although i cannot withhold an expression of admiration for the doctor's perseverance i beg him to think that we oppose his pilgrimage in search of the vampire because we fell more for his personal safety than we fear any of the machinations of varney well gentlemen said the doctor since i am in a minority of course i must give in and say no more about it i should certainly have liked to find the fellow for it is my impression that he certainly has a good many thousands of your money in his possession but as it is i will say no more about it although i shall retain my opinion that you are ill advised in not following him up oh said the admiral it won't do to follow people up always i don't know there's that quaker for instance who has got possession of deerbrook the quaker shouted the admiral damn the quaker i'll follow him up while i have a guinea left or a leg to stand on what the deuce made you mention him for you know the very sound of his name is enough to put me in a fever the quaker be hanged an infernal thief as he is it was well known to both henry and the doctor and in fact to all the family now that the mention of the quaker was always enough to drive the admiral nearly frantic so that we are inclined to think dr chillingworth was actuated by a little spirit of vengeance when he made that remark and that on the whole he was so vexed at the non-participation of the banner words and the admiral in his views concerning sir francis varney that on the irritation of the moment he did not scruple to say something which he thought would be annoying but his downright good feeling so got the better of anything of that sort that turning to the admiral he said i do apologize i ought to apologize for my calling to your attention anything of a disagreeable character for i have no right whatever to do so and it was only upon the impulse of a moment i assure you that i uttered the words 
doctor said the admiral i know all that as well as you can tell me so just say no more about it if you please for i don't want to hear one word upon such a subject well then said the doctor now that i stand acquitted of doing or saying anything of a doubtful or disagreeable character i can only tell you that i shall persevere in my opinion and that it is just possible though not very likely that i may upon my own account do something in the matter all of which said henry i am very sorry to hear you say doctor but why are you sorry because i cannot help anticipating danger i feel almost certain that it will ensue and in that case no one will more bitterly regret that you mix yourself up in the affair than i shall oh do not presume any such thing said the doctor jestingly you may depend varney and i understand each other too well for there to be much danger in my intercourse with him there is something about the fellow yet that will not permit him to do any deliberate wrong to me and strange as the feeling may appear i cannot help acknowledging that i like him in some things and that having been the means of restoring him to life i feel somehow or other as if i were bound to look after him well that is rather absurd said the admiral i must confess but however doctor if you have any such feeling by all means carry it out i won't say nay but by any means find him out if you like and if you can make him a decent member of society in heaven's name do so i do not expect that said the doctor and if i only keep him out of mischief i shall be sufficiently satisfied for that would be accomplishing a great deal with such a man promise me one thing said henry in connection with this affair what may that be it is that you will not take any step in the matter without letting us know of course you are a free agent in a transaction but have as much right as anybody to say or to do anything as regards varney the vampire but still knowing so much of him as we do i for one certainly would be glad to be made aware of anything you are attempting concerning him that i will promise you so you need be under no possible apprehension on such a score but feel completely at your ease that nothing is being done unless you know of it at this juncture a servant entered the room with a letter which was addressed to henry banavert and upon opening it he uttered a sudden exclamation of surprise what is it said the admiral you seem astonished henry i am indeed astonished and i may be who do you suppose admiral this letter is from i can't possibly take upon myself to say why from no other person than varney the vampire indeed cried dr chillingworth and does he offer restitution does he offer to return the money he so wrongly has got possession of tell me that i cannot answer you for i have not read one word of the epistle i only see by the signature that it is his but as it is impossible that there can be any secret between myself and varney i shall read it to you aloud and you shall both of you be able to judge concerning it the admiral and the doctor assumed attitudes of attention while henry after glancing his eyes slightly down the contents of the letter commenced reading it as follows to henry banavert sir probably the last person in the world from whom you might expect to receive a communication is he who now pens this epistle but as it is penned with a good feeling towards you and yours i hope and trust it will be received in a kindly spirit admitting that the circumstances under which i left the protection of your house were such as to require some explanation from me it is that explanation which i now proceed to give 
circumstances made it imperatively necessary that i should adopt a course of conduct that should no longer make me a burden to those who had more cause to wish me dead than to assist me in maintaining existence without then the least sinister motive towards you or any one belonging to you i left your home secretly and at once not being willing to listen to remonstrances that i knew would be spoken kindly but which i knew at the same time could not be very serious inasmuch as my presence cannot possibly be otherwise than a severe tax upon your kindness and your patience i cannot be so besotted as to think for a moment that you can forget although a generosity of temper for which i give you full credit might enable you to forgive the injuries you have received from me but i could not make up my mind to reside under your roof on such terms and since my recovery from the violence of a lawless mob the question in my mind has been not whether i should leave you or not but how i should leave you and where i should betake myself to at length finding it impossible to come to any rational conclusion upon these points and that time was rapidly wearing so that it became necessary if i came to a conclusion at all i should come to it quickly i resolved to leave without giving you any notice of the fact and set up my staff as it were in the wilderness and proceed in whatever direction chance may point out to me this i say was my resolve and i have carried it into execution all i ask of you is to forget me and not to waste any thought upon the man who will never do any injury to you or to any one belonging to you and who hopes you will make no inquiry for him but should you meet him ever you will pass him by as if you knew him not these few words come from him who was vani the vampire there was a dead silence when this epistle was concluded and all seemed busy with their own opinions as regarded this communication which certainly was one of a singular nature and highly calculated to excite their surprise upon the whole though there was one extremely evident conclusion to be drawn from it and that was that vani was extremely anxious not to be interfered with can anything be more transparent exclaimed the doctor it is just as i say vani wants to try some new scheme and is very much afraid that he may come across us in some way and be balked in it by our exposing what his real character is and if anything could give me a stronger impulse than another to follow him and see what he is about it would certainly be that letter i do not think you need to be afraid said henry for the letter bearing as it does that signification is such a one as induces me to believe he is fearful that some circumstance may throw him in our way and in that case that we may spoil his port or of the likelihood of such a thing occurring he is of course a much better judge than we can be so i should say let him alone and see if anything really turns up concerning him if it does we have a fair principal action before us for we have no occasion merely because he has asked us to be quiet and peaceable if we find him playing any pranks or attempting to play any pranks that's my opinion too said the admiral be quiet and take no notice and it will be an odd thing to me then if you don't soon hear something of master vani and that may be a something too that may astonish us is that all the letter said dr chillingworth yes with the exception of these words in a postscript any communication addressed to v v general post office london will reach my hands promptly ah 
then there's the gist of the matter said the doctor the vagabond wants to be assured that we shall not interfere with him and then he has got some rascality in hand you may depend which he would set to work about in real earnest i shall not write to him said henry but shall pursue quite a different course of policy and wait patiently for what may happen for i am convinced that is the only plan to pursue with any chance of benefit or success and you will bear in mind doctor said the admiral that the fellow in this letter talks of giving us an explanation and yet not one word does he say about jumping upon your back from the garden wall the deuce a bit does he explain that no said the doctor nor did i expect he would such a man as varney is not likely to criminate himself and while there is doubt about whether he is that person or not you may depend he will not be the man to take any pains to dispel it of course not of course not well said the doctor i can only tell you all one thing and that is that whatever you may think or flatter yourselves this affair is very far indeed from being over and sooner or later something yet very serious will occur in connection with varney the vampire do not fancy that you have got rid of him for most certainly you have not the doctor spoke these words so oracularly that he sounded extremely like one of those predictions founded upon such a firm basis that they are sure to be carried out by future facts and both henry and the admiral felt as if they had heard truth from some one who knew well what he was uttering and was not likely to be mistaken End of chapter 108chapter 109 of Vani the Vampire volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by valli vani the vampire volume 2 by thomas prescott prest chapter 109 the preparations for the wedding of the baron stolmoyer of salzburg there is a common adage which inculcates the necessity of striking while the iron is hot and this was an adage which to judge from her conduct seemed to have made a great impression upon the mind of mrs williams and she thought that as regarded her daughter's feelings the iron was hot and that if she struck now she might be able to wring from her a consent no matter how reluctant to call the baron stolmoyer her husband the objects which mrs williams felt certain she should succeed in achieving by such an union in her family were far too weighty to be easily dispensed with they not only comprehended the five hundred pounds which the baron had so judiciously promised her upon the wedding day being fixed but she had an eye to after circumstances and considered that the son-in-law who could spare five hundred pounds as a mere bribe to her would be an endless source from whence she could draw her pecuniary supplies and then thought mrs williams there are the other girls to get off too and what a famous opportunity it will be to do that when they can be at all the grand parties the baron will give at anderbury house to an intriguing woman such as mrs williams was in reality all these advantages appeared in full force and if ever she made up her mind thoroughly and entirely about anything in the world she certainly did that her daughter helen would be the baroness stolmoyer of salzburg 
she certainly wished in her own heart that the baron had chosen one of her other daughters because then she knew that she would not have had to encounter the opposition she had done and perhaps had still to encounter in the case of helen but as it was that part of the business could not be helped and she helen was to be sacrificed if the baron had thought for twelve months over the matter he could not have come to a better conclusion as to the best means of making mrs williams a zealous partisan of his than by distinctly naming a sum of money that she should have and when she should have it for now she considered that every moment's delay was a prize of actual criminality on the part of helen inasmuch as it was keeping her mrs williams out of a large sum of money there was one thing however which she did at once and that was to go to the different rates people who had had the awful insolence to stop the supplies and tell them that her daughter helen was about to become the baroness stolmuir and that if they continued to execute orders and to wait with patience they would all get paid within one month this positive announcement staggered some of them for they would hardly have thought it possible that she would have made it if there had not been some great foundation for truth in it of some sort and it was one of these announcements which as the reader is aware had been overheard by tom the son of the old sailor and which well reported had created so much consternation in the mind of the young man who had been saved by jack pringle from the wreck on the following morning the lady received a laconic note from the baron in which were the words Madam, have you settled with your daughter the day and the hour of my nuptials with her i have drawn a check in your favour and only wait your further proceeding in the affair to sign it and send it to you i have the honour to be madam yours truly stolmuir mrs williams this note put mrs williams into a perfect fury of impatience the idea that actually a check for five hundred pounds should be drawn in her favour and only awaiting the signature of the baron and that by one word her daughter helen could procure that signature was absolutely maddening she rushed at once to helen's room poor helen knew enough of her mother to feel convinced from the first that no possible exertion would be spared for the purpose of forcing her into that marriage which had no charms alas for her but which on the contrary presented itself to her in the most hideous of all possible aspects from the first moment that her mother had broached it it had seemed in its remembrance to lie at her heart like a lump of lead she seemed already to feel that after an unavailing resistance she would have to yield and then that her future existence would involve in it all the pangs of despair and regret alas alas she said under what fatal planet was i born that i should be so unhappy as i now am what will become of me and how shall i gather resolution enough either to bear with seeming patience the fate that afflicts me or to resist the machinations of my mother who would force me to wed this man whom i cannot love the long absence of her lover was so perplexing a source of worn reflection to her that already it had sapped much of the joy of her young existence he surely ought she said and might have found some means of communicating to me long ere this he might well know and must know that suspense is of all feelings the worst to bear oh why am i thus deserted by all and left 
to the mercy of the worst of circumstances. With her sisters, poor Helen could have no sympathies in common. Either of them would have been delighted to change places with her, as regarded the fact of becoming the Baroness of Salzburg, and they had towards her a tolerably cordial ill will, on account of her superior charms, which made her so much admired, while they were left to pine in maiden meditation fancy free. But to Helen Williams, this gift of beauty was what it truly has often been described, a most dangerous one, and she would have given the world to have been able to wear an appearance that would have repelled instead of attracted the Baron Stolmuir. She was in this desponding state of mind, revolving in her mind her dismal prospects, if she should consent to wed the Baron, and her equally dismal ones if she should refuse. For well she knew how painful a position with her family such a refusal would place her in when her mother entered the room. Mrs. Williams had so thoroughly determined that this marriage should take place, that she could not have said to have now sought her daughter to persuade her to it, but on the contrary to insist upon it. The sisters too, with whom this unnatural mother, or rather perhaps we ought to say too natural, but too common mother, had held a conversation upon the subject, were anxious, despite the jealousy upon the occasion, that the affair should proceed, because certainly the next best thing to themselves making such an alliance was to succeed in getting it made by some other of the family, and they fully intended making Anderbury on the Mount their home. What, Helen? exclaimed Mrs. Williams, in tears as usual. Have I not cause for weeping, mother? Well, well, I cannot say much to you beyond the few words I have come to say. I have, I fear, as regarded this affair of the offer that was made to you by the Baron Strollmuir, behaved precipitately. Oh, mother! cried Helen with renewed hope. I am rejoiced to hear you say so. Then you will not now ask me to sacrifice myself to a man whom I can never love? Say no more of the past. It is sufficient that you have awakened to better resolves now, dear mother, and I shall be happy. Such words as these ought to have softened the mother's heart. But such a woman had no heart to soften, and after a pause she proceeded in her plan of operations. Well, my dear, perhaps it is all for the best. It must be for the best, mother, because it never can be for good that I should have consented to plight my vows to one whom, of all others, I cannot look upon with the least affectionate regard. Indeed, mother, so much as I can absolutely dislike any one, I dislike that man. There is no occasion to say anything more about it, my dear. I have come to bid you farewell, and heaven only knows when we may meet again. What do you mean, mother? I mean, my dear, just what I say. I am going now at once to a prison. A prison? Yes, it certainly is not an agreeable idea, but as I told you, I was too sanguine, and built too much upon your consenting to marry the Baron, so I borrowed a sum of money to pay some pressing debts. But as I have not been able to repay it, I am arrested, and have now only persuaded the man to go away upon giving him a solemn promise that I will, in half an hour's time, be at the gates of the town gaol. Helen heard this declaration with a feeling of perfect horror. She was too little acquainted with the usages of society to see what a transparent light really was, and to her mind 
it did not appear improbable that a man who came to arrest anybody should take their word to come to the gaol in half an hour oh mother mother she sobbed can this be i don't know said mrs williams if it can be or not all i know is that it is so and that i'm perfectly willing to pass the remainder of my days in the dungeon helen's ideas of prisons were all procured from romances and she was not at all surprised consequently to hear her mother talk of a dungeon and if she had added something about chains and bread and water and a heap of straw merely for a bed it would have found a ready credence with poor helen no wonder therefore that the idea of such a catastrophe presented itself to her in the most terrific colours and she saw at once all her recent congratulations upon an escape from a marriage with the baron stolmeyer of salzburg scattered to the winds of heaven she was so petrified with astonishment and grief that for some moments she could not speak and mrs williams took care to improve upon that silence by adding i am sure i should be the last person in the world to ask any daughter of mine to make a sacrifice but as i have been so foolish because i took a pride in my family as to go into expenses i cannot stand why of course i must take the consequences oh no no oh it's all very well to say oh no no but it's oh yes yes and all i have to ask of you now is to say that business has compelled me to leave this part of the country and after that the best way will be to say that i am dead heaven help me and then of course continued mrs williams in the most matter-like and self-denying tone in all the world and then of course people will leave off making any inquiries about me and you may all of you in time manage to forget me likewise mother mother is not this cruel my dear i really cannot say that i think it is i am and have been mistaken and perhaps i did push the affair of your marriage with the baron stolmeyer of salzburg a little too far and too much counted upon it i know i'm apt to be too sanguine i'm well aware of that it's a little peculiarity of mine but i cannot help it and when we have those little peculiarities all we can do is to put up with it as best we may but mother oh it's no use talking is the creditor so very inexorable yes and only on one account he thinks i have deceived him that's the fact and having asked me to give a decided answer if the wedding day was fixed between you and the baron for nothing else would satisfy him and as of course i could not say that he got quite furious and at once threatened me with law proceedings which i did not think he really meant but it appears he did for here i am arrested but can nothing be done not that i see the baron when he made the proposal was anxious for an immediate reply and then he would have made some very handsome settlement which would have been soon known and anybody would have trusted me but as it is the only thing that can save you all will be for me to go to prison at once and so disappear helen wept bitterly and therefore my dear i beg you won't think anything of it i'm quite willing to go at once without any more fuss about it but i have not yet said anything to your sisters because i thought that the first explanation was due to you in the affair since you were the most mixed up with it oh this is too dreadful much too dreadful farewell farewell we may meet again or we may not i wish you all manner of happiness 
Mrs. Williams moved towards the door, but before she reached it, Helen sprung after her, and detaining her, cried, No, no, it must not be. If there is an imperative necessity for some victim, let me be it. Oh, let me be it. What do you mean, Helen? asked Mrs. Williams in pretended surprise. I, I mean, mother, that, that I will, to save you, give up all hopes of happiness in this world, and that although I would far rather go at once to my grave, I will, since my destiny seems to point out that it must be so, consent. Consent to become the Baroness Stolmoyer of Salzburg and, and, do I hear aright? Yes, yes, heaven help me. I feel that I have no other hope. The dreadful alternative that is presented to me leaves me no other course to pursue. I must and I do consent. If it will at once save you from the prison. It will, my dear, if I can succeed in convincing my importunate creditor that you have really consented, and that it is not a scheme of mine merely to escape a prison. But if you write a few words signifying your consent, that will be quite sufficient. This was an artful proceeding on the part of Mrs. Williams, for although she by no means intended to put the Baron in possession of such a document, yet she considered that by having it, she completely protected herself from any reproaches which he might otherwise cast upon her, should any hitch arise in the proceedings, or anything go wrong with the affair, even at the last moment. The few words in writing which sufficed, as Mrs. Williams thought, fully to commit poor Helen to the marriage were freely written, for there was no duplicity in the character of Helen, and what she said she would consent to, she was quite willing to write. Well, my dear, said Mrs. Williams, although you don't feel happy just now about the marriage, you may depend upon it, you will enjoy your existence very much. For when you get a little older, you will find that it is, after all, the possession of ample means that is the most important thing to look to. Helen shook her head, but she made no reply. She did not at all agree with what her mother said, but she felt by far too much depressed to argue the point with her just then. You will. All your life, added Mrs. Williams as she left the room, have the great consolation of knowing that you saved me from a prison, and in doing so, absolutely saved my life. For although I did not say before, I am quite sure I should have died. End of chapter 109《ワニ・ o ァ・ヴァンパイア Volume 2。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《ヴァニ・ヴァンパイア Volume 2 by Thomas Prescott Prest。Chapter 110 Jack Pringle calls upon Mrs. Williams and tells her a piece of his mind upon affairs in general. Jack Pringle never promised anything without an intention of performing it, whether he could succeed or not, and, accordingly, when he promised that he would make due and diligent inquiry for the purpose of ascertaining if Helen Williams was indeed faithless, he proceeded at once to do so in the most direct manner in the world, viz. by calling upon no less a personage than Mrs. Williams herself, and popping the question to her in a manner which almost precluded the possibility of her returning anything but a direct answer. This was a measure which few persons would have attempted, but having, as it had, all the characteristics of boldness about it, it was not one that he was likely to fail in, but upon the contrary, calculated in every respect to be eminently successful. 
He proceeded to the town in perfect ignorance of its locality, or even of the abode of Mrs. Williams, except so far as a very involved description had been given to him of the route to her house by the old sailor's son, Tom, who certainly was not the best hand in the world at a direction. But Jack was never at a loss, for, somehow or another, by the force of a good-tempered manner that he had, he contrived to make friends wherever he went, and among them he soon found one who was willing in every respect to take pains with him, and to walk with him to the door of Mrs. Williams. "'Thank ye, messmate,' said Jack, "'and if ever I meet you again you may make up your mind that you have met a friend, and so this is Mrs. Williams, is it?' "'Yes,' said the man, "'this is Mrs. Williams's. "'And what sort of a creature is she?' Oh, why, as to that, she is not the sort of woman I like, but there is no accounting for tastes, you know, and other people might like her very well. You are a sensible fellow, said Jack, and I should say you have quite wit enough about you that if you fell into the fire, you would get out again as soon as you could. The man hardly knew whether to take this as a compliment or not, but at all events he bade Jack good day, civilly enough, and took no notice of it. Jack then boldly knocked at the door, and when the one miserable servant of the Williamses made her appearance, and asked him what he wanted, he replied, "'Why, I have principally called to tell you what a remarkably fine girl you are, and after that I should like to see Mother Williams.' "'Go along with ye,' said the girl. "'You are only joking, and I can tell you that Mrs. would just as soon give you to a constable as look at you.' "'Oh, no, she wouldn't,' said Jack. "'For good-looking fellows are scarce, and I dare say she knows that as well as possible.' and she would much rather keep me herself than give me to anybody. "'Well, I'm sure,' said the girl. "'You are like all the rest of men, and have a pretty good opinion of herself. But if you really want to see Mrs., I may as well tell her at once.' "'To be sure,' said Jack. Mrs. Williams, from a room on the ground floor, had heard that some sort of conversation was going on at the street door, and she called out, "'Susan! Susan! How dare you be talking there to anybody! Who is that, I say? Tell me who that is immediately!' "'It is me, ma'am,' cried Jack. "'And who is me?' "'Why, ma'am, I have come on a delicate mission. "'I have got something to say to you as is rather particular.' "'Mrs. Williams's curiosity was excited, "'and perhaps some of her fears, "'for when she had told Helen that she was drowned in debt, "'she had, hyperbolically speaking, not far exceeded the truth, "'and therefore she dreaded refusing seeing anyone "'who came to ask for her, "'lest, smarting under the aggravation of such a proceeding, "'the party, be he whom he might, should leave some message that it would not be quite pleasant to her for Susan to hear. This was the respect, then, which placed Mrs. Williams positively at the mercy of any one who chose to call upon her, and which induced her to give an audience even to Jack Pringle, who, under ordinary circumstances, she would, as Susan had correctly observed, have not scrupled to place in the hands of some guardian of the public peace as an intruder into her house. When Jack was shown into the apartment where the lady waited to receive him, he made what he considered a highly fashionable and elegant bow, which consisted in laying hold of a lock of his hair in front, and giving it a jerking pull at the same moment that he kicked out his foot behind and upset a chair. "'How do you do, ma'am?' said Jack. "'You have the advantage of me,' said Mrs. Williams. "'I rather think I have,' said Jack, "'and I mean to keep it, and an out-and-out -out thing it would be if I hadn't, seeing the many voyages I have had when I dare say you was never out of sight of land in all your life. I certainly never was, says Mrs. Williams, and I hope I am speaking to some officer and not to anybody common. Oh, yes, ma'am, said Jack, I'm a rear admiral of the Green, and what I come to ask you is if there is going to be a marriage in your family. Rather an eccentric character, thought Mrs. Williams, but anybody may see in a moment he is a gentleman, or else he would not be an admiral of the Green. I know there are admirals of all sorts of colors, so I have no doubt he is quite correct. Yes, sir, there is going to be a marriage in my family, I am proud to say, for my daughter Helen is going to marry what might be called quite a foreign potentate. A foreign potato. None of your gammon. Don't be poking your fun at me. A foreign potentate, I said, sir, a kind of monarch. A potentate, you know. Oh, I understand. I dare say them fellows lives on potatoes, and that's why they calls them such. "'But are you sure it's your daughter, Helen, because I was thinking of proposing for her myself?' "'Really, then, Admiral Green, I am very sorry, but she is going to be married to the Baron Stolmuir of Salzburg.' "'The Baron what? Did you say? Stonemason and Saltpot? What a damned odd name, to be sure!' "'Dear me, what an eccentric character,' thought Mrs. Williams, but quite the gentleman. 
Admiral Green, it's Stolmuir of Salzburg, is the baron's name. Oh, I knew it was something about salts, but, however, it don't matter, and when is the ceremony to come off, ma'am? It is left to me, sir, to fix the day, and I shall do so, of course, at my convenience. And I can only express my great regret, Admiral Green, that you should have been too late, but, you see, the baron's offer was so unexceptionable, and he is really quite a wealthy individual, which his offering me a check for five hundred pounds is a convincing proof, that I really could not think of refusing him. What? Five hundred pounds? Yes, I assure you, Admiral Green, that he pressed upon my acceptance five hundred pounds. The stingy devil! Stingy? Rather, why, I meant to have asked you to accept a couple of thousands in a large estate that I have got, which brings in as much every year and that I really don't want. Two thousand pounds in an estate? Gracious providence! I don't know what to say to that. Really, Admiral Green, you are so very liberal that, upon my word, I am quite puzzled. Two thousand pounds, and an estate worth two thousand pounds a year? Did you really mean that, Admiral Green? To be sure I did. What else could I mean? But I don't want to interfere with a foreign potato in a barren salt box. Well, but, my dear sir, stop a moment. Let me think. No, ma'am, said Jack. I ain't quite such a humbug as you takes me for. I say nothing, but it's very likely that your baron will turn out to be some half-starved swindler who is going to wind up his affairs by doing you, and serves you right, too. I wishes you good morning, ma'am. So saying, Jack, despite the remonstrances of Mrs. Williams, whose cupidity was so strongly excited by what he had said, that she would gladly have thrown overboard the baron, and who now began to look with something like contempt upon the five hundred pounds, which she had before thought was quite a large sum. "'How odd it is!' she exclaimed when she was alone. "'How odd it is that after I have been looking about, I don't know how long, for a decent match for some of the girls, all the men should come at once and want Helen. It's an extraordinary thing to me, very extraordinary. Dear me, if I could but have a secured Admiral Green for Juliana, and so got her married on the same day with Helen, there would have been two thousand five hundred pounds to me at once. What a capital thing! I would not have spoken of it to anybody, but I would have paid all the tradespeople about here eight pence in the pound as a composition, and then I could have gone and lived in London quite comfortably. Thus is it ever with such schemers as Mrs. Williams. Success brings with it quite as many evils and distressful feelings as failure, and now the agony of what she thought she had lost, much more than counterbalanced any satisfaction she might have had in procuring her daughter's consent to the marriage with the baron. This consent, although we know how it was wrung from Helen, we certainly much blame her for giving, because no human power could readily force her to marry anyone who was not her choice, and the mere fact that her mother represented how deeply she was in debt ought not to have been sufficient to induce Helen to consent. She might and ought to have taken a much higher view of the subject, a view which should have excluded a consideration of James Anderson. That view should have been a refusal to commit the perjury of solemnly vowing before heaven to love and honor a man for whom she entertained such opposite feelings. But Helen was not a close reasoner, and although all the argument was upon her side, and all the propriety, and all the justice, we grieve to say that she did not avail herself of either to the extent she ought to have done, but on the contrary gave up those moments to regret, which should have been far better employed in resistance. When the consent which we have recorded had been wrung from her, she gave herself up to the most melancholy reflections, weeping incessantly, and calling upon heaven to help her from the pressure of circumstances which she was quite competent to relieve herself from if she could have persuaded herself to make the necessary efforts. At last it seemed to her that she had hit upon a plan which might afford her some relief, but, in projecting it, she little knew the real character of the man she had to deal with. This scheme was to tell the baron candidly that she loved another, and, whether that other was living or dead, his remembrance would so cling to her that she could never love another, and that, in making her his wife, he, the baron, would be laying up for himself a source of regret and disquietude in the feeling that he possessed one whose affections he could never hope to obtain. Surely, thought Helen, if he be at all human, and if he have any of the natural pride of manhood about him, he will shrink from attempting to continue a suit that must be mortifying in every one of its stages, and which cannot confer upon him even the shadow of happiness. End of Chapter 110 of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2 Read by Richard Wallace, Liberty, Missouri, 5 May, 2009
Eleven of Varney the Vampire, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Carl, St. Louis, Missouri, November 2008. Varney the Vampire, Volume Two, by Thomas Prescott Prest, Chapter One Eleven. The wedding day fixed, and the guests invited. When she was to receive so handsome a reward for the intelligence that she had wrung a reluctant consent from Helen to be the baron's bride, it was not likely that Mrs. Williams would let a long time lapse before she communicated that fact to him, and accordingly she started to do so personally. It would appear that the baron fully expected her, for he made no remark at all expressive of surprise, but received her with that courtly grace which Mrs. Williams attributed to his intercourse with the highest and the noblest. He did not seem so impatient as any one would have supposed a very ardent lover would have been, and before he would allow Mrs. Williams at all to enter into the object of her visit, he requested her to be seated, and would insist upon placing before her some of the very choicest refreshment. Indeed, as often as she then attempted to enter into the subject matter which had brought her there, he interrupted her with some remark of a different nature, so that she found it very difficult to say anything regarding it. At length, however, when he had satisfied the claims of hospitality, he said, I presume that I have the pleasure of listening to something particularly pleasant and delightful to me, inasmuch as it will convey to me the realization of my dearest hopes. Why, my Lord Baron, I must confess, said Mrs. Williams, that notwithstanding the extremely liberal office of Admiral Green— Admiral Green, madam, this is the first moment I have heard of such a personage. No doubt, no doubt. But for all that, since we have had the honour of your offer for the hand of Helen, Admiral Green has made one, and such a liberal one that it's quite distressing to refuse him. Then allow me to say, madam, that I hope you won't distress yourself about it, but accept of Admiral Green at once. I shall be very sorry indeed to stand in the way of any advantageous arrangement, and therefore I beg you will close with Admiral Green. The adage about coming to the ground between two stools forcibly presented itself to the memory of Mrs. Williams, and she replied in a great hurry, Oh, no, Baron, certainly not, certainly not. I have refused the Admiral on your account. I told him most distinctly. I could not think of entertaining his offer for a moment, and I refused him at once. Then why trouble me about him, madam? Oh, I thought I would only merely mention it. "'because the Admiral said he would have great pleasure, "'which, of course, was a very liberal thing of him, "'in handing me a cheque for two thousand pounds.' "'Oh, now I understand,' said the Baron. "'I give you credit, madam, for having a good reason "'for making this report to me. "'You think that I may be induced to emulate "'the munificence of Admiral Green, "'but when I assure you that I have not the remotest intention of doing so, "'probably you will think that it would have been just as well "'if the matter had never been mentioned.' "'The Baron was right, for Mrs. Williams did think so.' and she felt all that bitterness of disappointment which wonderfully clever people do feel when they find that some pet scheme has most signally failed, leaving behind it all the consequences of a failure, and, whatever people may say to the contrary, failures do always have bad consequences, and never leave the circumstances exactly what they were. There was rather an awkward pause of some moment's duration, and then Mrs. Williams thought she would get over the baron completely, for she put on the most amiable smile she could and said, My dear baron, I'm sure we shall all be the most happy and united family that can possibly be imagined, and it is the greatest pleasure for me to be able to give you the intelligence that my daughter has consented to become yours. Madam, I am much obliged. And although Admiral Green did say that if I were to bring him similar intelligence, he would there and then, on the spot without further delay, hand me two thousand pounds, I said to him, Admiral Green, I am only to get five hundred pounds from the Baron Stuhlmoyer of Salzburg, and that five hundred pounds he has likewise promised to pay me down. Down, you understand, Baron? Madam, I am not deaf, but you understand down? Oh, I begin to see. You want the money. 
Well, could you not say so at once? It's of no use hinting things to me, but if you had said to me at once, Baron, I have brought you the consent to the marriage, and now I expect at once the five hundred pounds that I am to receive for doing so, I would have understood you, and said at once, Oh, certainly, madam, here is the money, as I do now. You will find that check drawn for the amount. What a charming thing it is, said Mrs. Williams. What a charming thing it is to do business in such a real business sort of way. But there are so few people, Baron, with your habits, and upon whom one can so thoroughly depend as one can upon you. Madam, you do me too much honor. Of course, having promised you this insignificant sum of money, it was not likely that I should but keep my word. And now let me ask, when is to be the happy day? If this day week will suit you, Baron. Wonderfully well, madam, wonderfully well. Then we will consider that as settled. I suppose you will have a public marriage? No, no, strictly private. I am resolved, madam, not to have more than one hundred and fifty people, and to keep the expenses within a thousand pounds. So you see, I am going to do it in the plainest possible manner, and make no fuss at all about it. Gracious province, thought Mrs. Williams. What would he call a public marriage if he considers a thousand pounds expense, one hundred and fifty guests a private one, and making no fuss about it? On one of my former marriages, said the baron, with an air of abstraction. One of them, said Mrs. Williams. May I presume to ask how often you have been married, my lord? Oh, certainly. Let me see. I think eleven times. Eleven? And pray, sir, what became of your wives? Why, really, madam, I cannot say. I hope the majority of them went to heaven, but there were one or two I most heartily wished at the other place. My gracious, thought Mrs. Williams, he is quite a bluebeard, but, however, things have gone too far now, and I am not going to give up my check if he had twenty wives, and, after all, it shows he must be a man of great experience and of great wealth, too, or so many women would not have had him. But if that little fact about all his wives should come to the ears of Helen, I am really afraid she wouldn't have him. So I must caution him about it. My Lord Baron. Yes, madam. I think between you and I, my Lord Baron, that it would be quite as well to say nothing to my daughter about her being the twelfth wife. But just let her quietly think she is the first. Because, you know, my lord, young people have prejudices upon these subjects, and she might not exactly like the idea. Oh, certainly, madam. I shall not mention the little affairs that have preceded hers. I assure you I am quite aware that it is likely there should be a prejudice against a man who has had eleven wives, and people will think that he smothered a few of them. Good gracious, said Mrs. Williams. You don't mean that, my lord baron. I hope that nobody ever accused you of such a thing. Nay, said the baron. How are the best of us to escape censure? You know as well as I, Mrs. Williams, what a bad world it is we live in, and how dreadfully selfish people are. Yes, said Mrs. Williams, that's remarkably true. But it ain't often, my lord baron, that one man has eleven wives. No, and it ain't often that such a man would exactly like to venture upon a twelfth. Well, no, there is something in that. But I will now, my lord, take my leave, entertaining no doubt whatever, but that this will be an extremely happy marriage, and in every respect just what we might all of us desire. Mrs. Williams left the baron with these words, but to say that she believed them would be to make by far too powerful an experiment upon the credulity of our readers. When he was alone, the baron smiled a strange and ghastly smile. That woman he said, is so fond of gold that she sells her child without hesitation to me. If upon hearing of my pretended marriages she gave me back my money, I should have thought some good of her. But no, that she could not do. Money is her idol, and when once in her possession she could not dream of parting with it. But what is that to me? Have I not made up my mind to this affair? Let the consequences be what they may." Have I not resolved upon it in every possible shape? Henceforward I will cast aside all feelings of regret, and live for myself alone. For what have I now to hope, and what have I now to fear from mankind? Hope? Did I say I had nothing to hope? I was wrong. 
I have something to hope, and it is a something I will have. It is revenge. Yes, it is revenge, revenge, which I must and will have against society that has made me what I am, and the time shall yet come when my name will be a greater terror than it is, and that to someone needless, for it is such a terror already, but to mention it would cause a commotion of frightful inquietude. He looked from one of the windows of his home, and he saw Mrs. Williams as she proceeded down one of the garden walks, take his check out from her reticule, where she had placed it, and looked at it attentively. Ah, he said, now she is worshipping her divinity, gold. She knows that that price of paper carries weight with it, and that, flimsy as it looks, it is sufficient to purchase her. Fool, fool, and she thinks she is by contentment. End of chapter 111《Chapter 112 of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2 》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Carl, St. Louis, Missouri, December 2008. — Varney the Vampire, Volume 2 — by Thomas Prescott Prest — Chapter 112 the singular invitation to the baron's wedding. About three days after the transactions which we have just recorded, the admiral received a call from his friend, the attorney, and that call had a double object. In the first place, the man of law wanted to tell him how he was proceeding, as regarded the Quaker, and there they had a great tussle about what was to be done, for when the attorney said to him, Now, admiral, as regards to this assault upon Mr. Shepherd, all that can be done is to let him prove his case, and then come up for judgment and move in the court in mitigation. I dare say you will be dragged up to Westminster Hall for judgment, and I would not at all wonder, but you will get off with a fine of six and eightpence. What do you mean, said the Admiral, by letting him do what he likes? In effect, it is the same thing as pleading guilty, you know, to a charge brought against you, and by so doing, you, to a great extent, disarm justice. Guilty, roared the admiral. Guilty? You will be a long time indeed in convincing me that there is any guilt in kicking a Quaker, and especially such a Quaker as Mr. Shepherd. Why, I'll do it again, and think it, as I do now, a meritorious action. Yes, but you misunderstand me. It is called guilt, you know, in law to do anything contrary to law, and by pleading guilty you do no more than just admit the fact that you have kicked the Quaker. That's quite another thing. I've no objection to the fact, whatever, but don't call it being guilty, for that's all moonshine, and I won't have it at any price. Guilty be hanged. I think I see it. Guilty of kicking a Quaker, indeed. I have half a mind to go and kick him again, just on purpose, and I don't know but what I may do it yet. Well, well, Admiral, now that we have settled that naughty point, I have got something else to tell you of a more agreeable nature. Out with it, out with it. It is this. You recollect that upon the marriage of Miss Flora Bannerworth with your nephew, Mr. Charles Howland, the marriage feast, you mean, for, as far as the marriage was concerned, they all got the better of the old man. Yes, the marriage feast. You recollect that upon that occasion you gave me leave to invite a number of persons, all of whom were very grateful, and thought very highly of you and the honour of coming into your company. A devil of a sensible fellow this lawyer is, thought the admiral. It's enough to make one tick to lawyers. I'll be hanged if it ain't. Go on, go on, whatever all that. I am sure I was as well pleased to see them all as they were to see me. Well, sir, it appears that some of these persons, and especially a family of the name of Clark, have been exceedingly anxious to bestow some civility upon you in return, and, as they have been invited to a wedding, they wish to prevail upon you to go with them, as it will be a very stylish affair. 
Well, I don't mind, said the Admiral. Where is it? It is far as twenty miles off, at a place called Underbury, and it is wished that you should bring anybody you like with you upon the occasion. Well, it's civil, at all events, and I don't mind if Henry and Charles and Flora like it, going. But, when you mention Underbury, I'll be hanged if I don't think that's the very place that Jack Pringle has gone to, to get a sight of the salt water, for the benefit of his health. Well, sir, it will have none the less recommendation to you, I dare say, that it is close to the sea. You're right there, and I can tell you I was thinking of going myself, because you know what suits Jack in those respects is pretty well sure to suit me. And I thought, as that vagabond was enjoying himself down by the sea coast, I might as well go and do so likewise. Well, sir, then, I may consider I have your full consent to the arrangement, and I am sure it will be received by the parties with a great deal of satisfaction indeed. Well, well, somehow or another, you talk me over to things, so I'll go, without making any more fuss about it, and I will take Henry with me, and Charles, and Flora, and I'd take old Varney the Vampire, too, if we had him here. It would be a good bit of fun to take such a fellow as that to a wedding. He would not be the most welcome guest in the world. No, I should think not. But who are invitations to come from? They will come from the bride's mother, as the people I have told you are so anxious to take you with them are friends of hers. Very good, very good. So, as that's all right, I will speak to Henry about it, and Flora, and, I dare say, we shall all manage to get there comfortably enough. Let me see. It's just two stages for post-horses. Well, well, lawyer, you may look upon it as decided. It is to be, and there is an end of it. In due course on the following day, there came a note to Admiral Bell, enclosing a card on which was said, Mrs. Williams requests the honor of Admiral Bell's company with his party to breakfast on the 10th instant at 2 o'clock, on the occasion of the celebration of the nuptials of Miss Helen Fedora Williams with the Baron Stolmoyer of Salzburg at Anderbury on the Mount. "'The devil!' said the Admiral. "'This is not a fair. Something splashing and out of the way, I should say. Breakfast? At two o'clock? That's the d this piece of humbug in the whole affair. Who the devil is to wait for their breakfast until two o'clock? I never heard anything better than that. But I suppose there will be something to eat, so I shall take the liberty of having my breakfast at seven in the morning and calling that my dinner.' and my lunch I will manage to get at in some inn on the road. With this card of invitation in his hand, the Admiral went to Flora and laid it before her, saying, Here will be fine fun, Flora, for you. This is the invitation I spoke to you of, and they are going to have breakfast at two o'clock, lunch, I suppose, at five, dinner at nine, a cup of coffee at about twelve, supper at four o'clock in the morning, and I suppose they will get to bed at about daybreak. Flora laughed as she perused the card, and then she said, "'It certainly promises to be quite a fine affair, Uncle, and at all events, as we are the only guests, we shall be able fully to enter into the amusement of the affair, if there be any way, and I am inclined to think there will be, by the rather pompous reading of the card of invitation which has been so civilly sent to us.' "'If they are ridiculous people,' said the Admiral, "'we will laugh at them, and they cannot expect but that we should.' and if they should turn out to be otherwise they may become very pleasant acquaintances you know assuredly and it will not do to judge of people anyway by such a trivial piece of evidence as the card of invitation can afford to one so i will endeavour to go to the wedding with an impression that they are agreeable people an impression which considering the complimentary manner in which they have invited us we ought to cultivate very good and do you speak to Charles about it, for I have not had an opportunity of doing so, and as the people have invited us handsomely, I think we ought to go in a manner so as to do them as much credit as possible, and therefore I should say that a coach and four with postillions will be the plan, and look rather stylish. Oh, uncle, you will be mistaken for the bridegroom. Shall I? Very well. I am quite willing that I should be, always provided I might chance to admire the bride. But if I do not, you may be sure that I shall take plenty good care to explain the error. End of chapter 112
13 of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barony. Varney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 113. James Anderson Seeks and Obtains an Interview with Mrs. Williams. The report which, in accordance with what he had heard from Mrs. Williams, Jack Pringle felt himself compelled to make to the young man whom he had saved from the wreck, but too surely convinced him that all his hopes were dashed to the ground, and that it was indeed but too true that Helen had consented to become the wife of another. There could be no mistake in the affair, or the slightest loophole for escaping an entire and complete conviction of the faithlessness of her in whom he had so deeply confided for his future happiness. The blow appeared to fall upon him with a stunning effect, and for some time he seemed to be quite incapable of thought or action. But Jack Pringle rallied him upon this state of things, and tried hard to induce him to view the matter with the same kind of philosophy that he would have brought to bear upon it. "'Come, come,' he said. "'Don't be downhearted about a woman. Cheer up, my lad. There's many a better fish in the sea than has ever yet been got out of it. You may depend upon that.' I could have staked my life upon her good faith. Likely enough, and so can we all upon the good faith of the woman we happen to love and admire. But what is there in the old wide world so common as being jilted by a wench? And when it does happen, a man should whistle her down the wind, and forget her all at once and for ever. I have no doubt, said James Anderson, that such is good philosophy. But it's a hard thing to tear away from the heart at once an image that has lain enshrined in its inmost recesses for many a month. Perhaps it is. But the best remedy in all the world is to look about for another. I know that from experience in these matters. You do so, and you will soon be able to forget the girl who has jilted you." James Anderson shook his head and smiled faintly as he said, "'I fear I should never love another as I have loved her. The heart, when once it has loved, as I have loved, can never know another feeling. I cannot with any hopes of success undertake such a mode of cure as that which you point out to me." "'Oh, you will think differently in a little while, I can tell you. Time does wonders in these cases, and before you are a month older you will be in quite a different frame of mind to what you are now." "'I must confess I should not like to be all my life the subject of never-ending regret. But at the same time I do feel that, let what chances may befall me, I shall never feel another disappointment so bitter as this." James Anderson, upon making these few remarks, showed a disposition to drop the subject, and as it was one which certainly concerned himself more than any one else, Jack Pringle and the fisherman both agreed to say no more about it, and it rested. But although he said nothing, the matter was far indeed from being absent from the mind of James Anderson, for it occupied him wholly, and engaged his attention to that extent that all other thoughts were excluded therefrom most entirely and completely. Those who had afforded him so kindly a shelter were not unobservant spectators of the state of his mind, and Jack Pringle strove to move him from it by calling his attention to his obligations and duties in other respects. "'Come, messmate,' he said. "'Ain't it time you should think of going to London to make your report of how you lost the dispatches that your captain committed to your care?' "'It is so,' said James Anderson, "'and I shall start this evening.' "'That's right, and the best thing you could possibly do, I can tell you. You will get some new appointment, and in the bustle of life you will soon forget all disappointments whatever. If you go regularly into the service, you are young enough yet to rise in it, and you may yet live to have a pair of swabs upon your shoulders, I can tell you." "'At all events,' said Anderson, "'I can have the comfort of knowing that I have, by being wrecked here, made some acquaintance which I hope I may always have the pleasure to retain. I feel myself now quite well enough to walk, and I will go into the town and make some preparations for getting on to London which I am by your liberality, Mr. Pringle, enabled to do." Jack made a wry face as he said, "'Whatever you do, Miss Mate, don't call me Mr. Pringle. 
My name's Jack Pringle. It always has been Jack Pringle, and always will be. I begin to think as something must be the matter when anybody calls me Mr. Pringle, and I don't like it a bit. I won't again then offend you by calling you Mr., but you shall be Jack Pringle if you like to me, and I can only say that a more esteemed friend than yourself it is not likely I shall ever encounter in this world. Jack was always much more easy under censure, let it come from where it might, than under praise, and consequently he fidgeted about in a most alarming manner, while James Anderson was professing to him his grateful feeling, and at length he said, "'Belay there, belay there, old fellow, that will do. I don't want any more of that, I can tell you. It's a damned odd thing that a man cannot save a fellow man's life without it being at all sorts of odd times thrown in his teeth in this way. Don't say any more about it. I ain't used to being persecuted. This was no affectation in Jack Pringle. On the contrary, it really was to him a positive persecution to be praised, and as James Anderson now felt fully convinced that such was the case, he determined upon avoiding such for the future. Towards the dusk of the evening, having attired himself as respectably as the wardrobe of the old seaman and his son would permit him, for his own clothing had been completely spoiled by the salt water, he proceeded to the town of Anderbury. By so proceeding, Jack Pringle considered that his principal business would be to get some means of quick conveyance to London. But James Anderson had another motive in his walk to the town, which he communicated to no one. That motive was a strong desire to see Helen Williams, if he possibly could, before he left, in order that he might hear from her own lips what it was that prevented her continuing her plighted faith towards him, for he could not, from all he knew of her character, bring himself to believe that it was the wealth of her new suitor that had had any effect upon her. No, no, he said, I know her far better than for one half instant to do her such an injustice. She must have been imposed upon with some account of my death, or some artful and well-arranged tale of, perhaps, faithlessness upon my part has hurried her into the acceptance of the first offer that has been made to her. If I could but obtain an interview with her, for a few brief moments I should know all, and either be able to take her to my heart again, or to find ample reason for forgetting her. He knew the way well to that house where he had frequently watched Helen enter and emerge from, but how to send any message to her was a matter which required great consideration. He had been absent long enough, no doubt, for some changes to have been made in Mrs. Williams's household, so that although there had been in old times a servant who was favorable to him, and who would not only have taken his message to Helen, but would have told him all the news of the family, she, no doubt, had long since left. After thinking over the matter for some time, so as to come to a conclusion that the difficulty about getting any message or note delivered to Helen almost amounted to an impossibility, he saw a boy come out of the house, apparently to go on some errand, and with a feeling more of desperation than reflection, he spoke to him, saying, "'I think you came out of Mrs. Williams's house, my lad.' "'Yes, I did,' said the boy. "'What of that?' Hit one of your own size. I haven't done nothing to you. You mistake altogether, my boy. I am not going to touch you. You may depend. But on the contrary, I will reward you if you will answer me what questions I shall propose to you, and I assure you they are all such as you may honestly answer. Well, I don't know. How much? One shilling for every question. That's a rum way of doing business, but it ain't so bad either. Ask away, and you shall soon see how I'll earn the shillings. Is Miss Helen going to be married? Yes, a shilling. Who to? To the Baron Stalling mare and a salt bug. Two shillings. Will you take a note from me to her, if I reward you extra for so doing? Oh, I begin to smell a rat. Yes, I will. You is some of the lover you is. Three shillings. I am. One shilling. What do you mean? Why, my young friend, if I pay you a shilling a question, I don't see why I should not charge you at the same rate. So don't ask me anything, and then you will get all the shillings to yourself, you understand? Oh, I doesn't see any joke in that. I don't want to ask any questions, not I. What will you give me for taking the note? 
I think I ought to have, have a crown, between you and me and the post, because, you see, if old Mother Williams was to catch me, she would serve me out pretty tidy. You shall have your own price of half a crown, and here is the note which I charge you mine to deliver into no hands but those of Helen herself. Oh, I'll do it, and what should I get if I bring you an answer back? Another half crown, so you see. You will make a very good evening's work of it, indeed, if you are clever and faithful. Give me the note, I'll do it. You may always trust me when there's anything to be got by it. My father brought me up to get my living, and he used to say to me, Caleb, says he, always do your duty, Caleb, to those who employ you when you go out to service in a family, unless somebody offers you something more not to do it. Quite a philosophical maxim, said James Anderson. I suppose you are in the service of Mrs. Williams. Yes, I am page of all work I am. I do a little of everything, and make myself generally useful. Where will you wait for me? At this corner, and with a due regard to performing your part well, be as quick as you can on your mission, for I am rather impatient to see its results. Caleb, the page of all work, duly promised to be quick, and after completing an errand that he had been sent upon by Mrs. Williams, he returned to that lady's house. We cannot help thinking that after the principles in which Caleb had announced he had been brought up, it was rather an indiscreet thing of Anderson to trust him with a note that he had already prepared for Helen, in case an opportunity should present itself of getting it delivered to her, but he was desperate, and perhaps he did not so accurately weigh the pros and cons of the affair as he undoubtedly ought to have done. As it was, however, he had a faith in his messenger which we are sorry to say was most decidedly misplaced for Caleb did show that he had not forgotten the lessons of his paternal relative, but that, on the contrary, he was disposed to carry them out with great tact and perseverance. Whether or not he would of his own accord have set about scheming in the matter we cannot say, but at all events he was spared that trouble, for Mrs. Williams had seen, from one of the windows of her own house, his interview with one who was a stranger to her, for although she had once, before he went to sea, seen James Anderson, he was much altered, and she did not recognize him, and when Caleb came in she called him into the parlor and shut the door. Caleb, she said, I insist upon knowing immediately who you were talking to just now in the street, and who gave you a note. Caleb was rather staggered at this home question, for he did not think that Mrs. Williams had seen him, and after a moment's pause he said, What will you give me, missus, to know? Give? Give? How dare you ask me such a question? It's no use, missus, getting in a passion about it. I've got an opportunity of earning eight shillings, snugly and comfortably. If you'll give me sixteen shillings, I will tell you all about it, and I don't mind saying beforehand that I know, missus, as you won't think it dear at that price, no, nor at three times as much, if you could only guess what it was. Sixteen shillings? It must be something wonderful in the way of news that I would give you such a sum for. That's just what it is, missus. Come now, is it a bargain? Because I'm in a hurry, and I've got never such a load of things to do. Well, well, Caleb, tell me what it is, and give me the note. Not till I have the money, missus. Oh, no, I knows better than that. I've got to hold on the fellow as you saw me with, but I haven't on you. Oh, no, the deuce a bit. I must have the cash first, and then you shall have the information, and I'll tell you again that it ain't dear at the price as you will own yourself. The curiosity, as well as the suspicions of Mrs. Williams, were strongly excited, for she began to suspect that something or other was going on in which her interests were involved, inasmuch as upon mature consideration she had come to a conclusion that there was more in the visit of Admiral Green than quite met the eye. Well, well, she said, I have only gold in my purse, but you shall have the amount you may depend, Caleb, if I promise you. I haven't a doubt in the world, said Caleb, but there is nothing like ready money, missus, so just hand us a sovereign, and here is four shillings change, which will be right, you know, all the world over. This was vexatious, but as it was quite clear that Caleb had thoroughly made up his mind not to part with his information without the cash, Mrs. Williams was compelled to hand the amount to him, which she did not do with the best grace in the world, and then she said, Now, I expect you to tell me all. 
"'So I means, missus. "'You don't suppose I'd take sixteen shillings of you, "'and not tell you all as I have to tell you? "'No, missus, I'd scorn the action. "'Well, well, don't keep me in suspense, "'but go on at once.' "'I will. "'There's a chap at the corner of the street "'as wants me to give this here letter to Miss Helen, "'and bring him back an answer.' "'A letter to Helen? "'This is news indeed. "'And who was he?' "'That I don't know. "'I was going to ask him, "'but somehow or another "'I found out it was a great deal better left alone. "'But I should not wonder, missus, "'but you will find out who he is, "'if you read the note. "'People, you know, usually put their blessed names "'at the end of their letters, "'unless they send what is called a synonymous one.' "'This was a good suggestion of Caleb's. And Mrs. Williams, without the smallest scruple as to the fact of opening a letter addressed to another person, tore asunder the envelope that covered young Anderson's epistle, and read as follows, in a sufficiently audible tone, to enable Caleb to hear every word of it, for in her intense eagerness she forgot the fact of his presence. "'Dearest Helen, I can still address you as such, because I have not yet heard from your own lips.' although I have from the lips of others that you have forgotten me. Can it be true that you are about in the face of heaven to plight those vows to another which were to be mine and mine only? I ask of you but to meet me, and tell me yourself that such is the case, and you will meet with neither persecutions or reproaches from me. Tell me that you are oppressed, and you know well that in me you have a defender, Name your own time and place of meeting me, and by the boy who will deliver this to you, let me beg of you, by the memory of our old affection, to send me an answer, yours ever, James Anderson. I say, missus, that's pitching it rather strong, said Caleb. End of chapter 113 Recording by Barony Fourteen of Varney the Vampire, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barony. Varney the Vampire, Volume Two, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter One Hundred and Fourteen. Mrs. Williams's maneuver to get rid of Anderson. This exclamation from Caleb informed Mrs. Williams of the fact of his presence, and duly indignant was she at that circumstance, for in her anger she immediately rose to execute upon him some vengeance, and had he not adroitly eluded her by leaving the room, there is no doubt she would have well made him remember indulging in such a piece of impertinent curiosity. "'That wretch!' she exclaimed, "'has overheard me, and who knows now that he may actually go and tell the other? If he would betray him, he would betray me, and what redress should I get for such a circumstance?' This was a mental suggestion, which made it necessary Mrs. Williams should not only look over the fact of Caleb having stayed to listen to the letter, but likewise see him, and hold out some other inducements to him to be faithful to her, however he might choose to behave himself to other persons. "'Caleb,' she said, when she had summoned him again into her presence, "'Caleb, you may deep and I will make it well worth your while to attend to me in this affair, and to no one else. I can, and will, pay you well, and when the Baron marries Miss Helen, I dare say, if you would like it, I should be able to get you some great place at Anderbury House. Well, missus, said Caleb, I looks upon myself as put up to auction, and the highest bidder always as me. I don't mean to say but what you have done the right thing, as regards the sixteen shillings, so what would you like me to do next, missus? I want you to take a note back, in answer to that which you have brought me, but of course the young man who gave it must suppose that it came from my daughter, Helen. How much? What do you mean by how much? How much am I to get, I mean? Oh, I understand you. How much do you expect for such a piece of service? Something handsome, I should say. What do you think of ten shillings and sixpence, missus? I think it rather high, Caleb. But nevertheless, I shall not stop at a trifle in rewarding you, provided always I may depend upon you. Money down, said Caleb. 
"'You know, short reckonings make long friends, missus. "'Besides, it's always better not to let these things accumulate, "'for if we goes on doing business in this here sort of way, "'it will come to a good bit in a short time, "'and then you would think it was too much and wouldn't like to pay it.' With a bad grace, for Mrs. Williams never liked parting with her money, she produced the sum which Caleb required for this new service, remarking as she did, "'Well, Caleb, you will soon grow rich if you go on this way.' "'Likely enough, ma'am,' said Caleb. "'I likes to be paid, and I don't see why I shouldn't.' Mrs. Williams soon handed him the note, which merely contained the words, "'Come at eight o'clock and ring the doorbell.' These words she wrote as much as possible in her daughter Helen's hand, and having sealed up this extremely laconic epistle, she handed it to Caleb, directing him to go at once and deliver it to the party who was expecting him, and we must say that this lad appeared to be one of the most thoroughly selfish rascals the world had ever produced, for he was now quite willing for money to betray Mrs. Williams to James Anderson if there was any likelihood of his accomplishing such a purpose with safety. But here some difficulties presented themselves, which Caleb's natural acuteness enabled him very well to see. In the first place, James Anderson, he shrewdly suspected, was not the sort of individual to be trafficked with, as Mrs. Williams was, and, considering that he had already committed an immense breach of trust in giving the letter to Mrs. Williams instead of to Helen, he thought, and we are inclined to think correctly enough, that it would be rather a hazardous thing to say anything to him about it. No, no, he said. I'll just give him Mrs. Letter, and then back out of the whole affair, for I don't half begin to like it. That young fellow looks a chap that wouldn't mind wringing one's neck for one, for half a pin, so I'll just leave him alone and say nothing more about it. James Anderson waited round the corner with considerable impatience for in consequence of the proceedings that had taken place at Mrs. Williams's, Caleb had been considerably delayed. When, however, he saw him coming, hope again sprung up in his bosom, and he felt all the agitation of extreme pleasure as he saw that Caleb had in his hand what was undoubtedly a letter. When the boy reached him, he advanced to meet him, eagerly exclaiming as he did so, "'You have the letter, you have seen her, and you have her answer.' Now, as Caleb had made up his mind to commit himself but as little as he possibly could with the young stranger, he went upon the good old adage of the least being said the soonest mended, and accordingly, instead of making any remark which might at a future occasion be thrown at his teeth, he satisfied himself by placing his finger by the side of his nose and nodding his head sagaciously. He then handed to James Anderson the letter, in the contents of which that individual became too much absorbed, short as they were, to pay any further attention to the messenger. Caleb thought this a good opportunity of being off at once, before any troublesome questions should be asked him, so he made a retreat with all the expedition that was in his power. James Anderson, when he looked up from the perusal of the one sentence which the letter contained, was astonished to find his messenger gone considering how very eager he had before been on the subject of the reward which he was to get for that service. "'What can have become of the boy?' he said. "'I had a hundred questions to ask him.' So well had Mrs. Williams succeeded in imitating the handwriting of her daughter Helen, that James Anderson was fully convinced the letter was written by the chosen object of his heart. He certainly did think that it was cold and distant, and that there might have been a word or two of affection, at all events, in it, especially considering how long he had been absent, and with what an untiring affection he had ever thought of her. "'She might have told me that her heart was the same,' he murmured to himself, "'or else she should have let me know at once that it was so altered I should not know it for the same. But still it is something to look forward to an interview with her. She may not have had the time to write any more, or perhaps she may have doubted the messenger, and thought it unsafe to utter anything concerning her real feelings in this epistle. Thus, hoping and trying to persuade himself of the best, did James Anderson anxiously expect the hour when, by the note that had been sent him, he expected once again to look upon the face of her, the remembrance of whom had cheered him in many a solitary hour, and enabled him to bear up against evils and misfortunes which otherwise had been insurmountable. It wanted but a very short time to eight o'clock, 
and at five minutes before that hour James Anderson walked, with trembling eagerness, up the steps of Mrs. Williams's house-door. His hand shook as he placed it upon the bell-handle, and told himself that the time was come when all his doubts would be resolved, and he should really know what he had to hope, or expect, or to fear. There was certainly a something weighing heavily upon his heart, an undefined dread that all was not well, and during the interval between his ringing and the opening of the door he felt all that sickening sensation which is ever the accompaniment of intense anxiety, and which renders it so fearfully painful a feeling. The door was opened by a female servant, who had received her instructions from Mrs. Williams, so that she knew exactly what to say, and without waiting for the visitor to announce himself, she said, "'Are you Mr. Anderson, sir?' "'Yes, yes,' he said. "'Then I am ordered to ask you to step into the back parlour.' "'All is right,' thought James Anderson. "'She expects me, and has prepared for my reception.' He followed his guide implicitly, for he fully believed, as who would not, under the circumstances, that she was in Helen's confidence, and so could be safely trusted. She led him into the back parlour, where there was no one, and then she said, "'If you will be seated for a few minutes, sir, my mistress will come to you.' "'Her young mistress, she means,' thought James, and he prepared himself to wait with what patience he could assume and that, under the circumstances, was by no means a large amount, for he had been kept in such a constant worry by what had occurred, that suspense became one of the most agonizing feelings that he could possibly endure, now that his fate was about so nearly to be decided. It was no part of Mrs. Williams's plan to keep him waiting, for she certainly had no fancy for retaining such a customer in the house as James Anderson. For, playing the double part that she was, she knew not what sudden accident might happen to derange her plans, and probably render them completely abortive. For all she could tell, Helen herself might actually descend the stairs, and enter that very room where she hoped a short conference would suffice to get rid of the troublesome claims of James Anderson for ever. She was in the front parlour when he was shown into the back, for they communicated by folding doors. She had but to open these doors and at once show herself to the astonished Anderson, who little expected on that occasion to behold the mother instead of the daughter. He gave a sudden and violent start of surprise. But as Mrs. Williams had determined to do the dignified, and to call herself quite an injured person, she took no notice of the evident agitation of his manner, but said, with an assurance that only she could have aspired to, "'May I ask, sir, under what pretense you write notes to my daughter at such a time as this? Notes which appear to me to be highly calculated to do her some serious injury, and consequently, which I cannot but think are intended for that precise purpose.' "'Mrs. Williams,' said James Anderson, "'since it appears that I have been betrayed, and that the messenger I perhaps foolishly trusted has delivered to you instead of your daughter the note I addressed to her, I have only to say, I beg your pardon, sir, said Mrs. Williams, interrupting him, but as it was from my daughter I received your note, you may spare yourself the trouble of blaming the lad whom you had to seduce from his duty by bribes and corruption. From your daughter? Yes, sir from my daughter, and I flatter myself that there is too good an understanding between my daughter and me for her to keep as a secret such a circumstance." This was a very unexpected blow to James Anderson, a blow indeed which he was totally unprepared for, and yet, although he doubted, he had no means of disproving what Mrs. Williams chose to assert in the matter, and she quickly saw the victory she had gained over him, and the difficulty in which he found himself. Sir, she said, if you have anything more to add to what you have already said, my daughter desires that you should inform me of it, and if it consists of such matter as she can properly take notice of, she will reply to it by letter. But she most unhesitatingly declines an interview, which she considers cannot be productive of anything but unpleasantness to all parties, and most of all to her, considering her peculiar situation, and that she is so soon about to alter her condition and become the wife of the Baron Stolmurer of Salzburg. 
"'I'll not believe it,' said James Anderson, "'unless I hear it from her own lips. "'I suppose, sir, when you see it announced in the County Chronicle, "'you will believe it?' "'That,' said James Anderson, "'it never will be, for I cannot, will not, dare not think "'that one whom I have loved so well could be so false.' "'False, sir? What do you mean by that? "'I shall really have to speak to the Baron "'if you use such expressions towards his intended wife.' "'I'll speak to the Baron,' said James. "'And that in a language he shall understand, too, if I come across him. "'If you threaten, it will be my duty to inform the Baron, "'so that he may take such legal steps as he may be advised. "'I repeat to you, Mrs. Williams, that I will not believe it, "'and since you force me to such a declaration, "'I have no hesitation in saying that I think you are quite capable "'of selling your daughter to the highest bidder.' and that the baron you mention probably occupies that unenviable position, a position which no gentleman would for a moment wish to occupy, and which he perhaps is not fully aware of. I will see him, and explain to him, that there are prior claims to the hand as well as to the affections of your daughter." This threat rather alarmed Mrs. Williams, for she thought it possible that, if the baron really found there had been a former lover in the case, probably much encouraged by the lady, he might think his chances of happiness rather slender, and decline keeping the engagement which she considered was so suspiciously commenced. This might or might not be the result, but at all events it was worth consideration, and placed the matter in rather a serious light. Therefore was it, then, that Mrs. Williams determined to have recourse to her last expedient, and that was the production of the written promise to marry the Baron which it will be recollected in the excitement and impulse of the moment she had succeeded in procuring from Helen. "'Well, sir,' she said, "'since you will not be convinced by any ordinary arguments, and since you doubt my word in this matter, I shall be under the necessity of adopting some means of explaining to you the matter fully, and of showing you that there is abundance of proof of what I have asserted.' "'Proof, madam! Nothing but an assurance from Helen herself can come to me in the character of proof in such an affair as this. Let me see her, for the mere fact that you sedulously keep her from me involves the affair in a general aspect of suspicion. Read that, sir, and if you know anything of the handwriting of her whom you affect so much to admire, it ought to resolve your doubts." James Anderson took the paper in his hand, and glanced upon it and by the sudden change that came across his countenance as he did so, Mrs. Williams saw that it was having all its effect. He could not doubt it. He knew that signature too well. He had it to some affectionate documents, which he felt would remain by him to the latest day of his existence. It was, indeed, a horrible confirmation of all that had been told him, such a confirmation as he had never expected to see, and which at one blow dashed all doubt to the ground. "'Now, sir,' said Mrs. Williams, with a triumphant air, "'I trust that you are satisfied, at all events, of one fact, and that is that my daughter had consented to become the Baroness Stormure of Salzburg, and without at all entering into the question of anything which may have passed between you and her upon other occasions. I think you ought, as a gentleman, to perceive that the sooner you go away, the better.' "'It is enough.' said James Anderson. Falsehood, thy name is woman. I really can't see, sir, what you have got to complain of, for people have a right to alter their minds upon the little affairs of life, and I don't see, then, wherefore they should not have a similar privilege as regards something of more importance. Enough, madam, enough. What steps I may hereafter take, upon a due consideration of these affairs I know not, but now I bid you farewell." Mrs. Williams was very glad to hear these words, or rather the last of them, because she was in a perpetual dread during the whole of the interview that something would occur by which a meeting would take place between James Anderson and Helen herself, at which some very disagreeable explanation might take place. It was a wonderful relief to her when he had left the house and she heard the street door close behind him, and she drew a long breath when such was the case, as she said to herself, "'Well, thank the fates that job is over, and what a good thing it is, 
there is no knowing what mischief might have been the end of it, if it hadn't been stopped as it has. He is not a bad-looking young man, and if he had had a few thousands a year, I certainly should not have made any objections to his being my son-in-law. But I positively cannot and will not have poor people in the family. There is no end of trouble and bother with them, and instead of getting your daughters off hand, it's just taking on hand in addition some man for their amusement." James Anderson went sorrowfully enough back to the fisherman's cottage, where he related to the sympathizing old seaman what had occurred. For Jack Pringle was not there, and if he had been, James Anderson knew very well he would have got no sympathy from him on account of the circumstance for the frailties of the softer sex did not seem to have any material effect upon Jack Pringle or his sympathies, since by his own account he had been jilted so often that he now thought nothing at all of it. End of chapter 114 Recording by Barony Chapter 115 of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cole McKinnon. Varney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 115. The Return of the Resurrected Man and the Robbery at Anderbury House. The morning after the occurrence that took place in the Bone House of Anderbury, broke dimly and obscurely over the ocean in the neighborhood of that town. For leagues away, as far as the eye could reach, there was a haziness in the atmosphere which the fresh wind that blew did not dissipate. There was a white light rising on the horizon which did not cast a warm glow over the bosom of the ocean as it sometimes does. It was dull, cold, and cheerless. There was nothing that could be called beautiful. The waves dashed about and came tumbling over each other, their crests now and then covered with foam, which was swept off by the fresh breeze that blew over the ocean. It was just daylight. There was not in the landscape save the water and the sky, nothing else to be seen for miles. Yes, there was one object, and that was a boat washed to and fro by the waves as it sat on the bosom of the sea, wafted hither and thither as the waves impelled the boat, which appeared to be empty for no oar was used, and no human form was visible. But that boat, so lonely and left to its own guidance, or rather that of the waves, contained a living being. It was he who had striven so hard to escape from the baron on the preceding evening. He sat alone in the bottom of the boat. He was fatigued. He was shivering from the cold. The great exertion which he had undergone were followed by a reaction, but he knew not where he was, or in which direction to pull, or where the shore lay. How long he lay in this helpless condition it is not known, but he occasionally lifted his eyes upward and across the sea to watch which way the vessel sail, and if any should come in sight. The scene was one of singular desolation and dreariness, in which nothing could be seen that could cheer the eye or gladden the mind of a man. Now and then, to be sure, a gleam of sunlight would cross the dreary water, but it seemed to enliven only a small spot, and that but for a very short time, for it soon again became obscure. There was the dreary ocean, with its leaden color sky, and the boat at the mercy and direction of the wind and waves, both of which seemed in no placid humor, though not absolutely squally. A vessel from Cherbourg with brandies, for the port of London, was sailing direct for the mouth of the Tim, making for the foreland where it would have to round the point, and then enter the mouth of the river. There were three or four men and a couple of boys on board. When they came near the boat, boat ahoy! shouted the man on the lookout. Boat ahoy! No, no answer was returned to the shout, and the men on board shouted too, and crowded to the side of the vessel to see what was going on, and who was in the boat. The captain came up. He had been in the cabin, but hearing the shout, he came on deck to see what was the matter. What is the matter? inquired the captain, looking around. Boat on the starboard, said one of the men. Nobody in it, I think. She seems to be drifting. The captain looked at the boat for some minutes attentively, when one of the men said, "'Perhaps some wreck, and the boat has been swept away by the waves, or the crew hadn't time to get into her, or something of the sort.' "'No,' said the captain. "'She's not a ship's boat. A shore boat. That's what it is, lad. She got washed out, or somebody's drowned, upset, or rolled out.' "'Something of the sort, I dare say, sir.' "'Well, 
and we needn't heave to for her. She's no service to us, and we can't spare the time. I think there's someone in her. But the boat's drifting, said the captain. But she's coming this way, and that will be the easiest way to ascertain the truth of our conjectures. And they steered the vessel as to meet the boat, which the sea was beating towards them and in about twenty minutes, or half an hour, they came within a couple score yards of the boat, when they could plainly perceive that someone was sitting in the bottom of the boat. Aloha! shouted the captain. Boat ahoy! Ahoy! The man who was in the boat looked up, and seeing the vessel, he answered the cheer. Throw him a rope, said the captain to one of the men who were standing by. A rope was made fast to the vessel, and then it was thrown by a strong arm to the boat, and came right athwart it, and was immediately made fast by the man who was in it. He then began immediately to haul up the rope, and so draw his boat up alongside of the vessel, and then he came on deck. How now, shipmate, what do you do out at sea in such a cockle-shell as that? Nothing, replied the other. Nothing? Well, you have come a long way to do that. What induced you to come to sea, or were you driven out, or how was it that you came here? I was driven out against my will, replied the man. I was rowing about shore when I fell asleep, thinking myself safe, having secured the boat, as I believed, safely enough. Aye, aye, said the captain. And so you found out when you awoke your mistake. I did. My moorings had broken away, which was only a boat hook and a rope. The tide coming up lifted the boat hook out, and I have been out to sea ever since, and I don't know where I am. Why, that must have been last night, said the captain. Last night it was, said the stranger. You have been to sea all night, then, added the captain, taking a long gaze at the stranger. Indeed, I have, and I am quite cold and hungry. I had nothing with me. I rode sometimes in hopes of getting to shore again. Well, that is about the fact. You must be about fifteen miles out at sea, said the captain. You are a long pull away from shore, I can tell you, and how you will get back again, I don't know. But at all events, you are a very queer-looking fish, and I suppose your being out at sea all night, and no stores, makes you look as you do. Though upon my soul, I don't know what to make of you. But you mustn't starve. Here, lad, bring up some coffee and broiled pork. Can you eat any? Thank you, said the unfortunate being. I can. I have been out for many hours. Well, sit down, or rather go below and eat. When you have done, come up, and we will tell you where the land lies, though I don't know how you will keep it in sight for the life of me. The man went below, where there was some coffee royal made for him, that is, coffee and brandy, and some salt pork was given to him, of which he partook most plentifully, apparently, while the captain muttered to himself. Well, of all the odd-complexioned shore-going sharks as ever I saw, you are the oddest. If I should think he was a wholesome, there's a great deal of the churchyard about him. There isn't a very agreeable look about him, said one of the men, but I suppose he has been so much frightened that he looks more like a vampire than anything else. Aye, or a revived corpse. Yes, sir. But that arises from his being so terrified and starved, as well as fatigued, exposure all night, all added together, has almost changed the current of his blood. The man came up now, having had sufficient provisions below, and had expressed himself much gratified with the coffee royal to the cook, who in his own mind thereupon declared that he must be a Christian after all, though he had obtained by some means the complexion of a white negro. And now, said the captain, if you like to go with us to London, you shall go with us, for, as I said before, we cannot run into any port before we get there, for the wind is favorable and strong. I would sooner get back by means of my boat, replied the man, if I were sure of making land. You might, if you could keep in a straight course, but there is the difficulty. You cannot do so very well without a compass, and that you have not got. No, indeed, I have not, though with it I have no doubt of being able to reach the land. I have, said the captain, a small one below, a pocket compass. You shall have that, and see what can be done, and if you get ashore it will have done some service at all events. I shall be greatly obliged for your kindness, said the stranger, but I am wholly at a loss to know how I shall ever be able to repay your kindness. Say nothing about that. We who get our bread upon the sea know well the risks we all run, and therefore do not mind lending a hand to each other when in distress and trouble. 
"'I will endeavour to save someone else in your line of life, if I cannot you,' replied the stranger. "'And if so, if it be possible, make some return. "'Ay, that will do, mate. Do a Christian's charity to any one whom you may come across, "'and I shall be well paid for my trouble.' The boat was now brought up alongside the vessel, and before the stranger embarked, the captain said to him, as he held the compass in his hand, "'You must place this compass on one of the thwarts of your boat, shipmate. I will. A precious vessel she is for a voyage out of sight of land. But never mind, you are safe enough, unless the sea was to come and roll you over. But that's neither here nor there. Mind you, keep your boat's head to the northwest, and by doing so, you'll make land at the nearest point from where we now are. Thank you, said the man. Moreover, you must pull as to keep her head in the direction I tell you. It will be too long a pull for you to get there by rowing. You would get too tired to keep your seat, and you are unused to it, too. I am obliged to you, said the man. If I get to shore safe, I shall be under great obligations to you. You will have saved my life. I have ordered enough biscuit and grog and cold beef to last you till night. You will get to shore before that time. I have every reason to believe. In five or six hours you ought to get there. But in case of accidents, there is enough to last till night. You have loaded me with the obligations. Say no more. Be off with you, and pull away from the vessel as quickly as you can, for we have slackened our speed for you. Farewell. A pleasant voyage to you, said the man. Good-bye, and good luck go with you, replied the captain. Keep to the northwest, and all will be well. Push off, and keep your eye on the compass. The man did as he was desired laid the compass on one of the thwarts, took the oars in his hands, and began to row away with good will. The crew of the vessel crowded to the side and witnessed the departure of the boat, and when she was a few hundred yards off, the sails were spread, and the vessel ploughed through the waves, leaving the boat behind, a mere speck on the sea, diminishing each moment. But yet, while the boat was within hailing distance, the captain said to the crew, "'Give him a cheer!' He may meet with a score of accidents before he reaches shore, any one of which will be sufficient to destroy him. The crew obeyed, and gave a loud shout to the boat, and the captain added his own voice. The cheering huzzah reached the boat, for the occupant elevated his oar and returned it. The solitary cheer was borne. However, they gave him one cheer more, and then pursued their way over the trackless water. The boat perused its course for some distance until it was too far from the vessel to be seen, and then, slackening his pace, he contented himself with merely keeping the boat's head in the direction which he had been told, and in which he knew the land lay. There was no hurry and desire to reach the land, but merely to keep where he was, and when any vessel hove in sight, he pulled so as to keep clear of her and out of hail, and there were a great many who passed near him, and would have aided him had he required any but that did not seem to be his object. Midday was past, and the sun began to decline towards the west, when the boat was gradually brought nearer and nearer in shore. Not only was the shore visible, but the very houses might be counted, and yet he would not come ashore. It was about sunset that the provisions, which were given by the captain of the vessel, were now consumed, and that while they were being eaten, the occupant of the boat sat still with his eyes fixed upon the town, which was every moment becoming hidden by the approaching denseness of the night, and at length could not be distinguished, save by the existence of numerous lights that shewed the precious position in which it lay. Darkness now came on, and nothing was to be seen on the ocean whatever, and he remained yet longer at sea. But at length there was no danger of being noticed. He gradually rowed his boat in shore and secured it. Then jumping ashore, he wandered about the town from one place to another, and, finally, he determined to make his way to Anderbury House. There is at least plenty of everything there, he muttered, and, though there are plenty of servants, yet in so large a place there is ample room to secret oneself, and plenty to be had for the trouble of taking it. He came to a small public house, which he entered, with the view of resting a short time, and of ascertaining what was going on in the town. There were several people seated in the public room, and he now seated himself up in one corner of the room, unobserved by anybody. "'Well, well,' said one, "'there is more than one strange thing of late that has happened. The Baron has given some very handsome entertainments.' "'Aye, so he has,' said one. 
and more than that, they say he's going to keep em till he gets a wife, though I cannot tell why he should leave them off then, because women like that sort of thing too well to make any objections to its being carried on after marriage. The baron is very right if he carried it on then, he would be watched by his wife, who would take good care to rate him for any attention he may pay to any of the ladies, and therefore it would only be keeping up the means for being scolded to keep up the balls. Aye, it would only be getting into hot water, and keeping the kettle boiling on purpose. He would, said another man, merely be keeping the entertainments on for the purpose of showing off his wife and her self-will, as well as her power over him, and showing them all how she could rule a man. A very favorite pastime with married women, who when they have a partner who don't like fighting and quarreling, and who does love peace and quietness, know how to give it to him. I think better of the baron who, I think, is a man who wouldn't stand much of that. Ay, you don't know what a upus tree a woman can be when she pleases. Well, said another, the strangest thing that I know of is the loss of Bill Wright's boat. Oh, what was that? I have heard something about it, though I can't say I have heard the rights of it yet. What was it all about, eh? Why, he says when he went to bed he left his boat safe enough more to another boat and afloat, Bill says he'll swear she couldn't get clear without help, but she did get clear, and there's nothing to be seen of it now, at all events, and poor Bill's in a devil of a way about it, too, I can tell you, and good reason enough. Yes, Bill will scarce be able to get another boat unless some good friend should give him one, and that is scarcely likely, I think, as times go. There's no ball at Anderbury House tonight, I believe, said one of the visitors. No one that I know of. No, there is none, said another, because I know of several who have got leave of absence, so they are short-handed there, and they would not be so if they had anything particular going on, for the baron does things handsomely. So he does. The stranger listened to all this conversation very quietly for some time, muttering to himself, and That is well. It will suit my purpose very well. I will go and see how the land lies in that quarter. I have objects in view, and some of the valuables to be found there, at all events, will aid my projects, and assist in my comfort, and I may as well have them from there as anywhere else. Besides, I know more of that place. It suits my taste to do so, and will be somewhat in the shape of revenge." Calling for his reckoning, which he paid, he left the house and proceeded towards Anderbury House. It was now nine o'clock, or a little later. No one was about, or scarcely any and those few the moving figure endeavored to avoid. He turned out of the usual path, and walked over the fields and unfrequented ways, keeping near the hedgerows until he came to the bounds of the grounds of Anderbury House. Here he paused, and bethought himself the best means of entering the house unseen and unsuspected by any one, else his object would be defeated. However, after a few moments' thought, he determined to proceed, and, for that purpose, he made for a spot where the fence was low and ran by some trees that had been cut down and grew bushy. Having reached there, he, by aid of the branches, contrived to get over into the grounds, and then made his way swiftly towards a plantation that ran up close to the house, and by means of which he hoped to reach the house, and perhaps to enter it. Silently he made his way into the plantation, and just as he reached it, he saw the moon rise in the east. It was just rising above the horizon. Thanks, he muttered, looking towards the luminary. Thanks you did not appear before. But now you are welcome, for I can keep under the cover of trees. And the deeper the shadow, the safer I am from observation. This was right enough. The moon rose full, but not bright, for some clouds seemed to intervene, or rather some thin vapors, which gave her a strange color and at the same time increased her apparent size. But she rose rapidly, and as she rose that would wear off, and she would resume her silvery appearance and usual diameter. He was now safe in the plantation, but at the same time it would require some caution not to be discovered, for at times even the plantation formed beautiful evening walks, in which many of the inhabitants of Anderbury House had indulged at various times and especially when there was what was termed a family party. On a moonlit night, when there were several members of the family who knew the grounds well, 
then they would find ample amusement in wandering about. However, there was no such parties on this evening, and as it followed he ran no danger. Lightly, therefore, he crept forward, making no sounds, save as such it was impossible to avoid. The footfalls upon dried leaves, the crackling of sticks, and the rustling of the smaller undergrowth when he came in contact with it. "'How shall I be able to pass the open spaces I know not?' he muttered. "'But I have passed worse spots than this, and I may be pretty confident I shall succeed in escaping detection on this occasion. However, it shall be tried. There are few who are about. All is quiet and still. The very watchdogs are quiet and asleep.' He crept onward now until he came within some hundred and fifty yards of the house itself, when he paused and listened, but hearing nothing, he again came forward and approached within a few score yards of the house, when he was suddenly arrested by the sound of voices. He paused and listened. It was a female voice spoke near. She was evidently speaking to a man. "'Now, William,' she said, "'do you believe you can get into the house without making any noise?' I am sure of it, providing you leave the window open and the rope there. Yes, yes, I will. Well, that room is empty. Pull off your shoes and creep out of the door. Don't let it bang together, or it may alarm someone. Yes, yes, I'll take care. Well, then, remain in the passage or room until I come to you. But should you be disturbed, you can hide yourself in any of the closets, or go upstairs, which will bring you to the floor on which my room is. I will take care, but don't forget the rope, and leave the window open. I'll not forget. I'll throw the rope on one side so as to hang among the vine leaves, so it will not be detected by any one accidentally coming this way, though that is very unlikely indeed. I understand. For the matter of that, I think the vine is strong enough to bear me without the rope. I would not have you make the attempt, lest you fail and are killed, William. Be sure you do not make the trial. What a thing it would be if you were discovered! and all were to come out, I should be ruined. Never fear that. I will take care, both for your sake as well as my own. Then good-bye. Some words were then uttered in a whisper, the import of which he did not hear, but it continued for a minute or two, and then the female said, Wait here a few minutes, and you will see me come to yon window, and let down the rope, and then be gone as quickly as you can. Never fear for me. I will wait here until I see you at the window and then I will leave. The female figure he saw glide quickly away, and he watched until she was out of sight, and then he watched for the signal also. He could see the form of the male figure, who stood with it about three or four yards from the spot where he was concealed. Then after a time he saw the female figure come to the window indicated by her, and then throw the rope out of it, and cause it to hang down by the side, or among the leaves of the vine, so that it could not be seen except if it were looked for. When this was done, and the figure saw the female had withdrawn, he turned from the spot and walked hastily away further in the plantation, and when he was quite out of hearing, and the stranger could no longer hear his footsteps among the dried rubbish in the wood, he walked cautiously forward to the edge of the grounds, and then gazed up at the house and listened carefully to ascertain if there was any sound at all indicative of the vicinity of a human being. Hearing none, he assumed another attitude, and prepared to make a dart forward for the window, as he muttered, The coast is clear, and it will be hard, indeed, if I do not now succeed. Once in the house I will soon secure myself, and the contents of some of the baron's drawers, and some of his gold will be mine. Again, taking a cautious survey, and, being perfectly satisfied that he was unobserved, he dashed across towards the root of the vine, and in a moment more he had seized the end of the rope. But he heard the sound of footsteps. What to do he could not tell, but he sprung up a few feet and buried himself among the leaves of the vine, which were very luxuriant. The footsteps were heard closer and closer, until he could perceive the very female who had thrown the rope out of the window stop within a few inches of him, and then seize hold of the rope he had been about to seize. Her object was to ascertain if the rope was low enough to be reached, and when she had adjusted it to her mind, she exclaimed in a low voice to herself, "'Ah, that'll do. He will find it easily, I dare say, and it will be all right. Nobody will see it.' Having satisfied herself of that, she left the spot and returned the very same way she came. It was an awkward situation as any one could well indulge without discovery. "'It was a very narrow escape,' he muttered. "'I had no idea of her coming back in that way. 
I never dreamed of such a thing. But no matter, I believe I am quite safe now. If not, I shall have some other escape. She must have been next to blind not to see me. However, he got down, and then pulled down the rope straight, and, by the help of that vine, he then pulled himself up to the window, into which he speedily got and found himself in an empty room. Here he paused, to ascertain if he could hear any one moving about. But he heard nothing, and at once proceeded to feel his way cautiously along to the door which he approached with cat-like step. Opening the door he paused to listen, before he ventured into the landing to which it opened, but finding the coast clear, he went through that, and then into the next room, which was apparently a storeroom, being filled with a variety of things of miscellaneous character, and which were only of occasional use in the house. And this he closed, and went upstairs, where he came to a suite of servants' bedrooms, and thence he walked about from room to room, until he came to a portion of the house he recognized, and then he made direct for the baron's own room. There he muttered, I am likely to meet what I want, and the carpets are soft and give no noise. I can sleep for a short time if I will. He made at once for the baron's sleeping room, which he opened and entered. It was empty, and he at once closed the door, and then made an instant search about for a place of concealment, and having found one, he began to make a search for some other matters that were not of the same, but a more valuable character in the market. However, he found out the drawers and depositories, but he was unable to open them because they were locked, and he must wait until the Baron had gone to sleep, and then, taking his keys, he would be able to help himself without any difficulty to what he most desired. He had scarcely made this determination before he was alarmed by the footsteps of the Baron as he ascended the stairs. This produced a necessity for instant concealment, and he was immediately flew to the spot which he had chosen, and scarcely had done so before the room door was opened, and in walked the baron himself, who brought in a light with him. He remained walking about some time, examining a variety of matters, but appeared as though he never intended to go to sleep. There was every probability of his discovering the place of concealment, which was easily done, had he but turned his head or moved his hand under certain circumstances. But as fortune willed it, the Baron did not. It was near an hour before the Baron sought the repose he might have taken, but for the dominion of the spirit of restlessness. And it was even then some time before he fell into a sound slumber, apparently being engaged in deep thought. However, he did fall asleep and the tongue of Morpheus spoke loudly, like some human beings through the nose, and then it was the hero of Anderbury churchyard stole from his concealment, and began to examine the chamber. Where are his keys, I wonder, he thought. He must carry them about him, but he must have left them somewhere in his clothes. And if I can obtain and use them without making any noise, it will be fortunate. He found the keys, though not without making a slight jingle with them but that caused no motion on the part of the baron who lay snoring in his bed he stole to the drawers and the key fitted he quickly unlocked it and drew it open fortune befriends me he muttered at that moment the baron turned in his bed and heaved a deep sigh and appeared for a minute or two restless as if on the point of waking up the intruder however stopped short in his depredations and paused and then crouched down least the sleeper might open his eyes and by momentary glance detect him. Suddenly he spoke, but indistinctly, very indistinctly, and yet loudly enough. The stranger stared. He thought himself detected, but he found that the baron was only dreaming. He drew nearer to him and listened to what he said. Ha! sighed the baron. She is very beautiful, very beautiful. Ha! Her form and face are perfection. He paused and again went on, but too indistinctly. A word or two was heard plain and left now and then, but it was impossible to form any sense of them. They had no connection with one another. She is very beautiful, again muttered the baron in his sleep. She is lovely, amenable, what a wife! Then he fell into a train of half-mumblings from which nothing could be gathered. Heavens, what a prize! exclaimed the baron, and again he relapsed, but appeared more composed and quiet. I would he were nine fathoms deep below the level of the sea, muttered the robber, and then I should not be bothered by him. Sleep or let it alone, he exclaimed between his teeth. It would be almost safest to kill, and yet one cry might bring the whole household upon me. 
Turning to the door, he ascertained that it was locked. He turned the key, and in doing so made a noise with the lock, which had the effect of causing the Baron to start in his sleep. "'What was that?' he muttered in sleepy accents. "'I thought I heard the door go. But it can't. I locked it. I remember very well I locked it.' After this speech he fell fast asleep. "'Another escape,' muttered the intruder, who rose from his crouching posture, and setting the door open, so that he could, in case of an accident, make his escape from the room. Then he again turned toward the drawers, and began to help himself to the contents, when he accidentally struck the keys, which fell with a clash to the floor. In an instant the Baron started up on his elbow, and pulled aside the curtain to see what was the cause of the disturbance. In a moment the light was put out, and the intruder had assumed a motionless posture, but it was too late to escape the quick eye of the Baron, who instantly jumped up, exclaiming, as he laid his hand upon a pistol, which he had under his pillow, and cocked it. "'Ah! Robber! Assassin! Stand or I fire!' The sound of the cocking pistol was quiet enough. It came distinctly to the ear, and suggested the idea of more than ordinary danger with it and he dashed past, heedless of the command of the baron, who called upon him to stand. The baron fired, and in an instant the house was filled with a stunning report, which echoed and re-echoed from room to room, filling the inmates with wonder and alarm. The sensation produced by the sound was of that description that can hardly be described. To be awakened from a sound sleep by such a dreadful, stunning report, which carried such a sense of danger with it, that they remained in an alarming stupor for nearly the space of a minute, until indeed they were aroused by the shouts of the Baron, was rather terrifying. Hardly had the stunning and deafening report died away, when the Baron leapt from his bed to ascertain if the shot had taken effect. The intruder heeded not the commands, or the shot of the Baron, for he dashed out of the room at his utmost speed, making his way towards the lower portion of the house, that offering great facilities for escape. The Baron, as soon as he had recovered from his first surprise, jumped out, and seizing a heavy cane that was lying across one of the chairs, he rushed after the flying figure, shouting and calling to his people to get up. "'Robbers! Thieves!' he shouted. "'Here, help! Help secure the robbers who are in the house!' The intruder made for the lower stairs but was closely followed by the baron, who could just see the dusky form of the object of his pursuit before him. But now in the lower rooms, where there was no light at all, the shutters being up, he missed him. The robber had taken advantage of the darkness, and doubled upon his pursuer, and hastened upstairs, with the view of reaching the place where he entered. In doing this, however, he was met by one of the men who was coming down. There was no time for deliberation, and he dashed up regardless of the blow the man aimed at him, who said, "'Here you are! Here goes one for him. As, however, the battle is said not always to be with the strong, so in this instance was he unable to accomplish his object, for the blow, by the agility of the robber, was evaded, and the result was that the serving-man was suddenly whirled down the stairs, and being once on the descent, he did not stop until he got to the bottom. "'Murderer! Murderer! shouted the unhappy individual, as he rolled down the stair after stair, until his cries were stilled by a violent concussion of the head. In the meantime the stranger rushed upstairs at a headlong speed, until he attained the landing which led to the room, at the window of which he entered. Securing the door behind him, and then getting out of the window and seizing the rope, he began to descend very rapidly, fearing he would be intercepted by those below. He slipped down the rope rather than let himself down, and before he had got halfway down, he met with an impediment, which, however, quickly gave way, and they both came plump down to the earth together. "'My God! My God!' exclaimed a man's voice, in great terror and tribulation. "'What's that? What's that? Mercy! Mercy! I didn't mean to do any wrong!' The stranger heeded not the words of the terrified swain, who it would appear had begun to ascend to reach the dormitory of his fair but frail one, when his flame was so unceremoniously quenched in the way we have related, but dashed away from the spot, and was speedily lost in the plantation, whither the unfortunate individual, when he had sufficiently recovered his senses, and released his head from the imprisonment of his hat, soon after betook himself, thankful the affair was no worse. End of chapter 115
Chapter 116 of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cole McKinnon. Varney the Vampire, Volume 2. By Thomas Prescott Priest. Chapter 116. Jack Pringle falls in love, and has rather an unhappy adventure with a bull dragon. Jack Pringle, like other men, was subject to the vicissitude of the passions, which placed him under a certain string of circumstances that produced results quite at variance with those which are usually anticipated when an individual enters upon the pursuits of the tender passion. Indeed, Jack could see nothing at all unhappy, or in the least degree unfortunate, in the black eyes and rosy lips of Susan, who was most certainly the maid of the inn though not in precisely the same rank as the one alluded to by the song. He had taken up his residence at the inn, had Jack. Indeed, he was partial to inns in general. There was usually a greater latitude permitted there than elsewhere, not only each one being allowed to accommodate himself as he pleased, but he could always have what backy and grog he chose to order, as long as there was a shot in the locker. This being the state of affairs, Jack found another inducement to stay where he was, and that was the existence of the before-mentioned Susan, who appeared to be as kind as she was good-natured. She never refused to answer Jack's call, and when she came, she always said, "'What did you please to want, Mr. Pringle?' "'Mr. Pringle,' thought Jack. "'Well, that sounds pretty from such a pair of lips.' Jack scratched his head, and turning his quid in his mouth, was often lost in admiration and forgot all his wants at that moment, and it was not until the question was more than once repeated that Jack was aware that he really did not want anything, especially as his grog was not all gone. "'Well,' exclaimed Jack, looking at the glass, "'I forgot. But never mind, Susan. I'll have another can whilst this is going. So I shan't hurry you. I wouldn't hurry you, Susan. No, that I wouldn't.' The course of true love never did run smooth. That is, we know, a rule that is as old as the hills, but then it is of constant reoccurrence, and one that may be fairly presumed always will, to the end of the world, and possibly after. However that may be, Jack was not without a rival, and one of a very formidable character. Not that Jack valued him a piece of rotten yarn. No, he never did think anything of a landsman, especially a soldier, for it was to that class this rival belonged. Susan, said Jack, as he sat in the kitchen, watching the various evolutions to which the hands of Susan were applied, in the performance of her multidinious duties. Well, Mr. Pringle, said Susan. Ah, said Jack, and there was a pause, during which Jack forgot to even chew his quid, and was quite abstracted in a manner and thought. He had intended to say something, but it had quite escaped him, and it was difficult for Jack to hold his thoughts as it is for countrymen to hold a pig by the tail when this latter member was well greased, and when it was of the description usually denominated a bobtail, a common occurrence. "'What did you say, Mr. Pringle?' said Susan, bustling about. "'I am sure you were about to say something.' "'Well, I suppose I was,' said Jack. "'But I don't know what it was now. Perhaps you do. How should I know that? I can't tell what you're thinking about. What made you think that?' because your black eyes seem to go through me, Susan, like a forty-two-pounder. I tell you what, you ought to know what I want to say, because I'm always thinking of you. Are you, though? Yes, I am, said Jack. You're a light craft, a rare pretty figurehead you'd make. Lor, Mr. Pringle, said Susan. Well, you would, though, and I'll take three dozen and never wink, if there's one to be found half as handsome in the whole British Navy or in any other. To think, said Susan, that I should be called a figurehead. Well, I declare, I never heard the like. Why, what will you say next? I never thought that of you. Why, said Jack, who was very much bewildered, and didn't know precisely what to say, the turn the compliment had taken was one he couldn't understand. Why, you see, Susan, the figurehead is the beautifulest part of the ship, except maybe her rigging, her portholes, her sides, and her trim. But then, you see, them things ain't no matter of likeness to anything human, especially you, Susan. Ain't they, Mr. Pringle? Well, you know best, but I dare say it's all right, for you must know best. But my cousin says I am more like the Venus de Medici than anything else. Jack stared. 
Who? he inquired, with his eyes opening very wide. The Venus de Medici, said Susan, speaking in a very slow, emphatic manner for Jack's behoof. Don't know her, said Jack. I'll go bail there ain't such ship in the navy. There never was such a thing heard of unless some of them dem French craft. But your cousin ought to be well caught for saying you were like anything French. Why, you are true blue, and no French about you. Is there, Susan? I don't know. But I never heard there was, and I don't know if there is. But that's what he said, and he's been a long way. Who is he? said Jack, laying emphasis upon the last word, to indicate that the sound was displeasing. Oh, my cousin! Well, but who is your cousin? inquired Jack. Have you seen him very lately? Yes, I saw him this morning. His regiment is quartered only a few miles from this place. Oh, said Jack, he's a soldier then? Yes, he is. A horse soldier, added Susan. A horse marine. Ah, I know em afore to-day. They are a rare lot to lie and gallop away. But Lord bless you, they never lay alongside an enemy till you've beaten him. No, no, they can't do that. He'll be here to-night, said Susan. You shall see him, Mr. Pringle. He's coming all this way to see me. To see you, said Jack Pringle, who was much displeased with this piece of particular attention in the cousin, and he could not help saying so. But he is my cousin, said Susan, and you know one cannot refuse to see one's friends and relations. Besides, he has been at all times very kind and good-natured to me, so that I cannot do otherwise than to receive him kindly. Oh, to be sure, said Jack, by all manner of means, only we must understand each other, Susan. There can't be more than one captain aboard at a time. How very odd you do talk, Mr. Pringle. My cousin will ask you what you mean. Will he now? said Jack. Well, he may do so if he like, but my lingo will be as good as his, I am sure. But we shall see him, however. But, Susan, you don't care anything about him, you know. Not a bit, Mr. Pringle. Only as a cousin, you know. Oh, very well, said Jack. I don't care about that a bit. But if it so be you're going to carry on any games, you know, why, I won't stand it. Oh, honor, said Susan, looking tenderly at Jack. Honor, you know. Do you think I could be capable of doing so? No, I never do anything unbeknown to a person. No, I say, let all be fair and no preference. Well, said Jack, but I want all fair. But I should have no objection to a little preference, too. Don't you give no preference to me over a soldier, Susan? Don't know, said Susan. But she gave a look towards Jack that made him suspend the libation he was about to pour down his throat. Oh, I see how it is with you, Susie, said Jack, becoming more familiar and pleased. For Susan's black eye had a magical effect upon Jack, and he felt as if Susan must love him as much as he loved Susan. Her eyes told him more than her tongue. Jack was quite sure of that. When is he coming? said Jack. Tonight, said Susan, and you must promise me you will be very quiet and civil, and then you shall see him, only you won't take any notice of what he says or does. No, no, said Jack. It's all right. I understand. I won't quarrel with him. No, not even if he were to. But splinter my mainmast, if I could stand that. Stand what? inquired Susan demurely. Kissing of you, said Jack, striking the table with his fist so as to make the glass that happened to be there tremble. I couldn't. I could stand the cap first. Lor, Mr. Pringle, who asked you to do so? I am sure. I would not do such a thing. What? said Jack. Why, to let him kiss me, to be sure. Jack looked, perhaps felt, electrified, and after a moment's pause, took his quid out of his mouth, hitched up his trousers, and then seized Susan by the waist, and gave her a kiss. It was a kiss, such a one only as a man of war's man could give. It went off like the rapport of a pistol. Lord, Mr. Pringle, said Susan, I thought she were quite another sort of man. What would my cousin, the dragoon, have said if he had seen you? Dear me! You must have alarmed the whole house. I didn't think you were going to make so much noise, though. A footstep approached, and the landlady thrust her head in, but Susan was busy, and Jack was chewing his quid, as grand as an admiral. Susan? Yes, ma'am, replied Susan. What's the matter? Don't know, ma'am. 
Didn't know there was anything wrong at all, ma'am. I thought I heard a plate smash just now. Are you sure you haven't broken anything? Yes, quite, ma'am. Oh, said the landlady, I certainly thought I heard a smash. But I suppose it was a mistake altogether. However, I am glad of it. There, said Susan, when she had gone, I told you how you had alarmed the place. Well, said Jack, who felt much abashed at what had happened, I didn't make so much noise either. But never mind. The evening came round, and with it came the dragoon, as fine a specimen of military dress, discipline, and riotism as can well be let loose upon a decent community, and Susan met him in the passage. Ah, my pretty Susan, said the son of Mars, the star of my destiny and the hope of my heart. While I wear spurs, I will love you ever dearest. Oh, come, none of that nonsense, you know, Robert. It won't do. You say too many fine things, you know. Of course I do. But I can say them without occasion. No. As well might you want day without daylight, the moon without moonlight. You inspire me, you see, and without you I couldn't say anything. I dare say not, replied Susan. You are such a man that you make one believe what you say. You ought, since I speak the truth and nothing else. But come, come, we'll go in. I want to talk to you, Susan. I came on purpose to see you. There's the barmaid in the plow and gooseberry bush, quite sulky because I didn't stop there. But I know I promised you I would come, and so I would be as good as my word. Are you sure she was sulky? Certain, because she did would not say good-bye. Well, but now I want to speak to you about something I want to explain. Explain, my dear. I'll explain anything that can be explained. I don't mind what it is. You'll never find me backward in coming forward with any amount of explanation that you can by any possibility require. That is not what I want. I have a cousin here. I, I'm not particular. I will pay her every kind of attention. I am sure you will acknowledge I am not wanting in any attentions to you. Oh, dear, no. But it is not a female cousin that I want to speak to you about. Indeed, I can't tolerate another. Yes. But you must. He's just come from sea, and is a very odd man, but an uncommonly good-hearted man. So don't take any particular notice of what he says or does. I don't mind him a bit, not the value of a pinch of snuff. Yes, but you must do that, only don't do anything to vex him. You can be pleasant company when you please, I know. And so I will. To please me you will. For though I don't care anything for him more than if he were my brother, yet he's very fond of me. That's no recommendation to me, said the dragoon. A spoony anchor buttons? I suppose. You must be civil to him, or I will never see you any more. Well, then, my charmer, I will say anything you like to the salt-water fish of yours. But he mustn't lay hands upon you. If he should do so, why, I should be obliged to chastise him. But he's a man of war's man. And I'm a man of war myself, my dear. Lor, said Susan, upon which she turned her eyes and faced towards the dragoon, who could not let such an opportunity slip, and he immediately saluted her in true military style, but he did not commit the same offence that Jack Pringle did, for the former told no tale by the report. It was all quiet, and he followed Susan until they came to the room in which Jack was sitting. This is Mr. John Pringle, she said. Aye, I said Jack. Here I am, Jack Pringle, a floater on shore, all the same. And this, continued Susan, is Mr. Robert Swabham. How do you do, said Jack, Mr. Swabham? I dare say it is so, but since we are to be shipmates, we may as well be friends. How do you do? Pretty well, I thank you, Mr. Pringle, very well indeed. Hope I see you quite well, and at home? Yes, quite so both ways, well and at home. The devil! Yes, we call him Davy Jones, but then I suppose you have one on purpose, in your line. Why, there's a little of the devil in us, that is pretty well admitted on all hands, and that's as much as we have any wish to have in way of connection with the gentleman whom you name. Aye, aye, maybe you'll know more of him afore you are done. But no matter, sit down, Messmate, we can discuss a can of grog, I reckon. Yes, easily. I can do my duties in any point, friends. You may best please. Facing an enemy, drinking a can, or kissing a lass, what more can you say? 
I can do the same myself, as some I know can testify, if they chose to speak," said Jack, who gave a sly look at Susan, but at the same time she nearly fell a-laughing, when reminded of Jack's tremendous smack, which the landlady mistook for a smashing of crockery. "'But how so, member?" cried Jack, who had relapsed into a grim smile. "'We'll have a can together.' "'Very well. Susan, will you do what is needful for us? If the landlady would allow me, I'd wait upon you and do all your work. And a pretty boobery, said Susan, she would make of it. You would soon get discharged for tasting the grog on its way from the bar to the parlor. Ah, well, I might get in trouble if I did that. What do you say, friend Jingle? Pringle, said Jack. Ah, oh, ah, Ringle, I have it now distinctly. Why, you swab, said Jack in a rage. I ain't got so nickshaw names as them. Mine's quite different altogether. So say what you like. My name, said the soldier, ain't swab, but swab em, at your service. Ah, said Jack, whether swab or swab em, it don't much matter. We all must fill our place. Some are luckier than others, though they might be cousins. Cousins? Curse cousins, say I. Same here, said Jack, and then they both stared at each other believing each other's cousins to Susan, though not to each other. "'I am glad you are here,' said Susan. "'I have the grog for you. It's extra strong. I know, because I put some more into it. I turned the tap on into each, and she didn't see me do it. Ah, Susan, I see you have a great regard for me. But it's not more than you ought when you come to consider how I respect you,' said the soldier. "'The same here,' said Jack, who thought this pretty good for a cousin. I admire Susan. She's got such eyes and such cheeks. So she has. They are like diamonds set in roses. That they are. Yes, said Jack, and it's soft as velvet. Damn, said the soldier. You beat me a hollow. I say, messmate, where did you learn to fire your great guns off in that manner, eh? Where, said Jack, putting the can down? Why, where there were men to fire into us again, I'll warrant you it was none of your field days, where people are tearing their hearts out to look fine. No, no, the lee scupper ran with the blood, and every heart was a true British sailor's. Well, that was good, but when I served on foreign service, there was no getting out of the way of danger, behind a wall, stone, brick, or wooden. No, nor even laying on the ground. We had not even that, for as we fought we destroyed the very building which supported us, and we had the spirits of the sea to contend against us, as well as the dangers of the fight. Oh, it's all very well, said the soldier, but danger's danger, and there's an end of that matter. Only I wish there was no such thing as bad grog. That's a great evil. Why, what do you think we did at Portsmouth the day after we landed? The landlord gave us bad grog, and how do you think we served him? Why, we made him drink it till he was so drunk he couldn't lay down without being afraid of falling, and then we cut his hair all off. Well, I recollect a place in Portugal where they brought us some wine which we couldn't drink. It was horribly thin and sour. We had in vain asked for better, but none was to be had in our building. Indeed, we felt sure there was better, and we determined to have it. We called our landlord and told him we were resolved to ruin him if he didn't bring it up. We would have better wine, but he protested he had not got any. Now we were resolved to search, and accordingly we did search until we came upon some beautiful wine, some of the best port ever I tasted, and we made free with it. At all events, we drank as much as we could drink, and then fell fast asleep, and forgot to punish our landlord for the rascality. But I suppose he was well aware of what he deserved, for he endeavored to excite some of the peasantry about to murder us while we were slept, and when we awoke we found ourselves surrounded by a dozen men. There was but three of us, but we were armed, and the peasants had nothing but miscellaneous description of weapons, old guns, swords, and clubs, but they were not the men we were. Well. It came to a hard fight. More blows were struck, however, than did any mischief, because we could make use of our tools, and fought so hard that they were glad to leave us victors. Lord, said Susan, you don't mean that, do you? I do indeed, but that was nothing. I frightened a whole regiment of the enemy. Eh? said Jack. What's a whole ship's compliment, eh? Well, that will do. Go ahead. You beat all the cousins as ever I've heard of, if you don't never mind me. That is all about it. A good yarn, well spun, is worth a glass of grog at any time. Well, I'll tell you all about it, 
It's sooner told than done, I can tell you. But never mind. Susan, don't be frightened. It's all past now, though it was true. But the best things must have an end, some time or other, and this had one too. I was serving in Spain. I fought against the French then, and though I say so, you may depend upon it, I took my chances as well as any other man. However, I had many inclinations to go a step or two beyond my strict duty, and do more than I was obliged. But what of it? If you succeed, you are sure to be rewarded. And I wanted, if I could, to capture a pair of colors, which would give me a step in my regiment. Charge, my brave boys! shouted the colonel, as the enemy appeared coming down upon us. There were three or four to one, besides a reserve at a short distance, but we thought nothing of that. We had every reason to believe we were outnumbered, but that was all, and we drove hard at them. It was a glorious sight to see us full tear at the heavy armored cavalry in squadrons, but they had the advantage of weight and number of men. Yet our shock was so great that many of the enemy were thrown out of their saddles, and many more were killed. We hewed and hacked at each other for some time, until, in fact, the enemy began to give way. As soon as we began to find out that, we urged our horses on, and ourselves to strain our utmost, and we forced them back, and they began to turn about in right earnestness, and show us their heels. Unfortunately for us, there were no other troops at hand to support us. I say unfortunately, for while we were engaged in beating a larger force than our own, and which even then outnumbered us, we were taken in the rear by the reserves, and many men were cut down before our men could be called off. Among those who were taken prisoner was myself. I had received one or two severe wounds, which were indeed considered mortal, but which were not so dangerous as they were believed. However, as I kept my saddle, I was taken prisoner, indeed. I was unable to offer any resistance. My eyes were filled with blood. "'Lor, how dreadful!' said Susan. It was dreadful to think of it then. But I did not. I was too much occupied with my desire to do my duty, so heated and excited to think of anything about it. I was dragged away. Then what became of me? I don't know, but I have some recollection of having a cloak thrown over me and I rode away in company with them. I know we went away very fast, for they dreaded another charge of our men, and they had succeeded in escaping and reforming, and they were hovering reinforced upon our march. Well, that night, as I was deemed too badly wounded to give them any trouble or attempting to make an escape, they let me lie in a stable. I fainted away, and, after several attempts to restore me, they left me as a hopeless case but it was no matter to them, they didn't grieve. I wondered in my own mind as to the reason of their doing so much, but I suppose it was that prisoners were at a premium with them at that time, and they were anxious to return as large a number of prisoners as possible, and, upon the principle which induced the elderly dame to attempt emptying the sea with a teaspoon, that every little was a help, they thought that if I lived I should be one more, and where the numbers were small, one was of importance. They gave me up as a bad job altogether, and after they had racked up their horses, they sat down for the evening to their meat and their wine. They had been all conversing together, but they were about to lie down and have some sleep, when suddenly I woke from my trance, and walked out without at all knowing what I did. The men stared at me, and shook like so many aspens, but did not stir till one of them said, A ghost! A a ghost! This had the effect of clearing the place, for they all jumped up and ran away from the spot, leaving me master of the place, and judging that I was alone, I very soon made my way back to the quarters of the English, and got to the quarters of my old regiment, where I was kindly received, my comrades having given me up and lost. Well, said Jack Pringle, you were very nearly gone, certainly, though you weren't quite a ghost, but that ain't half so bad as a fire ship especially in towing a fire-ship among the enemy. I was once on an expedition of that sort when I was in the Mediterranean. Lor, a fire-ship! What's that? inquired Susan. A shipload of fire, with lots of combustibles, said Jack. It's a thing that won't do for a plaything. 
Well, the enemy had several, and as we came up to them, we found they had the wind in their favor, and the first thing they did was to put out several of these fire ships. But the wind was not direct for them, it was shifting. Well, we were ordered to man the boats, and tow the fire ships back again amongst the enemy. Well, you may be sure that they didn't like that, especially when the fire ships blew up. They did so with a dreadful explosion, setting fire to friend and enemy, and blowing them out of the water. This we did, and as we towed the vessel along, we were fired at, at a pretty smart rate, I can tell you, why the very sea seemed to boil around us. Lord, said Susan, how dreadful! Why, it's horrible here when the pot boils, and heaven knows what it must have been there. Why, I am sure, I wonder how you escaped being scalded to death. Why? Some on em did get killed, said Jack. My starboard man was shot through the head, and one or two more went on an errand to Davy Jones. It was lucky for them, said Susan, that they were set out of the way when there was so much danger going on around you. I am sure I should have been glad. Maybe so, said Jack, turning his quid. But I know this. Them as was sent up on the errand never came back any more. They stayed away altogether, many of them becoming food for the sharks. However, we towed away, and the breeze shifting, we got pretty well among them, and then we left the fire ships where they ought to be, among the enemy. Well, we had a hard pull to get back, there being five or six ships firing broadside after broadside at us, but they never hit the boat. The other boat they did hit, and a shot went clear through her, and she went down in the deep water. And what became of the poor men that were in it? inquired Susan, horrified at the detail. Some on em were drowned, and some were saved, said Jack. But we had scarcely reached our own vessel when the fire ships blew up, setting fire to and damaging several of the enemy, who were near at hand, and covering the sea with bits of burning timber, and many fell into the ships, setting fire to their rigging, and knocking men on their head, and doing a world of mischief besides. "'Goodness me!' said Susan. "'What a dreadful thing to be sure! I should not like to be near a fire-ship. At all events, Mrs. is quite a fire-ship here.' There were but a few observations to make. Jack thought he had quieted the dragoon, and had given him a dose of salt water, and moreover Jack ogled the maid of the inn in such a way that speedily brought the military hero to a sense of his danger. So curling his moustache with his finger, he said, "'Well, it's all very well talking of the dangers of the sea, but it's nothing to a storming party.' "'A storming party? What's that?' inquired Susan. "'Why, I'll tell you, my dear, and then you'll know all about it. You see, when we were at the siege of Bang Powder, "'Never heard of such a place,' interposed Jack. "'What's the bearing of that outlandish place?' "'Oh, never there, eh?' said the dragoon contemptuously. "'Then you don't know it. Talk of danger you should have been there, and you would have known what danger was. However, I'll enlighten your ignorance. You must see, Susan, my dear, that at Bang Powder we were very little use in the way of assisting the siege, except that we acted as outposts foraging parties, and kept off the light troops of the enemy when they shoot themselves, while the infantry set to work in the trenches to work the guns. They did work them above a bit, too, for weeks together there was firing day and night, on our side and on theirs, so the air was never without a strong smell of gunpowder, which you might smell for twelve leagues quite strong. Lord, said Susan. "'Smash my timbers,' said Jack Pringle, "'if ye ain't a come in it strong this time.' "'Well,' continued the dragoon, taking no notice of what was said, "'well, that was nothing. That was a mere trifle. After some weeks' firing, we made a hole in the wall, which increased day after day until big enough for a man to enter. After that a storming party was ordered. But, after more than one attempt, our men gave it up as a bad job. Our captain, being a daredevil sort of fellow, and not liking to see men beaten back, said the breach was practicable and could be entered. This was denied by the officers and men who had been defeated, and he said if his own troop would volunteer, he would undertake to enter the place. This was told us, and we all at once volunteered to follow him to the devil, if he chose to go. He at once informed the commander-in-chief, and we were ordered to mount the breach. To do this we of course dismounted and went on foot. 
There was some little excitement upon this manner, but we were cheered as we passed, and when we arrived within a few yards of the wall, we were met by a tremendous fire of all arms. This, however, did not daunt us, though it thinned our ranks and we were less in number. But up the breach we went, one man at a time. Six of them, one after another, were knocked over dead as herrings. Well, the men began to look blue over this. They wouldn't have minded rushing on in a body, and giving and taking till they all died. But to get on top of a brick wall, one at a time, to be shot at, why it was more than they liked, especially as they had not struck one blow, or fired a single shot in return. "'Hurrah, lads!' said I. "'I'll have a shine, now. Come on, follow me quick!' I jumped up and cleared the wall, though a thousand bullets were fired, and got over clear without a shot, save one that shaved some of my whisker off. We all got over, and soon after were followed by some of the other regiments, and the place was our own, but we were nearly stripped naked. Oh, Lord, how was that? inquired Susan, interested. Why, we had so many narrow escapes that our clothes were all shot to shreds. Goodness! Oh, but it is true said the dragoon rising and going out of the kitchen. In a few moments afterwards Susan left it also, and Jack, after turning his quid and squirting the tobacco juice on the floor, rose and hitched up his trousers with a preliminary, damn, left the kitchen also. But he hadn't gotten far when, oh, horror, he perceived Susan in the arms of the dragoon, whose moustache lips more than once met hers. Sink the ship, muttered Jack. Here's a pretty go, the black-looking piratical thief!" But Jack's peace was soon held as he listened to the assignation which Jack was determined he would keep himself to the discomfiture of the dragoon. Having made up his mind upon this point, he returned to the kitchen, and Susan also, in very few moments. But Jack pretended to be asleep and wouldn't speak to her, because he thought she hadn't behaved well in this affair of the dragoon. He was resolved, however, in substituting himself for the soldier, or at all events, of making a row. The time came, and Jack stationed himself upon a position where he could with ease lift the dragoon into the water butt below, in case he offered any opposition to the substitution before named. The moment came round, and the dragoon was seen slowly and cautiously mounting the way to the window of Susan. It was a kind of leads just above the water butt, accessible by means of some wooden steps. Avast there, said Jack, when he got up to the level with the top. What do you do there? What is that to you? inquired the dragoon. A great deal, replied Jack. But you don't come here. I heard all about it. But I tell you what, you ain't come in here at all events. But I am. Don't attempt, or I'll sink you. I will by all that's good. So keep back and go away. I'll see you dead first, said the dragon. I have mounted a worse breach than this before today, but I suspect there isn't much danger here. He ran up and soon faced Jack, who seized him round the waist, would have lifted him up in his arms, and could have thrown him into the water butt, only Jack's foot suddenly slipped, and he fell down, the soldier upon him, who in an instant regained his feet, and rolled Jack over and over, until he came to the water butt. Into this Jack went head first, and kicked and floundered about, and if the water butt had not been very rotten and gave way, letting all the water escape, it is very doubtful if Jack would not have found a watery grave in the confined space of a water butt. As it was, he was more than blind and breathless, and sat down in the midst of the water on the stones to recover himself from the immersion he had undergone. End of chapter 116「Chapter 117 of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cole McKinnon Varney the Vampire, Volume 2 by Thomas Prescott Prist Chapter 117 The Proposal of Jack Pringle to Take Anderson to the Wedding 
A circumstance now occurred which soon enabled Jack Pringle to console himself for the misadventure he had had, which he was delighted to think was not known to any of those persons with whom he came ordinarily into contact. The pleasant circumstance to which we allude was the reception of a letter from the Admiral, and by the mere fact of his writing such an epistle to Jack, it would seem to be perfectly true that he really felt unhappy without the companionship of that worthy. The letter was to the following effect. Jack, you mutinous rascal, your leave of absence has expired, and you know you ought to have a round dozen when you come back to your ship, but as it turns out you may stay where you are, for a reason that I am going to tell you. There is to be a wedding at the very place where you are staying, between some odd fish, a barren something, I don't know who, but as we have been all invited, we are coming down to the whole lot of us, and shall arrive on Thursday, so you may look out from the masthead as soon as you like, and you will see us coming with all sails set. No more at present from your vagabond, you know who. What an affectionate letter, said Jack. I know the old fellow couldn't do without me long. He's quite an old baby, that's what he is, and if I wasn't to take a little notice of him, he would be as miserable as possible. Helloa, what cheer? Have you come back?" These last words were addressed to James Anderson, who at that moment made his appearance in the cottage of the old seaman. He, having just left the house of the Williamses, after the painful interview which he had recorded took place between him and Mrs. Williams, during which she had succeeded in convincing him that all his hopes, as regarded Helen, were crushed completely. The appearance of deep dejection that was upon his countenance was such as to convince Jack Pringle the nature of the business he had been upon, and he cried, "'Come, come, cheer up, man. I guess now you have been looking after that sweetheart of yours, who is no better than she should be.' "'I have indeed,' said James Anderson, "'been to extinguish all hope. Nothing now lives in my breast but despair. I shall proceed to London at once, to make a report to the Admiralty, as it is my duty to do so, and, after that, I care not what becomes of me.' "'Stuff, stuff,' said Jack. "'I have got some news for you. My old Admiral, that I take care of, has had an invitation to the very wedding, as I take it to be, of your old sweetheart. What? Is it possible? Do you mean an invitation to Helium Williams's wedding? With the Baron Stolmer of Salzburg? Yes, I do. That's just what I do mean, and no mistake. Here is the letter which he has written to me to go, and I think I shall let the old fellow, for it will amuse him. Just read that." Jack handed the Admiral's letter to James Anderson which he read with a great deal of interest, and when he had concluded he said, "'Mr. Pringle, a sudden thought strikes me.' "'About ships,' said Jack, and begin again. I told you before not to call me Mr. Pringle. I cannot stand it. Call me Jack, and then go on telling me what your sudden thought is.' "'Well then, Jack, my sudden thought is this, that your friend, the Admiral, might be induced, upon your representation, to let me join his party and I would take care to conceal my features and general appearance, so that I should not be known, while I had the mournful satisfaction of taking a last look upon that occasion of her who I have loved, before she becomes irrevocably the wife of another. If you wish it, said Jack, it shall be done. I'll undertake there shall be no objections on the part of the Admiral. And as for the Bainsworths, they are a good sort of people, and would do all they can for anybody, I am sure. I should take it as a peculiar favor, for although I feel now that my hopes are blasted, and I can have no possible expectation of beholding her with eyes of pleasure, I still wish to look upon her, that I may see if anything of regret is upon her countenance, of if she has quite forgotten the past. Say no more, said Jack, but consider it as done. I'd take care, though, if I were you, that she did not find me out, for I wouldn't let the finest woman that ever breathed no, not if she was seven feet high and as big as a hogshead. Fancy that I cared so much for her as to go to her wedding after she had jilted me. She shall not see me, said James Anderson. She shall not see me, you may depend, for without doubt the guests will be very numerous, so that I can easily keep myself in the background, and look upon her face without her being at all aware of the presence of such a person at the ceremony. Yes, you can manage that. And, if I were you, just as I was going away, I'd give the Baron a jolly good kick, 
and tell him you wished him the joy of his bargain. I wouldn't do anything violent, you know, but a little quiet thing like that would just show them all what you thought of the business. A sense of my wrong, said James Anderson, should not extinguish a sense of justice, and I have no means of knowing that the Baron is at all in fault in this matter. Oh, you are too nice by one half. If a fellow takes away my sweetheart, hang me if I care who is at fault. Oh, but it is necessary that we should be just at all events. But still, Jack, accept my sincerest thanks for placing me in the way of looking upon Helen. I'd rather see that she was happy and contented with her lot, than I would observe evidence upon her face of any passionate regret. The former would reconcile me, by making me think I had made a great mistake in the object of my attachment, while the latter would leave in my heart a never-ceasing pain. "'Come on,' said Jack. "'I fear I tax your patience, Jack Pringle, when I talk in such a strain as this. I'll be hanged if you don't. What do you mean by it? There is a lot of women in the world. I have no patience with a fellow that, because one girl uses him ill, goes sniffling and crying about his feeling, and his agony, and his chest, and all that sort of thing. I should recommend a bottle of rum. Well, well, Jack, it may happen some day, even with you, and then you may feel some of the mental agony of knowing that another has posed himself of her, whom you thought all your own. This was hitting Jack rather hard, although James Anderson did not know it. So he said, Ah, well, to be sure, there is something in that, after all, and I don't mean to say there ain't. But, however, keep up your heart, my boy, and there is no saying what may happen yet. Alas, there can nothing happen that gives me pleasure. All is lost now, and the only hope I can have is to forget. Jack would have written a letter back to the Admiral in reply to the one which he had received, only that somehow or other he was not a first-rate penman, and as he said it was such a bother to know where to begin, and when you did begin it was such a bother to know where to leave off, that, taking all things into consideration, he rather on the whole declined writing at all. And as the appointed day was near at hand, on which the wedding was to take place, he thought it would do quite as well if he kept the lookout which the Admiral had suggested for the arrival of the Bannersworth. As for the scheme of James Anderson to be present at the wedding, the more Jack thought of it, the more he liked it, because he considered that it afforded a chance, at all events, if not a good prospect, of a general disturbance as any that had ever existed. Lord, what fun, he said, if he would but kick the Baron, and then if the Baron would but fall foul of him, and the girl scream, and old Mother Williams go into hysterics, that would be a lark, and no doubt about it. Shouldn't I enjoy it above a bit? I'd give them a helping hand somehow or another, and then, who knows, but the girl may have been regularly badgered by the old cat of a mother into the match, and may wish for all the world to get out of it. There can be no doubt but that if Helen Williams, even at that last moment, chose to make any appeal, it would not be made in vain to Jack Pringle, who with all his faults, and they were numerous enough, had in his heart a chivalrous love of rights, and a hatred of anything in the shape of oppression, which nothing could subdue. And such qualities as these surely are amply sufficient to atone for a multitude of minor errors, which were more those of habit and defective education than anything else. It very much delighted him to think that the Admiral and the Bainersworth were coming down to Anderbury, because such a fact not only prolonged his stay there, which he was pleased it should do, because he was really very much delighted with the place, but it at the same time threw him again into the company he so much liked, and his attachment to the Bannerworth family had really become quite a strong feeling. He waited quiet with impatience until the Thursday came on which the Admiral had announced his arrival, and instead of being in the town or on the outskirts to watch for him, which would have been but a tiresome operation, Jack walked boldly on to meet them by the high road which he knew they must traverse. After he had gone about four miles, he had the satisfaction of seeing, in the distance, a travelling carriage, manned, as he called it, with four horses rapidly approaching and Jack immediately produced a large silk handkerchief that he had purchased, 
which was a representation of the national flag of Great Britain. This he fastened to the end of his stick, and commenced waving it about as a signal to the admiral of his presence in the road. At this moment, too, it happened, fortunately for Jack Pringle, as he considered, that a man came across the still in the immediate vicinity where he was with a gun in his hand. "'Hello, a friend,' said Jack Pringle. "'Just let me look at that gun a minute.' "'I'll see you further first, said the man. "'You seem to me as if you were out of your mind.' So saying, he leveled the piece at some birds, which were flying overhead, and fired first one barrel and then the other in rapid succession. "'Thank you,' said Jack. "'That was all I wanted. "'And it will answer my purpose exactly. "'There is nothing like when you display your flag, firing a gun or two. "'It's all right. "'He sees me. "'He sees me.' The admiral had actually been looking from the window of the carriage, although he had not expected to see Jack quite so soon. But the appearance of the handkerchief, which was made so much to resemble a flag, convinced him of the fact that Jack had come that distance to meet them, and when he heard the gun fire twice he was quite delighted, and leaning back in the carriage he cried, "'Ah, Flora, my dear, it is a great pity that Jack is so given to rum, for he is a remarkably clever fellow. You would hardly believe it now, but he has contrived to hoist a flag just because he sees me coming.' "'Indeed, uncle. Yes, my dear, he has. And didn't you hear?' that he actually managed to fire a couple of guns, some way or another? I certainly did hear the report, but I had no idea that we were indebted to Jack Pringle's management for them. Oh, yes, I can see him a short distance ahead. He is lying too now, and, if the wind wasn't against us, we should be upon him in a few minutes, but don't you feel it blowing in your face? Notwithstanding the Admiral considered, which he certainly did, that the wind was a real impediment to the progress of the carriage. They did in a few moments reach to where Jack Pringle was waiting, when the Admiral called out from the window in a loud voice, Aloha! What ship, and where are you bound to? The Jack Pringle, was the reply, from Anderbury, and to fall in with the Admiral Bell, convoy of the pretty Flora. There now, said the Admiral, didn't I tell you what a clever fellow Jack was? What shore-going humbug, who had never been to sea, would have thought of such a thing. Well, said Jack, as he walked up to the coach window, for the Bastillians had been ordered to halt, or as the Admiral had expressed it, to heave too. Well, here you are, all of you. Yes, Jack, said the Admiral, and I was just saying I thought you a very clever fellow. I am sorry I can't return the compliment. You poor old creature, said Jack. I hope you haven't gotten yourself into any trouble since I have been away from you. What a miserable old hulk you do look, to be sure. There you go again. Now, you are getting into a passion as usual. What a dreadful thing temper is, to be sure, when you can't manage it. Jack scrambled up behind into the rumble before the Admiral could make any reply to him, for indignation stopped his utterance a moment or two, and when he did speak it was to Flora he addressed himself more particularly, saying, Now, did you ever know a more ungrateful son of a gun than that, after I had just told him that I thought him a clever fellow, for him to burst out abusing me at that rate? Now I have done with him. Oh, you may depend, Admiral Bill, said Flora, that he doesn't at all mean what he says, and I am convinced that he entertains for you the highest possible respect, and that he is only jesting when he uses those expressions which would seem as if it were otherwise. Let's just wait, said the Admiral, till the wedding is over, and then I'll let him know whether a boatswain is to make a joke of an Admiral of the Fleet. End of chapter 117「Varney the Vampire, Volume 2 」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Varney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 118. The Baron's Preparations for the Marriage and the Wedding Morning. During this time, neither Mrs. Williams nor the Baron Stolmuir were idle spectators of the progress of the hours, but, on the contrary, they made the best possible use of the week which was to elapse before the marriage ceremony took place after Helen had given her consent to it. Five hundred pounds in the hands of such a person as Mrs. Williams will go a long way and produce an amazing amount of show and glitter, 
so that she managed, before the day on which the ceremony was to be performed arrived, to make quite certain that herself and her daughters would present a most dazzling appearance, and she thought it not at all improbable that even at the very church some meritorious individual might be dazzled into thinking of matrimony with one of her other daughters, upon seeing what a brilliant appearance they managed to present upon the marriage of Helen. "'I am quite sure that no harm can come of it,' she said, "'if no good does, and at all events, if no good is done at the church, the baron will soon be giving parties enough to bring out the dear girls to perfection, particularly as I fully intend we shall all live at Enderbury House. Mrs. Williams considered this as a settled point, whether the baron liked it or not, and, knowing as she did the gentle and quiet disposition of Helen, she did not doubt for a moment of being permitted to rule completely over the domestic affairs of her establishment. All this was amazingly satisfactory to such a lady as Mrs. Williams, and the very thing of all others she would have liked, had she been looking out for what would please her in the marriage of her daughter. We shall shortly see how these views and opinions were verified by the fact. All the other preparations were left to the baron, and when he wrote a letter to Mrs. Williams, saying that he would be ready by ten o'clock on the morning which had been named for the nuptials, and would send one of his carriages for the bride, Mrs. Williams was perfectly satisfied that all was quite correct. There was no very good excuse for calling at Anderbury House, but if she had then called, she certainly would have been astonished at the preparations which the Baron was making for that day which was so near at hand. It was quite terrific the expense he went to and the gorgeous manner in which he fitted up one of the largest apartments in the house, for a dance looked really like expenditure of the most reckless character, and such as indeed it must have required an immense fortune to withstand. The walls of that apartment were hung with crimson draperies of a rich texture, and such beauty of design that they were the admiration of the very workmen themselves who were employed upon the premises. Then the magnificent order he gave for a feast upon the occasion, and the wines he laid in, really almost exceeded belief, and such proceedings were indeed highly calculated to give people most exaggerated versions regarding his wealth. He had indeed mentioned to Mrs. Williams that he had silver mines on some of his estates abroad and that fact to her mind was quite sufficient to account for any amount of money he might possess, because, to her ideas of geology and mineralogy, the discovery of a silver mine meant finding a hole of immense width and depth crammed with the precious metal. But be this as it may, and whether the Baron Stolmuir of Salzburg owed his wealth to silver mines or to other sources, one thing was quite clear, and that was that he had it. And that was the grand point for in a highly civilized and evangelical country like this, the question of how a man got his money is not near so often asked as, has he got it? And it is quite amazing what liberality of feeling and sentiment is immediately infused into people by the fact of successful speculation of any kind, while failure immediately incurs the greatest of opprobrium and contempt. And now the day was so close at hand that Mrs. Williams got into a terrible flutter of spirits and began really to wish it over, for she was completely ready, and each minute became an hour of impatience to her. She was continually bothering the baron with notes and messages upon different subjects, and he had the urbanity to answer two or three of them, but he soon left that off, and the last half-dozen, at the least, were, to Mrs. Williams's great mortification, taken no notice of at all. Some of these notes were upon the most nonsensical points, and several of them, although they did not actually ask it, pretty strongly hinted that more money would be a very desirable thing. The Baron would not understand any hint, however, upon the subject, so that Mrs. Williams became fully convinced that she must make the best of it she could, and put up for the present with the five hundred pounds she had already received. But when the day had actually dawned on which the suspicious event was to come off, and upon looking around her, she found herself surrounded by gay apparel and jewelry, she almost dreaded that even yet it would turn out to be some delusion, or a dream, for she could scarcely believe in the reality of such glory and magnificence belonging to her. But facts are stubborn things, and, whether for good or for evil, are not likely to be got over. So, when she looked out of the windows and saw that a bright morning sun was shining, and that the life, animation, and bustle of the day was commencing, she told herself that it was, indeed, real, and that she had reached very nearly the summit of her desires and expectations. Yes, she exclaimed, I shall be mother-in-law to a baron, and I dare say I shall have at least twenty servants in Anderbury House to command and control continually. 
a more gratifying reflection than this could not possibly have presented itself to Mrs. Williams, for if any one thing could be more delightful than another, it certainly was that kind of petty power which gives an individual a control over a large establishment. After she had arisen on that eventful morning, she did not allow her establishment many minutes' repose, but in the course of half an hour all was bustle, excitement, and no small share of confusion. And while she was thus energetically pushing on her preparations, let us see what the Bannerworths are about, now that they have fairly arrived at Inderbury, and are in readiness, probably, to be present at the ceremony. By Flora's intercession, a peace was established between Jack and the Admiral, and the former took the latter down to the old seaman's cottage in order to introduce him to James Anderson, and on the road he made him acquainted with the particulars of the young man's story, at the same time informing him of the wish that Anderson had expressed to be permitted to join their party. "'Oh, certainly,' said the Admiral, "'certainly. Let him come by all means, although I must say that he ought to leave for London at once with his dispatches, or at all events with the news that he had lost them. However, I am not on active service, and therefore have no right to do anything more than advise him in the matter. Oh, he will go, said Jack, as soon as he has seen his sweetheart, and perhaps kick the baron, for though he said he wouldn't, I live in hopes yet that he will be aggravated enough to do it. The admiral liked James Anderson so much, that he not only promised him he should go to the wedding under cover of the general invitation which he, the admiral, had received, but he proposed, likewise, that he should come home with him at once, and be introduced to the Bannerworths and by whom he meant the inn at Anderbury, where they were staying. The young man expressed himself highly gratified at this invitation, and at once accepted it, so that they walked towards the inn together, and began to make preparations for their appearance at Anderbury House. Flora and the Bannerworths, as well as Charles, received young Anderson very graciously, and they each expressed to him their sympathy for the painful situation in which the baron's marriage was placing him. Flora and Charles Holland, as may be well supposed, could both feel, and feel acutely too for any one crossed in his affection, as poor James Anderson was, and it certainly much damped the satisfaction they had in going to what everybody told them would certainly be the most brilliant wedding that had taken place in that part of the country for many a year. "'Let us hope,' said Henry Bannerworth, "'that you will find some other Mr. Anderson, who will be more worthy of your esteem, than she who has treated so lightly your affection and her own faith.' I know not, said Anderson, whether to accuse her or not, for who knows, but after all she may be the victim of treachery, notwithstanding the apparent powerful evidence that has been given to me by her mother. The Bannerworth family were determined, and so was the Admiral, that they would bestow what credit they could upon those who had so kindly invited them, and, accordingly, when they started for the hall in the handsome carriage which had brought them down to Anderbury, they certainly presented a rather showy and attractive appearance. But still, when they reached the entrance to Anderbury House, they found that theirs was by no means the only equipage of the kind that was there to be seen, for although both the entrances were open for the reception of guests, they had to wait a considerable time before they could get up to either of them. One hundred and fifty guests, sixty or eighty of whom kept equipages, were calculated to make some little degree of confusion, but when the Bannerworth family fairly got within the house, everything else was forgotten in their admiration of the brilliant arrangements within. The richest carpets were laid down that money could purchase, and servants in gorgeous liveries ushered the guests into an immense hall in which the marriage ceremony was to take place, and which was decorated with a splendor that was perfectly regal. And here a new set of domestics glided noiselessly about with various refreshments upon silver salvers, and the place began rapidly to fill with such an assemblage of wealth and beauty and rank as perhaps scarcely ever had been congregated in one place before. But among those whose beauty attracted much attention, we may need well reckon our friend Flora Bell, as she was now properly called, and whose sweet countenance was the cause of many a passing observation, couched in the most flattering terms. It wanted yet an hour to the time of the ceremony being performed, and the Bannerworths, as they saw that their companion, young Anderson, was in a painful state of excitement all sat down in the deep recess of a large window to wait the coming of the bride and bridegroom. "'I don't think, Mr. Anderson,' said Henry, "'that your coming here at all was a well-advised step, "'but since you are here you should muster up resolution enough "'not to betray any feeling.' "'I will not betray it, although I feel it,' said Anderson. "'Rely upon it that I shall look much firmer and act much firmer "'when she whom I wish to see is actually here than I do at present. 
I am enduring suspense now, and that is the worst of all. I do wish, interposed Flora, that you had seen her whom you love before the ceremony, for in that case, although you might have endured the pang of finding that she was willing to call herself another's, you would have been spared the pain of this day's proceeding. I wish to heaven I had seen her, but I knew not how to arrange such a meeting, and when I was shown in her own handwriting, which I knew too well to doubt, a consent to be the wife of another, I no longer had the spirit and the perseverance to ask to see her, and it was an afterthought that made me wish to look upon her face once more before I left her forever. What, said Jack Pringle, suddenly making his appearance, is he gammoning you with his feelings? Oh, so you have got in, have you? said the Admiral. So I have got in. Why, what do you mean by that? Of course I have got in. Wasn't I invited? I do think you get a little stupider every day, and in a course of time you won't know what you're about. I should not be surprised to see you take out your handkerchief to blow your eye instead of your nose. Latterly, Jack, when he made one of these speeches, always walked away very quickly, leaving the Admiral's anger to evaporate as best it might, so that he escaped the retort which otherwise he might have received. End of chapter 118 Read by Richard Wallace, Liberty, Missouri, 5 May 2009one hundred nineteen of Varney the Vampire Volume two. This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Varney the Vampire Volume two by Thomas Prescott Prest Chapter one hundred nineteen A rather strange circumstance at the Baron's wedding. At length the hour came so anxiously looked for and expected by all the Baron Stolmeyer's guests, and the great clock which was in one of the turrets of Anderbury House proclaimed that the minute had arrived when all was presumed to be ready for the union. All eyes were directed to a large table that was placed at one extremity of the hall, and covered with crimson velvet, and at which the ceremony was to be performed. The Bannerworths were a little forward, so that they commanded a good view of everything, and James Anderson was completely hidden from observation behind the bulky form of the admiral. Now a small door opened, and an archdeacon somebody, who had been engaged, as you would engage a celebrated performer at some theatre, to perform the ceremony, made his appearance accompanied by several ladies and gentlemen, whom he had brought with him to partake of some of the baron's good things. In a few moments from another doorway came the bride, accompanied by six bridesmaids, but she was covered with such a massive lace veil from her head to her feet that not the slightest vestige of her countenance was visible. But still Flora thought that, as the bride first came in, she heard from beneath that veil a deep and agonized sob, and she remarked the circumstance to Charles, who confirmed her opinion by at once saying, It was so, and I don't think it at all likely that we should both be mistaken." There was a slight murmur of applause and admiration among the assembled guests, as the bride took her seat by the table, for although there were many there who had never seen her face, there were likewise many who had, and even those who had not, could not but perceive, by her graceful movements and the delicate outline of her figure, that they were looking upon a creature of rare beauty and worth. It was astonishing that the bridegroom should be late, and the audience who were present began to be indignant at such a fact, and whispered together concerning it, in language not very flattering to the baronet, who, had he heard it, would have found that he must mind what he was about, or his rapidly acquired popularity would soon be at a discount. Minute after minute thus passed, and Mrs. Williams, who was attired in a richly flowing garment of white silk, embroidered with flowers, began to be in a most particular fidget. Where could be the baron? Good God, where is the baron? and some one or two said, Damn the baron! when suddenly the door at which the bride had entered was again flung open, and two servants in rich liveries made their appearance, one standing on each side of it. Then there was heard approaching a slow and measured footstep, and presently, attired in a court suit of rich velvet, the baron Stolmeyer of Salzburg appeared in the hall and marched up to the table. He had but just time to execute half a bow to the assembled multitude, when Admiral Bell called out in a voice that awakened every echo in the place, "'It's Varney the Vampire, by God!' 
Yes, it was Varney, the bold, reckless, audacious Varney, who had thus come out in a new character, and, with vast pecuniary resources, acquired heaven knows how or where, was seeking to ally himself to one so young and beautiful as Helen Williams. We do absolutely and positively despair of giving an adequate idea to the reader of the scene that followed. Ladies shrieked, the bride fainted, Mrs. Williams went into strong hysterics and kicked everybody. Jack Pringle shouted until he was hoarse, while Varney turned and made a dash to escape through the door at which he had just entered. James Anderson, however, by springing over a table, succeeded in clutching him by the collar behind. But Varney turned on the instant, and lifting him from the ground as if he had been a child, he flung him among a tray of confectionery and wine, and from thence he rolled into Mrs. Williams' lap. Following close, however, upon the footsteps of Anderson in pursuit of Varney, had been Henry Bannerworth, but he accomplished nothing except to strike his head violently against the door through which Varney escaped, and which was dashed in his face, and immediately bolted on the other side. "'He is a vampire!' shouted the admiral. "'I tell you all, he is a vampire! Varney the vampire, and no more a baron than I am a broomstick! Stop that damned old woman from making such a noise!' "'It's the bride's mother,' said somebody. "'What's that to me?' roared the admiral. "'It don't make her a bit less of a nuisance. "'I offer a hundred pounds reward for Varney the vampire, "'and there might be some people here that know the house well enough to catch him.' "'Do you mean a hundred pounds for master, sir?' said a great footman with yellow plush breeches. "'Yes, I do, you hog in armor,' said the admiral. "'The footman rushed through another doorway in a moment,' and then Jack Pringle jumped upon a chair, and waving his hat, cried, Hurrah! 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 Three cheers for old Varney! I'll tell you what it is, messmates, he is the meanest fellow as ever you see, and as for you ladies who have been disappointed of the marriage, I'll come and kiss you all in a minute, and we'll drink up old Varney's wine, and eat up his dinner like bricks. My eye, what a game we will have, to be sure! I am coming! At this moment the admiral gave such a kick to one of the hind legs of the chair, that down came Jack as quickly as if he had disappeared through some trap-door. "'Hold your noise, will you?' said the admiral. "'You great brawling brute!' "'I'll settle him,' said Mrs. Williams, who had suddenly recovered, and had not Jack suddenly made his escape, it is highly probable she would have made him a regular scapegoat in the affair, and that he alone, for Anderson had pretty quickly escaped her, would have felt the consequences of her deep disappointment.' The confusion now became, if anything, worse than at first, for many of the guests who had looked on apparently quite stunned and paralyzed at what had taken place, now recovered and joined their voices to the general clamor. Some, to rush out of the place, took the opportunity of going through the different rooms, while a number, who had heard of the widespread fame of Varney the vampire, and who were utterly astonished to find him and the baron one and the same person, joined in the pursuit with the hope of taking prisoner so alarming a personage. No one knew for some time what had become of the clergyman, until Jack Pringle saw a human foot sticking out from under the table, upon which he took hold of it, and with a pull dragged the archdeacon somebody fairly out, to the great horror of some of the very religious old ladies who were present, who considered that an archdeacon must be somebody very wonderful indeed. "'Hello, Mr. Parson,' said Jack. I suppose you thought it was your old friend the devil come for you before your time. But cheer up, I know him. It's only a vampire, and that's nothing when you're used to it. Jack did not seem at all to think that it was necessary he should assist in the capture of Varney, and probably the real fact was, he did not care whether Varney was captured or not, so he walked to one of the tables which were loaded with refreshments, and knocking the neck off a bottle of champagne, he gave a nod to Mrs. Williams, saying, "'Come, old girl, take something to drink. "'That red nose of yours looks as if you knew something of the bottle. "'It's only me, so you needn't be shy. "'Ah, it's devilish good wine, though. "'I do give old Varney credit for getting up the thing decently, "'which he certainly has, and no mistake.' "'Who has seen my daughter? Where is my daughter?' "'cried Mrs. Williams, as she looked about her in vain for Helen. "'You needn't trouble yourself, ma'am,' said the admiral. She has just walked off with a little fellow of the name of Anderson, who, although he was no match for Varney the vampire, I think will turn out to be the one for your daughter. Mrs. Williams was thoroughly thunderstricken, 
and she sat down in a chair and commenced wringing her hands and muttering as she did so, Oh, that I should have lived to see this day! Oh, that I should have existed to be so, so... Jolly well humbugged, ma'am, said Jack Pringle, with a vampire instead of a baron. Why, Lord bless you, ma'am, nobody in their senses would have taken old Varney for a baron. Why, he is a regular old bloodsucker, he is, and a nice family you would have had. But, however, if you are fond of him, you can marry him yourself, you know, now. And I shouldn't at all wonder, but he will consent, for a man will put up with any damned old cat when he finds he can't get a better. Good God, said Mrs. Williams, I think I know your voice now. Ain't you Admiral Green? Avast there, said Jack. I ain't nothing of the kind. They calls me Colonel Bluebottle of the Horse Marines. The what? The Horse Marines. Ain't you never hear of them, ma'am? I certainly never did, but don't try to deceive me, sir. You are Admiral Green, and if you will, my dear sir, spare me a few minutes of your valuable time, I shall be able to explain to you— What? said Jack. Why, that really, you will scarcely believe it, but really, Admiral Green, my daughter Julia is, although I say it, one of the best of girls. Oh, I dare say she is, ma'am, but I don't know as that much matters to me. "'Excuse me, Admiral Green, but it really does, and you must know, of course it's quite between ourselves, this, that she happened to see you when you did me the honor of calling upon me.' "'Did she really?' "'Yes, my dear Admiral, and, do you know, ever since then she has been positively raving about you, and, as you were good enough to say, the Baron should not stand in the way of your affections, allow me to recommend Julia to you.' "'Oh, that's it, is it?' said Jack. Well, ma'am, I should not have said no, only that you ain't half particular enough for me. Not particular? Oh, good God! No, ma'am, you ain't. Here you would have married one of your daughters to a vampire, and how do I know what other sort of odd fish you might bring into the family? But, my dear Admiral, oh, gammon, I tell you what now I will do. I don't mind standing something devilish handsome if you will marry old Varney yourself. What? The baron that was and the vampire that is? I marry him. Oh, dear, no, I really could not. That is to say, how much would you give, Admiral Green? Ah, said Jack, I knew it. Who says after this that women won't marry the very devil himself if they only have the chance? And now, Mother Williams, I'll just tell you what you have done. The fact is, I took a fancy to you myself, and that's why I came here at all today. I meant to have proposed to you, and if you had only said you would not have the barren vampire for any money, damn it, I would have had you myself, and settled a matter of fifteen thousand pounds a year upon you. Oh, gracious providence! What do I hear? Just what I says. I'm a man of my word, ma'am, and would have done it. Mrs. Williams was so affected at the chance she had lost, that she quite forgot to look after Helen, but was actually compelled to indulge herself with a glass or two of something strong and powerful, which she said was sherry, but which somebody else said was brandy, in order to recover from the faint feeling that would come over her. After this, Jack thought that he had had about the bitterest revenge upon Mrs. Williams that it was possible to achieve, and he was quite right as far as that went. The old admiral, too, who overheard some part of the colloquy, was quite delighted with it, and again told himself what a clever fellow Jack was, and quite a wonderful character in his way. Ah, he said, one would have to sail a tolerable lot of voyages before finding anybody as was exactly Jack's equal, and I'll be hanged if I don't forgive him for the next piece of mutinous conduct he is guilty of, on account of the way he has served out that horrid old mother Williams, for in all my life I never saw a woman I disliked more. Stop, what am I saying? Did I really forget Mrs. Chillingworth, the doctor's wife? That was too bad. End of chapter 119hundred twenty of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Barney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 120. The Hunt for the Vampire in the Subterranean Passage. The information that had been given to Mrs. Williams respecting her daughter and James Anderson having together left the great hall of Anderbury House was perfectly correct. 
the voice of Anderson whispering words of affection in the ear of Helen, was sufficient to arouse her from the state of syncope in which she had fallen. And when she recovered and looked in his face, the expression of joy which her countenance wore at once dispelled all his doubts. "'Helen, dear Helen,' he whispered, "'are you indeed still in heart mine?' "'Still as ever,' she replied. "'Come with me, I have much to tell you, and we need not heed the thoughts and feelings of the throng that is here. If you can walk, place your arm in mine, and lean upon me, and we will get out of all this trouble and confusion.' Helen was but too glad to avail herself of such an offer, and she accordingly at once did so, and leaning for support upon that arm, which, of all others, she most loved to bear upon, they together passed out of the great hall, through one of the numerous doorways leading from it. Being both of them quite ignorant of what may be called the topography of Andervery House, they went on till they came to a small but very elegant apartment, in which a table was laid with wines, and some costly refreshments, which, from the fact of an extremely clerical-looking shovel-hat being upon one of the chairs, there was no great difficulty in coming to the conclusion that this had been a reception-room, got up purposely for the reverend gentleman who was to perform the ceremony of marriage between the baron and Miss Williams, and in which he had refreshed himself prior to the performance of that dreadfully arduous task, for which, no doubt, as all persons are, he was so very insufficiently paid. A glass of wine which James Anderson poured out for Helen tended much to recover her, and when he said to her in accents of the greatest affection, Helen, Helen, is it possible that you really so far forgot me as to promise your hand to another? She burst into tears as she clung to his arm, saying, I know you cannot, you ought not to forgive me. I did promise, but I did not forget you, and if you know the cruel persecution to which I have been subjected, you would pity, perhaps, as much as you condemn me. You did not know that some days since I wrote you a note. Me a note? Oh, heavens, no, no! What became of it? To whom did you entrust it? Oh, James, had I but thought you were near me, do you think that for one moment I would have yielded even to the representations which were made to me? I see it all, he said. Your mother has carried on this matter with more tact than candor and honesty of purpose. I do not condemn you, dear Helen, and no one shall ever disturb you in your possession of a heart which is wholly yours. And can you forget? All but that I love you I can and will forget, Helen. I do not deserve this noble generosity, for I ought not to have yielded, James. I feel that I ought to have clung to the remembrance of your affection, and found in that an abundant consolation, as well as abundant strength, to resist the whole world. Say no more, dearest, upon that head, but let us, to the full, enjoy the happiness of this meeting, without the drawback of a single doubt. We will never part again. Never, never. But, James, what was the meaning of that sudden exclamation from one of the guests as regarded the baron? You allude to Admiral Bell proclaiming him to be a vampire, and, I must say, it fills me with quite as much astonishment as it can you. I did hear a strange story of that sort from a sailor a short time ago, but I looked upon it as a mere superstition and paid no attention to it. You know what it means, I presume, and that a vampire is supposed to be a half-supernatural creature who supports a spurious and horrible existence by feeding upon the blood of any one whom he can make his victim. If this horrible superstition, said Helen with a shudder, be true, what a dreadful fate have I escaped! It surely must be some error of judgment. But still, dear one, you have escaped a dreadful fate, a fate worse than any vampire would have afflicted upon you, the fate of being united with one whom you cannot love. Yes, said Helen, that is indeed an escape. But how came you, of all persons in the world, a guest here? I came, Helen, under cover of a general invitation, with a most worthy family, to whose kindness I feel myself much indebted, and which empowered them to bring with them whom they pleased. My wish and object was to take one last look at the face I had loved so well before I left you forever. Oh, heavens, said Helen, and I was so near being sacrificed while you were by. Even now I shudder at the dreadful chasm. I feel that you ought not to forgive me. Say no more, say no more. All that, Helen, is now past and forgotten, 
and I can well imagine how your mother would torture you with supplications, because she believed this man to be rich, and consequently the sort of person, above all others, as most desirable for her to have as a son-in-law. We will only consider that a great anxiety and a great danger has passed away, and we will not stop to ask ourselves what it was. Ever good and ever generous, resumed Helen, as her head reposed upon her lover's breast. Oh, said Jack Pringle, as he popped his head in at the door, I beg your pardon, you are better engaged, but we are going to have a grand vampire hunt through the house, and I thought you would like to join it, perhaps. Stay a moment, stay, cried Anderson. Do you mean to tell me, really, that this is the person who gave your friends, the Bannerworths, so much trouble and inconvenience? Yes, I do, said Jack. Lord bless you, he is quite an old acquaintance of ours, is old Varney. Sometimes he hunts us, sometimes we hunt him. He is rather a troublesome acquaintance, notwithstanding, and I think there are a good many people in the world, a jolly right worse vampires than Varney. I have no cause to hunt him, said Anderson, and so therefore I feel certainly more inclined to decline than otherwise engaging in such a transaction. Don't mention it, said Jack. You are a deuced deal better engaged, and there needs no excuses. Jack was quite right as regarded the projected hunt for the unfortunate Varney in Anderbury House, for the liberal offer of reward which the Admiral had made to any one who would secure him was calculated to stimulate every possible exertion that people could make upon the occasion, so much so indeed that the Bannerworths, after a brief consultation among themselves, thought that for the protection of Varney it would be much better that they should find him than now leave him with the character that had been given him as such a dangerous member of society. The servants, and some of the guests even, had gone very systematically to work for the purpose of taking Varney prisoner, for, in the first instance, they had secured all the outlets from the house, so that, as the footman with the yellow plush continuations remarked, he must jump over a cliff if he wanted to get away. The Admiral and Henry agreed with each other that they would be foremost in the search, in order to protect Varney from any violence for although this conduct of his might be considered as very bad, and an outrage upon society in passing himself off as a baron, and endeavouring to effect an alliance with a young and innocent girl, yet they, the Bannerworths, had nothing to complain of in the transaction whatever. Consequently was it that they felt an inclination to defend Varney from personal violence. And this was, to a certain extent, to be dreaded, because Anderbury being so short a distance from Bannerworth, it was not to be supposed but that some news of the mysterious appearance of the vampire had reached the ears of almost every one who happened to be present at the baron's wedding. And although these persons might be supposed to belong to a class of society not likely to commit acts of violence, yet there was no knowing what, in the excitement of the moment, might be done. While the search went on, Flora was introduced to Helen Williams, and remained with her, commencing a friendship which lasted afterwards, to the great advantage of Helen, for many a year. The Bannerworths would have been pleased and interested at going over Anderbury House under any other circumstances than the present one, for truly the Baron had made it a most magnificent abode. By judicious additions to the antique furniture which had belonged to it when he took it, he had made some of the apartments look gorgeous in the extreme and while he had not disturbed the character of the decorations, he had certainly shown a very fine taste in adding to them. But their minds were by far too much occupied with considerations connected with Varney to pay much attention to his house, and as they traversed room after room in search of him without finding him, they began to think that, with his usual good fortune, he had contrived entirely to escape. The servants, who knew the place well, perhaps better than Varney did himself, searched for him in almost impossible places, until it began to be the general opinion that he must have escaped. They were standing by a large bay window, which commanded a view of the gardens, when one of the servants suddenly exclaimed, I see him, I see him, there he goes, and pointed into the garden, where, for one instant, Henry Bannerworth, as well as the Admiral, saw Varney in his rich suit of wedding apparel, dart from among the bushes towards a summer-house that was in the garden near at hand. "'Tis he, indeed,' said Henry. "'Let us get down instantly, or he may yet effect his escape.' "'No, no,' cried one of the servants. "'He cannot do that. "'The garden wall is too high, and the men are stationed at the gate. 
It's quite clear to me what he is about. Look at him. He is going towards the old passage that leads to the seashore. Then he will escape, of course, said Henry, for no one can hope to overtake him. Don't you be afraid of that, sir, cried the servant. One of my mates has gone round to the beach to watch, and he won't let the door be opened that leads out on to the sands, so he cannot get away by that mode. In that case, then, we have him completely entrapped, and, as you say, he cannot escape. It must be the madness of positive desperation that induces him to go to that place. Let us be off at once after him, said the admiral. That is our only plan. Come on at once. The sooner we get hold of him, the better, for his own sake as well as for ours. Thus urged, they all proceeded towards the garden, in which was the mysterious, well-like entrance to the subterraneous passage, which formed so great a feature in the estate of Anderbury, on the moment, and which, at the time that Varney had taken the mansion, had evidently formed to him one of its principal attractions. To the admiral and his party, as well as to several of the guests, who joined from motives of curiosity in the pursuit for Varney, this place was perfectly new, and it certainly, to look down it, did not present by any means an inviting prospect for although it sloped sufficiently to take off the absolute appearance of being a downright hole in the earth, yet, beyond a few feet in depth, the gloom had something positively terrific about it. Well, said the admiral, I've been into the hold of many a ship, but never one that looked half so gloomy as this, I can say. What do you say to it, Jack? There's no use saying anything to such places, said Jack. The only way, if we want to catch old Barney, which I suppose we do, is to pop down it at once and done with it. So come along, I won't flinch if it was ten times worse. Come on, Admiral, let's go down after the enemy. I cannot say it's exactly the kind of place I admire, said the Admiral, but, howsomedever, if one must go down it, who shall say that Admiral Bell flinched from it? Come on, all of you, let all who will follow. The passage did not look a very inviting one, and it was found that the courage of the guests began to cool down wonderfully when, instead of rushing from apartment to apartment in search of Varney the vampire, they found that they had to encounter the gloom and darkness of that underground abode. Out of the positive throng which had been pursuing Varney, only four, in addition to the admiral and the male portion of his party, ventured to descend into that black-looking place. What, said Jack, have we got such a bunch of skulkers whenever we come to close quarters with the enemy? Well, shiver my timbers if I didn't expect as much from a lot of landlubbers who don't know what they are about any more than a marine in a squall. But who cares? Come along, Admiral, and if we have to do all the fighting, we shall at all events have all the glory. I hope there will be nothing of the one at all events, said Henry, for my intention is rather to save Varney from injury than to injure him. We must have lights, said the Admiral. I don't mind going down into a queer place to look for Varney, but I must have the means of seeing what I am about when I get there. They will be here, sir, directly, said the big footman, who from the first had made himself conspicuous in the pursuit of Varney, that is to say, ever since the reward of one hundred pounds had been offered by the admiral to any one who would take him prisoner. And in a few moments some of the links, which were always kept in the kitchen of Anderbury House, for the express purpose of descending into the subterraneous passages with, were produced and lighted. By this time, too, the four guests had decreased to three, and two of those seemed to hang back rather a little, while one of them seemed disposed to make up as much as possible for any deficiency of courage on the part of the others, by declaring his intention of ferreting out Varney, let him be hidden where he might. "'I am with you, sir,' he said to the admiral, let this place lead where it may, for I have heard so much about vampires, and really am so curious to know more about them. You don't believe in them, do you? I can't say that I do, sir, but, at the same time, when we hear such well-authenticated cases brought forward about them, it is very difficult indeed to say at once that one has no belief in such things. Well, you are right enough there, and if you knew as much about Varney the vampire as we do, I think you would be a little puzzled to know what to say about him, for I'll be hanged if he don't puzzle me above a bit, and I don't know now what to think of him. End of chapter 120
Chapter 121 of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Varney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 121 The Death of the Inquisitive Guest, The Escape of Sir Francis Varney. The guest, who was so valorous and so very impatient for the capture of Varney, would have preceded everybody in descending to the passage cut in the cliff, but Henry Bannerworth thought not only was it more particularly his concern to do so, but that as he knew Varney better, it was desirable that he should go first. He thought there would be less likelihood of any mischief by adopting such a kind of procedure, for he did not anticipate that Varney would willingly do him any injury while, as regarded what he might do if any stranger should attempt to seize him, that was quite another affair. "'You do not know him as we know him,' said Henry to the guest. "'He is a dangerous man, and in all respects such an one as your prudence might well induce you to keep clear of. Allow me to precede you, therefore, for the sake of preventing the probability of the most unpleasant consequences.' This argument appeared to have its effect, and to damp a little the ardor of this individual which it might well enough do without casting any imputation upon his courage whatever, for, after all, he could have no strong motive in the pursuit of Varney, since he was in a line of life which would have prevented him, even if he had been the sole captor of Varney, from taking the reward which the admiral had offered for his apprehension. The sudden change from the daylight, and all the noise and bustle which had animated the scene above, to the silence, the darkness, and the strange atmosphere which reigned in the underground region, could not fail of having some effect upon the imagination of every one present. This effect would, of course, vary in different individuals, being the greatest in those of a highly excitable and imaginative turn of mind, and the less in those who were of a more matter-of-fact kind of intellect. Probably Henry Bannerworth felt more acutely than any one else the full effect which such a scene was likely to produce, and he was profoundly silent upon the occasion for some time. Under even the most extraordinary circumstances, the descent into such a place must have affected the mind to some extent, for it seems like leaving the world altogether for a time, and bidding farewell to everything which we have been in the habit of enjoying and thinking beautiful. No one ever thought of accusing Admiral Bell of being very imaginative, but upon this occasion, although he was first to speak, what he did say showed that he had felt some of those sensations to which we have alluded. "'How do you feel, Henry?' he said. "'I'll be hanged if I don't seem as if I were going into my grave before my time.' "'And I, too,' said Henry. "'But I rather like the solemn feeling which such a place as this inspires.' "'Gentlemen,' said the tall footman, with the yellow plush what do you call ems "'Gentlemen, I think, after all, that I somehow will go back again. I, I don't seem actually, in a matter of speaking, to care to catch the baron somehow.' So, if you please, gentlemen, I rather think I'll go back. Why don't you say you are afraid at once, John, said the admiral. Who, me, sir? I afraid? Oh, dear no, sir. It would take a trifle, indeed, to frighten me, I rather think. Oh, no, no, sir, you mistake me. It's my feelings, it's my feelings, sir. Why, what the deuce have your feelings to do with it? Everything in the world, sir. Haven't I drank this beer, sir, and haven't I eat this beef, and his bread and his tato, sir, and shall I now hunt him up among his own ice-wells? No, perish the thought, perish the blessed idea, perish the, 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 good-bye, gentlemen. With these words, the chivalrous footman gave up all idea of continuing the chase for Varney the vampire, and turning quickly, so as to stop the possibility of his hearing any further remonstrance, he went from the place with great speed. Still, however, with the departure of this individual, whose courage from the first had had about it a very suspicious color, they were in a quite sufficient strength to have accomplished the capture of the vampire, if they could get hold of him, and always provided he was not sufficiently armed with powers of mischief to their number, by taking perchance the life of some one of them. There was one circumstance connected with a search for anybody in that strange region, which spoke much in favor of a successful result and that was that the passage was narrow, and that there were no hiding-places except the ice-wells, to explore which, at all events, could not be a very difficult task, and as they proceeded, they felt certain that they must be driving Varney before them. 
Before they had got very far, Henry Bannerworth thought it would be advisable to announce to Varney the precise intentions of himself and the admiral, always provided he were equally peaceably inclined, and within hearing of what was said to him. He accordingly raised his voice, inquiring, "'Sir Francis Varney, you no doubt recognize by my tones that it is Henry Bannerworth who speaks to you, and therefore you may feel convinced that no harm is intended you. But you are implored to come forth and meet your friends who, from former circumstances, you ought to know you can trust. There was no reply whatever to this appeal, and when the echoes of Henry's voice had died away, the same death-like stillness reigned in the place that had before characterized it. He will not answer, said the admiral, and yet, if the other end of this passage be guarded, as it is said to be, he must be here. Let us come on at once. I have no wish of my own to stay in this damp, chalky hole a moment longer than may be absolutely necessary. Nor I, remarked Henry, so let us proceed, and it will be necessary that we keep an accurate watch upon our progress, for I am told that there are ice-wells here of great depth, down which you may fall and come by an awful death when you least expect, unless you are very cautious in looking where you tread. There is no doubt of that, sir, said one of his guests. This place is considered to be one of the most curious that Anderbury can boast of, and I have been told that there are ice-houses, in which all kinds of provisions may be kept with ease and safety in the most violent heat of the summer months. After a few moments they came upon one of the ice-wells, which yawned terrifically before them, and had they not been very careful and watchful upon the occasion, one or more of them might have been precipitated down the well, and the loss of life must have been the result. I scarcely think, said Henry, that ordinary caution can be used in the construction of these places, or they never would have been left in such a state as they are now in. The ice-well, you perceive, lies directly in the very pathway. Yes, said the admiral, it does seem so, Master Henry, but if you look a little closer you will perceive that at one time there has been a wooden bridge exactly over this chasm. Ah, I do indeed now perceive such has been the case. Yes, and that made the place both safe and convenient, for no doubt there was a means of lowering down any baskets of wine or other matters that required a low temperature. The admiral was perfectly right in his supposition, for that was just the way in which the ice-wells of Anderbury House were constructed, and now, since the bridge had been broken down, there was but a very narrow pathway, indeed, by which the well could be passed, unless it was jumped over, which might be done by any active person. They could not pass this ice-well without an examination of it, and that was accomplished by lying down upon the rough pathway of the passage, and holding a light at arm's length down it, when the bottom was clearly visible. He is not there, said Henry, who was the person who made the experiment. He is not there, so we must pass on. They accordingly did so, until they came to another such ice-well, and then the guest, which had shown such eagerness in the chase, and accompanied them so far, went through the process of stooping down the chasm to ascertain if it contained anything unusual beyond the debris of broken bottles, old flint stones, etc., which might fairly be expected to be there. "'Do you see anything?' inquired Henry, as the guests seemed to be looking very intently over the precipice. He was about to reply something, for some sound came from his lips, when he suddenly, as if he had been impelled to do so by some unseen power, toppled over the edge and disappeared, torch and all, into the abyss below. "'Good God!' cried Henry. "'He has fallen!' "'Good night,' said the Admiral, with characteristic coolness. "'I suspect, my friend, that your career is at an end.' "'Listen! For, for God's sake, listen!' cried Henry. "'Does he speak?' There was a strange scuffling noise, and then a low, deep groan from the bottom of the ice-pit, and then all was still, and from the character of the sound, Henry was of opinion that this well was of much greater depth than the former one, which he had so successfully examined. "'He has met with his death,' said Henry." "'Don't be too sure,' said the Admiral. "'We must have a good stout rope, and somebody must go down. "'If nobody likes the job, I will go myself.' "'If ropes are wanted,' said one of the other two persons who were present, "'I can show you where they may be found, "'for I was at the inquest of the body of the man "'who was found dead in this place some time ago, "'and I marked that the ropes by which his body had been got out "'of one of the ice-wells were left where they had been used.' "'That, then,' said the other, "'is further on, and nearer the beach.' Yes, lend me the light, and I will get the rope as quickly as I can, for I don't think, as well as I can remember, that there is another well between this one and that which is near the beach entrance. This was done, and for a few moments Henry and the Admiral were left in the darkness, while the ropes were being searched for. 
It was a darkness so total and complete that it did indeed seem like that darkness which it requires but a little stretch of the imagination to fancy it can be felt. Henry, said the admiral. Henry! Yes, I am here. Were you ever in such a confounded dark hole in all your life? Scarcely, I think, ever. It is certainly tremendous, and it is a grievous thing to think that a life had been sacrificed, as it no doubt has, in this adventure. Ah, oh, well, we must all go to Davy Jones's locker some day. You, but, but don't lay hold of me so. I lay hold of you. I am not near you, sir. Damn it! Who is it, then? Somebody has got a hold of me as if I were in a vice. Stand off, I say. Who are you? Varney the Vampire, said a deep sepulchral voice, who warns you and all others that there is abundance of danger in visiting here and nothing to be gained. Almost as these words were spoken, Henry suddenly found himself whirled round with such force that it was only by a great effort that he succeeded in keeping his feet, and he felt convinced that someone had passed him. Who could that one be but Sir Francis Varney, the much-dreaded vampire? In the next moment the light glanced upon the walls of the subterranean passage, and the admiral cried, He has escaped, unless someone stops him above. But let us think of nothing else at present but to find out if the poor fellow who fell down here be alive or dead. Henry descended by the assistance of the ropes, and found the adventurous guest quite dead. They raised the body from the well, and conveying it as best they could, among them, they arrived, after some troubles on account of their burden, in the gardens, and finally in the great hall of Anderbury House, on a table in which they laid the corpse. It was quite evident now to the Admiral and to the Bannerworths that Varney had escaped, so they could have no desire to remain at the house, over which Mr. Leake was running like a madman, wondering what he should do. Flora had invited Helen Williams to accompany her to the inn, so that the whole party of the Bannerworths went away together with the one addition to it of that poor girl who had so narrow an escape of becoming the vampire's bride. Horrible destiny! End of chapter 121 Read by Richard Wallace, Liberty, Missouri, 30 April 2009hundred twenty two of Varney the Vampire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Varney the Vampire, Volume two by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter one hundred twenty two. Mrs. Williams visits the Bannerworths at the inn. The marriage of James Anderson with Helen. Let us fancy now, after all these singular circumstances had taken place, the Bannerworth family, with James Anderson and Helen Williams, seated in a comfortable room at the inn at Anderbury, where they had put up when they came to that place, in pursuance of the invitation they had received from Mrs. Williams. And that lady, probably could she have foreseen what was about to occur, would have taken most especial pains to prevent such an invitation from ever reaching such a destination but she had fallen a victim to her own love of display, and not being content with inviting people whom she did know, she must forsooth give them a carte blanche to bring with them people whom she did not know at all. And this it was that she had been horrified by what had taken place, and had had all her brightest visions of the future leveled with the dust. When Jack Pringle told Mrs. Williams that he believed she would quite willingly have sold her daughter to a vampire, he was right for she would have done so, always provided that the vampire, as aforesaid, had a good property, and was able to convince her of that most important fact. The only person of all the little party that was assembled at the inn, who looked pale and anxious, was poor Helen, and she certainly did look so, for when we come to consider her novel position we shall not wonder at it. She had thrown herself completely upon the consideration of strangers, and was severed from all those natural ties which ought to have for ever held her in their gentle bondage. But this conduct, or rather the conduct of that one who ought to have protected her through all trouble and anxieties, her mother, had been such as to deprive her of the feeling that she had a home at all. Flora saw that her guest, as indeed she considered Helen, looked sad and dejected and she made every effort within her power to rescue her from such a state of things. "'Do not despair of much happiness,' she whispered to her, "'but rather thank good fortune, 
which, at the last moment, rescued you from one whom you could not love. Be assured that now you will enjoy the protection of those who will soon be able to prevail upon your mother to look with a favorable eye upon any new arrangement. I am very much beholden to you, said Helen, very much beholden to you, and I feel that I ought to congratulate myself upon my escape, but my heart does feel sad, because the state of things, to avoid which I made myself a sacrifice, may now ensue in all their terrors. My dear, said the Admiral, who overheard her, don't you believe any such rubbish as all that? I have no doubt you have been regularly persecuted into the match with the supposed baron, and you would, perhaps, have found out afterwards that one half of the things you were told to induce you to consent had no foundation but in somebody's active imagination. Do you think so, sir? Do I think so? To be sure I do. Now, I dare say you were told how, if you married the baron, what's his name, you would be doing something wonderful for all your family. Yes, yes. Oh, of course, I can see through all that clearly enough, and I tell you, my lass, that you have had a most fortunate escape, and that there is and shall be no reason on the face of the earth why you should not be married to the man of your choice. He has been to sea, and so, of course, he has finished what may be called his education. If he had been on shore all his life, you might have doubted about the prudence of having him, but as it is, it's quite another matter. Sir, I thank you for your kind advocacy of my cause, said James Anderson and I shall ever consider, as one of the most fortunate accidents of my life, the meeting with Admiral Bell. Oh, don't say anything about that. I know some of the people at the Admiralty, and when you go to make the report of how you have been shipwrecked, and how you lost your dispatches, I will give you a letter of introduction, which, I dare say, won't do you any harm. Indeed, sir, this is more kindness than I ought to expect. Not at all, my boy, not at all. Don't put yourself out of the way about it. Only I tell you what I would do. You need not take my advice unless you like, but if I were you, I'd be hanged if I moved an inch anywhere till I made Helen Williams my wife. Can you suppose, cried James Anderson, while his eyes sparkled with delight, can you suppose, my dear sir, that such advice could be other than most welcome to me? And what do you say, Helen, to it? whispered Flora. What can I say? You can say yes, I suppose, said the Admiral. Helen was silent. Very good, added the Admiral. When a girl doesn't say no, of course she means yes. "'And you can make sure of your prize now you have got her, Master Anderson. "'Let's see. You manage these affairs with what you call a special license, don't you?' "'Yes, Uncle,' said Flora. "'That is the way. "'You seem to know all about it, and I almost suspect you really must have had some experience in these matters.' "'I experience, you little gypsy? What do you mean? "'I never was married in all my life, and I don't intend to be. "'Don't make too sure, Uncle. But, despite all that, "'no one could more warmly second your advice to Mr. Anderson than myself.' Very good. For that speech, I forgive you. And now, Mr. Anderson, just come along with me, for I want to say a few words to you which nobody else has anything to do with. When the Admiral got James Anderson alone, he said to him, Of course you are without funds, so it's no use making any fuss of delicacy about it. I have no doubt but that, with my interest, I shall be able to get you into an appointment of some sort. But in the meantime, I beg that you will not cross me in my desire to serve you. And mind, I take your word of honor to repay me, so, you see, there is no obligation." "'Sir, this noble generosity, there, there, that's quite enough. "'For the fact is, it ain't noble generosity at all, "'so hold your tongue about it, "'and be so good as to let me consider that as settled. "'Here are fifty pounds for you, "'which will enable you to go to London like a gentleman, "'and to conduct your marriage either here or there, "'as you may yourself think proper, "'and as your bride may consent. "'Sir, I would fain make Helen my own here. "'Very good. "'I don't pretend to understand how to manage these things, "'but set about it as quickly as you can, and don't be deterred by anybody. This short but, to James Anderson, deeply interesting conversation, because it relieved his mind from a load of anxiety, took place a few paces from the inn door only, so that they returned at once, but scarcely had they joined the rest of the party, and were considering what they should order for dinner, when one of the waiters of the establishment came to say, If you please, there's a lady who wants to come in. I asked her her name, but she won't give it, but she says she must see everybody. "'The deuce she must!' cried the Admiral. "'What sort of a craft is she?' "'Sort of a what, sir?' "'My fears tell me,' sobbed Helen, "'that it is my mother.' The Admiral whistled, and then he said, "'I suppose we shall have a breeze, "'but the sooner it's over the better. "'Let the lady come in, "'and don't you be afraid of anything, my lass. "'Why, you look as pale as if you expected. "'Here she is.' The door was flung open, and Mrs. Williams made her appearance. Anger was upon her face, 
and it required but a small amount of penetration to perceive that she came fully charged with all sorts of reproaches. Helen trembled and shrunk back, for she had an habitual fear of her mother, which the imperious conduct of that individual had induced in the mind of so gentle a creature as Helen from her very childhood. "'Well, madam,' said Henry, stepping forward, "'to what are we indebted for the honor of this visit from one who has not the courtesy to wait for an invitation?' "'Oh, I expected this,' said Mrs. Williams, with a shivering toss of her head. "'I quite expected this, I can assure you, of course. "'But I'll pretty soon let you know, sir, what I came about. "'I have come for my daughter, sir. "'What have you to say against that?' "'Nothing, madam, if your daughter chooses to comply with your request.' "'Helen!' screamed Mrs. Williams. "'Helen, I command you to come home this moment.' "'Mother, hear me,' said Helen. "'Consent to my happiness with one whom I can love.' with the same readiness that you would have seen me the bride of one for whom I never could hope to feel anything in the shape of affection, and I will accompany you home at once. Oh, dear, yes, of course, consent to ruin, consent to nonsense, consent to your marrying a scapegrace who cannot even keep himself, far less a wife. No, Helen, you cannot expect that I should ever consent to your marrying such a poor wretch. But don't you think, said Henry, that any poor wretch is better than a vampire? No, I do not. "'Oh, very good, then,' said the Admiral. "'If that's the lady's opinion, what can we say to her? "'And as for commanding Miss Helen here to go home, I command her to stay.' "'You command her?' "'Yes, to be sure. Ain't I an Admiral? "'What have you got to say against that, I should like to know? "'I shall take good care that James Anderson is no poor wretch "'by getting him some good appointment. "'And as your daughter is of age, old girl, and so can choose for herself, "'you may as well weigh anchor and be off at once, "'for nobody wants to be bothered with you.' "'Do you mean to say that you are a real admiral, and have nothing to do with the horse marines?' "'Nothing whatever, ma'am. Good day to you. We are all waiting for our dinners, and don't feel disposed to talk any more, so be off with you.' Mrs. Williams seemed to be considering for a moment, and then she said, "'Oh, gracious, a, a mother's feelings must always be excused. I almost think that, just to please you, admiral, I will consent.' "'You will, mother?' exclaimed Helen. "'Why, in a manner of speaking,' said Mrs. Williams, "'I should not mind, but it's quite, you see, a dreadful thing to think of, "'when we consider what an expense I have gone to in all these matters, "'and that I have not had so much as one farthing from the baron, "'although he did say he would pay all the cost I might be put to.' "'From resources which, in course of time, industry may procure me,' "'said James Anderson eagerly, "'you shall be repaid all that you can possibly say has been expended for Helen. "'Ah, well then, if Admiral Bell here will say that he will see me paid, I consent.' "'Very well,' said the Admiral. "'I'll see you paid. "'If you had acted generously in the matter, "'you should have been a gainer. "'But as it is, you shall be paid, "'and we decline your acquaintance.' "'Mrs. Williams began, "'from the tone and manner of her daughter's new friends, "'to suspect that it would have been more prudent on her part "'if she had behaved in a very different manner towards them, "'and complied with a good grace with their wishes. "'For, as regarded the Baron, "'anything in the shape of a more extended connection with him "'was clearly out of the question.' But she had gone almost too far for reconciliation, and, although there was no such thing as denying the genius of the lady, she was, for a few moments, puzzled to know what to do. At length, however, she thought it would not be a bad plan to be suddenly quite overcome with her feelings and make a desperate scene. Accordingly, to the surprise of everyone, and the consternation of the admiral, she suddenly uttered a piercing scream and commenced a good exhibition of hysterics. "'Damn it!' cried the admiral. "'What does she mean by that?' "'Come, come, I say, Mother Williams, we cannot stand all that noise. "'You know, it is quite out of the question.' "'Let us all leave the room,' said Henry, "'and send Jack Pringle to her. "'I have heard him say that he has some mode of recovering ladies from hysterics "'by throwing a pailful of salt water over them "'and then biting their thumbnails off.' "'The wretch!' exclaimed Mrs. Williams, suddenly recovering. "'The wretch! I'd let him know soon enough what it was to interfere with my nails.' "'Oh, you are better, are you?' said the Admiral. "'What's that to you?' shrieked Mrs. Williams. "'I'll go at once to a lawyer and see what can be done with you. "'I look upon you all with odium and contempt.' "'Ah, words easily spoken,' said the Admiral. "'And just like the young chickens, they commonly go home to roost.' Mrs. Williams darted an angry look at the whole party, which she intended should be expressive at once of the immense contempt in which she held them, and of her determination to have vengeance upon their heads, which double-dealing look, however, had no effect upon them of an intimidating character, and then she bounced from the room. "'My dear,' said the Admiral, turning to Helen, who he saw was affected at the proceeding, "'my dear, don't you fret yourself. Your mother cannot make us angry, and, as far as regards her own anger, it will all subside, 
and then we will forget that she has said anything at all uncivil to us. So don't you fret yourself about what is of no consequence at all. You may depend, said Henry, that such will be the fact, and that in a very short time you will find that your mother has completely recovered from her anger, and will be as pleasant with us all as possible. I grieve to say so to you, but the fact is, what you must perceive, namely, that as regards your mother, your marriage is merely a matter of pounds, shillings, and pence, and when she finds that the baron's fortune cannot be had, she will content herself with reflecting upon the prospects of Mr. James Anderson, who, if he do well, will soon be quite a favorite. It was humiliating to poor Helen to be forced to confess that this was the correct view to take of the question, but she could not help doing so at all, and, after a time, she did not regret having sufficient moral courage to resist the command of her mother's to return home. In the society of him whom she loved, and upheld and encouraged, too, as she was by Flora, who was just about the best and kindest companion such a person as Helen could have had, the minutes began to fly past upon rosy pinions, and the remainder of that day, she confessed, even to the Admiral, was the happiest she had known for many a weary month. The Bannerworths and James Anderson fully expected another visit from Mrs. Williams on the morrow, but she did not come, and although they had expected her to do so, her not coming was no disappointment, but, on the contrary, a matter for some congratulation. But no time was lost, and as James Anderson was really most anxious to get to London to report himself at the Admiralty, and as that was an anxiety in which the Admiral much encouraged him, so that as it was quite an understood thing among them all that the marriage of the fair Helen should take place before he again left her, a special license was procured, and the ceremony arranged to take place at nine o'clock in the morning, on the second morning after the strange and exciting occurrences at the Anderbury House. This marriage was conducted in the most private manner possible, because, as it had been so well known throughout the whole of Anderbury that Helen Williams was the chosen of the great and rich Baron Stolmuir of Salzburg, who had turned out to be such an equivocal character. The news of her marriage with anyone else would have been sure to have created a vast amount of public curiosity. All this they escaped by fixing the hour at which the ceremony was to be performed at an early hour in the morning, and trusting no one out of their own party with the secret. Of course, from what the reader knows of the gentle and timid disposition of Helen Williams, he may well suppose how glad she would have been to have had the countenance of her mother at her marriage, notwithstanding the conduct of that mother was certainly not what should have entitled her to the esteem of any one whatever, not excepting her own child. But this was a feeling which, when she came to consider the new tie she was forming, was likely soon to wear away, and although, while she pronounced those words which were irrevocably to make her another's, the tears gushed to her eyes, they were far different from those bitter drops she had shed when they considered that, beyond all hope of redemption, she was condemned to become the bride of the baron. When the ceremony was over, they all went back very quietly and comfortably to the inn, and after a good breakfast, and many healths had been drank to the bride, James Anderson, according to arrangement, took his departure for London, leaving Helen in the care of the Bannerworths until he should come back to claim her, as he now could do, despite all the plots and machinations of Mrs. Williams, who, as yet, was in a state of blessed ignorance as to the fact of her daughter's wedding, and who had not quite made up her mind as to what she should do next in so delicate and troublesome a transaction. End of chapter 122 Read by Richard Wallace Liberty, Missouri 1st of May, 2009123 of Barney the Vampire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Barney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 123. Mrs. Williams takes the initiative and nearly catches an admiral. Mrs. Williams, when she reached home after what must be called her very unsuccessful attempt to make a disturbance, and to do the grand at the inn where the Bannerworths were, set herself seriously to think what would be the best course for her to adopt in the rather perplexing aspect of her affairs. The few words she had used at the inn, indicative of her censure of all the proceedings, had been of rather a strong and energetic character, so that she had a very uncomfortable suspicion upon her mind 
that she would find it rather a difficult task to pacify her daughter's new friends. The offer which the admiral had made, to repay to her any expense she had been at, impressed her with a belief that he surely must be in possession of what, to her, was the most delightful thing in the world, and comprehended all sorts of virtue, namely, money. And, of course, her feelings became instantly most wonderfully ameliorated. "'I am very much afraid I have been too precipitate,' she said. "'I really am afraid I have, and that ain't a pleasant reflection by any means. What can I do to get good friends with them all, and particularly the dear old gentleman who promised to pay me. This was the problem which Mrs. Williams presented to her mind, for the captivating idea of actually having been paid five hundred pounds by the baron, and thus sending in a bill of the same amount to the admiral, took wonderful and complete possession of her. This was, indeed, she considered, a master stroke of policy, and all she had now to consider was, the means of getting on such good terms with the admiral, that he should neither question items nor amount of the account she intended to send him in. If he only pays the five hundred pounds as well as the baron has paid his, I shall not come out of the transaction so badly, said Mrs. Williams. While she was in this state of perplexity, she was sitting by the window of her dining-room, which commanded a view of the street, and, as she sat there, she was much surprised to see Jack Pringle, who she still had a lingering suspicion might, notwithstanding his declaimer of the title, be Admiral Green, on the other side of the way, making various significant movements of his hands and head, as if he had something of an exceedingly secret and strange mysterious nature to communicate to her, Mrs. Williams. This was quite sufficient to call for that lady's most serious attention, and accordingly she walked graciously so close to the window that her aristocratic nose touched the glass, and nodded to Jack, after which she beckoned him across the way, after the manner of the ghost in Hamlet, upon which Jack, with a nod, came across the way forthwith. In another moment Mrs. Williams opened the street door herself, and said, "'Mr. What's-your-name, have you got anything to say to me?' "'Rather,' said Jack. "'What is it, then? Pray what is it, Mr. What's-your-name?' "'Don't call me What's-your-name, ma'am, any longer. My name is Jack Pringle.' "'Mr. John Pringle, I suppose?' No such thing, nothing but plain Jack, ma'am, so you see you are mistaken. But I have got something to say to you, ma'am, as you ought to know. Any one who had known Jack would have seen, by a certain mischievous twinkling of the eyes, that he had on hand what he considered one of the most excellent of jokes in all the world, and was about to perpetrate what he thought some famous piece of jollity. What it was we shall quickly perceive from his communication with Mrs. Williams. Well, ma'am, he added, you know Admiral Bell, I believe? Oh, yes, yes, certainly I do. Well, I don't know as I ought to tell you, Mrs. W., what I am going to tell you. But first of all, the old Admiral, what with prize money, pay, and one thing and another, is so immensely rich that he really don't know what to do with his money. How dreadful, said Mrs. Williams. I think I could really suggest to him some few things to do. Oh, he is so desperately obstinate, he will listen to nobody. And, you see, as he never married, who has he got to leave it to? At least that's what we have been all wondering, for I don't know how long. But now what do you think we have found out, Mrs. Williams? Well, that's very difficult, of course, for me to say. Perhaps you will be so good as to tell me. You ought to know. He has fallen in love, ma'am, actually in love, for the first time in his life. Yes, he has actually fallen in love, Mrs. Williams. There's a go. And with one of my daughters. It's with Julia. I did mention her to him, and I thought I saw a curious expression come across his face. Of course, I'm quite delighted to hear it, for, with the feelings of a mother, I like to get my girls off hand as well as I can, and, as Admiral Bell is so very respectable a person, I can have no sort of objection in the world. There you go again, said Jack. You are quite mistaken, I can tell you. You never made a greater blunder than that in all your life, Mother Williams. Excuse me, ma'am, but that's my way. Oh, don't mention it. But where's the mistake, my dear sir? Why, just here, ma'am, just here. The Admiral is not so young as he was twenty-five years ago, and he ain't quite such a fool as to think that a young girl can care anything for him. But he is in love for all that. Only you see, ma'am, it happens to be with somebody else. "'Good gracious! Who is it? 
and why do you come to me about it? Because it's you. Me? Me? Oh, gracious providence, you don't mean that. In love with me, the rich old admiral. He cannot live long. How much money, take it all together, do you really think he has got? I declare you have taken me so by surprise that I don't know what I am saying. Of course, he will propose a very handsome settlement. You may depend upon all that, said Jack. But the odd thing is, you see, ma'am, that although he is quite over head and ears in love, he won't own it, but walks about like a bear with a bad place on his back, doing nothing but growl, growl from morning till night. Then how can you tell, said Mrs. Williams, if he never said so? Oh, he does say so. He mumbles it out to himself, and we have heard him say, Damn it all, that Mrs. Williams is the craft for my money, but what's the use of me bothering her about it? She wouldn't have an old hulk like me, so I won't say anything about it to anybody. What an amiable idea! Very, ma'am, very, and what I have come to you for now is to say that if you have no objection to the match, you might as well make the old man happy by letting him know in some sort of way that you wouldn't be so hard-hearted as he thinks, but would have him if he would say the word. How can I express how obliged I am to you, Mr. Wingle? Pringle, if you please, ma'am, is my name, and as to being obliged to me, you ain't at all, and I'll tell you how. You see, I and the Admiral have sailed with each other for many a voyage, and I have a sort of feeling for the old man that makes me, when I see that he has a fancy, try my best to gratify him. And without thinking of anybody but him, I've come to you just to tell you what I know about the affair, and I must leave it to you to do what you like. Still, I am very much obliged to you. What if I were to call and ask for a private interview with the old man? A good idea, said Jack. It was only the other day I heard him say you was his pearl, and the main chain of his heart, I can tell you, and ever such a load more. He will be taking his dinner at four to-day, and after that he usually takes a sleep in an armchair in a room by himself, and if you like to come then you will catch him. Be assured, my dear sir, I shall be there punctually to the minute. You will be so good as to receive me and introduce me to him, and perhaps it would remove some of his timidity if I were to let him know that I was aware that he called me his pearl, and the main chain of his heart. Of course it would, said Jack. You put him in mind of it, ma'am, and if you find him backward a little, don't you mind about giving him a little encouragement, because you know all the while he really means it, so you need not care about it. Well, Mr. Ah, uh, ah, uh, Bingle, all I can say is that I feel very much obliged to you indeed for letting me know this matter, and my great respect for you and for the old admiral will, I assure you, induce me to consent to what you propose. Ahem, of course, I have many offers, as you may well suppose, Mr. Kringle. Damn it, said Jack. I've told you before that my name is Pringle, and if you can't recollect that, just call me Jack and have done with it. You won't forget Jack, I'll be bound. Call me that, and I shan't quarrel with you about it, ma'am, but don't be inventing all sorts of odd names for me. Pray excuse me, my dear sir, I certainly will do no such thing and at three o'clock I hope I shall have the pleasure of seeing you. I believe it's the Red Lion where you are staying? Yes, the Red Lion Inn, and at three I shall be on the lookout for you, ma'am, you may depend. And I only hope you won't mistake the Admiral's bashfulness for anything else, because, I assure you, he is mad in love with you, but won't like to own it, ma'am. So just you bring him out a little, and don't you mind what he says." Mrs. Williams duly promised she would not mind what the old man said, and, from what we know of that lady, we are quite inclined, for once in a way, to give her credit for sincerity in that matter, and the greatest possible amount of candor. As for Jack, when he left her house and had got fairly round the corner and out of sight, he laughed to that excess that several passers-by stopped to look at him in wonder, and had he not ceased, he certainly would have had a crowd around him in a very few minutes longer that would have perhaps thought him out of his senses. But after a few minutes, the explosion of his bottled-up mirth had subsided, and after giving a boy, who was nearest to him of the admiring spectators, a good rap on the head, he walked to the inn. Jack would have been glad to have told someone of the capital joke he was playing off at the Admiral's expense, but he was afraid of being betrayed, so he wisely kept the secret of the forthcoming jest all to himself, 
although Henry Bannerworth and Charles Holland might both, after such a thing happened, or even during its progress, have a good laugh at it, it is not to be supposed, entertaining as they did so great a respect for the old admiral, that they would have lent themselves to the perpetration of such a joke. As may be supposed, Mrs. Williams was all flutter and expectation, and the idea of at length mending her decayed fortune by an union with the old man, who was reported to be immensely rich, and who had already reached an age when his life could not be depended upon one week from another, was one of the most gratifying circumstances on record to her. No possible plan could have been devised which was so likely to chime in with her humor as this, and if she had been asked in which way she would like to make money, it would have been that which she would have undoubtedly chosen. Now, she thought, I shall, after all, make an admirable thing of this affair. There can be no doubt. I shall, of course, soon be a widow again, for the old sea monster cannot live long. I shall insist upon a very liberal settlement indeed, and then I suppose, while he does live, I must keep him in good humor, so that he may leave me, at all events, the bulk of his property when he dies, and then I can live in the style I like, and make everybody die of envy. To excite an extraordinary amount of envy was the very height of felicity to Mrs. Williams, as, indeed, it is to many people of far greater pretensions than that lady and we cannot help thinking, when we see gaudy equipages, and all the glittering and costly paraphernalia of parvenu wealth, that the great object of it is to excite envy far more than admiration and pleasure. There are the Narrowidges, and the Staples, and the Jenkinses, thought Mrs. Williams. Oh, I know they will all be ready to eat their very heads off when they hear that I am married, and that, too, so well. Oh, they will die of spite, and particularly Mrs. Jenkins. I am quite sure she will have a serious illness. These were the kind of triumphs upon which Mrs. Williams felicitated herself, and pictured to her imagination as the result of her marriage with the Admiral, which she now looked upon as quite a settled thing, because, if he were willing, she felt perfectly sure that she was, and therefore what was to prevent the union from taking place. What pleasant anticipations these were! Really, we can almost consider them, while they lasted, as sufficient to counterbalance any disappointment which was likely afterwards to take place, and the hour or two which Mrs. Williams devoted to the gorgeous dream of wealth she so fully expected to enjoy were probably the most delightful she had ever passed. And certainly, so far she had to thank Jack Pringle for giving her so much satisfaction, although, as will be seen, she did not feel towards him any great amount of gratitude on the momentous occasion. Mrs. Williams, no doubt, still thought herself quite a fascinating woman, and when she had failed in guessing that it was to herself that the Admiral was, according to Jack's account, devoted, it was not that she entertained a modest and quiet opinion of her own attractions, but from the force of habit, seeing that so long a period had elapsed without her having an admirer, that she could not believe she had one then until actually assured in plain language of the fact." And now, about half an hour before the appointed time, the lady arrayed herself in what she considered an extremely becoming and fashionable costume, and started to keep her appointment with Jack Pringle, who, in her affections, now held quite a pleasant place, and towards whom she considered herself so much indebted for the kind information she had received at his hands. The distance from any house in Anderbury to any other was but short, so that Mrs. Williams was within the time mentioned when she reached the door of the Red Lion, but she was gratified to find that Jack Pringle was there, apparently on the lookout for her, because it showed that nothing had happened to alter the aspect of affairs, but that the chances of her becoming Mrs. Admiral Bell were as strong as ever. "'I'm glad you have come,' said Jack. "'They got over dinner rather quick, and that's a fact, and the old man is fast asleep as usual, so you can commence operations at once.' A thousand thanks, a thousand thanks, my good friend, and you may depend upon my gratitude. Hush, never mind that, said Jack. I don't want nothing. This way, this way, ma'am, if you please. End of chapter 123chapter 26, which immediately follows chapter 123 of Varney the Vampire, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Varney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Note, Chapters 124 and 125 do not exist in the text. Chapter 126, The Admiral in a Breeze, A General Commotion, and Jack Pringle Much Wanted But Not to Be Found. To say that Mrs. Williams was on the tiptoe of expectation is to say very little that can convey a good idea of what was her real condition, nervously speaking, as she followed Jack Pringle up, not the principal, but a back staircase of the inn, toward the room where the admiral took his nap, which was, his custom always of an afternoon. The fact is that Jack had a great dread of Mrs. Williams being seen by any of the Bannerworth family, because they all knew her and the nice little plot that he had got up for the purpose of holding out the admiral to ridicule, while at the same time he enjoyed the immense satisfaction of having some revenge upon Mrs. Williams. Hence was it that, like many a great politician, he went up the back staircase instead of the front, in order to avoid the unnecessary observation and remark. By good fortune, as well as good management, Jack met nobody, but succeeded in reaching the room door, within which the admiral was sleeping, in perfect safety. "'Now, ma'am,' said Jack, "'don't you be backward about going forward, "'cause, as I tell you, the old man is dying by inches for you, "'and I don't see why you shouldn't have his half a million of money "'as well as anybody else. "'Ah, and a good deal better, too, when one comes to consider all things.' "'Thank you, Mr. Pringle, thank you. "'I really don't know how to express my obligations to you upon my word.' "'You are so very kind and considerate in all you say. "'Oh, don't mention it, ma'am. "'Walk in, and there you will find the old baby. "'I shouldn't wonder but he's disturbing his old brains "'by dreaming of you now.' "'Jack opened the door, "'and Mrs. Williams glided noiselessly into the apartment, "'where, seated, sure enough, in an easy chair, "'with a silk handkerchief over his face, "'sat the admiral, fast asleep, "'enjoying that comfortable siesta, which he never for one moment imagined would be disturbed in the manner it was about to be. Well, said Mrs. Williams, there he is, to be sure, just as Jack Pringle said, asleep and no doubt dreaming of me. I must make sure of the old fool in one interview, or he may slip through my fingers, and that would not be at all pleasant after counting upon him and taking some trouble on the matter. But although she made up her mind that nothing should be wanting, upon her part, to make sure of him, yet she debated whether she ought to awaken him or not, for she well knew that many old people, especially men, were very irascible if they are awakened suddenly, and from what she had already seen of the admiral, she could very well imagine that such might be the case with him. This was getting rather a quandary, out of which Mrs. Williams did not exactly see her way, and yet the proposition that the admiral was to be, and must be, awakened in some way, remained as firmly as ever fixed in her mind and then, too, the idea, a very natural one under the circumstances, came across her that each minute was fraught with danger, and that, for all she knew, the yea or nay of the whole affair might depend upon the promptitude with which it was concluded. What if, she asked herself, some of the odious Bannerworth people were to come in and find her there? Of course they would awaken the admiral at once, and in consequence of their presence, she would lose all opportunity of exercising those little blandishments which she meant to bring to bear upon him. This was positively alarming. The idea of all being lost prompted her at all events to attempt something, so Mrs. Williams thought that the mildest way of awaking the admiral was by a loud sneeze, which she executed without producing the least effect, as might have been expected, for the man who had many a time slept soundly in the wildest fury of the elements was not likely to awaken because somebody sneezed. Dear me, how sound he sleeps! Ahem! Ahem! Achoo! Ahem! Achooey! The admiral was proof against all this, and Mrs. Williams might just as well have spared herself the trouble of exciting such an amount of artificial sneezes, for the admiral slept on, and it was quite clear that something much more sonorous would be required for the purpose of awakening him. How vexatious, she thought! How very vexatious! But there's no help for it. Awakened he must be, that's quite clear, and if fair means won't do it, why, foul must. Acting upon this resolve, Mrs. Williams hesitated no longer, but, approaching the sleeping admiral, she dragged the handkerchief off his face, and its passage over his nose, no doubt, produced the tickling sensation that induced him to give that organ a very hard rub, 
indeed, and start wide awake with an exclamation that was much more forcible than elegant, and that consequently we need not transfer to our pages at all. "'Oh, Admiral!' said Mrs. Williams, assuming a look that ought at once to have melted a heart of stone. "'Oh, Admiral, can you indeed forgive me?' "'The devil!' said the Admiral. "'Can you indeed look over the fact that in my anxiety to see that face I took from before it the envious and yet fortunate handkerchief that covered it? It was my act, and upon my head fall all the censure, my dear good kind Admiral.' The old man rubbed his eyes very hard with his knuckles as he said, "'I suppose I'm awake.' "'You are awake, my dear sir. It is indeed no dream, let me assure you, that disturbs you, but a living reality. You are awake, my dear sir. Why, why, what do you mean? I begin to think I am awake with a vengeance. But who are you? Hang me if I don't think you are old Mother Williams. Oh, my dear Admiral, you are so facetious, so very facetious. But can you for one moment fancy, my dear sir, that I am insensible to your merit? Can you fancy that I could look with other than indulgent eyes upon a bell? Upon a what? A bell, an admiral bell, indeed, I may say, with a slight but pardonable alteration of a word, an admirable bell. My dear sir, your pearl speaks to you. The admiral was so amazed at this address, accompanied as it was by most languishing looks, that, with his mouth wide open, and his eyes preternaturally distended, he gazed upon Mrs. Williams without saying a word, from which she inferred that he was beginning to see that she was aware of his attachment to her, and was thinking of how he could best express his gratitude for her taking the initiative in the matter. Thus encouraged, then, she spoke again, saying as she advanced close to him, "'Oh, my dear sir, what a thing the human heart is! Only to think now that from the first moment I saw you, I should whisper to myself, "'There, yes, there is the only human being for whose sake I could again enter into that holy state from which the death of Mr. Williams released me. Why, good God, said the Admiral, the woman's mad. Oh, no, no, the world, the horrid low workaday world, may make invidious remarks about us, but your pearl will recompense you for all that, and in the sweet concord of domestic life we shall never sigh for more than we shall have, which will be, of course, if I understand rightly, a large income. I don't know how much a year, and if I ask, it is only out of curiosity, my dear sir, and nothing else. Love, absolute and beautiful love, is all I ask. Helloa, roared the Admiral. Charles, Henry, Jack, where the devil are you all? Damn it, you are all ready enough when I don't want you, but now, when I am going to be boarded by a mad woman, you can't come one of you. Helloa, help, Charles, Jack, you lubber, where the deuce have you taken yourself to, and why don't you tumble up when you are sent for? But, my dear sir, why need you trouble yourself to call so many witnesses to our happiness? Let us be privately married in some rural church. Privately damned first, I'd be, said the old admiral. Oh, then, it shall be a public alliance if you wish it, exclaimed Mrs. Williams, as she made up her mind to clinch the affair at once by a coup de main, and advancing to the admiral, she flung her arms around his neck, just as a door at the other end of the apartment opened, and Charles and Henry, with Flora, made their appearance, and looked with the most intense astonishment at the scene before them. "'Well, uncle,' said Charles, "'I certainly should not have expected this of you. I am astonished, I must confess.' "'Nor I,' said Henry. "'Why, Admiral, I had no idea you were so dangerous a personage.' Mrs. Williams, when she saw what arrivals had taken place, gave a faint scream, and released the admiral, and then she added, "'Oh, admiral, how could you hold me so when you hear somebody coming? How shall I ever survive such a scene as this? My character will be gone for ever, unless I am immediately married to you, and I have no doubt but that all your friends will at once see the propriety of such a step.' "'I do,' said Charles. "'And I,' said Henry. "'And I, of course,' said Flora." Mrs. Williams burst into tears when she saw this unanimity of opinion, but the admiral's face got the color of a piece of beetroot, and he was only silent for a moment or two, while he was made the subject of these cruel remarks, until he could sufficiently recover to speak with the energy that did characterize him when he really began. 
we are not exactly in the vein to transfer to our pages the violent expletives with which he garnished his outburst of passion and our readers if they recall to their minds a large amount of nautical oaths can have no difficulty in supposing that the admiral uttered every one of them with a volubility that was perfectly alarming damn it do you mean to kill me all of you or to drive me mad five oaths in a string came in here do you want to cut me up you three horrible epithets what do you mean by setting this old woman upon me whose precious idea was this i should like to know to put an elderly she-dragon upon me whom i hate and be ten oaths at least when i was enjoying a comfortable nap hate exclaimed mrs williams did you say hate you old seducing villain when you knew you said i was your pearl you hoary-headed ruffian that's a thundering crammer cried the admiral you said it yourself and as for hating you damn it if i don't do that with all my heart and this is the way i am to be treated before people oh you wicked old sinner i understand you now your intentions were not honourable and now you find that my virtue is proof against your horrid old fascinations you want to pretend that it is all a mistake really said charles we must confess uncle that we found mrs williams and you ahem <clears throat> rather loving you know and the gentleman on these occasions is usually asked to account for such things i take it of course said mrs williams i'll bring an action against the admiral and i shall call upon you all to be witnesses for me oh you old sinner i'll make you pay for this we certainly can all be witnesses said flora that the admiral called for help and when we came in we found mrs williams holding him fast round the neck to which he seemed to have the greatest possible repugnance that's right hurrah that's the truth flora my dear that's just how it was this horrid old woman came all of a sudden and laid hold of me after awakening me, and then I called for help. That's how it was. But these gentlemen, said Mrs. Williams, appealing to Henry and Charles, will swear quite different. Oh, I beg your pardon, Mrs. Williams, said Charles. If we are brought forward to swear anything, we must be correct, and therefore we shall have to say just what this lady has stated, and perhaps your best plan will be to go away and say no more about it but consider that you have made a mistake. A mistake! screamed Mrs. Williams. How could I make a mistake when Mr. John Pringle, who knows the Admiral so well, told me that he was dying to see me and in love with me to never such an extent, only that he was afraid I would not have anything to say to him on such a subject? The Admiral drew a long breath and sat down. Then, clenching his hand, he shook it above his head, saying, in a voice of deep and concentrated anger, I thought as much. Damn it if I did not. It's all that infernal scoundrel Jack Pringle's doings, I find. It's one of that lubberly mutinous thief's tricks, and it's the last one he shall ever play me. A trick! screamed Mrs. Williams. A trick! You don't mean that! Ah, me! What compensation shall I get for the dreadful circumstance which has made me confess the secret of my heart? What shall I do? Oh, what shall I do? When shall I hope for consolation? What sum of money, even if you, my dear Admiral, were to offer it to me, would be a sufficient balm now to my wounded heart? Madam, said Henry, it seems as if you have been imposed upon, and made the victim of a practical joke, which we nor the Admiral can have nothing to do with, and the only consolation we can offer to your wounded heart is that we will keep the secret of your attachment most inviolate. What compensation is that to me? I'll bring my action for breach of promise of marriage, if I don't get something, and that's something very handsome, too. It's all very fine to talk to me about your mistakes. I'll be paid. Ah, and paid well, too, or I'll make the whole country ring again with the matter. Madam, said Charles, I dare say the Admiral don't care one straw whether the country rings again or not, and you can do just as you please but since you have commenced threatening, you will, I hope, see the obvious propriety of at once leaving his place. I will leave this place, but it shall be to go direct to my solicitor, and see what he shall say to a lone woman being treated in this way. I'll swear that he called me his pearl, and if that don't get me a verdict and most exemplary damages, I don't know what will. We shall see what we shall see, and in the meantime, you wretches, I'll leave you all to contempt. Yes, contempt. Stop a bit, ma'am, said the admiral. 
It's quite plain to me that you don't mind how you earn a trifle, so that you do get it. And now I'll tell you that if you find out that rascal, Jack Pringle, and give him a good trouncing for his share in the business, you may come to me for a reward. Mrs. Williams, whatever might have been her personal feelings on this head, did not deign to make the least reply to this intimation, but suddenly cried, I want to see my daughter. She's not here at present, said Flora, and if she were, she is Mrs. Anderson now, and therefore would of course decline accompanying you to your home, and she is only waiting some arrangements of her husband's prior, most probably, to going to London with him. This speech brought to the recollection of Mrs. Williams that the admiral had promised her all the expenses that she had been at contingent upon the broken-off marriage of her daughter with the baron, and she began to consider that her action for breach of promise of marriage against him might fail, and that, if it succeeded, it might not bring in half so much as the amount of the bill she could by fair means get out of him. These considerations were of great pith and amount, and they had their full effect upon Mrs. Williams. So, instead of bursting out with any further reproaches, she sat down and commenced a softening process by a copious flood of tears which she had always at command. Oh, said the old admiral, you may well cry over it, old girl. I suppose you really thought you had hooked the old man at last, eh? But never do you mind, you may make a good thing of it yet, if you get a hold of that scoundrel Pringle, and serve him out well. I'll pay for that job more willingly than for anything else I know of just at present. Don't speak to me of that brute, my dear sir, sobbed Mrs. Williams. It's a very cruel thing, of course, to be used in this way, and, as it's all a mistake on my part, I hope you will excuse and look after what has happened. I am sure I should be the last person in the world to trouble anybody with visits who did not want to see me, and so, I dare say, we shall only meet once again in this world. Once again, madam, what is the use of our ever meeting again? It would look decidedly disrespectful on my part if I were not to hand you the bill myself for the little matters that you were kind enough to say you would pay for on account of what I had expended on Helen's projected marriage with that vampire baron, you know, Admiral. Oh, ah, I recollect now. Well, well, I don't want to go back from my word, and as I did promise you, why, I will pay you but as I don't want on any account the pleasure of your company again, you will be so kind, ma'am, as to take this twenty pounds note and keep the change. This the admiral thought liberal enough, for his idea of matrimonial preparations consisted of a new dress or two, or so, and which twenty pounds ought fairly enough to cover, and he thought he would do well enough by overpaying Mrs. Williams, as he believed, with that amount. When Mrs. Williams recovered from her surprise, not unmingled with indignation, into which this most audacious, and to her, extraordinary offer threw her, she spoke with a kind of scream that made the old admiral jump again as she shouted in his ears, What? Twenty pounds? Are you in your senses? Twenty pounds! Why, my bill will be at least five hundred pounds! What? roared the admiral. Are you in your senses? Damn it, ma'am, you may swallow your bill, and you had better do so for all the good that it is likely to do you, for if I pay a farthing more, may I be hung up on my old yard-arm. Why, you must think that a British admiral is another name for a fool. Then I'll tell you what, said Mrs. Williams, I'll tell you what, you stupid, old, atrocious sinner, I tell you I will bring my action against you for breach of promise of marriage, and I'll swear that, before your gang of people here came in, who, of course, will swear black is white and white is crimson for you, because I believe you are the father of them all, that you first asked me to live with you, and when I refused, you said you would marry me by special license to-morrow. Madam, said Charles, now that you think proper entirely to forget that you are a lady, allow me to beg of you to retire, because it is quite impossible, after all that has happened, that I should hold any further conversation with you. Yes, Mrs. Williams, said Henry, I hope you will perceive the propriety of at once leaving. At this moment a note was handed to Henry, who, upon opening it, read aloud, The Baron Stolmoyer of Salzburg presents his compliments to Mr. Bannerworth, and begs to state that Mrs. Williams has received from him the sum of five hundred pounds for expenses to be incurred on account of the wedding of her daughter, 
and he hereby fully empowers Mr. Bannerworth to demand of Mrs. Williams that sum, and to devote it to the service and uses of Mr. James Anderson, of whose existence the Baron was not aware when he made his proposal to Mrs. Williams for her daughter, whom she sold to him, the Baron, for that sum. Hilloa! cried the Admiral. What do you think of that, Mrs. Williams? I don't know what you will say to it, but I know very well that I should consider it a shot between wind and water. I trust, said Henry, that you will now still further see the propriety of leaving here, and of letting this matter completely rest, because it strikes me that the more you investigate it, madam, the more it will turn out greatly to your disadvantage. I don't care a pin's head for any of you, nor half a farthing, cried Mrs. Williams. The baron gave me the money, and he has no power to get it back again, as you know well enough. I'll bring my action, and my principal witness shall be Mr. Pringle, who came to my house, and who, if put upon his oath, will be obliged to swear that it was all a lark, said Jack, popping his head just within the amazingly short distance that he opened the door, and then he disappeared before a word could be said to him. Mrs. Williams, who, notwithstanding all her threats, seemed to have a lingering impression that she was victimized in the transaction, had all the ire of her nature aroused at once by the sight of Jack, and she at once rushed after him, leaving the admiral and the bannerworths not at all lamenting her loss. Jack had no idea that he would be followed by anybody but the admiral, and to distance him he knew there was no occasion to run, so when he had got down to the hall of the hotel he subsided into a walk until he heard a tremendous scuffling of feet behind him, and upon looking round, saw Mrs. Williams in full chase, and with an expression upon her countenance which plainly enough indicated that her intentions were not at all of a jocular character. "'The devil,' said Jack, "'if here ain't Mother Williams coming full sail, and at fourteen knots an hour, too, with a fair wind I'll be bound. Never mind, a stern chase is a long chase, so here goes.' As Jack uttered these remarks, he dashed onwards at tremendous speed, but the sight of him again had inflamed Mrs. Williams' wrath to madness, and she made the most incredible exertion to come up with him, so that it was really wonderful to see her. But Jack, being less encumbered by apparel than the lady, would have distanced her but for an unlucky accident that gave her a temporary mastery. The fates would have it that a baker with a tray upon his head, containing sundry pies, was coming up the street, and as people do sometimes when they are mutually anxious to pass each other without coming in contact, they dodged from side to side for a few seconds, and then, of course, ran against each other, as if they really meant it, with such force, that down came Jack and Baker and Pies in one grand smash. In another moment the enraged Mrs. Williams reached the spot. To snatch up the only whole pie there was left was to the lady the work of a moment, and to reverse it upon Jack's face was the work of another moment, and then, in the vindictiveness of her rage, she stamped upon the bottom of the dish until his head was embedded in damsons, and he was nearly smothered. From the window of the inn the Bannerworths and the Admiral saw all this take place, and the delight of the old man was of the most extravagant character, exceeding all bounds, while the Bannerworths, for the life of them, could not help laughing most heartily. "'Now, you wretch,' said Mrs. Williams, "'I hope this will be a lesson to you. Take that, and that.' and that you sea snake you odious tar barrel as she spoke she hammered on the dish till it broke and that was for jack the best thing that could have happened for it gave him a little air and by a frantic effort he scrambled to a sitting posture and commenced dragging the damsons out of his eyes and mouth mrs williams then thought it was high time to leave and so muttering threats to the immense amusement of a crowd of persons who had assembled she walked away leaving Jack by no means delighted with the end of the adventure, and to settle with the infuriated baker as best he might. There was no small additional mortification to Jack to look up and see the admiral and the bannerworths at the window of the hotel, enjoying his discomfiture, and laughing most heartily at his expense. End of chapter 126《Chapter 127 of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Varney the Vampire, Volume 2 
by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 127 A Change of Scene and Circumstances, An Event in London The recent events which followed each other so rapidly were strangely concluded by the sudden and mysterious disappearance of Sir Francis Varney. That he should thus have eluded all was aggravating to a very large class of people, who seemed to insist that he should have come to some notable catastrophe. Had he only been killed, they argued, we should have known the last of him. Of the truth of this there could be no doubt. When a man is dead and buried, you do, as far as human nature serves, know the end of him. But this great fact does not always come within the knowledge of men, who sometimes, contrary to expectation, drop off themselves, and instead of knowing the end of somebody else, why, somebody else knows the end of them. It is a well-known fact, that as some die before others, that it does sometimes happen that those who wish to see another out may be seen out themselves. Besides, taking the question of longevity aside, it does not follow, because we so wish to come to the conclusion of an affair, that its author may but change the scene and transport it elsewhere, and the good and curious lieges become defrauded of their self-satisfying knowledge, viz. the end of the affair. Of course it was an aggravation to know that there was an interesting and highly exciting affair gone off, and they were not allowed to peep into that mystery, the future. But so it was, they were not gratified. Some were of the opinion that he had departed this life in a mysterious and unsatisfactory, because secret manner, and that was why nobody could tell anything about it. But there were other opinions afloat, and among others that of the admiral, which was pretty general, which was that he had very likely disappeared from that part of the world to seek in some other place the renovation his system required, by means that were natural to him, but hideous in others to contemplate or think of. This was generally the received opinion, for it was universally admitted by the wise people thereabouts that he must at certain times recruit himself. The opinion thus entertained by all who lived thereabouts became less and less absorbing. Other matters began to be thought of, things began to flow into their usual channel, and a subsidence took place in the turmoil and excitement consequent upon the presence of the vampire. About this period, while these parts were regaining their original serenity and calmness, and while the vampire was looked upon as an awful and fearful episode in the life of those who lived there, there happened in London a circumstance that it is necessary to relate to the reader, inasmuch as it is very important and bears strongly on our story. Not far from Bloomsbury Square, which, at the period of our story, was a very fashionable place, and in one of the first streets thereabout, was the house of a widow, whose name was Meredith. She had been the wife of a man in good circumstances, but at his death she was left with a house filled with furniture, some little loose cash, and several daughters, marriageable and unmarriageable, this being all Mr. Meredith had to leave. There could be but one way of obtaining a living, at least but one that suggested itself to her, which was to turn lodging-house keeper of the better sort. Her children had been well educated, that is, sufficiently so, to pass off in life, in decent society, without any particular remark. As she was well calculated for the object she had in view, it was no wonder that she succeeded in her undertaking, and appeared to do very well. About this time an arrival occurred at an hotel not very far from this spot, which caused a communication to pass to Mrs. Meredith, who had been recommended lodgers from the hotel, when any of the inmates desired to be accommodated, and wished for a place with all the comforts of a home, and domestic attention. Mrs. Meredith, said the head waiter of the hotel, I wish to have a word in private with you. With greatest pleasure, Mr. Jones, said Mrs. Meredith, who was extremely civil to the waiter. Will you be pleased to sit down? I have not the time, I thank you, I have not time, but I have run over to you to inform you we have an old invalid colonel at our place, who seems as if he did not know what he wanted. He wants some kind of lodging, he don't like the hotel, whether there is some genteel family whose kind attentions would soothe his disorders, and, I suppose, his temper. Oh, poor gentleman, said Mrs. Meredith, how unfortunate he should suffer. Is he rich? Yes, I believe so, very rich. He's a colonel in the India service. He's been a fine man, but he has had some hard knocks. I have seen more rickety matters than he before today, and he will do very well. I told him I knew where there was a lady who occasionally admitted an inmate to her house, 
which was a large one, but she must be satisfied that her lodger is a gentleman. Has she any family, he inquired, because I hate to go where there's nobody but the lady of the house, because she can't always attend upon me, read to me, and the like of that. Goodness me, what an odd man! Yes, but he pays well, a retired colonel, large fortune. You know that these East Indians expect I don't know what. They are even fed by beautiful young black virgins. The wretch! Oh, dear, no, it's the custom of the country. So you see, he's been humored, and it will be necessary yet to humor him, if you mean to have him for your lodger. I expect he'll only be troublesome, but when they pay for trouble, why, it's all profit. Very true, replied Mrs. Meredith. Is he a single man? Yes, oh, yes. I believe he has never been married, has had so much to do in India that he had nothing to do with marriages. Where does he come from? India. I believe he had a very fine palace of his own, at Putty Therapore, so I am told. Lord, he seems to think nothing of these parts, but he's an odd man. However, he pays well. He'll make a good lodger anywhere. Well, you may tell him, Mr. Jones, that we have a fine suite of rooms for his accommodation on the first floor, and bedrooms, every attention he can wish. You know our terms, Mr. Jones, I think, but I may as well tell you, five guineas a week. Five guineas a week, eh? Yes, that is moderate when you come to consider what a trouble and an expense it will be to get such things as will please the palate of an Indian. It is a trouble, certainly. And besides that, he will have such a place and furniture as he seldom meets with in London. Besides, from what you say, there will be little trouble in attending to him by myself and daughters, and you know I have several. Exactly, exactly. That is the thing he seems to desire. You will therefore have a preference over any one else who may have anything he wants, a kind of domestic hearth. He has none of his own, you see. Has he no friends? None living, I dare say. Besides, he would hardly like to trust himself along with relations, who would poison him for the sake of his money. And, if he have any living, he may know nothing of them, where they are or anything else, and they would be as strangers to him, for he would not be able to recognize them. But I must go now. Five guineas, that includes all? Yes, all except wines and liquors, you know. Very well, I'll let him know. And perhaps you'll be in the way, in case he should come around this evening to examine the place. Do you think there is any chance of his coming in tonight? Really, I cannot tell. He may or may not, just as he pleases. He is an odd fish. But, good Mrs. Meredith, I will talk to him. The waiter left, and Mrs. Meredith sat in her parlor, which was her own private apartment, which she and her daughters usually retired to and received their own friends. Here they remained, in some degree kept in continual expectation. Nothing was said for some time by either mother or daughter, for there was but one at home at that time. "'Do you know, Margaret,' she said, "'we are likely to have a new lodger?' "'Indeed, Ma?' "'Yes, my dear. He is a fidgety old man, a colonel from India. He is vastly rich, I am given to understand, and will require all the attentions of a relative. He will pay very handsomely. In fact, my dear, he will keep us all with a little care and management.' Well, Ma, the men ought to do so, the creatures. What are they for if they don't? I'm sure if ever I come to marry, which I am sure I shan't, and if I found that he didn't find me in all I wanted, wouldn't I lead him a life? I rather think I would, said the amiable child. I'd never let him know peace night nor day. It would be useless for him to tell me misfortune had deprived him of means. That would do for me. Oh, dear, no, a married man has no right to meet misfortunes. Indeed, he deserves to be punished for having a wife at all under such circumstances. A very proper spirit, my dear, but you must never let such a thing as that pass your lips, because it would be very likely to cause you to lose a chance. The men are so fastidious nowadays, and they think they win us when we angle for and catch them. And this lodger, ma? Oh, he's, as I told you, a rich old East Indian. At this moment a coach drove up to the door, and a tremendous double rap was played off upon the door, as if it had been committed by a steam engine, so loud and so long was the application for the admittance, that both mother and daughter started. "'Dear me, that must be him,' said the mother. "'Yes, a coach and all. There, there, I declare.' "'What, ma?' "'Why, look at that girl next door out in the balcony. There's Miss Smith. That girl is always trying to attract some person or other, and the men affect to believe that she is beautiful.' 
For my part, I think a girl of seventeen ought to have more modesty. The hussy, said the young lady, contemptuously. The servant now entered to inform her that a gentleman had called about the apartments. Ask him upstairs, said Mrs. Meredith, and she prepared to follow the colonel so soon as she heard he was ascending the stairs, which was a slow job to him, as he walked lame, with a gold-headed cane. When Mrs. Meredith came to the room, she saw a tall gentleman. His height was lost on account of him stooping. He wore a green shade over one eye, and had one arm in a sling, besides which, as we have before related, he was rather lame. "'Not so bad as I thought for,' muttered Mrs. Meredith to herself, as she curtsied to his salute. "'I have been recommended to seek here a lodging, ma'am. I do not know if I am correct in believing you have such as I want. This, sir, is the sitting-room. It is a very handsome one, and above what is visually offered in a lodging-house. The fact is, sir, the house was never furnished for letting, but for our own private occupation. Therefore it has all of the comforts of a private residence. That is what I chiefly want. You see, I do not care to undertake the trouble of setting up an establishment myself. I am alone, I may say. Therefore it is I seek such a lodging as comes nearest to what I should myself choose if I were to make a home of my own. Precisely, sir. There is the back drawing-room and a bedroom upstairs. Oh, very good. I need, I presume, make no inquiry as to what kind of table you keep. The best, I dare say. I was informed of the price you asked. Yes, we consider that quite moderate, sir. I dare say, said the Indian, looking about the place with an air of curiosity. I dare say. Yes, sir, you see the advantages we offer are much above the usual run. Besides, you are an invalid and will require extra attention. Yes, there is much truth in that. I have used to it, and therefore you will see that I bargain for it. But at the same time, you will not find me difficult to please, I flatter myself but we shall know more of each other the longer we are together. Certainly, sir, I can assure you that should you take the apartments, nothing on my part or my daughter's will be wanting to make your stay agreeable. The stranger examined the appearance of the room and the others, and then, after much conversation with them, he agreed to take the lodgings and to come into them on the morrow, as he was extremely particular as to well-aired beds, and should require them all to be re-aired. And now, madame, before I finally agree to come in, will you show me the means of escape, if any, in case of fire? I am anxious about that. I have read so many calamities arising from that cause of late in London that I am somewhat nervous about it, though I am so much of an invalid that I should hardly be able to avail myself of it. You shall see, sir, said Mrs. Meredith. We have ample and safe accommodation in that respect. You see, here is a pair of broad steps that lead up to that door, a trap-door, and here is another that opens upon the leads at the top of the house. The colonel made shift to walk up and to look over the housetops. There was a sea of chimneys and pantiles, at the same time they were all easy of access on this side of the street. So there was no danger from fire, and each house there was similarly provided. Well, madame, I think I may say that this affair is concluded. I will leave you my card, and, if you think proper, you can obtain what information you desire of me at the hotel. I am quite satisfied, sir, said the landlady, as she took the card that was proffered her, and also a bank-note which he offered her, in token for his taking possession of the lodgings. Mrs. Meredith curtsied, and the colonel left the apartment, and descended the staircase with great deliberation, for he could not go very swiftly. He was lame, and one arm was up in a sling, and therefore he had not the free use of his limbs. As he came down the stairs, and when near the mat, Margaret, the eldest daughter, came out and passed into the back parlor, for no other ostensible purpose than that of seeing the stranger, whose eye was instantly, but only momentarily, fixed upon her. But it was enough. They both saw each other, and had a glance at the features, and Margaret disappeared. The stranger stepped into the coach, and, as the door was being shut, he looked up to the windows of the next house, where the young lady, nothing daunted, still sat at the window, and so little was she interested with her neighbor's affairs, that she barely bestowed a momentary glance upon the coach or its occupant, whose solitary optic took notice of her, and then the Jehu drove away with his rumbling vehicle. "'Well, I never saw such impudence in my life,' said Mrs. Meredith, as she came to the parlor windows, which happened to bow outwards and give her a better opportunity of watching her neighbors to the right and left of her. "'What is the matter, Ma?' inquired her daughter. "'Why, there's that minx still up yonder. 
I declare if she didn't stare at the colonel. He saw her and noticed her too. Well, I wouldn't have had her there today for a trifle. He will think he's got into a bad neighborhood, seeing her so bold. Really now, she lays herself open to all kinds of imputations. I do not mean to say any evil of her, but really, if she will do that now, what will she not do by and by? I am sorry she has no one to advise her better. I am sure she is old enough to know better, rejoined the daughter. I am quite sure she's no beauty, and if she wants to catch any of the men, she won't be successful in that manner, unless indeed she doesn't care whom she picks up with. Oh, that is, I fear, too often the case with young girls with weak intellects. But did you see our new lodger, my dear? Yes, ma'am. And what did you think of him? inquired Mrs. Meredith, with an amiable whine and a gentle rubbing of hands. Think, ma, think. What can I think of a man whom I have hardly seen, ma? He only passed me. I could not recollect him again if I tried. Ah, well, my dear, you know best. I can always recollect people whom I have once seen. He is a very fine man. At least he has been. He has lost much of his height, for he is lame and stoops much. But still he has been a handsome man. One eye only, ma, I think. Yes, dear, one eye, as you say. But I think a remarkably keen one, too. He's quite the gentleman, too. He's been used to command, you can see that. These military men have an air about them that you cannot mistake. And even this gentleman, though you see, wounded and lame, yet he has the air of an officer about him. He may have, ma, but you know, if he gave the air of a general with nothing else, he would buy a very poor dinner. So it would, my dear. You certainly are an extraordinary girl, Margaret, a very extraordinary girl, and will be the making of your family. Only suppose you should marry this rich colonel. What then, eh? I only say, suppose you were to marry him, because it isn't certain yet. Well, wouldn't that minx next door think you were lucky? She would bite her nails in anger. Yes, she would, ma, but it may never happen. But if she thinks to get a bow that way, she's much mistaken. I am sure she will get insulted. No wonder. But, Margaret, my dear, you must do your best to please this gentleman. He wants to have people about him just as if he had his own home. He has no friends or relatives. Who knows what may happen yet? No, ma, we don't know what may happen. And I will do my best to please him. But I shan't court him, you know, ma. He must do that. Yes, certainly, my child, he must. No, you mustn't appear anxious about it. But merely say you are pleased to have his good opinion and you must be a little coy of everything else, for there are times when such old gentlemen are easily entrapped. But I must set about having things aired and put into order for his arrival tomorrow. End of chapter 127For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barony. Varney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 128. The New Lodger. A Night Alarm. A Mysterious Circumstance. It was not until late the next day that Mrs. Meredith heard anything of her new lodger. All she had heard was that he would be there during the day but whether to breakfast, dinner, or tea she could not tell which, and now she was waiting with expectation, if not anxiety. But at the same time she knew she was quite sure of her lodger, because she held his banknote. It had been a dull day. There are many such in London, and therefore that was no singular circumstance. It was one of those dull, leaden-colored days, of which you can predict nothing with certainty, or even a chance of being right. It was rather squally at times, and at others a west wind blew, not cold, at least not particularly so, but yet notwithstanding the heavy appearance of the sky, there was a clear white light that made every object look more disagreeable than ordinary. The landlady and her daughter were both on the qui vive, as it was called, looking out for their new lodger, whom they expected the more immediately as the evening drew on for there was less likelihood of his coming in the middle of the day than towards the evening, and less after evening had set in than before, for he was an invalid. It was, they thought, just about the time when he must arrive, when there could only be the uncertainty of a few minutes. The whole house was in order. Nothing was left to chance. 
Mrs. Meredith herself had gone over the whole place, and took especial pains to find all sorts of fault with the unfortunate drudge who did the work, of course aided by the mother and daughter. But such aid was distressing, because she had to wait upon both and do her own work as well. However, all was in readiness, and they were looking out at every coach from between the blinds. The sound of wheels was enough to cause them to start, when suddenly a coach drove up to the door, upon which had been carefully packed several leather boxes and portmanteaus. "'Here he is,' said the daughter. "'Here he is!' "'Yes, and as I am alive,' said Mrs. Meredith, as she cast her eye upwards towards the next house, "'as I am alive, there is that girl again. I do believe that she does it on purpose. It is done to aggravate me, and to attract attention from the men, the hussy. There was now no time to lose, the knocker at the door giving pretty clear indication that instant attention upon their part was requisite, and up jumped Mrs. Meredith and her daughter Margaret. Immediately the servant opened the door into the passage, the coach door was opened, the steps let clattering down, and Colonel Deverell entered the house. "'Will you walk into the parlour, Colonel?' inquired Mrs. Meredith. "'Until your boxes are all let in, and you see they are all correct, there is a good fire.' "'Thank you, madam,' said the Colonel, with some difficulty walking along. "'I am scarcely so well able to walk as I was yesterday.' "'Ah, Colonel, you must have suffered much. But I am glad the parlour is so handy. It will save you the walk upstairs at present, until you are quite recovered from your fatigue.' Pray be seated, Colonel, by the fire. The man shall bring them in and lay them before the door. Thank you, said the Colonel, and he sat down in a large easy chair, having first dropped his cloak, which was a large blue military cloak, lined with white, with a fur collar, and looked extremely rich and handsome, beneath which he wore an officer's undress frock, covered over with a profusion of braid. The boxes and portmanteaus were brought in, and laid down so the colonel could see them, and when that was done, the coachman made his demand, which excited an exclamation of horror from Mrs. Meredith, and a declaration that she thought hackney coachmen were the greatest impostors and extortioners under the sun. There never was such a set as hackney coachmen, never. "'Saving lodging housekeepers, mum. Axing your pardon for saying so. Not that I means any offence, only I lived in one once, and ought to know some it. The colonel, however, made no remark, but pulling out an embroidered purse which appeared to be full of gold, he paid the man his demand. "'Thank you, Your Honour. You are one of the right sort, and no mistake.' So saying, the coachman walked away, jinking the money as he walked along the passage, until he came to the door where the girl was standing, and then, giving her a knowing wink and jerking his head backwards, he said, "'They are a scaly lot here, ain't they, Mary?' "'Mary!' screamed Margaret. "'Yes, miss.' "'Shut the door and come away from that insolent fellow.' Slam went the door, and then the servant went downstairs, and the parlour door was immediately closed, and the colonel was given into the tender mercies of the lodging-house keeper. For though she pretended that she merely offered a genteel and presentable house for such as desired it, and could afford to pay for it, she was, in every sense of the word, a lodging-house keeper. The colonel, however, sat very composedly in his chair, and gazed at the fire in silence, and from time to time he gazed at the mother and daughter with his one eye. He had not lost the entire use of the other, but had a green silk shade over it. He watched what went on, and replied cautiously to what was said to him, but appeared inclined to silence, and occasionally abrupt in his conversation. But this they attributed to the habit he must have been in when abroad of commanding. "'Will you take tea at once, Colonel, or at what hour do you choose to have it?' "'I will take it at once. I am tired.' "'What will you take, sir?' inquired Margaret, at one end of the table, and placing herself in an enticing posture, she awaited the answer, expecting to be looked at. "'Coffee,' said the Colonel abruptly. There was a pause. But Margaret said nothing more, and set about doing such little matters as appeared to be an employment. But it was a mere deception. It was all done. Nothing had been left undone. They had taken care of that, as the servant knew full well. However, there was little that passed of any peculiar character on that occasion, 
for the evening passed off very calmly and comfortable, the colonel giving his opinion somewhat dogmatically, but that, of course, was submitted to, as he was a military man and had much experience, and moreover he was a rich man, quite a nabob. It is astonishing, as a general rule, what people will submit to when it comes from those who have riches at command. That fact alone seems to stamp all that is foolish and absurd coming from such a quarter with sense and worth. It is in vain for any one not blessed with property to talk. His talking is nothing in comparison with what falls from the lips of the man who has property. You are talked down, and if you are obstinate and won't be talked down, why you are a disagreeable fellow, a dissatisfied man, and your neighbors ought to set their faces against you. Thus through life, he who does not submit to the wealthy is always run down, and there is every disposition, if possible, of running him off the road altogether, no matter how great the injustice against him and the enormity of the conduct of others. They are, as they think, justified, because he is not a genteel person. In fact, he is not evangelical. The evening passed over, as we have said, in calmness and quiet, and Mrs. Meredith appeared to be well pleased with her lodger, and at a moderately early hour they separated and went to bed. The colonel retired after taking leave of them to his own room, complaining he was in great pain and scarce able to walk, and so cold he was nearly benumbed. "'This climate,' he said, "'is so cold, so moist, and altogether so uncomfortable, that I cannot understand how it is people ever endure it. Indeed,' he continued to Mrs. Meredith, "'there must be some great difference between rich and poor in their confirmation, else they couldn't stand it.' Of course, Mrs. Meredith assented to the proposition, as she would have done to any other, no matter what proposition, that had been so urged by such a person. Thus it was with the Colonel, who appeared very well satisfied with his lodgings, and all parties for so short a time were well pleased with each other. The night was dark. That is to say, it was one of those nights in which neither moon nor stars showed themselves. No sound was heard through the streets, save the heavy step of the guardian of the night, or the midnight reveller, who might be finding his way homeward boisterously, and with scarce enough sense to enable him to take the right path. There were clouds enough to have intercepted the moon, but there was a kind of light that was spread through them that you saw when you looked up, but which aided not the traveller below. But then there were countless lamps that illumined the streets. At that time there was a man creeping over the housetops. He had gained the housetop of Mr. Smith, the house in which resided Miss Smith, who had given so much offence to Mrs. Meredith by sitting so much out in the balcony. He stooped in the gutter, and looked cautiously around. No human being was within sight. He was alone, and no soul saw him. Cautiously. He crept towards the trap-door. It was bolted, but that was soon obviated. No sound, however, could be heard. The soft but rotten wood gave way under the steady pressure exerted upon the door, which at length opened. He paused a moment or two, and listened carefully for several minutes. Then he entered the loft, slowly and noiselessly keeping as low as possible, so that he might run no risk of being observed by any one who might be passing the house, or who might be up by accident in any of the opposite houses, in consequence of illness or any other cause. There was a lower trap-door through which the figure passed. There could be no difficulty in passing, because that was always kept open, as it was considered to assist in ventilating the house and then the intruder stood within the house. He then drew himself up to his full height, and paused for some moments, as if considering the next step he would take. But then he descended to the second floor, on which were placed what are called the best bedrooms. He paused at one, gently tried the handle, and finding it turn and the door open, he gave one look towards the stairs that he had just descended, and then he entered the apartment. 
all was yet still. No sound met his ear, save the breathing of the sleeper within, who lay in a sweet sleep, and was as calm and unconscious as the blessed. Perfect rest and forgetfulness had steeped the senses of the young girl, who lay in ambrosial sleep. One arm was thrown outside the clothes, and revealed in all its symmetry a snow-white bosom, heaving gently to the throbbing of the heart. The intruder gazed at the young girl for some moments, and clasped his hands with trembling eagerness, and a ghastly smile played upon his terrible features, while a fearful fire shot from the eyes of one who thus disturbed the slumbers of the living. He approached the bed, and took the hand within his own, and then the sleeper awoke. It would be impossible to describe the look of terror and horror that sat on the young girl's face. She could not scream. She could not utter a sound. Her whole faculties appeared to have been bound up for a short time. She could not even shrink from the horrible being who approached her. She was so perfectly horror-stricken with that truly horrible countenance, the glance of which seemed as if it would destroy the power of speech forever. She shrank now, but could not move. The creature crept closer. It seized her hand, and held it within its own. But even that could not awake her from the trance she was in. She felt a horrible sinking feeling, as though she must sink through the very flooring of the house, and yet she could not stir. It appeared as though, so long as the hideous face was opposed to hers, so long she was unable to move. It was a species of fascination, however great the horror felt. Yet there was no help for it. She could not ever shut her eyes. That boon was denied her. What she saw cannot be described. It is by far too horrible for pen to describe. The wild, horrible insanity that appeared in the eyes of the creature, with their peculiar cast, was indescribable. The only light that entered the room, at that moment, came from a lamp below, and illumined only the upper part of the room above the window-sills. The creature then stood in relief against this light, a horrible, dark object, whose glaring eyeballs were too terrible ever to be forgotten. Then again, while he with one hand held hers, he passed his other hand up her arm and then felt along the soft white flesh with its cold, clammy fingers, as if it were feeling for something, or greedy of the velvet-like substance. Still keeping the eyes fixed upon the hapless and helpless girl, he drew the arm towards him, and leaning upon the bed, suddenly plunged his face on the arm, and held and seized it near the middle with his teeth, and then it made an attempt to suck the wound. This, however, broke the charm, horrible and complete as it was, for the creature's hideous countenance was lost to her sight as he plunged his face to her arm. Shriek followed shriek in quick and rapid succession. The whole house was alarmed by the terrible shrieks that came from the apartment. She struggled, and by a sudden effort she disengaged herself from the grasp of the fiend, and rolled, wrapped up in the bedclothes, to the other side of the floor. The monster still pursued her with greedy thirst for blood, and had picked her up, and again placed her on the bed with more than mere human strength, and again sought the arm he had been deprived of by the sudden effort of the young girl. Help! Help! Mother! Father! Help! Help! The shouts rang through the house, awaking the affrighted sleepers from the repose in a manner that may be called distressing. It is distressing in the midst of a large city to be awoke, in the dead of the night, by loud and urgent cries of distress. It is such a contrast to the dead stillness that reigns around, and when the first cries are heard, it creates a terror and surprise that takes away all power of action. It was not till the cries had been heard a second time that the inmates aroused themselves. The fact was, they were fearful of fire. The moment that idea floated across their minds, then indeed they started up, and the father of the young girl, hearing the fall, at once rushed to the room of his daughter. 
He arrived but in time. The hideous monster, being affrighted by the footsteps approaching him, turned from his blood-stained feast, and hid himself beneath the drapery as the father entered the room. "'Mary,' he said, "'Mary, Mary, what means this? What can be the matter? Are you hurt? How come you in this disorder?' "'Oh, God! That thing from the grave has been sucking my blood from my veins. See, see yonder, he moves. Watch him, note him, father.' Believing she raved, her father paid no attention to what she did say, but continued to regard her with sorrow and regret, for he believed it to be a sudden attack of mania. But seeing the curtains move, he turned his head, and at once divined it to be the cause of his daughter's alarm. The glance was but momentary, but he saw the figure of a man who was escaping from the apartment by the door by which he had at that moment entered. "'Help!' he shouted. "'Help! Thieves! Murder!' And as he shouted, he rushed after the figure that was flying towards the top of the house. By this time the house was filled up with people, and the noise upstairs had caused the servants below to rise confused and thoroughly terrified by the sounds they heard and the cries of their master. At that moment one of those watchful guardians of the night passed by the house, and was immediately hailed by the unfortunate people below, who were afraid to go upstairs to offer any assistance, lest they might be knocked back again, which fear stopped all aid from below. "'Hello! What's the matter now?' inquired the worthy guardian of the night. "'Oh, I don't know. Goodness knows. You had better go up and see. I'll come up after you. Don't be afraid. I'll come up after you if you'll go first. "'Stop a moment while I spring my rattle,' said the worthy functionary, who thereupon gave an alarming peal upon his instrument, and then he entered the house, with instructions to the servant to run downstairs and let any of his party in that might come up. Then the guardian of the night hastened upstairs with all the haste he could, and came up just in time to pick Mr. Smith up, who was lying stunned at the foot of the stairs. The fact was, Mr. Smith had pursued his adversary too quickly, and finding he could not get off, he turned round and felled him to the earth like an ox. It was just at this juncture when the Charlie came upstairs, and in another moment Mr. Smith recovered. "'What's the matter?' inquired the watchman. "'Is the house on fire?' "'No, no, the vampire, the vampire.' "'Eh, hey, what? Never heard of him before. Never seed him.' "'Quick, quick, he has gone upstairs. Quick, after him,' said Mr. Smith as he ran up the stairs, and was quickly followed by the watchman and some others who now crowded about, having had time to dress themselves and come to Mr. Smith's aid, and they now crowded to the housetop, for they saw the trap-door was unfastened, though it had been hastily pushed to. This they opened, and then looked on the housetop, first one way, and then another. "'He ain't here,' said the watchman, "'and we mustn't expect to find him here. He wouldn't wait for us, you may depend upon that.' We had better search along the housetops till we see him, or find some of the other traps open, and then you may guess where he has gone." "'The difficulty is which way did he go?' said Mr. Smith. "'Oh, I saw him go that way,' said another watchman, who came upstairs, having been first attracted by the sounds of the rattle, and then, looking up at the house, he saw the figure of a man stealing with great rapidity of motion across the housetops. "'There I lost him, then,' he said. I didn't see him after that spot, but he may have gone further for all I can say to the contrary, but we shall soon see." "'This trap-door is open,' said the other watchman, as he pulled aside Mrs. Meredith's trap-door, which had only been pushed to. "'We had better go in here, and see if he isn't gone somewhere into the house, and hiding himself till all is quiet, and then he will make off if left alone.' End of chapter 128 Recording by Barony Twenty nine of Varney the Vampire, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barony Varney the Vampire, Volume Two, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 129 The Unsuccessful Pursuit Mr. Smith's Disappointment 
and the testimony of Mrs. Meredith. Mrs. Meredith and her daughters had long sunk into deep sleep before the events just narrated took place in her neighbor's house. There was a perfect stillness. The whole house appeared as though there were no living soul within it. All was so still and quiet. Presently, however, there was a terrific sound. It was like that of a human being falling and bumping downstairs, and then there was a great deal of shouting and calling, and Mrs. Meredith opened her eyes and trembled in her bed, while her daughter Margaret, who upon the occasion slept with her, was likewise as frightened. "'What is the that?' she stammered, with some difficulty. "'Oh, here, I cannot think. Thieves, murderers, I dare say. Oh, merciful heaven, what shall we do? Where shall I go? We shall be murdered!' Both females trembled in their beds, and were quite unable to move, breaking out in a profuse sweat from fear. And yet the noise came nearer and nearer, and there were many persons evidently in the house. Their numbers were so numerous that they evidently didn't care to conceal themselves. The fact was this. When Mr. Smith and his party found the trap-door open, they descended into the house, the watchman leading the way. But in going down the ladder his foot slipped, and he came with a dreadful thump on the landing. And fortunately he rolled up against the servant-girl's door instead of downstairs. The door flew open, and the girl was too terrified to speak for some moments. At length, the watchman having got up, he made for the bed, upon which the girl jumped up and began to scream out for help in piteous tones. "'Come, come, don't be frightened,' said the watchman. "'Get up and show us over the house.' "'Well, I'm sure,' said the girl, who had recovered some of her assurance, for the coat, stick, and lantern of the watchman at once assured her that she was in no immediate danger whatever. "'Well, I'm sure. To think of coming in a female's room in this manner. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, you old wretch, you ought. "'No names. If you don't get up and show us over and call your master—' "'I ain't got a master.' "'Well, your mistress, then. We will go ourselves, and we'll soon make short work of it. Come, come. No nonsense. We will dress you ourselves.' "'You monster! Go out of the room, can't you? Have you no decency left you? I'll get up, but I'll lay a complaint before the Lord Mayor, and he shall tell you a different tale to this. I am ashamed of you, and so you ought to be of yourselves.' However, during this energetic remonstrance, she contrived to shuffle on some things, and when she was ready, she came down to her mistress's door, and then began to hammer and kick at it, saying— "'Oh, Miss Meredith, there's such a lot of men in the house. Do come out, ma'am. I don't know what's the matter, but they'll break into your room as they broke into mine.' "'What do they want, Mary?' "'Don't know, ma'am.' "'There is some one escaped into your house that has broken into the next house, and your trap-doors on the roof were open.' "'Gracious me!' said Mrs. Meredith. "'Gracious me! Show them over the place, Mary. We shall get up in a few moments and come to you. Margaret, my dear, get up!' Some housebreakers have gotten into the house, and we shall all be murdered in our sleep if we don't find them. Oh, dear, dear, what will become of us? What will our new lodger say to this disturbance?" Margaret made no reply, but began to dress herself, while the party began their search, and Mr. Smith hastened back to his daughter, to understand the nature of the attack that had been made upon her, and whether she were any better than she was when he left her. However, when he came to hear what was the real cause of her terror, to find the marks upon her arm, and the certainty that nothing had been lost or moved, he was perfectly staggered, and hastened back after the party he had left, to make some further attempt to follow the miscreant, and to discover, if possible, his retreat, and bring him to justice for the vile attack he had made. When he returned, he met Mrs. Meredith coming out of her room, she having hastily dressed herself, followed by her daughter. "'Oh, Mr. Smith!' "'Mr. Smith, what is the meaning of all this disturbance? Here are a number of strange men who have forced themselves into my house, and whether their object is our property or our lives we cannot tell. What can I do, Mr. Smith?' "'You have nothing to fear, ma'am.' "'Nothing to fear, sir? Why, is not such an occurrence something to be feared for its own sake alone?' "'Yes, ma'am. It is very disagreeable, I am willing to admit. But I presume you would not give refuge to a vampire.' A what, sir? A vampire, madam. I know not how to explain it to you. 
but I have to assure you my daughter has been attacked in her sleep by the midnight blood-sucker from the graves. Oh, God, that such a thing should happen in my family! I would not have believed it had the same been related to me from anybody else." "'It must have been the nightmare,' suggested Mrs. Meredith. "'Would to heaven it had been so! But I came to her assistance, and saw him, as he fled from my daughter's bedside, and I followed him to the roof, and he was lost on your house, and your trap-door was open, and we presumed he went in here." "'The door was bolted when we went to bed last night,' said Margaret. "'Yes,' responded her mother. "'We always have that bolted every night, for it is our only protection from that side of the house. But no one can be here. We have no man in the house save our lodger, an invalid and quite a gentleman. Can we see him? I should think not, because he is an invalid. He is a colonel in the East India service, and will no doubt be very angry at such a disturbance, and much more so when he finds he is wanted. I am really much shocked at this disturbance, which is the more unfortunate, as it is the first night he has slept here. I must see him. Must, Mr. Smith, must! I cannot permit anything of the kind to be said in my house. I give you permission to look for him over the house, but I can't give any such permission with what my lodgers possess. It is not in my power to do so, if I had the inclination." While this was going on, the house had been rummaged over and over, and then a party of them, with Mr. Smith, came to the Colonel's bedroom. A close travelling cap and a dressing gown were found on the mat before the door. Oh said Mr. Smith, as he picked it up. This appears very much like what I saw the figure was dressed up in, something like robes, and this would serve the purpose. Ah, said the watchman, we shall have him now. But the gentleman is an invalid. He can hardly walk upstairs, much less can he be scrambling over housetops, said Mrs. Meredith. You must surely all have been dreaming. Something has disagreed with you, and the result has been visions of which you can, of course, find no trace. "'Not quite that either,' said one of the watchmen. "'For we saw him getting away, and he made for your trap-door, where I missed him. I could not see any more of him among the chimneys, or something of that sort, but I thought he came in here, and found your door open.' "'And you saw him come in?' said Mrs. Meredith. "'I can't say I saw him come in,' said the man. "'I couldn't see through a brick wall and a stack of chimneys which were in the way, but I felt certain he must have come in here.' Well. This is very strange, very singular. The dressing-gown, too, said Mr. Smith, is dusty and dirty all over, at least in places where it appears to have come in contact with anything dirty, possibly the roof of the house. Certainly something of that sort has happened. It looks very much like it. And the cap sits close to the head. That is dirty. But it is dry dirt, said Mr. Smith, and of the same character. We had better see this lodger of yours, Mrs. Meredith and with your permission I will knock." As Mr. Smith spoke, he gave two or three loud knocks at the door, which were not answered for some time, but they were speedily repeated, and then a peremptory voice exclaimed, "'In the name of goodness, what is the meaning of all this disturbance? Is the house broken into, or is it a resort for thieves? Be it as it may, if I am disturbed in this way, and you don't instantly get out of the way and make less noise, I'll fire through the door. I have loaded pistols by my side, and I will not submit to the shameful disturbance." At the sound of these words, the two watchmen were much disturbed, and immediately stepped back so hastily as nearly to overthrow Mrs. Meredith and her daughter. But Mr. Smith, after a step or two backwards, resumed his place by the door, and exclaimed, "'I have not come here, sir, to be frightened. Some strange circumstances have just happened, and I must beg you'll open the door to explain them. And who the devil are you? My name is Smith, sir. I live next door, and my daughter has been attacked by a vampire. I know not what nature the creature must possess, but it has shocking propensities. There are evidences at your door which make it appear he has got into your room. It would be very foolish in him to do anything of the sort, said the Colonel. For in the first place, I will not suffer annoyance in any shape, and besides, I have loaded pistols for his reception. Wait till I am dressed, and then I will come out to you." "'I am sure the Colonel will be very much offended by this conduct, which is very shameful. 
people's houses broken open and entered in this manner, and people's rest broken so, I am quite ashamed of my neighbours, quite. Really, we have strong suspicions, strong grounds of suspicion, too, against that lodger of yours. Look at that dressing-gown and cap, the open trap-door and all. Really, I can't help thinking there is something very suspicious in all this. Yes, said the watchman. I know there's nobody else in the house. I've been all over it, and it's very strange to me if he ain't the man. Well, said Margaret Meredith, it seems as if you are most willing to accuse those who are quite incapable of doing what you accuse them of. This gentleman was barely able to get upstairs without assistance. Besides, he could not have gone upstairs without someone being awoke by the noise. It's my opinion that this is a piece of impertinence altogether. So I think, my dear said Mrs. Meredith. "'I am a father, Mrs. Meredith,' said Mr. Smith, "'and I have my daughter's safety and happiness at heart. I am sure there's much too very suspicious. You wouldn't like your daughter's blood sucked out of her arms. I am sure I don't, nor does she.' "'Oh, botheration!' said Margaret. "'Who ever heard of such stuff? I'm sure I never did, except in some book of improbabilities and nothing more. But here is Colonel Deverell. At that moment Colonel Deverell opened the door, and then retired a little into his room, saying as he did so in a very angry voice, but at the same time endeavouring to be courteous. "'You can come in now, but I am quite at a loss to understand the nature of this disturbance. The house doesn't appear to be on fire, and that is the only contingency in my mind that will justify such a disturbance. What is the matter, Mrs. Meredith?' "'I can hardly tell you, sir.' I have been disturbed by finding a party of people in my house. It is most amazing to me how they came in. I will tell you, sir, said Mr. Smith. My daughter has been terrified by the appearance of someone in her bedroom, who attempted to suck her blood from the veins of her arm. I don't know what to say about it. I am sure I don't, said Colonel Deverell. But I must say it's a most unpleasant affair for those who have nothing to do with it. It is a pity your domestic affliction should call you out in this manner. Take my advice, sir. Go home, else you'll catch cold. You may repent making a jest of this. I never repent anything, sir. I regret I am so unnecessarily disturbed, and it appears to me your intrusion here is most unwarrantable. Is this your dressing-gown, sir? Yes, it is. Well, then, how did it come here, and in this state? inquired Mr. Smith triumphantly. I don't know. I didn't put it there, but I suppose it must have fallen accidentally. It would not have been thrown there willingly," said the Colonel, deliberately. "'Well, I don't know,' said Mr. Smith. "'But it strikes me you've been on the tiles this evening. My good sir, if you don't leave my apartment, it may happen I may forget my pains and lameness and fling you out of the window. If this had happened in India, instead of here, you would have had a particularly sharp knife inserted between your ribs, or have been thrown into a well. But I know nothing of this matter, which appears so strange as to be beyond all reason. Neither experience nor common sense at all throw any light upon the matter. Be advised, sir, and retire, and allow honest people and invalids to sleep the night out. Mr. Smith looked very blank, and unable to comprehend all that had passed, he could not tell what to think. He could not urge the matter further, for he was met by real contempt and perfect self-assurance on the part of the Colonel, who moved about the room very lame, while his hand was in a sling, and a green shade was placed over his eyes. "'You see,' said Mrs. Meredith, "'you must be very entirely mistaken. Colonel Deverell, we are sure, is quite unable to run about over housetops, even if he had the inclination to do so, which is really absurd. It must be at least a great mistake on your part. Yes, I am sure, too, Colonel Deverell could not have left the house without our knowing it. Indeed, it is a very silly affair, and has been a great nuisance, to say the least of it. I wonder Mr. Smith doesn't know better than to break into peaceable people's houses. But I did not do so. How came you here, then? I followed someone else. The place was open, and yet you say it was shut at night, and usually kept so. How do you account for that? I cannot do so, unless some neglect took place, or else you must have forced it open. Oh, no, ma'am, said the watchman. 
"'I can swear Muster Smith didn't do that. It was open, and I found it so. So there's that to be accounted for. And then there's the togs a-lying outside here. That's to be accounted for. So you see, it's a weary suspicious case.' "'You are a very stupid fellow,' said the Colonel. "'A very idiot, if you imagine people are to be held responsible because a dressing-gown happens to fall down. I do not know, but I shall proceed with this matter myself. It seems to me you have committed a trespass, to say the least of it. I can pledge my word, as a man of honour and a soldier, I have not left my room. Indeed, these ladies know I could not do so, and their testimony would be ample in a court of justice, and to a gentleman.' "'Yes, that is no more than the truth.' said Mrs. Meredith, who was by no means pleased with the disturbance, and because she had no sympathy for the young lady who sat in the balcony to the annoyance of herself and her daughter. "'And I can bear witness to the same,' said Miss Meredith. "'I think it is quite time Mr. Smith returned to his own place, and see what is the matter there. Perhaps the person he saw may have passed him and gone back again into his own house.' Mr. Smith lingered, looked wistfully, as if his doubts were not cleared off but yet the testimony was so clear and so strong that he could not dispute it, and however unwillingly he was compelled to acknowledge, there were some matters that he could not dispute, though he was unable to solve them. And he and those with him returned from their unsatisfactory search. End of chapter 129 Recording by Barony Hundred thirty of Varney the Vampire, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Varney the Vampire, Volume Two, by Thomas Prescott Prest, Chapter One Hundred Thirty. A Breakfast Scene: A Matchmaking Mother. The next day there was some anxiety on the part of Mrs. Meredith to ascertain how far her new lodger might have been disturbed by this event, and in what temper of mind he felt upon the occasion. It is usual in all lodgings to have some little regard to the lodger's comforts for some days, perhaps a week or two, and then things are allowed to take their chance, and if the lodger complains, he gets for an answer that they take a vast deal of pains to oblige him, and intimate that he is a peculiarly lucky man for having become a lodger at that place and you would have been worse off if you had gone elsewhere, which, of course, you don't believe, though they tell you so. It is an old and favorite saying that a new broom sweeps clean, and, in time, an old one becomes very nearly useless. So it is with lodging-house keepers. The longer you remain, the more inattentive they become, until you get wearied and are compelled to leave, and then you get some scurvy insolence, and your landlady eventually believes she is an ill-used woman. But in the present instance, Mrs. Meredith had other hopes and fears than those of a mere lodging-house keeper. Not that she had formed any plan in her own mind, but she had some floating idea that there was seldom such a chance turned up, because the colonel had evidently no relations, and who could tell what, in the chapter of accidents, might happen. "'I am quite grieved,' she said to her daughter. "'It should have happened this night. What could be the meaning of the disturbance, I can't think.' Now it's very tiresome things will happen so cross as this, that I don't know what to think of it. It really appears as if it was done on purpose. It does, but I am sorry for it, because it would seem as though we were liable to some kind of interruption at all times, for they generally expect attention at the first, if at no other time, and he may think this is a bad beginning at all events. But we shall convince him that we shall not treat him neglectfully, Ma, no, my dear, but these Indians are strange-tempered people, and when they once take a fancy, there is no knowing what they may do, and there is no knowing what a dislike taken at such an occurrence might produce, and likes and dislikes are taken without rhyme or reason. Yes, ma, so they are, and that is the reason why you took such a dislike to young Willis, for he was as nice a young man as I have seen. Nice, my dear, nice! I don't see why he was nice unless it was because he was presumptuous and had no money, said the amiable parent. He was not rich, ma. He was positively poor, Margaret, interrupted the mother, 
and therefore it was absolutely necessary to discourage such persons, for, if they do no good, they are sure to be productive of mischief, for their hanging about, you know, determines others from coming forward who have means. He was very handsome. Handsome is as handsome does, my dear. You'll find that is a motto through life, that will carry weight at any time. All the good looks in the world would never put a gown on your back or a sixpence in your purse, recollect. Besides, he was not handsome. You are prejudiced against the young man. Not that I care anything about him, though he was a very agreeable and nice young man. So it's no use in saying that he wasn't. Well, my dear, it doesn't much matter. This is a matter of opinion. What do you think of our colonel? He is a fine man, and a rich one besides. He is tall, I admit, but stoops a great deal, is very lame, one eye much worse than the other, and one arm in a sling. Well, I can't see much beauty in all that, much out of repair, you must admit, Ma. Yes, Colonel Deverell has seen some service, and his misfortunes are so many points of honor. They are like so many medals which speak of his worth. Besides that, he is a most gentlemanly and pleasant man. I don't know that I ever spoke to a more fascinating man. That might be at times, but then that was evidently a constraint upon his natural temper, because he every now and then broke out abruptly about something or other, which proves that he has an abrupt and imperious temper, not to say savage and snappish. There you are clearly unjustifiable, my dear Margaret. The colonel, you see, is a military man, and used to command, and therefore it is a very usual occurrence, and not a matter of disposition at all. But what can that matter when you come to consider his wealth? There is certainly room for congratulation there, said Margaret. Indeed, my child, there is room for congratulation, and I am convinced there is happiness where there is a fortune, for that will obtain all you want, and, when you obtain all you want, what can you be otherwise than entirely happy? Therefore, riches are happiness. Yes, there is much truth in all that, Ma, said Margaret, and all I hope is that I might obtain a fortune. Then I would make you comfortable, Ma. I'm sure you would, Margaret. My whole life has been spent in ships to maintain you and bring you up in a manner that would enable you to become a fortune, which, thanks to my care, example, and precept, you are fully equal to at any moment it may become your lot. Yes, Ma, I feel that I was born to command, and the lady of a colonel would not be a bit too high in rank for my ambition or deserts. Indeed it would not, my dear, but now listen to me. You know, my dear, I never plan anything but what is for your benefit. Now I am given to understand that Colonel Deverell has no relatives at all, and I think hardly any friends, and that we can make ourselves quite necessary to him, in fact perfect friends to him. He will look upon us as his nearest relatives, and he may take a fancy to you, as you may easily induce him. Old men like flattery, there is no doubt, and that kind of flattery which is called attention. Wait upon him most assiduously, and read to him, and all that kind of thing, my dear. Yes, I know, Ma. And then, dear, if you mind what you are about, the colonel and all his wealth may be yours before six months are over, or I'm no witch. Hush, I hear him stirring. He's coming downstairs. There he is in the drawing room. I hear him overhead. Go upstairs, my dear, and inquire when he will choose to have his breakfast. Yes, ma, said the young lady, who betrayed an extraordinary desire to obey her parent, a matter not equally to be said of all young ladies, nor of this one upon many occasions. But then, this was one that was quite agreeable to her own feelings, which explains the secret. Colonel Deverell had, indeed, descended, and was seated in the drawing-room, with his feet on the fender and his head leaning on his hand and his elbow on the table, when Margaret entered. He appeared to be thoughtful and unwell. He had, perhaps, passed a bad night, or the interruption had robbed him of his sleep, which to an invalid was the more severely felt. "'Good morning, Colonel,' said Margaret, advancing. "'I hope the disturbance that so inopportunely took place "'did not have the effect of destroying your night's rest.' "'Indeed, it did do so to a very great extent,' replied the Colonel. 
though not entirely, but still it makes one very poorly, gives one the headache, and causes a sense of lassitude and fatigue to oppress the body, which, added to the weariness incident to such cases, makes one very uncomfortable. I am sorry you have been so discomposed, and so is my ma. She really is grieved. But you see, sir, it was a matter so entirely beyond any control that she cannot be blamed for it, though it happened, most unfortunately, at a time when it was least wanted or most to be avoided. True, very true, I can imagine all that. I am not unjust enough to blame you for it. I could no more help it than you could, and I dare say you were none the better for such a disagreeable disturbance. I am not, I am very certain. No, sir, I am not. When would you please to breakfast? As soon as I can have it, replied the colonel. You can have it at once. Then be pleased to let me have it. I have the use of but one arm entirely. May I beg your aid in making tea for me? With pleasure, sir. Margaret immediately left the room and informed her mother of what had passed upon the occasion, and when the breakfast was laid and all things ready, Margaret Meredith sat down with Colonel Deverell to breakfast. Before, however, they had gone far, he inquired if she had breakfasted. No, I have not. And your mother, has she breakfasted? No, sir, she has not. Then give her my compliments, and I shall be glad to take breakfast in her company, too, for I am very poorly this morning, and company is agreeable. This was soon effected, and in a few minutes more they all sat down, the colonel being duly waited upon by Margaret and her mother, the latter being employed in aiding the former to pay great attention to their host, for they breakfasted at his expense as a matter of course. "'It was really a most unfortunate occurrence, that of last night,' said Mrs. Meredith. "'Very unfortunate, because some people have a difficulty in sleeping in a strange bed, and when once awake they cannot easily, if at all, get asleep again,' and that I had great fears might have been your case. Not precisely, said the colonel, but the fact is, I have seen so much hard service, that I can sleep anywhere without any effort of mine. But when one has suffered from wounds, the heats of climate, and the terrors of imprisonments in Indian prisons, one's health becomes so shattered, that one's rest is not so good as it ought to be. But that is no one's fault." It is a grievous misfortune, said Mrs. Meredith. Yes, added Margaret, and I think there is not enough gratitude in the country towards those who so nobly defend us in our homes, to do which they must not only brave danger and death in the field of battle, but all the evils that spring from climate, insidious diseases, brought on by the exposures and hardships of a soldier's life, and then when they see them return to their own country, with wounds that ought to bring honor, glory, and sure profit, they are omitted and neglected. The colonel sighed deeply, but said nothing. My dear Miss Meredith, will you fetch me my keys? I left them in the bureau. Yes, sir, said the amiable young lady, who arose and left the room. Your daughter is an amiable girl, Mrs. Meredith, said Colonel Deverell. She reminds me of one who is now dead, and at whose decease I left England for India. The country became insupportable to me at that time, but she now recalls all the feelings and aspirations of youth. Ah, she is an amiable and good girl, though I am her mother. Yet I must not do her less than justice, because it is usual to consider it partial or silly of a parent praising her own child, but she does deserve all that can be said of her. It is a blessing, there was the same class of beauty and the same amiable and sensible deportment. Oh, dear, those days are gone by, indeed. Who knows but they may return? It is doubtful, more than doubtful, certain. I am an old man now, Mrs. Meredith, an old man. Yes, I have deserved some thanks at the hands of my country, and I am rich. Yes, Mrs. Meredith, I am rich, very rich, I believe I may say. That is some reward. It is, but I cannot recall the past. I am no longer young. I have no young wife by my side, to soothe my pillow, to attend to my wants. No, I am an old man, as I said before, and I cannot expect the attention of the young and beautiful. 
But, Colonel Deverell, you are not an old man, and as for your wounds, they are honorable. But my shattered constitution may be mended by care and attention, doubtless, and I am sure, while you are here, you shall want no attention we can possibly bestow. I thank you, Mrs. Meredith, I thank you, said the colonel. I only regret the disturbance you suffered last night, said Mrs. Meredith. I am afraid want of proper rest has made you melancholy. I knew not of such a thing, neither was I at all aware of the fact of the trap-door being open. Indeed, I can't understand it. Nor I, ma'am. I do not clearly understand what they said. They talked of some young lady being strangled or assaulted in her sleep. Yes, Colonel, it was in her sleep, and I cannot help thinking it must have been a dream. However, if it were not, I do not know what to think of it. Nor I, said the Colonel thoughtfully. They talked about a vampire, and said Miss Smith had been seized by the arm, and the creature had attempted to suck the blood from the veins. Dear me, what a strange affair! Very, sir, but I never heard of such things only in books, but goodness help us from such strange unearthly beings. Have you seen any in your travels, Colonel Deverell? You have travelled in hot countries, and have seen them, I should imagine. Not I, Mrs. Meredith. I have seen strange things, but I never saw a vampire, though I have heard of such things. Indeed, there are many disgusting things in creation, and that is one of them. But what could be the reason they should come to that young lady above any other, I cannot conceive. Nor I, sir. At this moment Margaret returned, having recovered the keys, which were not wanted. Only the watchful mamma thought there was an opportunity for a little tender gag relative to the amiability of the young lady, and therefore it ought not to be omitted. Moreover, she saw that there was no necessity for leaving them alone yet. There would be plenty of time yet for that, and she felt assured there would be ample opportunity for the progress of the suit she now confidently anticipated must take place for she saw, however prompt and ready the colonel might be from habit, yet there was a good deal of the willing mood about him. His health and weakness, she thought, causes that, and now, while his health lasts this way, he may be secured, or at least the foundation laid upon which we may build our hopes. He shall want no aid of mine to help him on that way. "'Have you been long in England, colonel?' she inquired. Not very long. The voyage homeward must have been very tedious. It would have been, but I did not come that way. I crossed into Egypt and came to the Mediterranean and thence to Italy. So I varied the scene and travelled at leisure and got here a month before the vessel I was to have come by. Oh, that was much more pleasant. Decidedly so. And then I came to the hotel. Not that I had not all proper attention paid me, but then there was no sociality there. Men only surround you with whom you can hold no converse whatever. Certainly not, they are menials. And of the lowest class. However, I sought out such a place as this, where I wished to have some of the domestic comforts around me that I might have had, had I a home of my own. Someone to whom I could speak more seriously, for I am debarred the affectionate regard of near and dear female relatives. You must look upon us in that light, Colonel Deverell, as persons who are anxious and desirous of causing you to forget these wants by our assiduity and attention. I can speak for my daughter as myself. She will do all in her power to render your stay comfortable. She is young and beautiful. Ahem! And doubtless will change such occupations to those of a more endearing character. Well, it is as it should be, and I am selfish to feel jealous. I wish I was young myself. But enough of this. I have to express my obligation to you for the ready manner in which you came forward to speak of my being in my room last night when that man was here and the watchman. Mr. Smith? Yes, that was the man. They would not have taken my word for it. However, I hope to be able to remain here until I find myself sinking to the grave. And those who act as you have began to act for me... I must and will remember at my death and afterwards. I do not act with such a motive, Colonel Deverell. No, no, I am well aware of that. 
but that renders it a duty in me. However, we will say no more now. I am even wearied out. End of chapter 130One hundred thirty one of Varney the Vampire, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Varney the Vampire, Volume Two, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter one hundred thirty one. Mrs. Meredith's Friend, Exchange of Services and Compact. There could be no doubt in the minds of both mother and daughter that there was something much resembling a moral certainty concerning the fate of the retired colonel. That he must marry was evident. He was to all intents and purposes resolved to do so. He talked of a home and domestic comfort, and all that kind of thing. Therefore it would be easy to entangle him in the meshes of love. The snares of passion might be successfully set, and they would be sure to be productive of some sport, and even a stray colonel might be caught, one who, having had enough of wars of man, might now be considered to become a fair object of attack in those of Venus. However, there appeared much in the colonel's circumstances and disposition that laid him open to the attacks of designing matrons and maidens. He seemed to appreciate female company, was particularly well pleased with female attentions, Perhaps his health required their aid more than that of any other, and he had evidently been in love and lost the object of his earliest affections. One great thing in Margaret Meredith's favor was, the colonel had taken it into his head that she much resembled this lady, whoever she was, and this fact, no doubt, had opened his heart towards her, and he felt a kindly and perhaps a warmer feeling towards her. This, they calculated, would greatly assist them in their efforts to circumvent the colonel, and cause him to capitulate upon matrimonial conditions. "'There was never so good a chance,' said Mrs. Meredith, in the course of a day or two after the above scene. "'There never was such a chance as the one you now have.' "'What, with the colonel, ma?' "'Yes, my love, you may depend upon it. That is a very safe speculation. Why, he must be immensely rich.' I am sure that some of the jewels I have seen on his fingers must be worth thousands of pounds. He is a very rich man, there can be no doubt. Yes, Ma, he is very rich. And you will have many fine things that you have never dreamed of. Why, you will have a carriage. I should think he would never refuse you that trifle. He has not one now. Yes, that is true. He would never use it himself, and that accounts for it but when he has a wife it is quite another matter, and one which you can easily manage when you are a wife. You can do more then than you can now. Besides, you'll see how the money is spent, and it must all go through your hands, you know. That can't be helped. No, I dare say not. But, Ma, don't you think when he dies there will be a loss of the pension? And that would be a serious loss." It would, but then you will have a pension as an officer's widow, besides all his vast property, without any trouble whatever, with nobody to contradict you, that is, if he were to die. But I think he will not do that. He does not at times appear so old as one would think, and yet he is very pale. But that, I suppose, is caused by his long residence abroad in hot climates, and being exposed to the weather of all kinds, attended by wounds and sickness." No doubt he has suffered much, but he has obtained a handsome fortune, which pays for a great deal, you know, said Margaret. Undoubtedly, my dear. By the by, have you heard how that affair of Miss Smith has ended, and why they came in here in such a manner? Oh, it was a very shocking affair. There were some marks in her arm, which I cannot understand. It does seem very extraordinary to me, but she says she was awoke in the night by some monster sucking her blood. Dear me, who ever heard of such nonsense? I cannot but think there must have been something in it, and yet what could have been the reason for them all to utter a falsehood I don't know. There was, you know, the father, then the watchmen, all of whom said they saw it. At all events they appeared to have some idea that it must have been done by someone in our house, 
The dressing gown and that appeared to bewilder them. Did they say they thought so still? No, they did not do that. We spoke so positive. And I saw when I went in to see her, she was much terrified at what had occurred, and could not get up. She had a physician to attend her, who will not hear of anything that she says. Well, I think he is right. But the whole family appeared to side with her, and insist that it was no robber who made the attempt, for nothing was gone, nothing was attempted in the shape of robbery, nothing was touched or moved. Therefore there could be no common motive, they said. Well, at all events, they have made somebody very disagreeable in the family, and they had better have been quiet, but they are a disagreeable set, and I shall not go in again. You are right, my dear, they would be glad to push that minx of theirs in here, and get an acquaintance with the colonel. No, it will be safest to keep them apart. We will have as few female visitors, my dear, as possible. Not that I think you run any chance of rivalry, but you know men are such uncertain things. To be sure they are, ma, replied Margaret. Well, then, if we have no female acquaintances, you see we cannot possibly run any risk, and the matter will not be so protracted, because everything depends upon things being smooth and uninterrupted. He will be the more ready to propose and push the matter to a point. Do you think him a likely man, Ma, to marry? Certain of it, my dear, quite certain of it. I know a marrying man as soon as I see him. The colonel is decidedly a marrying man. He talks of home, domestic comfort, and all that sort of thing. And when men do that, you may be sure, if you are cautious, to catch such an one. Well, I will try. Do, my dear, it will be worth your while. It will make all our fortunes. I wonder what his money is invested in. I should like to know that, said Margaret. And so should I. Do you know, I have been thinking of that myself more than once. It will be necessary to find it out, and yet it is so delicate a matter that I think you had better make no attempt to work it out of him. Let the affair take its own course at present. But I can hear all. Then you will act wisely, my dear, very wisely, prudently, but do no more. Hear and see all, and say nothing. Of course, I mean upon that subject alone. Now, if we proceed cautiously, we shall be sure to gain our object. I will take some method of obtaining the information I want at some future time, because it will be well to have him caught before we begin to pull tight the line, or, at least, before we begin to make any inquiries respecting his means, he must give us some cause to do so. I dare say we shall know something by accident some of these days. Perhaps at the hotel where he comes from, something may be learned by inquiry. Possibly there may, my dear, but I do not like to go there. At all events, they can know but little, for he has not been long in England, and would hold but little communication with such people. We must have some better plan than that to go upon, else we shall never be successful, except at the cost of some cross in our hopes we would rather have avoided. Well, Ma, you shall do as you like in this affair. I am sure you will do what is right and best for the occasion. Besides, one plan is better than two. You are right, my dear. I am, however, resolved to have a visitor. A visitor, Ma? Yes, my dear, only Mr. Twistle, the attorney. Oh, I know who you mean now, but why do you have him? He is a very funny sort of acquaintance, especially if he is to meet the colonel. I wish to meet him, my dear, for that reason. He will be able to get out of him, by some means, what he has got his money locked up in. A hint will serve him, and he can make inquiries and learn it all, and then he will, if we are successful, have a good thing of marriage settlements, and so forth. Besides, I will make an agreement with him that he shall receive a sum of money for his trouble. That will be a very good plan, certainly. Exactly, and you needn't be seen in it at all. So I think we shall be all very fairly put in the way of doing well. I shall go out this morning and call upon Mr. Twistle and have some conversation with him. He used to have some business of your father's to do, and has had much of his money, as well as a good word now and then. Dear me, who is that? There is a double knock at the door, Ma. 
How vexing it will be to have any one come here. I shall hate the sight of any one coming in now. Can't you see from the window who it is, my dear? No, ma. Then we must wait until the servant comes in. The words had hardly been uttered before the servant entered, and said that Mr. Twistle wanted to speak with Mrs. Meredith if she was at home. "'God bless me! Send him in!' said Mrs. Meredith, after the first surprise was over, and then, turning to her daughter, she said, "'Talk of what's his name, and you are sure to see some of his friends. If I had wanted him to come, he would not have been here.' "'Very likely, Ma, and yet you do, and he is here.' At this moment Mr. Twistle made his appearance and entered the parlour. Having saluted the ladies, he proceeded to lay his hat and cane upon the table, saying, "'Mrs. Meredith, I dare say you are surprised to see me after so long an absence.' "'My surprise is not greater than my pleasure, Mr. Twistle. I am very glad to see an old friend of my husband's. Pray sit down, sir.' "'Thank you, I will. I am glad to see you look so well. I need not ask how you are, and your amiable daughter, too. She appears charming.' Yes, Mr. Twistle, we are in tolerable good health, not often better. Do not let me disturb you, Miss Margaret, said Mr. Twistle, as she rose to leave the room. Oh, no, sir, not at all. I have something to attend to, if you will excuse me. Certainly, certainly. I hope I shall not be any cause of putting you to any constraint and inconvenience. At the same time, I shall not detain Mrs. Meredith long. "'Oh, we don't intend to lose you suddenly,' said Mrs. Meredith. "'Anything I can oblige you in, I shall be very happy to do so, if you point out the how.' "'Then I shall proceed to do so at once,' said Mr. Twistle. "'I will do so at once. You see, when your late husband died, or before, he gave me several debts to collect.' "'So I understood,' said Mrs. Meredith. "'Exactly. I see you understand me.' Now, those debts I was to collect myself for my own benefit, he having, when he died, owed me a considerable sum of money. He assigned them to me, and I accepted them as payment of his debt due to me. I understood such to be the case, and at that point the matter was considered as settled, was it not, Mr. Twistle? said Mrs. Meredith. It was so, and is so now, as far as I know now but I want some few papers which it is possible may be somewhere in your possession to enable me to secure the payment of them, and without these papers I shall not be able to enforce attention. Now I want to know if you will oblige me with them if you have them by you? I will certainly look and make any search I can for them, and if I find them you shall have them certainly. But now I have disposed of that, will you do me a favor? Certainly, with pleasure. Well, then, Mr. Twistle, you see, there is a certain rich lodger of mine who pays certain attentions to my daughter Margaret, said Mrs. Meredith. I see, said Mr. Twistle. Well, then, he had made no positive offer yet, but we have certain expectations, you see, and in case those expectations become realized, I want to be in such a situation as to know at once what I shall do in such a case, what ought to be done. Very good, my dear madam, very good. Now, we only know from report and from appearances that he is rich. We feel quite convinced of that. He could not well be otherwise, said Mrs. Meredith. But we are anxious to know in what kind of stock or property he is likely to have invested it. Yes, I see. Well, then, all you have to do is learn what you can from himself or his friends, and then make inquiries respecting the truth of what you hear. I should be very happy in assisting to make such inquiries, or in any way you may point out. I am very much obliged to you, but, Mr. Twistle, it is a very delicate subject for females to touch upon, and, moreover, it is worse, considering how my daughter is likely to be in connection with him. It is a delicate matter, certainly. Well, now, what I wanted was this. If you would, on some occasion, I would let you know beforehand, call in and take some tea, or whatever meal happened to be at hand, and get into conversation with the colonel, and get this matter from him. Oh, he is a colonel in the army, then? Yes, but returned in bad health from the Indies. He has come only recently. 
Ay, ay, I see. You have a nabob, I see. That will be a very handsome settlement for your daughter, my dear madam, a very handsome settlement. Yes, it will. Well, it is handsome, but there are drawbacks, you see. Oh, age and ill health. Exactly, they are drawbacks, you see, that are not always to a young female's taste. No, no, but then my daughter is a reasonable young woman, Mr. Twistle, and would not object to a good fortune because there was a kind, though perhaps elderly, gentleman for a husband. Oh, dear no, sir, I have no apprehensions of that character. She will be good and obedient, especially when she knows that it is all for her good. Besides that, you see, the colonel, though an invalid, is not so very old, and is a most pleasant, and I must say, fascinating gentleman to converse with, so that she can have no personal objection. And besides, from what I can observe, I have reason to believe that the colonel is by no means disagreeable to her. Then I am sure it is a very handsome prospect for her, and one that might have been long in happening to one who had a better fortune to aid her. Yes, indeed, it might. Well, then, if I can aid you, command my services. In this respect you may do me much good, but I do not, as it will be some little loss of time to you, desire you should do so for nothing. If we succeed and all is comfortable, you shall have a hundred pounds soon after the marriage, say three months. Very well, I am quite willing to accept the terms, and should I be wanted at any time, perhaps you will let me know as long before as possible. I will do so. And then, when I next come, perhaps you'll be able to hand me the papers, and be ready to sign some agreement which I will get ready for the purpose. Very well, I will do it. I am much obliged to you, said Mr. Twistle. However, I suppose, when I am introduced to the colonel, I am only to come in as an old friend of the family? Exactly so. That will be by far the best character to assume, because you may be anything. Besides which, when matters come to a point proper for interference, you can do so the more easily, and with more effect, and he also will be less inclined to quarrel. And at the same time he can have less objection to do so, which, you see, is a little better." I see, said the attorney, rising, and now, as we have settled this business so far, I will bid you good afternoon, as I have some business elsewhere this evening, which I must get finished. After exchanging greetings, the attorney quitted the house of Mrs. Meredith without further remark. End of chapter 131 End of Barney the Vampire, Volume 2 of 3, by Thomas Prescott Prest